It was a cold night. To the northwest of the small town of Gladstone was the low-grade Fleming's Academy, and in the darkest corner on the third floor of her student dormitory was room numbered 309. Blankets were scattered in all directions. A thin, fragile, black-haired young man woke up in a cold sweat. Moonlight streamed through the windows, casting a dull glow on his face. Am I really in the Firuman world now? A world of darkness, dying gods, bloody night, and sparkling magical lights to save him. Is this all real? The young man's head was in complete chaos. His name was Link. He was from Earth. At least he was there just an hour ago. Just recently, he was playing Legend in his own home on Earth. Legend was the most popular online virtual reality game on Earth. It was about a world going through difficult times, where dark forces were gradually taking over. In the game, he was the first Archmage in history, as well as the chief mage of his largest guild, the Guild of Starry Dreams. Shortly before this, he challenged the main boss of the game, the Lord of the Abyss, Nozama. Nozama was a powerful demigod. He was one of the three lords of the Dark Army in the mortal world. Link's battle with Nozama was intense. Out of his team of over 110 players, only Link managed to hold out. Under Nozama's constant attacks, his health level was close to the end, and at the very end, Link unlocked a god-level item, the Archangel's sword. Unlimited power surged from him, and the guy became invincible for five seconds. During those five seconds during which Link and the Mad Boss collided, each of them used the three fingers of death spell on each other. Finger of Death, Legendary Spell Level 19 Effect, Spell Strike on the enemy subjects him to Divine Justice and there is a very high chance that this will cause his sudden death. The version used by the player is basic. The spell can only be used when the boss's health drops below a certain level. The worst thing is that the spell completely ignores the enemy's rank. If the spell is successful, then even a god will be killed in an instant. The fingers of death were simultaneously activated by Link and Nozama. They both literally fought to the death. Oddly enough, Link's character was not resurrected in the graveyard. Instead, he suddenly found himself in a dark and ominous dimension. In this dimension was a ghostly ball of light. He said that he was the ruler of light, originally from the Legion of Light, and his kingdom in the world of Furuman was on the verge of defeat. His powers as the Supreme God were already completely exhausted, and he begged Link to save his dear world of Furuman. Link simply listened. Who could believe in such a ridiculous thing as saving the world? He believed that this scene was activated by killing the final boss, and so Link, filled with self-esteem, agreed to the ruler's request. Due to this, he was sent to this godforsaken, miserable place. Under the dim moonlight, Link looked around and was able to make out the room around him. The room was neither big nor small. There was a strange bookshelf and a chair by the window, a single bed against the wall, and next to it there was a chest for storing things. That's all. There were three books on the bookshelf. Link found that he knew their names, Elemental Magic, World Balance, and Light and Darkness. They were all basic textbooks from the Academy's library. More memories began to surface in his mind. His name here was also Link. He was the youngest son of a small baron in the eastern lands of the Kingdom of Norton. This year he turned 17. He was taciturn. In six months at the Magic Academy, he learned only one extremely simple spell, Mage's Hand, Level Zero Apprentice Spell. He was a hermit and almost no one noticed him. But that didn't matter now. Jumping off the bed, not even bothering to put on his shoes, Link rushed to the calendar hanging by the table. Today's date was clearly marked on the calendar. Light ages. 1056, ninth day of the tenth month. Link sighed heavily. It seemed like it was an ordinary day, but it will forever go down in the history of the Firaman world, because late today the advance party of the Dark Elves manages to ambush the city of Gladstone. They will carry out a massacre, and 150,000 people will be destroyed within a day and their souls will be sacrificed to the Dark Elf Goddess, the Spider Queen, Lolth, One. There will be less than 1,000 survivors. After the ritual of sacrifice, the corpses will be thrown into the river near the city. The corpses will form a dam and block the river, and the water will turn scarlet with blood. Overnight, Gladstone will be reduced to ruins. This incident will be known as the Blood Moon Changing. Soon, the war will engulf the entire Firaman world. Dark times will come. Twenty years later, there is still no sign of its completion. In fact, it will seem like it will only get worse. This was all part of the backstory of the game legend. After comparing what he knew about with the memories in his body, Link realized that this world he was in now was almost identical to the world in legend. The only difference was the time. 
in the game it happened in 1076. The Legion of Light retreated, losing more and more battles, and its territory was steadily shrinking. In addition, constant infighting led to even greater chaos, and the world seemed to be about to face the beginning of a catastrophe. The Blood Moon will change tonight! Link turned in horror to look at the pocket watch that lay on his bed. He rushed over and picked them up. Pocket watches were made by dwarves. Having opened them, he could easily determine the time, since the clock hands glowed in the dark. 9.35, evening, less than an hour left. The Dark Elves attack will begin soon. And Link, his heart began to beat wildly. This night the Dark Elves will strike the first blow. They will sneak into Gladstone and set in motion an elaborate plan to destroy the city. In the game, the first murder was committed at 10.30, and the killings continued for an hour. During this hour, almost all the leaders of the city were destroyed, and the rest were mortally wounded. When the Dark Elves launched their main attack, the city was already in turmoil and their army did not encounter any significant resistance. How did he know all this so well? Because in the game legend, every newbie had to go through this as part of their first mission. This mission involved escaping Gladstone. How can I save myself? Link walked around the room, asking himself over and over again. He needs to survive an urban massacre on an alien world. If he didn't escape, he would definitely be one of the corpses in the river near Gladstone City by morning. Thinking about the events that he knew were about to happen, Link felt himself break out in a cold sweat. But being the only archmage in the game, he had a clear mind. While in shock, Link managed to maintain his resolve and did not want to despair. After thinking about everything that was happening, he began to develop a strategy to get out of his predicament. Suddenly, Link's heart skipped a beat, and a glowing number appeared in his head. It was number 20. This, Omniglasses, the ruler of light spoke the truth. Link felt his morale begin to rise. In the game, the ruler of light was the main god of the Legion of Light. It was the same in this world, in the strange dimension he was in before teleporting to this world. The ruler of light said that in order for him to leave Gladstone safely, he would receive twenty Omni points. With them, he can quickly grasp the power of magic. Link's eyes lit up. Even though he was the Archmage in the game, he had no idea how magic actually worked. If he really wanted to master magic, he should have studied at the Magic Academy. And this will require a huge amount of time, which he did not have now. How to use Omniglasses? he asked immediately. Something flashed before his eyes. Link discovered lines of glowing text that opened up in front of him. Everything was exactly the same as in the game. The text gradually began to appear. The game system is loading. Loading is complete. Body statistics scan. Scanning is complete. Player, Link Morani. Noble title. Mage's apprentice magic recovery rate. 0.2 points per hour. Maximum mana. 1. Mana consumption in accordance with Omni points charts. List of mastered spells. Level 0. Hand of the mage. 0.2 mana per use. Current equipment. None. Link was dumbfounded. What it is? It's so similar to the game's user interface. Either way, this body was just trash. There is almost no difference between this body and a commoner. The game system continued to give it a detailed explanation. To help the player adapt to the real Fearman world, the player's body will be integrated with the game system. The game system will give the player missions from which he can obtain Omni Points. But what can Omni Points be used for? The interface has been updated to show new information. Omni points can be used to change the player's body statistics. Exchange rate, 1 Omni point, equal sign, 1 point of speedy mana recovery, equal sign 10 maximum mana points. Omni points can be used to purchase spells. Spell prices are listed below. Mortal spells. Zeroth level spell equal sign 1 Omni. First level spell equal sign 10 Omni. Second level spell equal sign 20 Omni. Tenth level spell equal sign 100 Omni, and so on. Legendary spells, level 11, spell equal sign 500 Omni. Level 12, spell equal sign 1000 Omni. Level 13, spell equal sign 2000 Omni. Level 19, legendary peak spells, equal sign 128,000 Omni points and so on. Demigod divine spells, blocked. Okay, this definitely cleared things up. That is, as long as Link completes the missions given to him by the game system, he will gain Omni points and continue to get stronger until he reaches the legendary peak of level 19. Of course, all of this will be in the future. Now Link has there were only 20 Omni points. He needs to use his Omni points wisely to get out of Gladstone alive. In the game, Link decided to become a mage. That's why his starting point for escaping from Gladstone was Fleming's Low Grade Magic Academy. On the night of the Blood Moon changing, the Magic Academy was the key site of the Dark Elves' attack. 
the Magic Academy was very small. There were less than 100 students, of which less than 20 were full-fledged magicians. At best, they possessed level 4. Over 200 assassins were sent here. At least 20 of them were already hiding around this place by this time. Half of the Academy teachers were killed in their sleep. Some of them woke up, but could not resist the assassins. As a result, the Academy of Magic fell and its students were killed. It was a real bloody mess. Remembering the details of his last escape, Link decided to buy some of the spells he used then. Call up the spell menu. Many glowing cards appeared in his field of vision. Each slowly rotating card was a spell. The number in the upper left corner of the card indicated the mana cost, and the number in the upper right corner of the card indicated the level of the spell. All the spells were there. More than a thousand. The higher the level of magic, the brighter the card glowed. The legendary spell cards nearly blinded Link. Among them, he also noticed the legendary spells. Finger of Death, Doomsday Meteor, and Great Ruins. I was made this ruler of light. If I had 2,000 Omni Points, I could win this battle alone. But I only have 20 points. Considering how weak the ruler of light looked, it was probably difficult for him to even send me here. Getting 20 points from him is also not bad at all. But in any case, that sad old man is probably already dead. Filter. Show only level 0 spells. High level spells were powerful, but he couldn't afford any of them. Just one level 1 spell cost 10 Omni Points, and their mana consumption was much higher than a level 0 spell. As for level 2 spells, they cost 20 Omni Points and required 30 mana. The price and cost of using any of them was too high for Link. He didn't even consider them. Level 0 spells were also known as apprentice spells. If you fail to use them wisely, they will just be garbage in the form of smoke. But if they succeed, they can kill. Even though the spells were not as powerful, he chose them because apprentice spells required less recovery time than higher level spells. Link could cast a level 0 spell for 0, 1 seconds. For a first level spell, he would need at least 0 0.3 seconds. And for a third level spell, he will need a whole second. This is too long and completely unsuitable for a single magician. Whoosh! The brightly glowing magic cards disappeared, leaving only a few dozen dimly glowing cards. They all had the number 0 in the upper right corner. Link looked through them all one by one. Finally, he settled on four level 0 spells. Bye, Fireball, Earth Spike, Weak Invisibility, Sleep. Instantly, these magical cards lit up brightly. They broke into countless small points of light and then disappeared into thin air. Link felt his mind go blank for a split second and then recover. He was very familiar with these four level zero spells. If he wanted, he could use any of them in an instant. And it's all? He thought. The feeling of learning a spell was exactly the same as in the game. This gave Link a feeling of comfort. After purchasing four spells, Link spent two more two Omni points to increase his maximum mana points. His maximum mana became 21, enough to cast a level 0 spell 10 times. After exchanging Omni points, he felt the amount of mana in his body rise by a whole level. And after that, he breathed a sigh of relief. The game system was quite reliable. The mana in his body increased automatically. If he runs out of mana, he will need time to recover. Link's mana was restored at a rate of 0 0.2 mana points per hour, making him useless at this time. He now had 14 Omni points left. Link glanced at his pocket watch, 9.40. Only five minutes had passed. The killings would begin in an hour. Until this time, it is safe to stay in the student dormitory. But the assassins outside have already taken their positions and are waiting. Running away now equals suicide. In the game world, in order to escape from the academy, you had to wait until the killings started. It was the only way to survive. There's still an hour left. What should I do? Link puzzled over this, saved the others, convinced the students to run away with him. It was pointless. Link was a nobody at the Magic Academy. Who would listen to someone who has only mastered one pathetic spell? They would take him for a madman. Maybe get some magical items to increase his powers as much as he could? Yes, that was a good idea. Underscore. Underscore, 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 In the original, her name is Blue Eyes, which can be translated as Curly Silk Thread. In one Anli, this name is written Lolth, 
which can be translated as Loth, but as a fan of Drow and Salvatore, X books, I am more familiar with Loth, so I'll leave it that way. How can you quickly become strong in the world of Firuman? So there were three ways. Magical items, potions, and buffs. One. Only students lived in the student dormitory. Their magical abilities were so low that they did not even dare to think about buffs. Link also did not consider the option of potions. There were no alchemy laboratories in the dormitory. Between the student dormitory and the nearest alchemy laboratory was more than 100 meters away. It was impossible to overcome this distance in the dark, given the assassins lurking at every step, ready to strike at any time. The only option remained a magic item. What is the most important magic item for a magician? It is an item that reduces mana consumption. In other words, it is a magic wand. Mages could use magic without a magic wand, but their weak bodies were not able to fully concentrate mana, so the magic they used would be very weak. This forced them to seek outside help. A prime example was wands. A level zero fireball thrown by a mage's apprentice was roughly equivalent to a firework. But using even a simple magic wand, the effect was much greater. The firework started similar to a grenade explosion, and no changes in mana consumption were observed. This was the secret of the magic wand. It simply reduces mana costs. If you compare magic to a bullet, wands would be pistols. The quality of the pistol determined the penetrating power of the bullet. The sticks were very expensive. The cheapest of them cost 100 gold coins. Link was just the youngest son of a small baron. He had little talent in magic, and there was no way he could obtain such a luxury item. But the other students in the dormitory, definitely had it. More than 50 mage students lived in the student dormitory. At least 20 of them had magic wands, but the best one belonged to a student named Grant. Link knew that his magic wand was called New Moon. It was one of the early works of the wand maker Hermiru, and it cost more than a thousand gold coins. It was a gift from Grant's father, the Duke, to his favorite son as he came of age. It was rumored that Grant loved his wand so much that he even slept with it. She was Link's target. He immediately sprang into action. Link began to put on the clothes that were on his bed, but stopped midway, as they were student clothes issued by the Magic Academy. The material and design were unique. His identity as a student of the Academy of Magic immediately became obvious to everyone who saw the robes. Normally this wasn't a problem, but today, the more attention you attract, the more likely you are to be killed. Throwing off his student clothes, Link opened the chest and took a gray robe. There was nothing special about him. Wearing it would help him blend in with the crowd. Link headed out immediately after getting dressed. Most mages loved towers. The student dormitory was a tower with five floors, each of which had ten rooms arranged in a circle. Upon leaving, Link found himself in a round hall about ten meters in diameter. It was dimly lit by a ball of light flying over the hall. The clock showed 9.45. Mages, as a rule, went to bed at this time. Climbing the spiral stone staircase to the second floor, Link approached Grant's room and knocked lightly on the door. There was no answer. Grant was probably fast asleep. Link hesitated. The knocking could wake other students. Considering what he was planning to do, this might not have come in handy. Placing his palm against the lock, Link activated the Mage Hand. Mage Hand mana cost, 0 0.2 points. Level 0 spell effect. Moving objects without physical contact. Mages often use this technique to boast of your abilities. Mage's Hand was the only spell Link knew to begin with. It was very simple and only cost 0.2 mana. The student dormitory had standard locks. Opening them with the hand of the magician was as easy as shelling pears. Five seconds later, the door opened. The wooden door made a slight creaking sound as Link pushed it softly. For someone who was stealing for the first time in his life, the noise would have seemed extremely frightening, but not for Link. As someone who managed to become the first Archmage in a virtual reality game, he was very emotionally stable. Without flinching, he entered and quietly closed the door, doing it all as naturally as if he was entering his own room. The room was dark. The layout was exactly the same as his, but the furniture was much more elegant. The academy did not provide its students with furniture. Grant bought it himself. Grant slept soundly on the bed. The rumors were true. He loved his wand so much that he would not part with it even in his sleep. This might be a problem for others, but not for Link. He knew that after the massacre, there would be no one to take care of what he had done. Standing by Grant's bed, Link swung his hand and hit Grant in his handsome face. This was revenge for the fact that Grant often pestered him. One day, one of his antics resulted in Link breaking his arm. Grant's father was a duke, so Link had to endure it. But not now. 
Grant woke up from such a slap and jumped out of bed in fright. Pressing his hand to his cheek, he looked around. What? What's going on? What is happening? He was not yet fully awake and did not understand what had happened. Link quickly snatched the fancy wand from his weakened hand and before Grant realized what was happening, smacked him in the back of the head. Grant's eyes crossed and he fell unconscious on the bed, not understanding what had happened. Link admired the wand he held in his hand. It was 38 centimeters long with gold rings along its entire length, on which there were magical inscriptions. Tiny magical runes were etched all over the wand, and a new moon adorned the tip. A virtual box appeared next to the wand. Glowing text flashed across the box. Dark Moon Wand Quality. Excellent effect. Attack spells plus 20% power. Note, a gift from Duke Gridden to his second son when he came of age. Link smiled. The Ruler of Light did this game system really well. Everything is like in reality, Link thought. He received the New Moon Magic Wand. His pocket watch showed 9.50. He still had 40 minutes left. There was more than enough time. He left the room and pressed the tip of his Dark Moon Wand to the door lock. Activate, Mage's Hand. With a click, the door's bolt was broken. With the help of a magic wand, the magician's hand spell has become much more powerful. Now no one will be able to open the door, neither from the inside nor from the outside. Even if Grant woke up in the middle of the night, he would have to find another way to get out of the room. In 40 minutes, no one at the academy would care about anyone else's affairs. He had a magic wand, and that was the first step. Link made his way to the first floor of the student dormitory. There were several display cases there. One contained a magic bracelet, the so-called protective bracelet. It was a low-level magic item. Whoever wore it could use a level 2 defense spell, Guardian Barrier. Link had to obtain it. Currently, due to the low mana density, there were few strong people around compared to what would be in the future. A second level protection spell was already considered very powerful. If used correctly, it can save his life. If the war continues, the clashes of powerful forces will cause spatial cracks in the world of Firumen. As a result, the density of mana in the world will increase, and with it the number of warriors. By that time, level 2 spells would not be able to harm anyone at all. But now his problem was that a full-fledged sorceress lived on the first floor, Madame Fairfax. This kind old lady was a level 1 mage and was the head of the student dormitory. She was a light sleeper and would wake up at the slightest noise. With her, it would be very difficult to steal the bracelet, but Link had a plan. He walked towards the stairs but stopped abruptly in front of the door. A sudden rush of feelings overwhelmed him. Link blinked. The young man's memories appeared in his head. The hostel was mixed. In this room lived a student named Celine. She was of ordinary origin. She attended the Magic Academy on a full scholarship due to her exceptional talent in magic. In just three months, she mastered three level zero spells. Her future was bright and promising. According to his recollections, Celine was a very beautiful girl. Even without makeup, she was undoubtedly the first beauty in the Academy of Magic. But these feelings arose not only because of this, but because she provided him with invaluable help. When Grant broke his arm, Celine cared for him for more than a month, feeling guilty about that incident. Link was an introverted and insecure person. He had practically no friends at the Academy. He developed strong feelings for Celine while she was courting him. Ha <laughs> ha. Baby, is she your first love? Link chuckled quietly. He didn't want to poke his nose into other people's affairs. He'll be lucky if he can get out on his own. With one more person, the danger he faced would increase exponentially. Turning toward the exit, he took a step, then another, and then a third. At the fourth step, he froze. He discovered that the feelings he was experiencing had become so strong that he could no longer ignore them. Okay, okay. Since this is your last wish, I will do it. In the end, I took over your body. It was inexplicable, but when Link made his promise, those feelings disappeared. He felt as if a weight had been lifted from his shoulders. Link knew that the original owner of his body was gone forever. What a fool in love, Link thought, shaking his head. He will take Celine with him, but not now. At this point, he will have to steal. No, pick up the safety bracelet. Buff, English buff, is a term in computer games that means a temporary strengthening of a player, usually under the influence of a special spell or the effect of an item. On the ground floor of the student dormitory, there were three display cases. The first display case contained a document issued by the previous Lord Gladstone. The second contained a beautiful hand-forged sword that was supposedly a gift from the dwarves. 
and in the latter there was a magic bracelet created almost two centuries ago by a level 10 master mage from the Magic Academy. Due to the low density of mana, legends of level 11 and above did not appear in this world. A level 10 master mage was already the pinnacle of existence in the mortal world. He was the pride and joy of the low-grade Fleming's Academy. The things on display were not that valuable. They were only exhibited to show the history of the Magic Academy. They were protected by a simple spell that activated an alarm if the display cases were destroyed. However, Link knew not only that the display case had a key, but also where it was located. The corridor on the first floor seemed very gloomy. It was much darker there than in Grant's room, and therefore it seemed that the corridor was endless. Link made it to Madame Fairfax's room without any problems. He knocked softly on the door. Knock, knock, knock. In the night the sound seemed even louder, and immediately a voice was heard from Madame Fairfax's room. Who is it? She really was in a light sleep. Madame, it's me. Link from room 309. I need to talk to you urgently. Please open the door, Link said with anxiety and fear in his voice. Even if someone disturbed her sleep, this kind old woman never refused to help anyone. Yes? Give me a sec. I'm coming. Apparently the women's outfits of this world were quite difficult to put on, and Madame Fairfax, being no longer so young, spent about three four minutes before approaching the door. Link took a deep breath and pointed the dark moon wand at the wooden door. Soon the key turned and the door opened with a click. Madame Fairfax's wrinkled face appeared from behind the door. What happened? Before she finished speaking, the tip of Link's wand began to glow. Sleep. Sleep level zero. Spell effect. Causes people to fall into deep sleep. The stronger the opponent, the weaker the effect. Now this was considered real magic. The feeling when Link used the spell for the first time was truly amazing. It was as easy as in the game. Now escaping from Gladstone will not be difficult. Link felt more confident. The spell cost two Link's Omni points, but it was worth it. Link could not bring himself to hit this kind old lady. Madame Fairfax was a first-level magician. One could hardly call her a real sorceress. Her magical talent was extremely mediocre. Her level one qualification was achieved through determination and perseverance. Even now, just waking up in the middle of the night, she didn't even have time to react to the spell Link used. With a flash of light she froze and her body began to fall. Lightning fast reaction. This is how Link managed to outshine everyone in the game legend. This is exactly how he acted in this world. Link quickly caught the old woman's frail body and put her back on the bed. He estimated that the effect of the spell would last an hour at most. 9.55. He had enough time. As the head of the hostel, Madame Fairfax kept the keys to the display cases. Link searched the entire room. Finally, he found a large bunch of keys in a small chest by the window. The old lady was quite forgetful and numbered each of the keys. This made things much easier for Link. Finding the key, Link opened the third display case and grabbed the magic bracelet. The bracelet was made of fine gold. Copper alloys gave it a purple glow, and the magical runes engraved around its circumference emitted a silver glow. It was wonderful. Protection bracelet quality. Excellent effect. Forms a level 2 barrier when activated. Use, 0 over 1. Item use is limited. Note, The Pride of the Academy. One of the early works of Master Mage Ilantha. Unfinished item. Although it can only be used once, that will be enough for me. Link put the bracelet on his hand. Now he got all the useful items in the dorm. His pocket watch showed 9.58, half an hour left. The last thing that needed to be done was to fulfill the last wish of the original owner of his body. To save Celine. Moving with long strides towards the second floor, Link didn't even have time to notice how he found himself at Celine, door, as if his feet had led him to her of their own accord. Knock, knock, knock. This was the third time that evening that Link knocked on someone's door. There was no answer. The young girl was fast asleep. Link sighed quietly. He pointed the Dark Moon wand at the lock and activated the mage's hand. There was a click and the door opened. Link pushed the door lightly and entered the room, closing it behind him. Only then did he turn to look around the room. The room was very modest. Apart from the bed, the room contained an old dressing table. On it, next to an open book, lay a mirror and a comb. Celine slept on the bed, curled up in a ball, under a thin old blanket that barely kept warm. This clearly demonstrated the difference between nobles and commoners. Even with a full scholarship, the girl had no choice but to live a modest life. Even Link, despite his lousy magical talent, thanks to his background, didn't have to worry about things like heating and food.
Link sat down in a chair. Silently, he looked out the window at the night, patiently waiting. Ten o'clock. There was still half an hour left before they could take their chance to escape in the chaos that lay ahead. To avoid having to explain everything to Celine, Link decided not to wake her now. Walking over to the dressing table, he flipped through the pages of the magic book. The book was called Direction of Magic, Analysis. It was an advanced magic book. Link tried to read a few pages. Hmm? Surprisingly, Link found that he could not only recognize what was written, but also understand it easily. He even found some errors in magic theorems. His head was working very well. He couldn't believe it. Thinking it was just an accident, he looked at a couple more pages. However, this was no accident. The book, which should have been completely unfamiliar to Link, especially since he was from Earth, was absolutely understandable to him, just like children's storybooks are understandable to all adults. Oh yes, the Ruler of Light said that he would strengthen my soul so that I could travel safely through time and space. Could this be a consequence of that strengthening? This seemed to be the only possible explanation. Link quickly read page after page, interested in the contents of the book. He not only understood and remembered everything that was written in it, but also developed his own interpretations of the application of the theories in practice. The cogs of his brain were a well-coordinated machine, as if they were designed for magic. By the time he finished reading the book, Link had a fairly complete understanding of this new outside world. According to the book, the world of Firaman was a lonely island surrounded by an endless sea of mana. Mana coming from the sea fed all the creatures of the world of Firaman. Mages called this phenomenon absorption. The world was literally saturated with a sea of mana. Even though the absorption had no effect on the sea of mana, it made this world a completely different place, full of different shapes and colors. The creatures of the world of Firaman used mana to create wonderful and vibrant magical civilizations. This is how the magician saw this world. This is so strange. I was an archmage in the game, but I feel like this is the first time I'm learning what magic is. Link looked at the wand in his hand. He found that it was not difficult to understand the principles behind the magic wand. It was simply an item used to compress mana. He could easily find flaws in this magic wand. If I devote enough time to study, then in three months. No, no, in just one month, I will be able to create a magic wand much better than this. Link was sure of it. As a gamer, Link already knew how to use spells, but he didn't know how they worked. Archmage was simply an honorary title among gamers. In this same world, with the blessing of the Ruler of Light, he had the resources to become a real Archmage. After I get out of Gladstone, I'll need to get some magic books. I will study them in my free time from assignments. I must become stronger. Link needed to become very strong and master many spells as quickly as possible, even if he only relied on Omni Points. But the main problem was that the spells provided by the game system were common and run-of-the-mill, the same as those in the game. The spell used by the player will always be weaker than the spell of the elite boss, not to mention the final boss, although the spells are the same. Each powerful magician has his own techniques. The same spells in their hands can become more powerful. These higher magical skills were built on a deep understanding of magic. This is not something the game system can provide. In his final battle, the Lord of the Void, Nozama, was able to use his superior magical skills to instantly cast the level 19 spell Finger of Death. There was almost no lag when he used it. As a result, 90% of the team were killed. The gaming system and Omni Points are just bonuses. I must find my way as a magician. A as a Having made this decision, Link felt more calm. His pocket watch showed 10.25. He doesn't have much time left. Link stood up and walked over to the bed. Lightly touching her smooth face with his hand, he said softly, Celine, Celine, wake up. There's no doubt she was beautiful. Her figure and facial features were amazingly beautiful. No wonder Link was intoxicated by her beauty. For some reason, her face seemed familiar to him, but he couldn't remember where he'd seen her before. This is strange, Link thought. Everything was confused in his head. Celine was sleeping very soundly. Mom, a bit more, she whispered. She acted like a little girl. Link couldn't help but smile. Eventually, Celine came to her senses and looked at Link with her blue eyes. Why are you in my room? She looked surprised, but not afraid. Get ready. We can't stay at the academy any longer. We need to leave now. Link stepped back a little. The expression on his face was serious. What did you say? Celine was confused, but still began to get dressed. Don't wear this. Wear some simple short robe and pants, Link warned her. He looked out the window. 
In the misty moonlight he caught silhouettes that disappeared into the shadows. Dark elves are killers. It's starting. The dark figures moved quickly and silently. Two of them headed to the student dormitory. Hurry up, they are coming, Link urged, but his voice was soft. Don't rush me. I'm getting dressed, Selene complained to him. Link turned his head to look at her. He was stunned. The young girl had no choice but to take off her nightgown to put on a short robe and trousers. The underwear she wore was very thin, and therefore a small part of her naked body could be seen. Under the misty moonlight, her waist and legs seemed especially slender, and her skin was so white that it was blinding. Link felt his blood boil. He quickly looked away. I saw the killers come. When you get ready, follow me. If anything happens, I will protect you, he explained. All the Dark Elves who participated in the operation were elite. In the game, during the escape from Gladstone, they were all very difficult opponents due to their high level of health and attack. Ordinary students do not stand a chance against them. Assassins? It's horrible? Selene quickened her pace. The scream outside the window proved that Link was telling the truth. When she finished getting dressed, Link walked to the door. Ten meters from the door, he pointed his wand at the lock and activated the magician's hand. The door swung open. Some students flashed outside the door, but fortunately there were no killers. Clearly, follow me. Link motioned to Selene. As much as possible, he did not want to face the killers. It wasn't that he was afraid of them, he just wanted to conserve his mana. Selene followed him silently. She thought Link was acting unusual. He looked more serious. This man is strange? Selene looked at him with curiosity. He didn't seem worried, even though there were creatures around that were ready to kill them. Link observed the situation in the hall and did not pay attention to the girl's suspicious behavior. According to the memories of the original Link, Selene was gentle and soft. It seemed that nothing could upset her. Because of this, he did not notice any changes in her. The hall was a mess. All the students were completely confused. They had no idea what was going on. What happened? Why is there so much noise? Damn it, I slept so well. Good God, what a mess. Noticing Link leaving Selene's room, some students stared at him in amazement. What? This commoner studies in the middle of the night? Someone shouted in a fit of jealousy. Selene, why are you disgracing yourself? Was heard from another discouraged student. Selene's face, which had been calm and collected, turned red. Just as she was about to say something in her own defense, a piercing scream came from the first floor of the dormitory. It was a scream that could only come from someone who was dying in agony. What happened? Damn it, it sounds like Madame Fairfax. Bam! The student ran out of his room. Look at the street! People are attacking the academy! In a short period of time, many of the academy's buildings were on fire. From time to time, the sounds of magical explosions filled the air. Not far from the Garden of Magic, they could see the vague outlines of fighting people. It was chaos. Oh, ruler of light, who can tell me what is happening? Good God, these are the Dark Elves, the servants of Lolth, the queen of the spiders. Look, there they are. On the stairs leading to the second floor stood two figures, completely dressed in black leather. Although they were wearing masks, their distinctive dark red eyes and ashen gray skin gave them away. Link was amazed by their appearance. He knew that battle was inevitable. He dragged Selene back into the room. He had a reason. The hall was too big. The elves will be difficult to deal with. On the other hand, the door to the room they were in was small and narrow. Even if the assassins followed them, he would only have to face one enemy at a time. This will significantly reduce mana consumption. There were alarming cries outside the door. He killed Madame Fairfax, one of the students shouted, pointing at the dark elf with a bloody dagger in his hand. The killer immediately responded to his words. Placing an arrow in the dark elf's bow, quickly drawing the string, he fired the arrow straight into the student's throat. The student flopped to the ground, and blood began to spread around him. The smell of blood filled everything around. The other students were speechless. Oh, murderer! The young magicians froze in horror, then panic began. Some ran back to their rooms, locking the doors. Others became hysterical and screamed. Those who were bolder attacked back. But what can the spells of a magician's apprentice do? Their attacks were nothing to the powerful dark elf killers. One of the students threw a pale orange fireball no bigger than a football at the killer. He didn't move an inch. He only used his black dagger to block that tiny level zero spell. Puff. The dagger cut the fireball into two halves. All that was left was sparks. Anti-magic weapon! Someone exclaimed. Starting from the third level, the warriors of the world of Firuman had combat key. Those of lower level used anti-magic items. Weapons, elemental armor, and potions. 
Of course, one could rely on speed and agility to hide and evade spells. But there was a significant risk. When meeting with a powerful magician, just one fireball could burn the trickster to ashes. These were the thoughts of the young magician. But the young magician had no chance of survival. The dark elf raised his bow and fired another arrow. With each lightning-fast bow shot, the students fell to the ground one by one. This was a real meat grinder. The elves were too powerful and experienced in battle. In the blink of an eye, only a few young defenseless mages remained. One of them burst into the room where Link and Selene were hiding. Slamming the door behind him, he fell to the floor, clutching his head and trembling in horror. In the room, Selene hid behind Link. It was hard for the frightened girl to believe that such bloody scenes could happen right before her eyes in the quiet Academy of Magic. Dark elves are monsters. In three months here, Selene managed to fall in love with this peaceful atmosphere of the Academy. But the Dark Elves destroyed it all in just a few minutes. Link was calm. He stood in front of the door, holding the new moon magic wand in his hand and waiting patiently. He also felt fear in his heart. This was the first time he had been in such mortal danger. But listening to the voice of reason, he tried to suppress fear. In the corridor he could hear doors being knocked down and screams were heard. And then there was an eerie silence. In the midst of this eerie silence, the sound of footsteps was heard. They got louder and louder, closer and closer. The assassins walked towards the room where Link was hiding. Please don't, uh, uh, uh it'd kill me. Don't, uh, it'd kill me. I don't, uh, want to die. I don't want to die, the magician muttered, choking in tears. Selene retained her composure, but quietly clung to Link. The footsteps stopped just outside the door. For a couple of seconds, everything froze. This short moment seemed like an eternity to the students in the room. Suddenly, the wooden door broke with a crash. She couldn't resist the Dark Elf's power. Little cowards, why don't you go to hell? Link looked at him. Information about him appeared in front of him. Dark Elf Assassin, Elite, Level 2. Warrior Combat Skill, High Speed Burst Magic Item, Standard Bow, Quality Good. Compared to an ordinary person, a Level 2 Elite Assassin was an extremely powerful being. To make matters worse, all of the Dark Elves today were at least at this level. Gladstone was a small town without strong people. No wonder he fell. Something flashed before Link's eyes. Another message appeared. It was a mission. Open mission details. Mission. Part 1. Revenge. Mission details. Finish off the killers in the dorm. Reward. 15 Omni points. Link was excited. He really needed strength. This mission is just in time. Link was the calmest of the three students in the room. In addition, he attracted attention more than anyone else, given the fact that only he had a real magic wand in his hand. The dark elf standing on the threshold pointed his bow. Whoosh! The bowstring vibrated and the arrow flew towards Link's head. If he had enough mana to repel the attack, Link would have used a small shield field, but it cost Omni more than he could afford. So he used Fireball, a level 1 spell. A small white ball appeared in front of him. With a wave of his wand, he directed it towards the arrow fired by the elf. Ha, ah, you're quite good at spells. But how naive are you if you think that this can stop my anti-magic arrow? The Dark Elf grinned to himself. At that moment, Link and the Elf, frozen, watched as the fireball and the arrow flew past each other, separated a couple of centimeters. Having caught up with the arrow shaft, the fireball exploded. There was a roar. It wasn't loud, but the air around the anti-magic arrow vibrated, sending air currents in all directions and, more importantly, towards the arrow itself. Great. To deal with the Academy of Magic, all Dark Elves were armed with anti-magic weapons. If Link had aimed the fireball directly at the arrow, it would have pierced him, turning it into sparks. Instead, he used the fireball's blast wave to change the arrow's trajectory. It was an extremely effective move. By the time the arrow reached its target, it had deviated from its original trajectory by almost 20 centimeters. She flew past Link, ruffling a few strands of his hair. Hmm. The Dark Elf Assassin seemed surprised that he had missed. He readied another arrow, but he never managed to release it. Link wasn't the type to fight back when he got hit. An eye for an eye. That's what he was guided by. Psh! The floor under the Dark Elf's feet suddenly distorted, and an Earth Spike grew out of it. Earth Spike Zero Level Earth Element Spell Effect causes a stone spike one meter high to appear from under the ground. Do not step on it under any circumstances. As with the Fireball, the Earth Spike appeared so suddenly that the Dark Elf did not have time to react. In addition, in order to move silently, the Elves wore light shoes with thin soles. He was completely defenseless. With a dull sound, the Earth Spike entered the Dark Elf's foot and passed through his calf. 
It's hard to imagine how much hellish pain this caused. Even the Dark Elf Assassin, who had undergone extremely difficult and sometimes dangerous training, could not withstand it. He howled in pain and fell on his back in agony. Psh! At that very moment, another thorn rose from the ground. Link skillfully placed this spike, anticipating the Dark Elf's reaction. It grew exactly in the spot where the killer's back was. Pierced by the thorn, the Dark Elf twitched. His eyes opened wide, his body tensed, and for a few seconds he froze. Then his head fell back. He was dead. Even the legendary hero would not have survived being pierced by a meter-long spike. Both spikes were brought into action quickly and silently, leaving no chance for the victim. It was only when the killer fell to the floor that his companion realized what had happened. He could not even imagine this. There were only students in the room. He figured they would be easy prey like the others. Bastard! He rushed towards Link with the anti-magic dagger. Looking like a black tornado, it was approaching very quickly, covering a dozen meters per second. This was the combat skill. Speed dash. Fast opponents with anti-magic weapons were the worst nightmare of low-level magicians. Meeting with them in most cases turned into a disaster. Be careful, Link's voice came from behind him. It was Selene. Link's face was unreadable. His gaze was cold and indifferent. He called up the spell menu. Level 1 spell, Vector Barrier. Purchase completed successfully. 10 Omni, Vector Barrier level. 1 spell mana. Cost, 6 effect. Repels objects in the direction chosen by the wearer. If level 0 spells were equivalent to large fireworks, then level 1 spells were powerful enough to instill fear in the average person. The killer was a couple of meters away, Linka. He readied his dagger and swung his leg to strike him. Link extended his wand in front of him and exclaimed, There! Level 1 spells take effect within 0.3 seconds. Setting the air around him in motion, a whirlwind of wind erupted from the tip of his wand. The vortices spread out in waves from Link in the direction he was looking. The assassin, rushing at the speed of an arrow, stopped as if he had run into a wall. For a split second, his body froze as if time had stopped. The vector barrier has reached its peak. The elf's body ricocheted in the opposite direction with a roar. Possessing the strength of an elite level 2 mercenary warrior, the elf could withstand the effects of a first level spell. But Link used it at just the right time. The shield appeared the moment the assassin swung his leg. In such an unstable position, the elf could not effectively reflect the spell. Link won a complete victory, taking advantage of the enemy, his momentary weakness. Now that he had the advantage, Link couldn't let the elf come to his senses. He pointed his wand at him. Even though the elf was in motion, Pushed back by the force of the shield, the fireball could hit him. The fireball, whose mana was compressed by the magic wand, was much hotter than usual and shone with a blinding white light. But the killer did not give up. Even as he moved, following his instincts, he was able to raise his dagger in an attempt to split the incoming ball. If the ball had been launched by an ordinary student, it would have been easily dispelled by the anti-magic dagger. But the person who used the spell had much higher capabilities than the elf could imagine. A small white ball of flame circled, not wanting to fly in a straight line. He either gained speed or slowed down, making it impossible to predict his location at the next moment. It seemed that the elf's dagger was about to touch the sphere, but at the last moment the ball deftly eluded the blade, described an arc in the air and landed right between the assassin's eyes. Considering the fact that it was a level zero spell, even enhanced by a wand, the most damage it could do to an ordinary person was turning their hands into a bloody pulp. For the elf, seasoned in training, these would have been just scratches. But sensitive eyes reacted completely differently. In such a situation, it was impossible to avoid the tragic development of events. The elves wore masks, but they only covered the lower part of the face, leaving the eyes unprotected. Link's fireball was fast. The killer only had time to close his eyes. But how could this help with the explosion of the fireball? Boom! The ball exploded, depriving the killer of his eyes. He screamed in pain and was horrified by the impenetrable darkness around him. But his screams did not last long. Struck by pain, the blinded dark elf began to fall to the floor, not suspecting that the earth spike was already waiting for him there. With a dull sound, the spike pierced his chest, instantly taking his life. Now the elves were finished. The mages and the dark elves were sworn enemies. Their powers were polar opposites. A low-level mage could take out a high-ranking assassin just as a novice assassin could take out a high-level mage using a well-planned trap. Victory in a duel depended not so much on level as on combat skills and experience. In this battle, Link managed to do everything almost perfectly. 
he used five level zero spells. The first level spell cost him 16 mana points. Throughout the entire battle, Link did not move one iota from his position. Not because he couldn't, but because he didn't need it. A notification flashed before his eyes. Mission complete. Player Link receives 15 Omni. A pleasant feeling spread through Link's body. He checked the Omni again. Buying a spell during the battle cost him the lion's share of points. Having received 15 Omni for completing the mission, he now possessed 19 Omni. The student who was in the room with Link and Selene watched in horror what was happening there. When Link dealt with the last elf, he tried to say something, but his strong stutter prevented him from doing so. Link, yeah, you, you. Was this stranger the person he knew? He mastered spells perfectly. The cowardly student could not express his surprise. He was amazed not only by the spells that Link used, but also by the way Link carried himself, as if he was completely in control of the situation. Finally, he managed to find the right words. It was divine. There was not a hint of pride in Link, his behavior. Such battles were child's play for him. He left the room. Come on, Selene. Delighted, Selene looked at Link. Okay, where are we going? She asked, following him. To be honest, the elves' attack took her by surprise, but she didn't think about it. She followed Link because she was intrigued. He has changed so much. Something was wrong. To the main tower of the academy. Link had carefully planned everything in advance. The city was surrounded by an army of dark elves, consisting of hordes of dark elf assassins. He had 19 Omni and less than 3 mana points. It was impossible to fight when there was another person with him. The only chance to get out was the portal in the main tower. After thinking, Link spent 1 Omni to purchase 10 additional mana points. Thus his mana level increased to 13, but was far from the maximum. We'll have to wait for recovery. The speed of recovery was very important. But for Link, it was only 0.2 mana per hour, which in such unstable, rapidly evolving conditions was zero. Nevertheless, Link calmed himself with the thought that 18 Omni would be enough to face whatever might happen to them. There were two types of magicians. The first are learned magicians. Such people had a deep understanding of how magic worked. They were excellent at spells, but they were not warriors. Under pressure, they made all sorts of mistakes. Unfortunately, the magic teachers of the low-grade Fleming's Magic Academy were learned magicians. Link saw Grant's corpse in one of the rooms. He was lying on the floor with a deep and bloody hole in the center of his chest. Grant apparently woke up when he was killed. The floor was littered with bodies, and the air was filled with the smell of blood. Link mentally fought down the onset of nausea. What surprised him was that although Celine's face was still pale, she was able to regain her composure. Her gentle appearance did not match the strong fighting spirit within her. Seeing the wand on the ground, Link picked it up and handed it to Selene. Take it. Selene nodded. Taking her wand, she took a deep breath and attempted to create a fireball. It took just over a second. Not bad. Link praised her. It was an excellent attempt for an ordinary magician student. I'm still far from you. Selene smiled faintly but already looked calmer than before. They went down the stairs. In the first floor corridor, they saw the corpse of Madame Fairfax. She lay there with her eyes wide open, an arrow lodged in her chest. Sighing, Link walked past the old woman's corpse and headed towards the exit of the dorm. When he approached the exit, the following text appeared before his eyes. Second part of the mission. Stop the signal mission details. Destroy the main tower of the Academy of Magic. Stop communication between the Dark Elves and the army outside the city through the portal in the tower. Reward. Twenty Omnilink grinned sadly. Twenty Omni were a high reward. But how will he get out of the city if he destroys the portal? It doesn't matter, he thought. I'll deal with this when the time comes. First you need to get to the main tower. As for the mission, I will accept it for now. I will have to fail it if the circumstances are not in my favor. Omni are important, but life is more important. He needed to carefully consider his actions. Together with Selene, they moved on. The sounds of fighting outside the walls of the academy died down. The teachers did not have good fighting skills. Moreover, they were taken by surprise and outnumbered. They stood no chance against the well-prepared Dark Elves. As they left the dorm, Link touched himself and Selene with his wand, casting a Weak Invisibility spell. Weak Invisibility level zero spell effect covers the wearer in a veil of darkness, extremely effective for hiding in the dark. You need to be careful of bright light. This was the most basic invisibility spell. It could not hide the sound of footsteps and smell. It was also powerless against bright lighting and hunting dogs. But for late at night its effect was enough. Stay close, Link said to Selene. 
the first to step into the darkness in the direction of the main tower. Not far from the dorms was the Magic Academy's Star Garden. Fed by mana, flowers of all kinds bloomed in it. Peonies, roses, lilies, and tulips. You name it, how beautiful it was. But all the charm disappeared as soon as one noticed the body stretched out in the middle of the bushes. This is Mr. Glassy? Celine noted. Even Mr. Glassy, a level 3 illusionist, absolutely unfit for combat, but possessing the skills of magical transfiguration, was pierced by an arrow in the back. Obviously, the illusions he created did not deceive the Dark Elves. Link was prepared for this. He knew that they would see the bodies of many teachers along the way. And this was just the beginning of the Gladstone Massacre. To confirm his thoughts, they soon came across a beautiful young teacher, Vera. She was wearing a light nightgown. She probably ran out of her room in a hurry when she heard the noise. But the Dark Elves overtook her, too. They did not spare her beauty. She was still breathing, crouched on the ground. The blood, red as roses in the garden, oozing from a wound in her stomach, soaked her thin robe. She heard the rustle of their steps. Her beautiful eyes, burning with the desire to live, searched for the source of the noise. Vera was not even thirty years old. She had great magical abilities and had already reached rank two. Her future was promising, and rumors about her beauty spread throughout the academy. She did not want to die, because her life was just beginning. But the wound was fatal. Nobody could save her. And Link was powerless. Seeing the corpses was hard, but looking at someone who was on the verge of death was unbearable, especially if that someone was a beloved teacher struggling to survive. Link's pupils shrank. He squeezed Celine's hand tighter. At that moment, the thought suddenly occurred to him that he might never return to Earth. He may become one of the many creatures trying to survive in the dark world of Firamun. I'm no longer a player watching from the sidelines. I'm one of them. The ruler of light set me up. Celine sensed Link's confusion. She is seriously injured. We can save her, she said with a sigh, quietly stroking his hand. With a heavy heart, Link nodded. Approaching the teacher, he raised his wand and activated the sleeping spell. If he could not save her, then at least he could help her leave in peace. The bewitched Vera slowly closed her eyes and stopped writhing in pain. After a few more steps, they discovered the elderly Mr. Wilson. His severed head lay a few meters from his body. Looking at what had become of all these good people, Link became acutely aware of the cruelty of the struggle between light and darkness. Death mowed down people's lives like a scythe of ears of corn in a field, with wide strokes and indiscriminately. How terrible this dark world is. Link was full of sadness. Behind the garden there was a small grove. There were only a few trees, but they were huge. Each one is over two hundred years old. A path wound between the trees, illuminated here and there by lanterns. This was a favorite meeting place for couples from the academy. Making his way through the grove, Link counted six corpses spread out along the path. They all met their lovers here at night. Today this grove has become the last refuge for these couples? These dark elves are such disgusting devil spawn? Celine, face was full of contempt. Link suddenly stopped. He took a step back and wrapped his arm around Celine, covering her mouth and dragging the girl behind one of the ancient trees. Shh, she blinked but didn't say a word. After some time, they saw a squad of dark elves running towards the dormitory. There were at least 30 magic students left in the dormitory. These dark elves were going to finish them off. Celine asked in a whisper, Link, are we going to save them? Link barely shook his head. He could not. Celine understood. Her eyes flashed. Then why did you save me? She asked. Link paused before answering. We're friends, aren't we? His answer made her eyes sparkle even brighter. You're a good friend. Can I ask you something? Come on. How did you learn so many spells in such a short time and use them so well? She was burning with curiosity. I consider it a gift from God. When I woke up, something popped into my head, Link answered bluntly. Oh, that's it. Without asking anything else, she pointed to the main tower. Let's go. As soon as the dark elf squad disappeared, Link nodded and they left. Passing the grove, hiding in the shadows, they walked along the Alley of Truth. Soon the main tower appeared on the left. The portal in it was small and could move objects no further than ten kilometers. But even despite this, it cost the city dearly. The ten thousand gold coins spent on its construction accounted for half of the taxes collected in Gladstone for the year. The main advantage of the portal in the tower was that it was used to transmit information. Unlike physical objects, data could be transmitted over distances of up to five hundred kilometers. 
That is why the tower was an important strategic site for the Dark Elves. Link noticed three elf warriors near the tower. They protected her. He would have to deal with them. If Link's memory served him right, the Dark Elf Mage would soon arrive at the tower. He was going to use the portal to transmit a detailed report to the headquarters of the Dark Elf Army, located 50 kilometers from the city. One of the three elf warriors was covered from head to toe in anti-magic armor. In his hands he held a shield painted with runes. Link recognized him. He met him in a past life during an escape mission. His name was Jiggs, and he commanded the takeover of the Magic Academy. As a level 3 warrior with a combat aura, he possessed many powerful combat skills. Anti-magic armor allowed him to ignore any direct attacks from spells below level 3. In the game, he was known as the Mage Ripper. All aspiring magicians outside of Gladstone feared him like the plague. The warriors next to him were his subordinates. Both were rank 2. Their equipment wasn't as good as Jig's, but it wasn't weak either. Link currently had 18 Omni and 7 Mana. It was impossible to engage in battle with three strong opponents with only this in reserve. But Link had no other choice. Taking a deep breath, Link purchased two new level 0 spells. After that, he spent another three Omni to purchase 30 additional mana points. There was no time to restore mana naturally. After the necessary preparations, Link had 13 Omni left. He told Selene to hide in a safe place, and he stepped out of the shadows, allowing the moonlight to reveal his location. She wanted to object, but then restrained herself and hid in the shadows of the bushes. Link, who was focused on the opponents, did not notice this. Donna, pay attention to this stupid boy, she told herself. I'll help him when it all starts. Without taking his eyes off his opponents, Link waved his hand in greeting. Hey, you outcasts, what are you doing? He said quietly. But the dark elves heard everything clearly. They turned at the same time, staring menacingly at him with their bright red eyes. The young magician who jumped out of nowhere confused Jigs. To be honest, the operation at the Magic Academy was too easy. The local mages were sissies and mastered spells at the level of children who had just learned to walk. Jigs was a little disappointed. The mage who guarded the main tower had a lot of knowledge and mana. He could use fourth level spells, but Jigs finished him off in just two seconds. One shield attack and a quick blade strike was all it took. Easy and no grace. A magician who had no idea how to use magic in battle was incomprehensible. Such a person would not last a day in the Black Forest. Jiggs would not give the young man standing in front of him even 20 years. He was probably one of the academy's students. But compared to the teachers Jiggs had already encountered, what could a student do? Jiggs did not act immediately. He just snorted and laughed coldly. Boy, you don't think you are invincible just because you studied magic for a few days. Look at him. He's probably been into magic longer than you've ever been alive. Jiggs kicked the corpse. Link recognized him. It was Master Phil, the Academy's only level 4 mage who turned 50 this year. He studied magic for almost 30 years, which far exceeded Link's age. The strength of a person's magic depends not only on how long he studied it, but also on talent. Now I will show you outcasts, what real magic looks like. Link's voice was calm and cold. While he was talking, he quietly tapped his foot on the ground and no one paid attention to it. Ha ha ha. Well, let me see your so-called talent. Sherman, go and bring me his head. Jiggs ordered his subordinate. As you wish. The dark elf warrior, Sherman, carrying his shield, walked towards Link. Twenty steps away, he shielded his body with a shield and rushed at the young mage. Minor enhancement. Combat skill. Effect. The warrior can use a special breathing technique to gain explosive power throughout the body. In a short period of time, it will give unimaginable speed. Highly recommended for use against mages. The Dark Elf Warrior accelerated incredibly and was already rushing towards Link, taking cover behind an anti-magic shield. An open frontal attack could not harm him. When he reaches Link, he will be able to cut off the mage's head with one swing of his sword. In the shadows, Selene prepared her magic wand. Link was in danger. She couldn't just stand by anymore. However, the next moment she lowered her wand for one simple reason. Sherman failed to reach Link. Halfway, when Sherman reached his maximum speed, his movement suddenly slowed down and he sank into the ground. The hard ground became very soft. He couldn't move. Because he moved forward at lightning speed, his foot sank so deeply into the ground that he could not pull it out. There was a cracking sound. It was the sound of broken bones. But the worst was yet to come. He moved forward with all his might by inertia. And as a result, part of his body crashed into the hard ground and he also crushed his pelvis. Ah! Sherman screamed loudly. The pain was unbearable. After letting out a couple more screams, 
he lost consciousness due to severe pain. Warrior Sherman was defeated with just one small spell. Swamp of Mud, zero level spell. Effect, turn hard earth into soft mud. Note, not step on it. Stepping on it while running at high speeds is strictly prohibited. Otherwise, serious consequences are inevitable. Hmm. Looking at Sherman's condition, Jiggs finally began to take his opponent seriously. He glared at Link. Student, you have made me very angry. The mage in front of him was of a very low level. Sherman lost not because of his strength but because of negligence, but now Jiggs was serious. Drawing his sword from its sheath, he ordered the warrior standing next to him. Terry, guard the main tower. I'll deal with this little thing myself. Yes, Commander. Terry stepped aside. He knew that Jiggs would never team up with him against such a magician. He was too proud a warrior. Jiggs walked forward slowly, waving his sword in the air. The black heavy shield he carried glowed especially brightly with white light in the darkness of the night. It was a battle aura that only level three warriors had. He slowly walked towards Link as if he was strolling through the park. Fireball! Link shouted. A small white ball appeared. He fired towards Jiggs. Jiggs raised his shield. The fireball that collided with it dissipated into sparks, causing no harm to anyone from the white glow of the shield. Level zero magic was too weak. A level three warrior could easily defend against such attacks. Ahead of Link's thoughts, Jiggs said, If that's all your magic can do, then you don't need to fight. Just stretch your neck and let me cut off your head. Fully clad in anti-magic armor, Jiggs seemed as invincible as a battle tank. In the darkness, Selene readied her magic wand again. This Jiggs was an experienced warrior, and he had a fighting aura. She couldn't believe that Link could defeat someone like him. She must help somehow. The next moment, Link attacked again. He waved his Dark Moon wand several times. At this moment, he looked like a musical conductor. With each of his movements, a white ball of flame appeared. It only took him a second to create nine fireballs. Something incredible happened. The balls flew out at the same time. Each of them followed a different trajectory, spinning in random directions. But their final target was Jiggs. The fireballs crashed into different places, some into Jiggs's chest, others into the seam between the helmet and the armor on his neck. Some even hit the eye holes of his helmet. Bang! 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 Fireballs exploded in quick succession. Some of the flames even managed to seep into the seams, thereby causing damage to Jiggs. Damn it, your little tricks got me. You're in deep trouble. Jiggs raised his voice. The fireballs were a real nuisance, and they actually caused some damage. After the incident with Sherman, Jiggs did not dare to run forward, but anger overcame him. Link waved his wand again. Whoosh! Nine more fireballs appeared, again flying in different directions. But now, with frightening precision, they landed directly into the open seams of Jiggs' armor. Jiggs had learned his lesson. He didn't slow down even when shielding his face from the flames. However, fireball's power was limited. Even if other parts of Jiggs' body were directly affected, thanks to the battle aura, the worst that awaited him was burns. They will heal within a couple of hours, as long as the eyes are not damaged. Bang! 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 The fireballs exploded again. Even if they didn't cause any harm, their explosions made Jiggs feel cornered. This damn student is a magician. I will crush his head with my hands. Jiggs? Blood boiled and his speed increased. In his place, even a saint would be angry. The mana in Link's body was almost depleted by the use of fireballs, but he still has 13 Omni left. He used one of them to replenish 10 mana points. And while Jiggs was still trying to protect himself from the fireballs, Link used another spell. Slide, slide, level zero spell. Effect. The ground becomes covered in oil and becomes very slippery. Within one second, the ground under Jiggs became slippery as ice. Jiggs ran, covering his face with his shield and smoking due to the constant barrage of fireballs. His anger and impatience led to his death. It is important to never lose your cool in battle because this can lead to making poor decisions. Jiggs noticed changes in the ground. He was wary of the Swamp of Mud spell more than anything, so he slowed down. This led to the completely opposite result. The heavy armor of the tense and anxious Jiggs made him clumsy, and so he was unable to maintain his balance, slipped and fell. In fact, no amount of armor could cover the body completely. Some parts of the armor, such as around the joints, had to be made of soft, flexible leather to allow the flexion and extension of the limbs of the legs and arms, especially in the waist area. Like a turtle, Jiggs lay on his back exposing a part of his body that had never been there visible when he stood upright. Buying a spell, Vector Throw, Link muttered. Vector Throw, level one spell. Effect, the thrown object flies at high speed. The lighter the object, the faster its speed. 
Link was very familiar with this spell. If he threw a stone weighing two kilograms, then the spell could bring his speed to 60 kilometers per second. If he hit an area such as the groin, then no one can predict the result. Having purchased the spell as quickly as possible, he pointed his wand at the ground. Forward! he shouted. Controlled by magic, a fist-sized rock flew out and landed right in the middle of the only unprotected area of Jig's armored body. Bam! There was a muffled sound. <sighs> Jig's let out a piercing scream, letting go of his shield and writhing on the ground. He didn't know how badly his genitals were damaged, but the pain was excruciating. Worse, he didn't even feel them. Pain, fear, panic gripped him, and he even forgot about his combat aura, which protected him from magic. Earth Spike! Link dealt the final blow. A two-meter-high stone spike rose from the ground, which pierced the unprotected area between the helmet and neck. Jiggs was dead. Warrior Terry could not believe his eyes. The commander was killed by someone from afar, who did not even move throughout the entire battle and only used low-level magic spells. How is this possible? In the shadows, Selene gaped in amazement, using first-level spells to killing a level three warrior who was literally dressed in armor from head to toe was something unheard of. Perfect timing, impressive spell skills, and an excellent understanding of the human psyche and behavior, Selene thought. This warrior played with death. The keen-eyed Selene saw all the movements and even caught the emotions of the combatants. She was deeply shocked by what she saw. Two of the three powerful Dark Elves warriors were defeated in the blink of an eye. Link didn't care about what others would think. He was just glad that he managed to kill Jiggs. On the one hand, this was facilitated by his own strength. On the other hand, by the self-confidence of Jiggs, who underestimated Link. The warrior thought he could crush the young mage like a bug, and therefore did not consider Link his equal. In other words, he was too reckless. Link now had two Omni and five mana points left. Without hesitation, he exchanged all the Omni he had were to increase the mana level. He had increased to 81, 26 of which were at his disposal. This amount of mana was more than enough to deal with the Dark Elf warrior named Terry. Link pointed his wand, the tip of which shimmered with magic, at Terry the Elf. He began to wait for his attack. The Elf was just a second-level warrior. Just like with Sherman, and with Commander Jiggs, waiting for Terry to attack, you could find a gap in his defenses and then deal him a fatal blow. Terry swallowed nervously took a few steps back, and completely unexpectedly rushed off into the darkness so that only the heels sparkled. Okay, this guy must have gone to call for help. I need to hurry. After all, there were many dark elves in the Academy of Magic. He motioned to Selene. We must leave as soon as possible. The main tower was right in front of them. Since there was no one on the way, it was possible to safely leave this place. Selene emerged from the darkness, a strange sparkle reflected in her blue eyes. Smiling, she said, Link, you use magic so well, better than anyone I know. There was no fear on her face, only admiration. This reaction seemed a little strange to Link. Her smile seemed painfully familiar to him. Selene is not just an ordinary person. I must have seen her somewhere before. Hey, what are you thinking about? It is dangerous to stay here? Selene patted Link on the shoulder, bringing him back to reality. Oh, yes. Time doesn't? Wait. Link thought no more about it and followed Selene to the main tower. But as he watched her beautiful figure from the back, her hair tied in a ponytail, and her graceful movements, he finally remembered. Selene looked exactly like the person he knew, or rather, the demon he knew. The demoness, one, who broke Link's heart in his past life. Her name was Selene Flandre, also known as the Demon Princess. She was one of the four beauties of the game legend. Her mother was a human, and her father was the famous demigod, Lord of the Abyss, Nozama the same demigod that Link fought to the death. According to the latest update to the game, killing the end boss required completing an extremely difficult mission. And one of those who was sent on the mission was Selene Flandre. As a half-demon, Selene Flandre was extremely talented. At a young age, she was already a legendary. The Lord of the Abyss, Nozima, hating the fact that his daughter was lost to him among mortals, sent his demonic servants after her. Nozama even killed Selene's mother for this. Since then, Selene and her demon father have become sworn enemies. Having escaped from her father, she was able to fend for herself from childhood, even when she was driven into a corner by Nozama himself, who entered the world of Firuman. I cannot change my origin, but I can choose my own path. My father. Ha! He's just a piece of shit. I swear I'll kill him. Oh, Link. You really are a funny magician. Honestly, 
I think I may have fallen in love with you. Huh. You didn't believe me, did you? Stupid. I love looking at you mortals and your stupid, dumbfounded expressions. Ah ha ha. Every word of Celine Flandre from his past life was spinning in Link's head, and he still remembered her laugh. Although she was controlled by artificial intelligence, the game company thought out her character very well. Her pain, determination, love of pranks, exciting spirit, and it has a sweet yet mischievous charm. All of this fascinated Link. For a long time, Link had hoped in his heart that she was real and not imaginary. Link quickly came to his senses. He knew that this Selene was most likely different from that famous demon princess. The woman in his memory had eyes like the night sky, a head full of thick black hair, cute little fangs whose tips were barely visible on her red lips, and two small horns. This Selene had golden hair and blue eyes. They were completely different people. I must be mad at her right now, Link thought. She's just a character from the game. She may exist in this world, but she and Selene in front of me are definitely different people. Hiding his thoughts as deeply as possible, Link continued to follow Selene to the main tower. The tower had a spacious hall. The floor of the hall was painted with runes. There were four obelisks around the hall, white light emanating from their tops. The main tower was small. There was only one portal that could only teleport one person at a time. Looking at the portal, Link remembered the mission of this game system. Stop the signal. Destroy the portal in the main tower to prevent the Dark Elves from contacting the rest of the army outside the city. The purpose of this mission was very clear, to delay the arrival of the Dark Elf army. It may have only delayed them for an hour or two, but this time was especially valuable during sabotage. Every second of wasted time could lead to an unexpected turn of events in Gladstone. Link initially intended to abandon the mission, but on the way here he saw countless victims of elven atrocities. Now he doubted. Maybe, just maybe I should try to destroy this tower after all. If I do this, I can save a lot of people, he thought. Selene, his voice rang out. Hey, is something wrong? Why are you lagging behind? Hurry up. She was already standing at the portal. Link raised his head and looked at her. The beautiful face in front of him seemed to merge with the face of the demon princess, hitting Link right in the heart. Yes, the main tower must be destroyed. Only then will the Dark Elves not be able to pursue Selene through the portal. And I will gain twenty Omni. I can definitely find another way to escape Gladstone. Link finally made his decision. He will complete the mission and destroy the portal in the main tower. Of course, he didn't tell Selene anything. He had a feeling that as soon as he told her about this, she would stay with him. It would be too risky? He smiled. I was just thinking about a complex magical question. You go ahead. I will activate the portal and follow you. Activating the portal was a simple task. He just had to channel the mana into the portal rune. Link tapped the portal rune with his wand. The four obelisks around the portal shot a white beam of light at the keystone rune on the ceiling. A huge rune was activated. A white light shone from her, enveloping Selene with countless magical runes. Selene gradually dissolved in it. When she disappeared, Link breathed a sigh of relief. He activated the portal again. The light on the obelisk appeared again. But this time there was no one in the portal. Link turned and ran out of the hall. When he was within 100 meters, the imposing rune on the ceiling once again shone with a white pillar of light. At that moment, Link turned and shot a fireball at the portal rune. The main tower was an intricate magical building. However, it was easy to destroy it. All you had to do was use a small level zero spell on it to cause mana chaos within it. Using magic within the portal was prohibited. This was a taboo in the magic academy. Bang! The white fireball collided with the portal rune, shattering it into countless small particles of light. The particles were then converted back into pure mana. When the beam of light hit them, the rune on the ceiling exploded with a loud sound. The explosion caused a huge chain reaction. The mana contained in the tower began to fly out of it. Boom! 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 The main tower erupted with mana, blinding everyone around it. White, golden balls of light flew up and disappeared into the air, releasing mana uncontrollably. Many cracks appeared on the outer wall of the tower. A large number of runes were torn apart thereby releasing a wave of magical energy. As a result of blinding flashes of light and a huge explosion, the main tower collapsed, turning into a pile of stones. By then, Link was far away. He returned to the grove where he had been before and hid in the shadow of one of the ancient trees. He once again disguised himself with a minor invisibility spell. The destruction of the main tower attracted the attention of the Dark Elves assassins. They all knew its value. The elves ran towards her or rather towards her ruins. Hiding in the shadows, 
Link was able to see the game server notification, even as he looked at the dark elves running past him. Mission. Stop the signal. Completed. Player Link receives 20 Omni. Third part of the mission. Escape details. Mission. Escape from the pursuers of the dark elf assassins. Mission reward. 20 Omni looking at the contents of the mission. Link smiled bitterly. The city was full of dark elf killers. He killed the commander of the dark elves, Jigs, and destroyed the portal to the main towers. More importantly, he allowed Terry the warrior to escape. Link would definitely be their main target. After some time, not only the Dark Elf warriors would be looking for him, but also the Dark Elf mage, who would soon arrive and use the portal in the tower. Now that the tower was in ruins, he would also join the search. Link's mood worsened as he remembered the mage he had encountered in the game. This Dark Elf mage was not like the weak mages of the Magic Academy. This was a true battle mage, a member of the Black Forest Silver Moon Council of Mages, a level 2 elite. Luckily, Link had 20 Omni, and there was no need to kill opponents. You just need to run away from them. There is still a chance. Gladstone Suburb In the darkness of the night, a white light flashed. A human figure appeared out of thin air. It was Selene. She stepped aside and waited patiently. Half a minute passed, but the light did not appear. A minute later, a blinding white light appeared, not in the suburbs, but in the Academy of Magic. Seeing continuous flashes of light and feeling huge waves of mana emanating from there, she immediately guessed what had happened. It was Link. He did not come. He destroyed the main tower, afraid that the Dark Elves would come for me through the portal. But now I'm safe and he's not. At this moment, Selene felt a strange confusion. You go ahead. I will activate the portal and follow you. He smiled when he said this. His smile appeared in her head. Fool. Idiot. Goat. You didn't have to save me. Selene stamped her foot. She made her decision. This will not work. I need to get him out of there. She grew up alone. No one other than her mother had ever been as kind to her as Link. Link held his breath and hid in the shadow of a tree. He was contemplating a plan to escape from the Dark Elves. Twenty Omni. First, I will spend nine on increasing the speed of mana recovery, Link told himself. If everything goes well, then he can simply avoid meeting them. The faster he replenishes his mana, the longer he can lead them by the nose. Firstly, it is safe. And secondly, it can save mana. Taking into account the spent 9 Omni, his mana recovery rate was 9.2 per 1 hour. The total amount of mana is 91, and currently available is 23. If he can hide from the Dark Elves for another 7 hours, then the mana will be fully restored. And then he will be able to use 6 0 level spells and 2 1 cent level spells. He was confident that even if he had to fight, with these spells he could get out. He could hear the voices of the Dark Elves from the ruins of the tower. They were arguing about something. Everyone from the Academy of Magic was killed. Now is the best time to escape, Link thought, and began to act. Buying the Silence spell. Silence zero level spell. Effect silences the sounds of steps, breathing, voices. The spell lasts for 20 minutes each time it is used. As Link acquired the spell, he felt a familiar fog envelop him. This meant that he had successfully mastered a level zero spell. At this time, the mana around the main tower had already returned to normal, and the flashes of light went out. The Academy of Magic was once again plunged into darkness. With the lesser invisibility and silent spells hiding him, Link moved like a shadow. He avoided the streetlights and walked along the road leading out of town. The escape route was in his head. Link managed to escape from the Academy by sneaking past the unsuspecting Dark Elves standing at the back gate of the Academy of Magic. The Academy of Magic was built in Gladstone's Flower District. It was a gathering point for the upper echelons of society, most of whom even lived there. That's why so many Dark Elves gathered in this area. They had a specific target, the powerful people of the Flower District. Therefore, they did not kill the first people they came across, unlike the killers at the Academy of Magic. As long as Link was not exposed as a magician, he would probably be safe even if he was discovered. At this point, Link was extremely glad that he was wearing a simple gray robe. As long as he hides his wand, he won't stand out at all. I will be safe until news of the Magic Academy spreads. I need to get as far away from the Academy as possible before the Dark Elf army arrives. Link ran quite quickly. Thanks to spells and luck, he has not yet encountered any obstacles along the way. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk Academy of Magic at the main tower. When Link left the Academy of Magic, a crowd of Dark Elves stood around the ruins of the tower, not believing their eyes. Commander Jiggs died, and the main, the tower, was destroyed. Terry, what should we do now? One of them asked in a rough voice. 
Despite the fact that Terry ran away from Link, after the death of Commander Jiggs, he became the only high-ranking Dark Elf among those present. Terry, Sis heart bled. The main tower played a key role in the capture of Gladstone. If news of the completed mission did not reach the Chief Lord outside the city, then reinforcements would not come. In addition, there was a possibility that the attack on Gladstone would be abandoned. If this happens, every Dark Elf present here will be severely punished. Most likely the Chief Lord will execute everyone on the spot in a fit of rage. The only thing we can do now is to avenge the death of the Commander. We need to find that brat, said Terry. The Dark Elves exchanged glances. The same elf asked again, Could he use the portal to leave? Impossible. If he had done that, he would have died already. He must have escaped immediately after the portal was destroyed. If I am not mistaken, he's hiding somewhere in the Academy of Magic, Terry answered. We'll find him. The Dark Elves began to search every corner of the Academy. The Academy was small. There weren't many places to hide. At least two hundred Dark Elves were searching for Link. In less than half an hour they turned everything upside down but found nothing. He's nowhere to be found. He escaped, said one of the Elves. If this is so, then he probably used some kind of disguise, and we will not be able to find him now. It's a pity we didn't bring hounds from the Black Forest. Terry frowned. He felt helpless. Suddenly a rough voice sounded in the darkness next to them. What's going on here? Why is the main tower in ruins? Why is Jiggs dead? They turned to the source of the voice and saw a middle-aged dark elf dressed in a black robe with silver trim, holding an ebony staff as tall as him. He stood at the fence of the tower gate. The dark elves immediately straightened up at the sight of the newly arrived elf, Master Holmes, they said in unison, greeting him. Holmes was a second-level battle mage and a member of the Council of Mages of the Silver Moon. He was famous for single-handedly defeating three elite assassins from the Norton Kingdom, who never even touched him. He was supposed to activate the portal in the main tower after the Magic Academy was cleared, in order to send a detailed report to the Dark Elf Army, in fifty kilometers from here. The Academy was cleared, but the main tower was destroyed. And what was the point of him coming here? What happened here? Holmes shouted. He walked over to Jig's corpse and examined his wounds. Level Zero Earth Spike? Was he killed by a magician's apprentice? Holmes could not understand what happened. A fully armored level 3 dark elf warrior with a combat aura was defeated by a single level 0 spell. This was a shame for the dark elf warriors. No, shame on all dark elves. I demand an explanation. Holmes shouted sharply. Lord, the following happened. Terry took a deep breath and stepped forward. He began to describe and tell everything down to the smallest detail, from the appearance of the young magician to every word spoken by Commander Jiggs. He missed nothing. When Terry finished, the Dark Elves began to tremble. They could never imagine that such a young, powerful magician was hiding in this low-grade magic academy. At the same time, they were glad that they had not encountered this dangerous magician. Otherwise, someone else would have been standing here instead of them. Holmes's face was gloomy. He was a mage, and therefore knew better than anyone else how dangerous this man was. Nine level zero spells in just a second. Excellent magic control. Two fireballs to piss Jigs off then use slide to open a hole in his defenses, and finally finish with vector throw. The thought that all this was clearly and calmly planned threw Holmes into a cold sweat. This is a master of tactics, Holmes concluded. He thought about it over and over again. He has achieved a lot at such a young age. If he grows up, he will become a big threat in the future. We must kill him. But, Lord, he has already escaped from the Academy of Magic. But he left his mark. We can track him. Holmes laughed coldly. The fiery red crystal on his staff glowed brightly. A mana beam shot into the ground. A two-meter hound began to appear from the ground. Earth Hound, second level spell. Effect forms a giant hound from the ground. The power of a dog has no limits. Her eyesight and sense of smell are exceptional. Note, never let an earth hound smell you. She had black holes instead of eyes. When the earth hound was fully formed, Holmes pointed it to Jig's corpse. Find the killer. The hound pounced on Jig's body, sniffing furiously. After about ten seconds, she howled and rushed towards the exit of the Magic Academy. She sniffed the ground even as she ran. You and you. Send this report to the Chief Lord in the camp outside the city. Holmes handed the scroll to one of the Dark Elves. Now that the main tower was destroyed, he could only rely on them, I obey. The elf took the scroll and disappeared into the night. The rest, follow me, Holmes ordered. The situation in the Flower District was much better than in the Academy of Magic. There were much fewer casualties here. Although there were many dark elves in the city, 
compared to Gladstone's population of 100,000 people. This number seemed small. The sounds of explosions coming from the Academy of Magic woke up many residents of the Flower District. Usually there were few people on the streets at such a late hour, but today the streets were filled to capacity. From time to time, high-pitched screams could be heard from the large mansions. Someone had probably already discovered the dead. Link continued walking down the street. Gladstone was in complete chaos. Usually in the event of any suspicious situation in the Magic Academy, or the murder of any famous person in the Flower District, the city guards would usually immediately appear and immediately restore order in the city. But today none of her showed up. The city guard must have been killed. People continued to flood the streets. In addition to the attack initiated by the Dark Elves, robberies and other crimes began to occur throughout the city. In the absence of the city guards, the criminals who were usually hiding came out into the streets to wreak even more havoc. After about 20 minutes, the lesser invisibility and silence spells ended. But Link had already blended into the crowd by this time. A middle-aged man dressed in rags rushed at Link with a dagger in his hand, but Link didn't stop. He raised his wand hand and released mana into it, causing the wand to emit a faint light. Back off, Link snapped. The man froze in horror, but then turned sharply and ran away, looking for another weaker victim. For ordinary people, magicians were mysterious and powerful. Angering them meant signing your own death warrant. In half an hour, Link was only able to walk halfway through the flower district. More and more people crowded the streets, leading to an even greater crush than before. Some buildings were engulfed in flames, and screams were heard everywhere. Some tried to help, while others, succumbing to influence, began to engage in looting. There is no law and order here anymore? Link sighed. There was nothing he could do to help anyone in such a situation. A little further, he saw a river. It wasn't wide, but there was a small port next to it where small boats were moored. It was one of the branches of the Gladstone River. Link had an idea. He walked over and untied one of the boats, and then jumped into it. Link used the oar to push away from the shore, allowing the boat to float downstream. He did this to escape his pursuers from the Magic Academy. The Dark Elf Mage who comes to the Magic Academy will definitely look for me using magic. But he is only a second-level mage. He can only rely on smell. Now that I'm already floating in the boat, he has no chance to find me. Link did not encounter the Dark Elf Mage in the game, but in his past life, when he had time, he often looked through various forums on the game server, where players discussed strategies, looking for clues in case they encountered a dangerous mage. Therefore he was familiar with all the powerful Dark Elves who appeared during the change of the Blood Moon. Link even remembered the name of that magician, Holmes. Low-level magicians did not have enough skills to track. That's why Link could use publicly available means to get away from them. But if it was a high-level mage capable of tracking by mana, aura, or worse, using the soul imprint spell, then Link would truly be in danger. Ten minutes later, Link finally reached another port. Due to the fact that the river current was not strong, he was able to row his oar to the shore. Having reached the shore, he reached the exit of the flower district, the market square. During the day it was quite noisy here, but at night it was completely quiet. Only guards can be here. The oil lamps located on both sides of the street were extinguished. There is darkness all around, not a soul. The city gates were just outside the market square. From there you can leave the city. The Dark Elf army will arrive soon. If I stay, I won't be able to escape later. I must leave now while I still have the chance. Link walked through the market square without looking back. He glanced at his pocket watch. 2336. It was almost midnight. His mana was restored to 32. In the game, the Dark Elves' army attacked the city at half past two at night. Nobody guarded the city. Worst of all, the Dark Elves calmly captured the main gate to the city and let their entire army through. By the time dawn came, over 100,000 people had been killed and sacrificed by the Dark Elves. And then the corpses of the dead were thrown into the Gladstone River. It was a real disaster. Link had more than two hours to escape from Gladstone. This time was quite enough even if, God forbid, something went wrong. The market area was too quiet. If he had gone without using magic, he would have stood out too much. So he used magic. Twenty minutes later, Link reached almost the end of the market square. And just as he was about to cast the spell again, he heard that someone was fighting in one of the alleys. Link was ready. This is not the sound of ordinary people struggling. Who could it be? Link decided to take a look. The alley was quite long and dark. Luckily, it was a cloudless night. So in the moonlight, Link was able to see what was happening. He saw four figures next to the corpse. 
Three of them were dressed in grayish-black leather armor, which is the hallmark of the Dark Elves who attacked the Academy. The last one was a man who was surrounded by these elves. He wore dark green leather armor. Although he was disguised as a Dark Elven assassin, his face gave him away. The one killed was one of the Dark Elves. Apparently the man had paid a heavy price for killing him. He was wounded, blood dripping from his left arm. Neither of them said anything. They silently watched each other. The elves gradually approached him, watching his every movement. The man slowly retreated, but there was a dead end ahead. He had nowhere to run, so he pressed his back against the brick wall. He held a dagger in each hand. They did not have any anti-magic properties. This was quite understandable. Anti-magic weapons were extremely expensive, and not everyone was able to get their hands on one. Just as they were about to engage in a fight, the man laughed. Ha ha ha. The main tower has been destroyed. Your plan to capture the city has failed. One of the Dark Elves replied. Even without the main tower, we still have postal crows. We can send an attack order through them. It's just a slight delay. Mail crows? As soon as night falls, bloody owls begin to fly over Gladstone. They were bred just to take care of carrier crows and pigeons. Do you think your crows can resist them? The man spat in their direction. The elf could not deny this. Our mission is not sending news. Our mission now is to kill you. Since you are a worthy opponent, I will leave your corpse unharmed. The dark elf walked forward, and his comrades began to surround him from other sides. Three against one. Link, eavesdropping on their conversation, guessed the person, his identity. He is from Military Intelligence Section 3, otherwise known as MI3. 1. MI3 is the intelligence agency of the Norton Kingdom. Its main goal is protection from the penetration of Dark Elves into the East. Before the Blood Moon change, the Norton Kingdom and the Dark Elves of the Black Forest did not openly fight each other. However, their intelligence services secretly fought among themselves. Now their confrontation has reached its climax. An analog of MI3 was an organization known in the Black Forest as the Hand of Death. This is an organization created under the leadership of the Dark Elves. The change of the Blood Moon will mean the defeat of MI3 in the Information War. Thanks to their short conversation, Link was finally able to gain a better understanding of the situation in Gladstone. Could Gladstone really be saved? The Norton Kingdom probably knew about the Dark Elves' plan to take over the city, but they were unable to react in time because the Dark Elves attacked earlier than expected. If the Dark Elf army doesn't arrive, is there any chance to save Gladstone? Just as this thought crossed his mind, a new notice appeared before his eyes. The third part of the mission is completed. Escape. The player receives 20 Omni. The fourth part of the mission is unlocked. Helping Hand. Mission Details. Help the man in the market area defeat the Dark Elves. Mission Reward. 10 Omni. Saving the life of one person can earn him 10 Omni. Link couldn't miss this chance. He accepted the mission without hesitation. Underscore 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 one. MI3 is like MI6, the British Secret Service. Artivan had a very deep wound on his hand, from which blood was flowing. He was no longer able to use his arm. Fighting the Hand of Death organization was very difficult, let alone doing it with one hand. But he had no choice but to fight to the end. I've already killed one of them. Only three left. He attacked them fiercely, not caring about his wounds. The Dark Elves did not expect such a fierce fight from him. They launched several attacks before they managed to wound Artivan in the side. But he did not remain in their debt. Artivan's jagged dagger bit into the hand of one elf, almost completely depriving him of his arm. Get away from him! He will soon pass out from loss of blood! The three elves instantly jumped back. Artivan was already at his limit. His breathing was labored and he could barely stand, leaning against the wall. Fighting alone against three elves, he had already surpassed himself. Artivan could not bandage his wounds while the dark elves were nearby. Blood from his arm and a wound in his side stained his clothes red. He felt his resolve evaporate with every drop of blood lost, his strength slowly leaving him, and his head becoming foggy. Artivan chuckled. I wonder how the commander and the others are now. Even before the Dark Elves attacked Gladstone, MI3 and the Death's Hand clashed in intense combat. The situation was critical. The Hand of Death suddenly sent all of its agents into Gladstone, and MI3 found themselves outnumbered, causing their scouts outside the city to be killed, and them trapped. 
MI3's carrier pigeon nests, and the city guards were destroyed, and the pigeons were killed by the Dark Elves. Thus they were cut off from the outside world. Only one secret postal place in the market survived. Only the most skilled assassins in disguise broke through the Dark Elves' ambush under the cover of their commander. Artivan was one of them. He did his best to get to the market, find the homing pigeons, and send word of what happened in Gladstone. A special spray was used to protect the homing pigeons from the attacks of bloody owls. If nothing happened to them, news would reach the Black Iron Garrison in the south within an hour. The Black Iron Garrison was the first major stronghold of the Norton Kingdom north of Gladstone. The Kingdom's Iron Crusade Corps were stationed there. When the news reached them, the Army Marshal, Master Swordsman Allens, would immediately send his troops to help Gladstone. Now all the city needed was time. I wonder who destroyed the Academy's main tower. It was truly a blessing from above, Artivan rejoiced. Without receiving a detailed report through the portal in the main tower, the Dark Elf army would not dare to act rashly. To ensure that the report reached the army, the elves had to send foot couriers. This will give the Black Iron Garrison troops some time. It. It's a pity that I won to live to see this moment. Artivan sighed with regret. He understood that his enemies were waiting for him to lose consciousness from loss of blood, and only then would they deliver the final fatal blow. But he didn't want to just wait for death. Gritting his teeth, he stood up and rushed at his opponents, brandishing a dagger. He will fight to the end. Naturally, the killers also did not retreat. They too rushed towards him. The Dark Elves and Ardivan were engrossed in the fight, and therefore did not notice what was happening behind them. Less than 100 meters away from them, a misty patch of shadow was getting closer and closer. 100 meters, the ideal distance for a fireball attack. Just as Artivan and the assassins clashed once again, a dark figure jumped out of the shadows. Fireball. Three fireballs flew from the dark figure, emitting sparks and gaining even greater speed. Bang! 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 Three explosions thundered in the air. The elves were completely taken by surprise. The explosions caused their eardrums to burst. The Dark Elves felt a sharp pain in their ears and were no longer able to maintain their balance. The inner ear is an organ that helps maintain balance. If it is damaged, a person or elf will not be able to stand steadily. The anatomy and physiology of Dark Elves and humans are similar in this regard. The movements of the elves slowed down sharply. They stumbled and could not get up. Artivan felt a surge of strength. Taking advantage of the situation, he cut the throat of one of the Dark Elves. In the blink of an eye, he plunged his dagger into the other's chest. Finally, crouching slightly, dodging the useless attack, Artivan planted a dagger in the latter's chest. Everything happened in an instant. Three dark elves lay, and only Artivan remained standing. This was the final victory. He immediately took out a first aid kit. Quickly bandaging his wounds, he looked towards the dark alley where the magician who saved him was coming from. A young man in an ordinary gray robe walked towards him. There was nothing remarkable about his features. He held a magic wand in his hand, and a magic bracelet glittered on his wrist. I swear by the ruler of light, can't think of anything better. A warrior and a magician complement each other perfectly? Artivan rejoiced to himself. Martial art was not the strong point of magicians. They succeeded thanks to their wisdom and various spells. There were many things that warriors could not do, but magicians could do. For example, flying. Any level three mage can fly. This alone was enough to dominate the others. Now that Gladstone was in serious danger, Artivan needed the help of a magician to stall the time until help arrived. MI3 initially thought about turning to the Academy of Magic for help, but by the time he got out of the encirclement of the elves, the entire academy had already been destroyed. Nevertheless, he managed to find a magician outside the academy. His speed of casting spells and the way he fought suggested that he was a battle mage. Nothing could be better. Quickly bandaging his wounds, Artivan took out and drank a healing potion. Then he stood up and approached the magician. Thank you for saving me, Mr. Magician. I, Artivan, from Military Intelligence MI3. He took out a ring as proof of his affiliation with MI3. On the ring were runes and an image of a lion. In addition, behind the lion, the blade of the blade formed a kind of circle. This was the characteristic symbol of MI3, and the lion represented the Kingdom of Norton. Link looked at the ring in Ardivan's hand. This is probably a level 1 magic ring. This conclusion could be drawn from the runes and from the fact that the item was enchanted with a first level spell. Concealment. Such rings were not worn by ordinary MI3 intelligence officers, which means Artivan's rank was not low. At this point, Link had already completed his rescue mission assassin. 
In addition to the twenty Omni he had recently received, he had received ten more. He now had at his disposal a total of forty Omni, twenty-six mana, seven zero-level spells, and two one-level spells. Link's confidence grew along with the gains he received. Resources. Perhaps I really could change history and save Gladstone. But he immediately rejected this thought. Considering the fact that there was an entire army of Dark Elves outside the city, he would most likely die a tragic death if he tried to take on any more responsibility. He wanted to know more about the situation in Gladstone, and so he needed to gain the trust of this, an assassin named Ardavan. I, Link Morani, third son of Baron Hamilton Morani and Mage of Fleming's Academy. I just escaped from the Academy. Link introduced himself. I destroyed the main tower of the Academy before escaping. Link set his back up. At this, Ardavan, his eyes lit up. Mr. Link, you really did us a great service. But the town of Gladstone is still in danger. I beg you. Before he finished speaking, Link stopped him. There is no time for empty talk and formalities. I know that the Dark Elf army is waiting outside the city. Just tell me what I need to do. The destruction of the main tower will definitely delay the arrival of the Dark Elf army. In a previous life, they attacked the city at 1.30. This time they will be delayed for at least an hour. It's 11.55 p.m. He had at least two hours left. By lending a helping hand to MI3, he could earn more Omni points. It seemed like a good idea. Ardavan did not expect that the magician would agree to help him so quickly, so he was a little confused. However, when Link said he would help him, he was overjoyed. In such a dangerous time, the magician was exactly what they needed. I have never met such an honest and sympathetic magician, he said from the bottom of his heart. You are exaggerating. Link was embarrassed. The outpost commander distracted most of the Dark Elves so that I could leave. He is now in serious danger. We must help him and the rest of the troops. Ardavan went straight to the point. Ardavan was nervous. He wanted to help his comrades, but there were only two of them. Most likely, they would not have a chance to survive if they went to save them. After Ardavan finished speaking, a new message appeared in front of Link's eyes. New mission. Mission. Help MI3. Mission details. 1. Rescue and ensure the survival of Annie Abel, MI3 Commander, Primary Objective. Point 2. Rescue the remaining MI3 members. Mission Reward, 25 Omni. Annie Abel? This name was familiar to Link. She was a famous character in the game. Her father was the Duke of the Kingdom of Norton, the younger brother of the King. He was a strong-willed man, also known as the Iron Duke. He had a very high status in the kingdom. Annie was his only daughter. She could have become a spoiled princess. But instead, she became an assassin working in the shadows. She worked her way up from the very bottom of the organization. Ten years later, she was awarded the title of Legendary Assassin for her services and became one of the three main decision makers in MI3. There was another mission in the game concerning her, but only a year later. This mission was to rescue her from the Blackwater prison in the Black Forest. Yes, Annie Abel did not die during the Gladstone Massacre. Instead, she was captured. During her imprisonment, she was subjected to inhumane torture. In the game, when Link and his teammates rescued her from the Blackwater prison, she was missing one of her eyes, and her beautiful face was covered in scars. Link could not even imagine what she had to go through. According to the latest news that reached Link even before Faruman came to the world, Annie became the main assassin of the Norton Kingdom. She possessed mighty power, but in the end, darkness enveloped her heart, and she became the ultimate instrument of evil, killing King Leon and thereby causing the destruction of the Norton Kingdom. Link believed that this had something to do with the inhumane torture she suffered in Blackwater Prison. But now, he had a chance to stop all this. In addition to this, he will also receive an Omni. How could he refuse? Under Ardavan's encouraging gaze, Link nodded. Show the way, assassin. The MI3 outpost was located within the quarters of the old city, a considerable distance from the market. Adrian walked ahead and Link followed him. How are you feeling? Ardavan's face was pale and he was breathing heavily. After every step it seemed that he was about to fall. He looked more like a fragile magician than a warrior. Ha <laughs> ha! Don't worry, Mr. Magician. I can't stand that much. Ardavan laughed weakly, trying to calm Link down. As a professional assassin, he had undergone rigorous endurance training. The injuries he suffered were nothing to him. However, the excessive blood loss still took its toll on him. Link looked closely at Ardavan. The following information appeared before his eyes. Ardavan, MI3 Level 2, Elite Assassin Combat Skills, Speed Dash, Dancing Daggers. Current state, weakened and wounded. Ardavan had lost more than half of his strength, and his endurance was less than 30%. His vitality was rapidly drying up. 
He could die at any moment. Ardavan. Face was covered with sweat. Link was deeply moved by the assassin's determination to fight to the end. When he was on Earth, everything that happened in the world of Firamin was just a game for him. He did not take the deaths of characters to heart. They had nothing to do with real life. But now, being part of this world, Link realized that he was dealing with real people. They are just like him. Flesh and blood. Ardavan could have simply left, but instead he risked everything he had to save Gladstone. Thinking about this, Link decided to spend 10 Omni on an Elemental Healing spell. Elemental Healing Level 1 spell effect. Restores trace elements within the body, thereby clearing up symptoms of fatigue and weakness. The stronger the body, the stronger the healing effect of the spell. Elemental healing was not a true healing magic, but it could slightly improve health conditions, which was quite suitable for Ardavan, who was suffering from excessive blood loss and severe dehydration. Ardavan was a powerful assassin, and the key to Annie's salvation able. He shouldn't die. It was worth spending ten Omni on it. In addition, if Link encounters other assassins, they may also be wounded. This additional spell will help increase their overall combat abilities. Link was once again enveloped in the familiar fog. Moments later, he successfully mastered elemental healing. Ah, Devon. I know one auxiliary healing spell. Perhaps it will help you? Link told him. Please use it on me, Ardavan said in high spirits. The assassin was fully aware of the situation in which he found himself. He's about to pass out and possibly die due to massive blood loss. It didn't matter to him, but it would be terrible if his death affected the overall situation. Link pointed his wand at Ardavan's chest. A transparent ray of light, along with mysterious runes, entered the assassin, his body. After about a second, the elements of water, fire, and then wood, earth, and metal joined the flow. After that, the light went out. The elements, attracted by mana, mixed together to form a misty cloud. This milky white smoke was not only composed of elements, but also contained nutrients produced by magic. Under the influence of mana, the cloud penetrated Ardavan's body and replenished the loss of blood. In other words, the healing spell simply gave Ardavan all the necessary missing elements. As soon as the elements entered his body, they were immediately absorbed by the body. Ardavan felt that he was no longer thirsty. The heartbeat returned to normal and breathing became calmer and more uniform. He felt a surge of strength. Incredible. I feel much better. Ardavan was delighted. He moved his hand. Now his wounds were not as painful as before, and his body was gradually healing thanks to the necessary micro-elements. Link smiled faintly. After a while, you will feel even better. Let's go right now. But there will be no rush to let your body adapt to the changes. They continued into the old quarters of the city at a less rushed pace, and in less than half an hour they were standing at the entrance to it. This part was once the source of the city of Gladstone. It contained many ancient buildings, most of which were more than a century old. Many of Gladstone's important government departments, including the MI3 outpost, were also located here. Therefore, most of the Dark Elves were sent to this area. Due to the large number of important government facilities, few ordinary citizens lived here. In such a place, Link and Ardavan would be easy prey for the Dark Elves. Link had 30 Omni and 30 mana left in reserve. Link spent another 5 Omni to increase his mana in case they got involved in a fight. Link knew the benefits of increasing the speed of mana regeneration, but current circumstances did not allow him to do so. If he had used his Omni to increase his mana regeneration rate from the beginning, he would probably have simply died at the Magic Academy. I'll definitely be spending a few Omni on this in the future. But first you need to increase your maximum amount of mana, Link calculated. A first level spell requires 6 mana points. A second level spell requires 30 mana points. A third level spell requires 120 mana points. And a fourth level spell requires 300. If my maximum mana is too low, then I will not be able to use high level spells. This would be a shame. He had to use his Omni for the best combination of maximum mana level and mana regeneration speed level. Ardavan, how are you feeling now? Link asked. He had to make sure that everything was okay with the assassin. Ardavan waved his wounded hand and smiled. It's is getting better and better. My wounds don't hurt anymore. Your magic is amazing. Link looked at him carefully. Ardavan's face was no longer pale and his breathing had returned. Go forward as fast as you can. I will follow you. You don't have to worry about me, I can keep up with you, Link said. At the same time, Link spent another 10 Omni on the Cat Sagility spell. Cat Sagility first level spell. Effect Energy will fill the body allowing it to be as flexible as a cat. 
The spell lasts 20 minutes. There were many dark elves ahead, all of them fast and agile. If Link uses spells while standing in one place, as he did in the Academy of Magic, then he will definitely die. But thanks to magic, he could avoid it. After purchasing the spell, Link spent six mana to cast it on himself. Silver light erupted from his wand and wrapped around him, leaving sparkling magical runes on Link's body. Link examined the runes. He was ashamed to admit that he did not recognize any of them. When I get out of here, I'll need to study magic well. Otherwise, if I ever encounter a magic master, I won't have a chance to defeat him. Link thought with concern. Under the spell's effect, Link felt much better. Now each of his steps was equivalent to a dozen meters and he quickly kept up with Ardavan. Follow me? Stay in the shadow of the walls? Ardavan said as he entered the old city quarters. Link followed him. He also used eight mana to cast lesser invisibility and silence on himself and Ardavan. They almost immediately became invisible, as if they had merged with the shadow. Ardavan was in shock. He did not immediately notice these changes. Turning his head to the side, he realized he couldn't pinpoint Link's exact location. Now even the Dark Elves will not be able to detect them. The magic is truly incredible. He was absolutely sure that they would be able to save the commander. For Link, Casting spells on someone else was nothing special, but for Ardavan, it meant a lot. After all, the magicians were very proud, most of whom were not even combat magicians, but just scientists. Even when magicians appeared on the battlefield, they became the main trump card of the army. In a normal situation, Ardavan would never have been able to enlist the help of a magician. After about five minutes, Ardavan suddenly stopped and rushed into one of the dark alleys. There, Link saw another assassin from MI3. It was a girl. She was petite and wore the standard dark green armor. She had cuts and wounds on her arms and legs, but at least she was still alive. She needed medical attention. Hearing the noise, the assassin girl instinctively raised her dagger. However, she was too weak. She didn't stand a chance before a professional killer. Maria, it's me, Ardavan. I'm back, Ardavan exclaimed hastily. Joy transformed the face of the assassin girl, but she immediately pulled herself together and seriously asked, has the news been sent? She broke through the Dark Elves with Ardavan in order to send word of the situation in Gladstone to the Black Iron Garrison. But she was seriously wounded and could not go further. I sent it. I sent all the carrier pigeons. All twenty-three pigeons were sprayed with a special spray. The news will definitely reach you, Ardavan cried. Maria sighed with relief but then hastened to say, You need to urgently go to headquarters. There are at least a hundred of those damned elves there. Commander Abel is in danger. Maria looked at Link suspiciously and asked Ardavan, Who is he? This is Link Morani. He is a magician. He is with me, Ardavan hastily explained. Link looked at the miniature female assassin. Seeing her wounds, he said, Don't move. I will heal you. He raised his wand and pointed it at Maria. Magic was mysterious to an ordinary person. This was the first time Maria heard about magicians who could heal. She pulled back, but Ardavan reassured her, Don't worry, Maria. You'll recover very quickly. The lights flashed and within five seconds the healing spell was complete. Maria fidgeted. She didn't understand anything. There seemed to be some effect, but it was still not that effective compared to the priest's divine spells. But at least now I can stand. In Firaman's world, all healing magic was divine. Divine healing spells were powerful and capable of healing all wounds at once. They could even raise the dead. But all this belonged to the kingdom of the gods. Mortal mages could never hope to obtain something like this. Maria struggled to get up, but Ardavan prevented her. Link's healing spells are amazing, but you shouldn't move. Just get some rest. Now I'll go to headquarters. Come back as soon as you regain your strength. Maria nodded. With a worried face, Ardavan said to Link, I need to rush to the aid of the headquarters. He wanted to ask Link to help him, but remembering the 100 dark elves ahead, he changed his mind. There were too many elves. There were only about 30 members of MI3 left. The situation was desperate. Ardavan was ready to go to the end, but he did not want to send Link to certain death. Let this go, said Link. Ardavan wanted to object, but Link interrupted him and said, looking straight into Ardavan, his eyes. Every second of delay could cost us the life of one warrior. He had a rescue mission with a high reward, and he also knew that it was impossible for Annie Abel to be captured. Otherwise, it will turn into a disaster in the future. As long as he is in this world, he cannot allow this to happen. Either facing a hundred dark elves now, or facing a formidable legendary assassin in the future, Link made his choice. 
Ardavan breathed a sigh of relief and rushed to the headquarters. More than a hundred elves ahead, it won't be easy. Link had fifteen Omni and sixty mana available. After weighing everything, he decided to buy a spell for ranged combat. However, which spell he would use would depend on the situation. MI3's headquarters was three hundred meters away. As an agency in charge of gathering information, its location was rather unremarkable. The two-story building with iron bars was hidden behind huge trees. The facade of the building was made of stone. No expense was spared in its construction, so the building was quite durable. On the left and right sides of the headquarters, there was a shop selling armor and a tailor's shop. The entire area in front of the headquarters building was laid out in smooth pebbles, and in its center there was a fountain, opposite which there was a small hotel. All other buildings were wooden. The buildings did not have any identification marks, and no one guarded them. If Ardavan had not brought him here, Link would never have found this place on his own, even with the knowledge gained from the game. After all, the game was just a game. Compared to reality, many details were omitted. The game server could not exactly copy Gladstone, so in order to avoid mistakes, the city was created using a general model without expanded detail. Ardavan and Link hid in an alley near a fountain. Link leaned slightly against the wall, and in the meantime, Ardavan poked his head out to look around. After a while, Ardavan pulled his head back and turned to Link. The battle in the building is still going on. The building is surrounded by twenty dark elves on all sides. They captured the main observation points around the square and lit all the oil lamps so that no one could sneak in undetected. Even Link's lesser invisibility spell becomes useless. Is it worth going ahead? They will simply become easy prey for the elves. Link frowned and thought deeply. After a while, he had an idea. Why don't the Dark Elves attack with fire arrows? They want to capture Commander Abel alive, Link asked. Even though the building's fey, aid was made of stone, the rest of it was made of wood. A small spark would be enough to force all the assassins inside to leave this building. This is quite likely, Ardavan thought. They will need much more time to catch her alive. This is our chance. Can you sneak past the Dark Elves around the fountain? Link asked. Yes, I can. I'm the best person to hide in this headquarters. Even the Dark Elves are no match for me. Only one or two will be able to spot me, Ardavan said proudly. Can you promise me that none of them will notice us? Link asked again. Link's question puzzled Ardavan. Even for him alone, it would be a big risk. We'll have to take advantage of the little commotion if we want to get to Commander Abel safely, Link answered calmly. What should we do? Set the building on fire? Link said. Okay. I will rely on you. Wait, they'll see us as soon as we approach the building, said Ardavan, when he suddenly remembered that Link was a magician. Mages had many ways to start a fire, much more than ordinary people. Link quietly poked his head out from behind the wall and took one look at the entire area. He memorized the location of all the oil lamps around her. Their diagram and their location immediately appeared in his head. Link had never had such an excellent visual memory before. But thanks to the Ruler of Light, his soul underwent a transformation, and now he had a photographic memory. Leaning against the corner of the wall, Link extended his wand forward. Mana began to flow forward imperceptibly. With the help of the magician's hand spell, Mana slowly approached the oil lamp after fifty meters. Very soon, Link felt the magician's hand touch the lamp. But he didn't make any move. He waited. About thirty seconds later, a strong wind blew, causing the oil lamps to sway and squeak with noise. Now! Link pushed the oil lamp with a gust of wind, and the lamp that should have broken on the floor fell instead onto the firewood, which was three meters away from her. The oil spread over the wood, and a fire broke out. There was a wooden house next to the firewood. A moment later it also caught fire. Due to the strong wind, the flames began to flare up even stronger, and instantly spread to other wooden buildings around the square, gradually approaching the MI3 headquarters. At this time, Link saw several figures deftly jump from one window of a wooden house. It was the Dark Elves hiding there. They fled from the fire. Five minutes later, the flames began to flare up even more fiercely, and other elves were also forced to leave the burning buildings. Everything around was in complete chaos. That's enough. Link said to Ardavan, Let Sis go. We have to hurry. No, you don't know the way. Ardavan didn't have time to finish his words when Link jumped forward from under his nose. Under the influence of the cat's dexterity spell, he was extremely fast. Ardavan had no choice but to follow him. But Ardavan was soon amazed that Link was moving in the right direction, overcoming all the obstacles in their path without the elves noticing. It looked as if he knew the way like the back of his hand. 
even halfway to the headquarters, the elves still did not notice them. Ardivan could not understand how the magician managed this, but soon stopped thinking about it and focused on Link walking ahead. They. We very quickly reached the iron gates of the headquarters. They had nowhere to hide, so the elves finally noticed them. They were out of the attack range of the dark elf archers, but were vulnerable to the elves standing nearby. Link didn't even stop in front of them. He continued to run towards the iron gate, shouting to Ardivan, They are still more than 100 meters away. Ignore them. Just run forward. With his fast movements thanks to the cat's agility spell, he rushed forward. Right in front of the iron gates, Link soared into the air to a height of almost five meters and grabbing a branch of one of the ancient trees, flew into the courtyard. Ardivan also quickly flew through the gate behind Link. In the courtyard, the dark elves were already waiting for them. Three of them arrived before Link landed. Link, while in the air, was preparing to cast a fireball spell. But at that moment, with a whistle, three arrows flew out of the window of the second floor of the stone building, each of which rushed towards the dark elves, thereby forcing them to retreat. This was an ally. Thanks to this, Link and Ardivan managed to land safely. Ardivan, covering Link, allowed him to pass forward. Link jumped into the window where he saw a mysterious figure. Using the cat's dexterity spell in the game, he was able to jump to a height of more than ten meters. Link grabbed the windowsill and climbed through the opening. From this window, the MI3 assassin fired towards the elves. This meant it was safe there. That's why Link decided to enter the building from here. Although Ardivan didn't have the explosive power to jump as high as Link, he was still able to easily climb up there as a level two elite assassin. Ardivan jumped onto the wall and by grabbing onto the cracks in the walls, he was eventually able to climb through the window. As soon as Ardivan entered, he was shocked by what he saw. He hurriedly shouted, Commander, this is the magician Link Morani. He's here to help. Annie Abel held the dagger to Link's chest, mistaking him for an enemy. Link, assuming that this would be the case, immediately raised his hands up. In reality, of course, he did not think that Annie would harm him. It was just that at this moment he wanted to take a close look at the future legendary assassin. She was very young. She was only 23 or 24 years old. Her height was about 167 centimeters. The dark green clothes she wore emphasized her slender figure. Although she was wearing a mask, her facial features were perfect. Milky white skin, dark blue eyes, bright golden hair cut short in a bold style. All this made her not just beautiful, but insanely beautiful. Compared to the tortured and scarred girl he saw in the game, Annie Abel was here in the prime of her powers. Link looked around the room. There are only four MI3 assassins left. Each of them received injuries of varying severity. The one who was in the most terrible condition could not even stand. There was blood everywhere. Hearing Ardivan's words, Annie hastily removed the dagger from Link. She looked at her subordinate and asked, Has the news been sent? All 23 carrier pigeons were sprayed with a special spray. And if the bloody owls do not attack them, then the news will reach the Black Iron Garrison in an hour? Ardivan said, pulling up his back. Very good. Annie sighed with a smile. Turning to Link, she told Ardivan, Imagine this magician. Commander, he is from the Academy of Magic? It was he who destroyed the main tower? Ardivan answered briefly and restrainedly. At this, all the assassins in the room turned to look at him, their gazes full of respect. The main tower was crucial in this battle. It was only because it was destroyed that the Norton Kingdom had a chance to save Gladstone. If Gladstone managed to overcome this disaster, then Link's contribution would be invaluable. What he did gave Gladstone a chance to save himself. Annie relaxed completely. I apologize for being rude, Mr. Link. Link did not take this threat seriously, given the difficult situation around, so he immediately got down to business. Commander Abel, what is, what's your plan? Annie and the other assassins were dumbfounded by Link's question. They didn't have any rescue plan. Only five assassins remained alive, and they were surrounded on all sides by dark elves. This room on the second floor was the only place where they could retreat after they lost control of the first floor. In truth, they were already preparing for death. It was useless to hope for reinforcements, since no one except themselves, the leading intelligence service of the Kingdom Norton, was unaware of the current situation at Gladstone. The Dark Elves have long hatched a plan to attack the city, and by the time the assassins found out about him, they could not help Gladstone's defenders in any way. Everyone in the city thought only about their own salvation. To remain alive could already be considered a great success. It was virtually impossible to save the others. There was silence in the room. We want to get out of here. 
But as you know, Mr. Link, there are too many enemies around, Annie said, blushing a little. They could only wait for death. However, Link came here to save them. He was confident that he could get them out of here with magic, even despite the large number of dark elves around. But what will we do next after we get out of here? asked Link. If we really can get out of here, then we will go to the city barracks. There are about one and a half thousand soldiers there with whom we can repel the dark elves, Annie said after a short pause. The commander of the city garrison was Carlos, a powerful warrior of the fourth level. But shortly before the ambush, he died of an unknown illness. Apparently, he was deliberately poisoned by the dark elves in order to sow discord in the ranks of the army. But Annie was confident that if she could get to the barracks and use her status as the daughter of the Iron Duke, then she could take control of the situation in the city. Link nodded to her, and at that moment, a new notification appeared in front of him. Mission. 1. I'm part. To save the legendary assassin. Find the legendary assassin. Completed. The player receives 10 Omni. Beginning of the second part of the mission. Breakthrough. Mission description. Break through the encirclement of the Dark Elves. Link received ten more Omni, and now he already had them twenty-five. Now he could expand his list of spells. He also had sixty-five mana. He looked at the assassins in the room. Two had serious wounds. The other two had more or less minor wounds. He approached the seriously wounded and pointed his magic wand at them. Don't move. I'll heal you. Annie was overcome by doubts. She had never heard that magicians could heal. Artivan caught her gaze and immediately explained, Mr. Link, his treatment is very effective. Annie did not object. Link used a spell, and two rays flew out of his magic wand. He spent twelve mana on elemental healing. Immediately after casting the spell, the killer's breathing returned to normal, and their faces were no longer so pale. These changes caused Annie to sigh with delight. In half an hour they will be able to walk, Link said softly, when suddenly he suddenly felt a chill run through his skin. He immediately pointed his wand towards the door. Who's there? Someone? Black silhouette flashed past the stairs behind the door. Seeing Link's wand, he disappeared into the darkness again. Link's question took everyone by surprise. Such a lightning-fast reaction from the Dark Elf meant that he was quite strong. It was possible that he was proficient in martial key. For a mage, those who mastered martial key were ten times more dangerous than a warrior of the same level, as their movements were too fast and their agility was discouraging. The magicians had to predict the opponent's next movements, since magic required time to prepare. Even Link couldn't cast spells instantly. Level 0 spells took 0.1 seconds, level 1 spells took 0.3, and level 2 spells took a full second. If the magician was not able to prepare his spells in advance, then in a battle with the enemy, he could only rely on luck. But who would rely on luck when it comes to life and death? Annie shielded Link with herself and turned to him with a serious expression on her face. It was a Dark Elf captain and a level 3 warrior. Those who reached level 3 had mastery over battle key and were thus feared. Looking at Annie standing in front of him, Link was able to look up information about her. Annie Abelolite Assassin, 3, level 1. Combat equipment, shadow, combat skills, speed dash, dancing daggers, shadow dance, death grip. Link sighed with relief after reading the information. As a future legendary assassin, she was truly an excellent fighter and was most likely stronger than the Dark Elf Captain. Otherwise, MI3 would not have been able to hold back the enemy, its onslaught for so long. Link himself could not have defeated the Dark Elf Captain alone. The Dark Elf Assassins were famous for killing magicians. In addition, the Elf Captain was two levels above Link. But now that Link was not alone, things could turn out differently. A hundred years ago in the Kingdom of Norton, one famous magician said the following. If a magician has time to cast a spell, he can work wonders, and with a team like Time Links was enough to cast spells. He immediately calmed down. I... I'll be careful. Annie Link nodded. He glanced at the two seriously wounded assassins he had just treated. They were much better than before and were able to stand up on their own. We will be out of here in twenty minutes, Link muttered. During these twenty minutes the assassins will restore their strength, and he will restore his mana. What should we do? Even with the help of the magician, Annie did not know how to break through the encirclement of the Dark Elves. But Link already had a plan. Fearing that they might be overheard, he did not say anything, but looked at the nearest table and saw charcoal there for drawing. Taking it, he wrote on the floor, First, let's kill their captain. Even if we kill the Dark Elf captain, we will still be surrounded. The market square is too open, and they will soon put out the fires. 
there is no way for us to avoid the attacks of their archers. Disagreeing with Link, Annie immediately wrote this back. There isn't a single secret exit in this entire building, Link immediately wrote. How could an intelligence service such as MI3 only have one exit in its building? They definitely have an emergency exit. Our secret exit has been discovered. They bribed one of our assassins. The only way out was destroyed by the elves. She smiled bitterly and wrote back to Annie. Link did not expect this. But now Link understood why Annie and her comrades were trapped on the second floor. After careful consideration, Link came up with a new plan. My magic will help deal with their ranged attacks, and they will only be able to fight us hand to hand. Then I use my magic on them again. Do you think we can get out in this case? At first he was going to use Small Whirlwind to deal with the arrows. But now that he had 25 Omni, he could buy a second level spell. And these spells were an order of magnitude more powerful than first level spells. Such a spell would greatly increase their chances of a successful escape. In this case, we will certainly be able to break through, wrote Annie back. Her eyes lit up. She had no doubt about her fighting skills. The only obstacle was the enemy's arrows. Great. Now let's think about how we can kill the Dark Elf Captain. Link nodded. And how? Annie asked. And just like that, a magician who appeared out of nowhere suddenly became the leader in her already small team? Link chuckled to himself and wrote on the floor. Can you pinpoint the location of the captain? Yes, I can feel his aura. Annie nodded in concentration. All powerful assassins could sense each other's aura. And since Annie was clearly superior to the Dark Elf Captain, and considering that he had previously given away his location, it would not be difficult for her to find him. You can then draw a diagram of the first floor and indicate its exact location. Link cheered. It was simple. All the scouts had basic drawing skills. Annie drew a detailed 3D plan of the first floor. Looking over the diagram, Link closed his eyes to form a complete picture in his head. Where is he now? Link wrote to her. Annie raised her head and listened. Three seconds later, she marked his location with a dot on the three-dimensional drawing. Not far. It's just around the corner after the stairs. The error may be no more than two meters. Link began to imagine the plan coming to fruition. He visualized the location of the Dark Elf Captain, but Link knew for sure that with his level zero spells he would not be able to defeat the nimble level three elf. First level spells required too much mana, and he should have conserved his reserves. Therefore, he needed a partner. If I use magic to impede his movements, will you be able to kill him? Annie raised her head up, looked at the ceiling, and after thinking for five, six seconds answered, if other elves don't interfere with me, I will definitely kill him. Don't worry, they won't be there. Link nodded and confirmed. The passage next to the stairs was very narrow. If other elves want to come to their captain's aid, Link's fireballs will delay them. Then we will begin as soon as the seriously wounded gather their strength. Written by Link. At that moment, the room stopped being illuminated by flashes of fire. The dark elves almost put out the fire. Chaos was slowly giving way to order. However, apparently over time, the Dark Elves' patience came to an end, and their attacks became more violent over and over again. The wounded recovered faster than Link expected. After about ten minutes they could already stand on their feet and even walk. Although they were still exhausted, some of their strength had already returned. Captain, we have not yet fully recovered, but we have enough strength to escape, said one of them. Annie looked at Link. At this moment, he closed his eyes to rest. During this time he managed to restore only three mana. At the moment, he only had fifty-eight mana. That was enough. Even with his eyes closed, Link could feel Annie's gaze. The Ruler of Light made Link unusually sensitive to such things. Link opened his eyes and nodded. Well, we are starting to break out of the encirclement. Gladstone, Old Quarters, MI3 Outpost. The patience of the Dark Elves has come to an end. Their commander hid in the stairwell on the second floor. He waited for his subordinates to take their positions. They were supposed to launch their final attack half an hour ago, but unexpectedly two people came to the aid of the enemy, who, in addition, started a huge fire. Instead of finishing the battle, most of the elves went to put out the fire in the market square. This was not at all part of their plans, but in the end, the fire was put out. It's time to end this confrontation. Ding, ding, ding. The Dark Elf commander heard the distinct sound of swords crossing. This was a pre-agreed secret signal meaning that almost everyone had taken their positions. There are still three positions left, the commander thought. His plan was very simple. When all escape routes were blocked, they would shoot fire arrows at the windows and the room where their opponents had taken refuge. Then three dark elves would collapse the eastern wall of the room, 
letting in more elves, which would cause even more chaos. Taken by surprise, the powerful assassin will be easy prey. He will burst through the door and personally capture her alive. Annie Abel? I wonder what the cunning old duke, his expression will be like when he learns that his only daughter has been captured. The dark elf leader chuckled coldly. Capturing Annie Abel was an important goal in the siege of Gladstone. Unexpectedly, three white glowing balls flew out from the enemy, his hiding place. Sliding in a smooth arc, they rushed towards the commander's head. His pupils narrowed. Fireballs! This is mage! Fireballs were just a level zero spell. They didn't surprise the commander much. Reacting instantly, he moved, and the battle chi enveloped him in a faint gray light. The commander's speed exceeded the capabilities of an ordinary person. His torso arched sharply, and a dagger flashed in his left hand. He threw it with deadly accuracy. Quick as a flash of lightning, the dagger headed towards one of the fireballs. With a slight poof, the blade cut through the sphere, which flew along an unpredictable trajectory. The fireball scattered into a harmless cloud of sparks. One was ready. There were two more left. This time the dark elf leader did not use his dagger. He raised his foot, the gray glow on the toe of which was becoming brighter, to kick the second ball of flame. It went out with the same sound as the first. It is just ridiculous to try to deal with me with level zero spells, the commander said contemptuously. But suddenly he noticed a shadow six meters away from him. Some strange smoke shone around the shadow. One glance was enough for him to understand that this was a special type of martial key. Compared to him, the shadow was small, about 170 centimeters tall, but it moved with incredible speed. In the blink of an eye, she covered the six meters that separated them. He could almost feel the touch of something cold on his skin, her dagger. Too bad, it's Annie. She used Dagger Storm. The commander of the assassins became nervous. Dagger Storm was the basic skill of the assassins. When using it, an assassin could shred the enemy's vital organs in the blink of an eye. And with the help of Combat Key, the assassin became frighteningly fast. Annie wielded the dagger so quickly that it was impossible for an ordinary person to follow it. But the Dark Elf Commander was no mere opponent. Faced with mortal danger, he began to fight with all his might and also use Dagger Storm. The darkness, illuminated by the sparks of clashing daggers, was filled with the sounds of combat. Dagger Storm versus Dagger Storm. Annie's dagger struck eight times with incredible speed, but each time collided with the Dagger Commander of the Dark Elves. Her attack was completely repelled. The Dark Elves on the lower floor were the first to react to what was happening. Two of them rushed to the aid of their commander, but not only their leader had the opportunity to receive reinforcements. Whoosh! Whoosh! Two more fireballs burst out from the room on the second floor. Taking a sharp turn down the flight of stairs, they headed straight towards both Dark Elves. Determining the location of a target by sound was an integral skill of battle mages. If their attacks were based only on what they saw, it would be a waste of magical power. Link's spell helped Annie buy time. The fireballs would keep the commander's assistants occupied for a while. The dark elf commander was lucky enough to withstand her dagger storm, but it cost him a lot of effort. Annie felt his reaction slow. She, on the other hand, was at her best. She didn't use any other combat skill. Quick as lightning, she aimed the dagger at the neck and chest of the enemy. The leader of the dark elves repelled her attacks with difficulty. His hand went numb, he was unable to react quickly. He felt the inevitability of the end. Awe filled his heart. Everything is over. Ding. Psh. He managed to deflect the blow to his heart by only tilting his neck far back, but was unable to block the blow to the neck that Annie had cleverly placed. The cold blade slid down his throat, cutting his windpipe. Annie poured Marshal Key into the blow. In an instant, his throat turned into a bloody mess. Blood flowed, but Annie was no longer there. There wasn't a drop of blood on her. By the time the Dark Elf Commander fell to his knees, clutching his throat, she had already returned to the room on the second floor. She did not need to check the results of her work. The feeling of the dagger's blade piercing her flesh told her all she needed to know. Returning to the room, she calmly said, Done? He's dead. Link immediately commanded, Forward? Now. The death of the leader threw the Dark Elves into confusion and became the best moment of breakthrough for Link and the MI3 agents. Giving commands, Link mentally exclaimed, Spell Purchase, Minor Hail Hurricane, Small Hurricane with Hail Level, Two Spell Mana Cost, 30 Points Effect, Causes an Icy Wind that surrounds the caster of the spell in a whirlwind. The radius is more than 3 meters, 
Anyone approaching will be attacked by gusts of wind and ice chips. The duration of the spell is five minutes, unless the magician cancels it earlier. While level zero spells were just big firecrackers, and level one spells could penetrate normal defenses, then level two spells, which cost 30 mana, were enough strong enough to make the average person tremble in fear. Link's minor hail hurricane and Holmes's monstrous earthhound were forces of enormous magnitude that had never manifested in normal life. After Annie's battle, Link had 48 mana left. This was enough for him to use the minor hailstorm spell once. When he acquired the spell, Annie had already descended to the flight of stairs, the same one where the two dark elves remained, distracted by the fireballs. They both belonged to the second level elite, but to Annie, they were no stronger than newborn kittens. Annie moved like a flash. The daggers in her hands fluttered like butterflies, causing one assassin to grab his chest and another to his throat. The rest of MI3 rushed to the first floor, into the hall. The six stationed there, the dark elves were attacking them from all sides. Annie had no problem having to fight two, but six. She would put herself at risk if she tried to kill everyone. No matter how strong she was, fighting off six would take incredible effort. But she wasn't alone. Five of her assassins, including Ardavan, stood around Link, protecting him from the Dark Elves. Six against six. Even though the two MI3 assassins were very weak, they had Annie, a level three assassin with Battle Chi and Link, who used fireballs to confuse the enemy. Annie dealt with the three Dark Elves. Link saved the lives of his comrades twice with fireballs. When there was no one left in the hall to stop them, they ran towards the door. More than 90 Dark Elves were waiting for them behind her. Their skillful ambushes can be everywhere. Silent arrows can strike at every corner. They are in great danger. Everyone turned to look at Link. He took a deep breath and calmly said, Gather around me. Do not move further than three meters. I will cast a spell. If they move too far away, they will also suffer from the minor hailstorm. All the assassins nodded. They were all experienced warriors and immediately surrounded Link, standing no more than half a meter away from him. The six of them formed a ring. Fortunately, the diameter of the ring was small and did not exceed two meters. Link was in the center. He raised his wand and felt magical energy concentrating in his body. A cold glow poured from his wand. A bright white light shone from the magic wand. The howling of the wind was heard. The wind, ice shards and snowflakes swirled around, capturing an area with diameters of approximately five meters. In this wind, the ice shards were like dancing daggers flying at great speed. The sounds of ice shards breaking against each other were heard. The storm destroyed the walls in the hall. In the blink of an eye, countless holes appeared in the walls. Link, with his wand raised in the air, was like a god in the eye of a hurricane. Even the experienced members of MI3 were amazed. Admiration was reflected on their faces at what they saw. They even froze in surprise. What are you waiting for? Run! Link shouted loudly. They only had five minutes. Every second counted. His shout brought the assassins out of their stupor. They surrounded Link in a tight ring and ran out of the building straight into the market square. The Dark Elves were clearly surprised by the appearance of a hurricane with hail from the MI3 outpost. What the hell is this? This is magic. Where is the commander? Where is he? The Dark Elves did not see their leader from where they were. In fact, it was the whirlwind that prevented them from seeing anything. Their commander was most likely killed. Some Elves attacked, others hesitated, others screamed in confusion. It was a complete mess. Link led the MI3 assassins through the iron gates into the market square. Whoosh! Arrows flew in their direction. Shoot! Shoot! They're inside! One of the elves shouted. Even more arrows rushed towards them, but none of them reached the target. The hailstorm not only reflected the arrows, but also hid them from the elves. Link and the assassins were relatively safe. All they had to do was be on their guard and deflect arrows that could penetrate the hurricane. Seeing that the ice hurricane continued to move, the Dark Elves realized that the arrows were absolutely useless. Attack? The hurricane is too dangerous. There are a lot of ice shards there. How can we attack him? Are you afraid? Cowards! Any arguments were used, but without orders from the leader, the crowd of Dark Elves behaved like a flock of sheep. Still, there were still a few reckless daredevils among them. More than a dozen of them rushed towards the ice storm, but they regretted it as soon as they approached it. The wind was as cold as ice, and countless dagger-like fragments were carried in its currents. The attack failed. The zone where the hurricane's effect was greatest was no more than three meters, but whoever fell into it risked being torn to pieces. The attacking elves were met with blows from all sides. Some of them received serious wounds almost immediately and were unable to continue moving forward. 
the slightly more fortunate ones made it to the center. But there, shivering from the cold and covered in wounds, what awaited them was not a warm welcome, but razor-sharp blades of assassins. One minute was enough to smash this first wave of the Dark Elves, advance to smithereens. When the hurricane moved on, only their sprawled, mutilated bodies remained on the ground for everyone to see. Silence reigned among the Dark Elves. Not a trace remained of their bravery. No one else dared to attack the hurricane directly. A small group followed the hurricane, keeping a safe distance. Several more elves continued to fire at him with their bows. There were also those who simply froze in place, not knowing what to do next. The commander is here. He is dead, said someone who was examining the outpost abandoned by MI3 agents. Link safely led Annie and the assassins out of the market square into some alley. It was narrow and protected from shooters, which significantly reduced the level of danger. Continue to go to the tavern. There is a secret passage there, Annie suddenly said. Only the highest ranks of the organization had information about the secret move. It is likely that he was not discovered in such an inconspicuous place. Link immediately moved towards the tavern. There were also dark elves hiding there, but knowing the destructive power of the hurricane, they flew out from there like arrows. The tavern was small and abandoned. After making sure that there were no dark elves nearby, Link lifted the spell. Annie waved her hand and said, Follow me. She led everyone into the kitchen. Several corpses lay on the floor, a cook and several workers. In the corner was the entrance to the basement. Annie took a deep breath, opened the basement door, dragged the cook's body and threw it down. The corpse landed with a thud. There was no other noise. Looks like there was no one there. Clear, Annie said before going down to the basement. Link immediately followed her, slightly ahead of the rest of the MI3 members. As they made their way deeper into the basement, Annie explained the situation to Link. There is a secret passage in the deepest part of the basement. This is a real labyrinth with only one correct path which leads to a house 200 meters away. That should be enough to confuse the elves. Link nodded. In fact, the game server has already sent him a new notification. The mission to rescue the legendary assassin is completed. The player receives 15 Omni. The next part of the mission is activated later. Taking into account the 15 points received, Link's total Omni number reached 20. This gave him relative freedom of action. They we reached the deepest part of the basement. Annie felt something on the wall behind a large barrel of wine and opened a cleverly hidden secret door. Passing through the door, she turned to Link. Mr. Link, you have done us a great service. We'll take care of the rest, and first of all, make sure you get to your destination safely. You saved my life. Now I will be your faithful shield said Artivan. The rest of the assassins nodded in agreement. In this short time, they realized the important role of the mage in the team. It was magic that helped them escape from the ambush of the Dark Elves, who outnumbered them tens of times. It was almost a miracle. No one would believe it if they were told about this. With Link, they were able to achieve what had previously seemed impossible. How could they put such an important member of the team in danger? Link relaxed a little, knowing that he could take a little rest. During this battle, his brain was in constant tension. Using several different spells in a row required constant concentration, because one mistake could be fatal. He was truly exhausted. Fortunately, their passage through the tunnel was without incident. Five minutes later, they emerged from the tunnel and found themselves in an ordinary house, where they were met by a young couple who were also part of MI3. They weren't surprised when Annie and her team arrived. Seeing that some of those who came were wounded, the husband immediately brought clean bandages and medicine while his wife tended to the wounded. Apparently, she had undergone professional training. It is a pity that there were no magical medicines with which Link could quickly restore his mana reserves. When his wife treated Artivan as wound, she exclaimed in amazement, How did the wound heal so quickly? Hearing this, Artivan nodded gratefully towards Link. Annie was also somewhat surprised. She had never imagined that Link's healing spell would be so effective, and she couldn't help but stare at him. Link slumped against the wall, folding his arms across his chest. His eyes were closed and his wand was tucked into his belt. Incredible fatigue was clearly visible on his young face. Annie knew that magic takes a lot of energy, and that is why all mages spent a lot of time resting. It was already close to one in the morning. In just one night, this young mage destroyed the main tower with the help of magic, then hid from the Dark Elves, and then came to their aid. He was clearly exhausted to the limit. Not understanding what was happening to her, Annie suddenly felt a surge of tenderness. She wanted to hug Link and let him sleep peacefully. 
she had never felt anything like this before. When this rush of feelings subsided, Annie was amazed. What is happening to me? Why would I think about something like that? She silently felt her face, feeling her cheeks burning. Artivan looked at her with curiosity. Commander, are you feeling bad? Why are you blushing? I'm... fine. Annie became nervous as if someone had found out about her thoughts. She immediately hurried to regain her calm expression. We don't have much time. Take a good rest. That's right. Artivan did not dare argue with the commander. The small group rested in the house for ten whole minutes. All wounds and injuries were cured with the help of healing drinks. They all perked up and were ready to move into battle. Commander, is it time to move out already? Artivan asked softly. According to their plan, they were to go to the city barracks. Annie hesitated, looking at Link. She wanted to give him a little more time to rest. But Link had already opened his eyes. It's time to move out. But you still? Annie couldn't help herself, looking anxiously at Link. I am completely fine. After resting, my mana recovered a little. It will be enough to get you out of several unpleasant scrapes. Let's go. Now he only had 15 mana points, but he still had 20 Omni. Even if Holmes comes for him, he will be able to fight back. But then a new notification appeared before his eyes. Mission has begun. Escort. Mission description. Escort Commander Annie Abel to Gladstone City Barracks. Reward for completing the mission. 30 Omni. This is an incredibly high reward. Link understood the logic of the game system better and better. The game didn't want Link to escape Gladstone like in the previous game world. It wanted him to prevent the massacre and save the city. Should I take it? Link had some doubts. It was risky. He could even die. Several scenes flashed before his mind's eye. The beautiful magic teacher Vera, fighting for her life. Bleeding Artivan fighting the Dark Elves. A badly wounded Maria, hiding in an alley whose first words were, Has the news been sent? The MI3 assassins put their lives on the line to save Gladstone, without even thinking about the danger. Link realized that he, too, was willing to take risks for a common goal and help these people. This time, let me put everything on the line, Link muttered to himself. What good is all his enormous power if he can? Even save one small city? Link straightened up. He grabbed his Dark Moon wand tightly. After several battles, Link had already made his decision. Gladstone, Flower District. Following the Black Earth Hound, who took the trail, were the Dark Elf Mage Holmes and several Dark Elves. Tracking required endurance and could not be hasty so as not to lose the trail. Only an hour later, the Dark Elves reached the port from where Link had sailed away by boat. And then they encountered a serious problem. The trail had broken. The Earth Hound walked in circles around the port, emitting short screams. She looked completely helpless. Master, he must have boarded the boat. What do we do? Terry asked. It... obvious, Holmes said irritably. He stood at the pier and looked into the water, thinking about his next step. Go along the river downstream. He can't stay in the boat all the time. He had to land somewhere, Master. What if he swam upstream? Terry asked uncertainly. Is he a complete idiot? Holmes looked angrily and snapped. Out of a hundred mages, probably only one magician is capable of swimming against the tide. So do you think we should look for it downstream or upstream? Downstream. Now Terry no longer had any doubts. In order to swim against the current, not only skills were required, but deliberate strength. Even he, being an experienced warrior, was not capable of this. Not to mention a magician. The Dark Elves began searching down the river, ignoring the distraught people from the Flower District. In truth, even the most frostbitten people tried to avoid meeting the Dark Elves. Twenty minutes later, the Earthhound let out a low roar and accelerated. Then she lowered her head and began to sniff the ground. We are on his trail, Holmes shouted joyfully. Stalking is like gambling. No one could say how it would turn out, but this time he won. Holmes even involuntarily straightened up and raised his head up when he felt the respect and admiration with which the Dark Elves were looking at him. The pursuit of Link led them to the market square. Apart from a few people milling about here and there, the place was deserted. But the fewer people around, the fewer smells that could distract the hound from its task. She followed the trail much faster than before. An hour later, Holmes and the Dark Elves found themselves at the entrance to the old part of the city. It's rubbish if he headed here. What if he's here to rescue the leader of MI3? Holmes frowned. He knew that Annie Abel was one of the Dark Elves' main targets. They received the order to capture her alive. Let's hurry, Holmes exclaimed. He had a bad feeling. The old part of the city was even less crowded. The Earthhound ran at full speed, and ten minutes later Holmes and his team entered the market square. 
What they saw horrified them. All that was left of the buildings were piles of cobblestones. There was still smoke coming from them, indicating that there had recently been a fire here. More than ten mutilated corpses lay in the square. It was difficult to determine who it was from the bodies, but the remains of clothing indicated that the dead were dark elves. Noticing the puddles, Holmes walked over to take a closer look. Touching the water, on the surface of which ice crumbs floated, he became convinced that it was cold. The power of magic. Small hurricane spell with hail. He was here. Holmes frowned again. Not only because another mage was here, but also because he practiced high-level magic. Lesser hurricane was a second-level spell. This means that this young mage is not level one, as he previously assumed. He has the same skills as me. This complicates things a little. But Holmes was confident in his abilities. This mage may have gotten the hang of using the lesser hurricane spell, but he is young and inexperienced. And he certainly doesn't have superior magical abilities. If we had to meet face to face, I would have no problem teaching him a lesson. Magic was Holmes's old hobby. Over the years of practice, he developed his understanding of mastery. This was the source of his self-confidence. Footsteps were heard behind him. They belonged to Terry and another dark elf. Holmes had no difficulty in determining that the elf standing in front of him was not a member of his search team. He must have witnessed the battle in the market square. What happened here? Holmes asked. The elf was still in shock and scared. It was the magician. Terrifying magic. He caused an ice storm and killed the commander, then escaped with Annie Abel. Where did they go? I don't know. We lost them at the tavern. When we entered, they were not there. We turned everything upside down, but were still able to find the secret passage. The elf looked unhappy. Fear was visible in his gaze. He knew perfectly well that he would be severely punished for the failure of the operation. But there must be a move, Holmes exclaimed furiously. He glanced at the tavern building, then looked up at the hound and cursed loudly. The earth hound was too big to squeeze into the doors. But then something dawned on him. Digging secret tunnels is hard work. The stroke cannot be too long. It is not necessary. Maximum 500, 800 meters. How many of you are left? Holmes turned to the elf. 78. And where are they? We split up to search for MI3 agents. Very good, Holmes concluded. Suddenly something occurred to him. Why should I chase them? What's the first thing they'll do after escaping? Why not just ambush them? Another question arose. Where would they most likely go? The answer was obvious. They will probably go to the city barracks. If they take control of them, the situation will turn in their favor. Well, damn it, no. It will not happen. Holmes's heart began to beat wildly. He realized that the escape of the magician and Annie Abel was no longer important. What really mattered was that the garrison could not be allowed to restore order in the city. Otherwise, if the magician and the head of MI3 united with the city's troops, it would be impossible to resist them. All dark elves in the city will undoubtedly be killed. Gather everyone. We are going to Horus Castle. Horus was the ancestral castle of the Mayor Hesman Horus. It was located in the western part of the valley, in the north of the old city quarters. The mayor, Duke Hesman, was already finished. He was destroyed by debauchery. He was killed three hours ago in his bed by a beauty whom the Dark Elves had trained for more than ten years. Moreover, all the castle servants were also killed. The city barracks were located not far from the castle. The commander of the garrison was poisoned the day before. Most of the officers were killed by the Dark Elves. Thus, the garrison was decapitated. The soldiers were left without a leader. Perhaps some of them tried to take command, but this did not become a serious threat to the Dark Elves. However, now that the mage and Annie Abel have entered the game, the situation can easily change. They must be stopped. Mages had a high social status. Although not officially, after the death of the commander and his right hand, Holmes actually began to act as commander. The elves in need of a leader gathered around him. Their number has already reached 150, including those whom Holmes brought with him from the Academy of Magic. Almost half of all the dark elves who infiltrated Gladstone. Under the leadership of a level 2 mage, they became a force to be reckoned with. Alive! We still have time! Holmes growled. With a snap of his fingers, the earth hound lowered itself, allowing him to mount it, and then rushed forward. The dark elves hurried after. The hound was fast, very fast. In the blink of an eye, Holmes left the killers far behind him. He put himself at risk by doing this, but he didn't care. He firmly believed that he could cope with the young mage, even if all the MI3 agents were on his side. But in trying to catch Link and Annie by surprise, the dark elves overlooked something. 
a small, frail figure hidden in the shadows, watched as they gathered in the market square. It was Maria, the MI3 agent whom Link had rescued on his way to headquarters. After resting for half an hour under the influence of elemental healing, she recovered a significant part of her strength. The commander and that mage are in danger. I must warn them urgently. Maria secretly entered the tavern and headed to the basement. Quickly feeling the wall, she found a secret passage and ran as fast as she could. Soon she found herself in the house. The young couple stared at her in surprise. Was the commander here? Mary blurted out. The husband nodded. Yes, they left just recently, about three minutes ago. Where did they go? I don't know exactly, but it seems to be north. Being an ordinary employee of MI3, the man was accustomed not to ask unnecessary questions. I see. Immediately block the secret tunnel. Whoever comes from there will be an enemy, Maria warned. The couple nodded in understanding. Maria caught up with Link and the others at half past one in the morning. According to the plot of the game, it was at this time that the Dark Elf army struck its decisive blow. But now, thanks to Link, the city was quiet and peaceful. However, deep inside Link knew that the destruction of the main tower would only delay the Dark Elves for a short time. They gradually lost their edge over the situation. Maria joined Link and the rest of the MI3 agents on the way to the city barracks. She reported everything she had seen and heard in the market square, leaving everyone confused. A group of over 150 Dark Elves was indeed a force to be feared. But the worst thing was that the Dark Elf Mage was with them. This was reality, not a game. It was impossible to simply correct the imbalance of power. From the point of view of an ordinary person, Mages possessed wisdom beyond their understanding. Their magic was full of mysticism and power. Fear captured the heart of any warrior only because it was impossible to predict what to expect from the magician. Often when dying, people could not even understand what had happened. The intelligence of the magicians was the basis of their complete dominance. Silence hung between them. Annie turned to Link. What do you think, Mr. Link? To resist the mage, you need another mage? Annie was more than ever glad that a mage like Link was with them. Otherwise, her subordinates would already be dead, and she would be captured. Naturally, the possibility of retreat was not considered. Fortunately, Link knew a lot about his opponent. The Dark Elf Mage's name was Holmes. This second-level elite mage specialized in elemental magic and summoning magic, and was also a member of the Silver Moon Council of Mages. Unlike the teachers of Fleming's Magic Academy, he was a real combat mage. As far as Link knew, Holmes possessed at least one ultimate magical skill, swift casting. With such power, Holmes could cast first-level spells such as Fireball at terrifying speed. His best record is considered to be the creation of ten Fireballs in one second. Level 1 Fireballs was an advanced version of the same Level 0 spell. They were also significantly more powerful. If Level 0 Fireballs could be compared to Firecrackers, then at Level 1, they were like grenades. Link remembered that in a previous life, there was a team of ten newcomers who tried to oppose Holmes while getting out of Gladstone. All of them died during the fireball attack, and Holmes received the nickname Fire Cannon. All this information appeared before Link's eyes. He compared it with what he knew about Holmes. He didn't know a single high magic spell, but he had twenty Omni, fifteen mana points, and of course, a second-level defensive item, a bracelet. It seemed that he had a good chance, as long as there was a sufficient supply of mana. To confirm these thoughts, Link spent ten Omni to acquire maximum mana. A pleasant warmth spread throughout his body. He was again full of mana. Now his maximum mana was 241 points, and at the moment he had 118 points. This was enough to enter the battle? The magician is very strong, but Maria clearly described his powers. No need to worry. I can handle him, Link reassured Annie. Holmes is just a pathetic second-level magician. Link once became the Archmage, the legendary Apotheosis. How could he lose in this magical battle? That is good, Annie sighed. The rest of the assassins also breathed a sigh of relief. After running for another five minutes, they saw the raised flag of the city barracks. In the distance, one could also see the mayor's castle. Lively, we'll be there soon, Annie urged, causing the MI3 agents to invariably speed up their pace. It was then that she noticed something. Listen. Footsteps are heard behind. Someone is chasing us at high speed. Startled, Link wanted to turn around and look, but suddenly he felt a huge wave of mana rushing towards them at high speed. And danger, as if an unknown beast was attacking him, ready to sink its fangs into his throat. This feeling made his hair stand on end. 
The sense of danger was so strong that Link hardly paid attention to anything else and only activated his magical bracelet. A magical light flashed, and a crystal clear radiance spread from his waist throughout his body, merging with the gray robe he wore. Now his clothes were covered with a thick, dense layer of light, in which magical runes swirled, turning his robe into something surprisingly majestic and intricate. Protective Barrier Second Level Spell Effect Reliably protects against the effects of spells, but is powerless against physical attacks. Once the spell is activated, Link out of the corner of his eye he caught a flash of fire. At the same moment, he felt a hot blow to his back, forcing him to take a few steps forward. There was an explosion behind us, but that was not all. Boom, boom, boom. The explosions continued, scattering sparks of fire everywhere. Link turned around to see bluish-white balls the size of fists whizzing towards each of the MI3 agents. Each ball exploded with a powerful bang, except for Annie, who was able to withstand the flame ball thanks to her speed and the strength of her battle key. The blast wave scattered all the members of MI3. Maria and Ardavan were not protected either. Their charred bodies were thrown five to six meters. They were unconscious. Just like that, with one blow, all the assassins were eliminated. Many of them were mortally wounded. Such was the power of a mage with supreme magic abilities. It's Holmes. Not only does he have swift sorcery, but he also has long-range sorcery. Holmes created fireballs at a distance of 100 meters. This was twice the performance of ordinary magicians. Link hardly had time to think about it or get upset. He needed to take control of the situation. He pointed his magic wand at a brick by the road and screamed, Vector throw! The enemy was out of the range of his magical abilities. His attacks would not reach their target. The only option to reach Holmes was a vector throw. The brick rushed towards a huge dark figure in the distance. Link already realized that it was Holmes. He was alone, without a crowd of dark elves, riding an earthhound. As an archmage, Link had excellent control over his magical abilities. The brick flew straight at Holmes's head. The bodies of magicians and ordinary people were not much different. If the brick had reached its target, Holmes would have been seriously injured, if not killed. But he managed to dodge, ordering the Earthhound to lean to the side. Taking advantage of the moment, Link sneaked up to Annie. Annie was stunned by the power of Holmes's magic. She was breathing quickly, hiding in the corner. There was no mask on her face, but there was fear that distorted her delicate features. There were tears in her eyes for those of her fighters whose fate remained unclear. Link immediately grabbed her and slapped her in the face. Fingerprints were left on her face. Sharp pain brought her to her senses. Placing her palm on the impact site, she stared at Link, full of confusion and misunderstanding. Forward! To the barracks! I'll stop him! Link growled. This was the only chance to change the course of Gladstone's history. They couldn't miss it. His wand flashed, and a beam of light enveloped Annie with Cat's agility. A first-level spell? What about you? Annie asked anxiously. Holmes was close, and 150 dark elves followed him. How can Link deal with them alone? Stop worrying and go! Link used Vector Throw on Annie and literally forced her to do his bidding. She flew a couple of meters and flew into the window. Link! A hysterical scream came from the window. She knew he wouldn't follow her. He will fight to the end. The gifted mage had already saved her once, and now he is going to sacrifice his life for her. Annie was incredibly sorry. Her heart sank, and tears streamed down her face. But Link didn't hear her. His opponent was strong, but he had to remain calm and focus on controlling his spells. Once again, the tip of his wand glowed. He cast the cat's agility spell on himself. With elastic jumps, like a cat, he rushed towards Holmes. Link needed to get closer to Holmes, since his magical capabilities did not allow him to act at such a great distance. On the contrary, Holmes tried not to let him close the distance. Sitting astride his hound, he pointed his magic object at Link and said, Fireball! Woohoo! 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 Under the influence of rapid sorcery, fireballs appeared one after another and rushed towards Link like a machine gun burst. Link was protected by the defense barrier, but his capabilities were not endless. Seven or eight fireballs were enough to tear it apart. He will not expose himself to attack, unless absolutely necessary. Small hurricane with hail, Link shouted. An icy shine began to spread from the wand. At the same instant, using Cat's agility, Link dodged two fireballs. Another second later, the small hurricane reached its full strength. An ice storm enveloped Link, blocking the road. Holmes would have to walk through the hurricane to reach the garrison. The speedy fireballs he had special hopes for were also unable to attack Link without going through the vortex. But these were level one fireballs, 
and Small Hail Hurricane was classified as a level 2 spell. It would take at least 10 fireballs to break through it. After creating 14 fireballs, Holmes was running out of mana. Trying to break through a hurricane would result in complete exhaustion, but he had enough combat experience to cope with the problem. Pointing his magic item at the hurricane, he growled, For battle! The Earthhound was created from a dense mixture of earthen elements and therefore possessed incredible strength. The Minor Hurricane was a chaotic mixture of the elements of water and wind. He could damage the Hound, but she would definitely be able to kill the Mage before the storm blew her to pieces. When a Mage dies, so does his magic. Link and Holmes's battle took a serious turn in just a couple of minutes. Victory and defeat, life and death, their fate could be decided at any second. Attacking the spells of another Mage was pointless. The best thing to do was deal with the Magician himself. Every magician knew this, including Holmes and Link. Seeing a huge hound almost three meters high rushing towards him, Link immediately used a spell. Sliding. A faint beam of light shot out from the hurricane, landing on the ground in front of the earth hound. The ground in front and behind Link in the alley instantly became slippery, as if oil had been spilled on it. Your pathetic tricks will not help you here? Holmes grinned. Slide was a level zero spell. A magician of Holmes's level could easily handle this. Sand. A bright light shot out from Holmes's staff. A small whirlwind containing a huge amount of sand suddenly appeared in the alley. As soon as the whirlwind touched the slippery surface, it instantly enveloped her in sand, leaving no trace of it. The earthhound ran unhindered across the ground, quickly approaching Link. And in the blink of an eye, she fearlessly rushed into the epicenter of the lesser hurricane, despite the sharp ice shards. Link was fifty meters away from Holmes. The distance prevented him from reaching Holmes, who was his ultimate goal. And just as the Earthhound was about to pounce on Link, he did two things. First, he cancelled the Small Hail Hurricane spell, and second, with with the agility of the cat and under the cover of the protective barrier, he left the safe zone inside the Hurricane and dodged the attack of the Hound. Leaving the Hound to deal with the Small Hurricane, Link rushed towards Holmes and pointed his wand at the nearest wall. Vector Force Field? The air was distorted when powerful streams of air burst out of Link I wand as if from a rocket launch. The vector force field hit with all its force against the wall at the moment when Link jumped. The impulse generated from the shock wave of the force field picked up and accelerated his progress forward. Behind him, the hound had already escaped from the small hurricane and rushed at Link again with its mouth wide open, but its jaws closed in the air, so and without hitting the mage. The next moment, Link was already approaching Holmes at breakneck speed. However, the monstrous hound was catching up to him from behind, and all it took was a touch from Link to take his life. They were separated by one second. During that second, Link was so focused that the world around him seemed to slow down. Raising his wand, he pointed to the stones lying on the ground. Vector throw! Vector throw! Vector throw! In the blink of an eye, Link cast a first-level spell three times. Despite the fact that three cobblestones were sent flying from a distance of 35 meters in a second, each throw was incredibly accurate and flew straight to Holmes's head. It was not for nothing that it was called Archmage. The rapid use of fireballs was Holmes's main trump card. But every spell in this world required a special approach. Being only a second-level mage, he could not apply the same technique to other spells. Therefore, Link was able to cast spells a little faster than Holmes. Anticipating Link's next move, Holmes cast a defensive spell. He did this for one simple reason. His opponent was protected by a level 2 defense barrier. Even if his fireballs reached their target, they would not harm the mage. In addition, he himself was weakly protected from vector throws. Holmes was a magician, not a warrior. He had neither natural agility nor a spell like Cat's agility in his arsenal. Therefore, it was not so easy for him to avoid meeting the cobblestones rushing towards him. It was necessary to act quickly. Ice Shield Ice Shield. First level spell. Effect. Forms an ice shield from water elements. Reliable protection from both magical and physical attacks. Ice Shield was the right solution against Vector Throw, but Holmes made one small but unforgivable mistake. He underestimated Link's casting speed. Link activated his spell in about 0.3 seconds. The ice shield took just over 0.4 seconds to create. When the first boulder approached Holmes, the ice shield did not fully open. He parried the blow, but he himself was broken into pieces. Meanwhile, the second cobblestone was already on its way. In the face of danger, Holmes had no choice but to use his trump card. A ring sparkled on the middle finger of his left hand. 
light began to spread from it, covering Holmes from head to toe. It was similar to Link's defense barrier, but not as bright and thick. This was because Link was wearing an advanced version of the second level, and the mage was only wearing the first. However, this did not solve Holmes's problem. The protective barrier was designed to protect against the effects of magic. It was effective against fireballs and airblades, but not against physical attacks. The second boulder reached Holmes just as the protective barrier was fully activated. Bam! It slammed into Holmes's forehead with damn precision. The outer protective barrier softened the impact, but not so much that the force of the blow did not resonate in the magician, Sis head. Holmes pulled back, his head spinning. His dark red eyes were full of fear. How does this runt manage to cast magic so quickly? He was terrified. Link cast spells one after another at great speed. Bam! And the third boulder completed its flight, crashing into Holmes, his forehead. The protective barrier offered virtually no resistance to the last boulder. A fist-sized stone flying at high speed towards someone, his head was enough to knock him down. Given the circumstances, it could have ended in death. Link saw a small dent on Holmes's forehead. The magician's eyes rolled back and he fell. It was undoubtedly a knockout. But was he alive? Link finally landed, running a couple more meters by inertia. The earth hound caught up with him but no longer posed a danger. Having lost the control of the magician, she was dumbfounded and covered in cracks. A moment later the huge hound began to crumble, slowly turning into a mountain of sand. Vector throw, Link said again, intending to finish what he started. Bam! This time the blow hit the temple. Without so much as a sigh, a groan, or a wheeze, Holmes's faint breathing was interrupted. He was dead. During the battle that began with Holmes's ambush and ended with his complete defeat, Link cast one level zero spell, eight level one spells, and one level two spell. In the end, he only had thirty-eight mana points and ten omni left in his account. Looking at Holmes's body, Link marveled at how weak his defenses were. He thanked fate once again for having the bracelet. Otherwise he could have died. Link's victory was largely due to his speedcasting skill, but the advantage of the level 2 protective barrier was also an integral part of this. Stepping over the corpse, Link picked up Holmes' staff. Fire crystal staff quality, flawless effect 1, plus 30% magic efficiency. Effect 2, plus 10% to fire element spell speed. Good, much better than the new moon sticks. It can even increase the speed of my spellcasting. Unsurprisingly, Holmes' fireballs appeared like bullets from a gun undoubtedly, largely due to this staff. Just before his eyes, a message popped up. Annie Abel had reached the city barracks. The escort mission was completed. Player Link received 30 Omni. Unfortunately, Link's joy was short-lived. He soon discovered that he was in surrounded by dark elves. Link wasn't surprised at all. Left to fight Holmes, he had already signed up to meet with these guys. They seemed to be in no hurry to attack. Are they scared, or do they want to capture me alive and send me to the dark forest? The latter was more likely. Holmes died, leaving the Dark Elves without a leader. Revenge was likely the first thing that came to their minds, but fear of Link's power held them back. The Dark Elf mob was the greatest threat of them all that faced him today, but he still did not retreat. He stood leaning on the Fire Crystal Staff, contemplating his escape from the Dark Elves with ten Omni in reserve. Suddenly, a sonorous but beautiful voice was heard behind him. Is this how you surrender, Link, and you can't even pretend to be a hero? A painfully familiar voice made Link, his heart skip a beat. He turned to face its source, a fragile silhouette. It belonged to a woman with long dark hair, eyes black as night, a pair of neat horns on her head, graceful facial features and red full lips, behind which were hidden small sharp fangs. A simple short robe could not hide the perfect curve of her waist. Tight trousers hugged her long slender legs. Everything about her evoked thoughts of carnal desires. It was the demon princess, the one who stole Link's heart. She held an obsidian sphere in one hand while the other rested on her waist. Her pose perfectly emphasized the perfect curves of her body. She turned to look at Link. How much temptation was hidden in that look? Link was shocked. Feeling his heart jump out of his chest, he nevertheless averted his eyes and focused on the magical shield designed to protect them. A group of dark elf assassins went on the attack, but the shield was very strong. Link recognized him. Obsidian Barrier, 5th level dark magic spell. Looking at the princess again, he suddenly remembered Selene and finally understood everything. The demon princess and Selene were the same being. That's why they seemed so similar. What he saw earlier was only her human form. What appeared before him now was her true form. You. 
Are you Celine? He asked, still not recovering from the shock. But then another thought flashed through his head. So we met again. The current Celine was still very young. She was only 17 years old. Compared to Link's game world, she had a certain childish naivety. Although she was not as powerful as in the game world, she was still much stronger than an ordinary person. Link tried to look up information about her in the game's interface, but all he got were question marks. In the game, this only happened when players were more than three levels higher. Link now had the power of a level two mage. Since Selene used Obsidian Barrier, a fifth level magic spell, Link assumed that she was at least a fifth level mage. With such power, she would definitely be among the top 1,000 strongest in the Firaman world, and would always be an honored guest in any kingdom. But this is provided that she does not flaunt her demonic traits, since demons are the enemies of the Legion of Light. The Dark Elves of the second level were powerless against her. Grabbing Link's hand, she flapped her black wings and flew high into the air. Seeing how they left the area of effect of the protective spell, the elves showered them with arrows from all sides. But suddenly a blue crystal sword appeared in Selene Swetsi's hand, which she wielded with incredible speed. The sword moved so fast that it left sky blue traces in the air. Iron arrows crashed on the sword with a loud ringing, and none of them reached the fugitives. Selene then flew to a height of about 100 meters above the ground. There, the arrows could no longer hit her and Link. The Dark Elves could only helplessly watch as they gradually moved away. Ten seconds later, Selene landed on Gladstone's clock tower. Link, still in a daze from what had happened, simply stared at her silently. Why are you silent? She was beautiful. Her bright red lips slightly stretched into a smile, and her voice is so gentle and pleasant that anyone who heard it would be enchanted by it. Charming evil is what immediately came to Link's mind when he thought of the game world. In the game world of legends, there were four great beauties, rumors of which spread to every corner of the world. Angel of Light, Herrera, Queen of the Red Dragons, Gretel, Princess Elves, Milda, and finally the Demon Princess, Selene Flander. The Four Great Beauties. They were named so by the players for their stunning appearance, incredible charm, and powerful strength. Every player knew about them, or at least heard the name of each of them. The character of the Demon Princess was like a well of fragrant poison. Unable to resist her charms, you sink deeper and deeper into him, and eventually just drown in him, unable to control yourself. Looking at the thoughtful expression on Link's face, Celine smiled even wider. She reached out and ran her thin, delicate fingers over his face and coquettishly whispered, What? Are you scared? I'm a demon, you know. At the same time, Celine slightly exposed her small fangs. Link finally came to his senses. He shook his head slightly. You saved me. Why should I be afraid of you? In the game world, the mission to find and destroy the end boss Nozama lasted quite a long time. During this mission, Link and Selene spent quite a bit of time together. He knew her inside and out. Although she had a penchant for pranks and various eccentric antics, she never killed someone without reason. It was a clear line that she did not cross, which made her very different from other demons. In truth, she did not want to become a real demon, so she led a wandering lifestyle, hiding from her father, his minions, who said I am saving you. You fooled me. I'm very angry about this, and that's why I brought you here to punish you. Celine furrowed her eyebrows angrily, looking at Link with her black eyes, and raising her hand to her face. She contemplated what to do with Link. Link wasn't scared in the slightest, but just began to wait patiently. If he was not mistaken, then this eccentric girl would play some mischievous prank as punishment. Such calm behavior embarrassed Celine. Never before had anyone reacted as he did to her real appearance. In the past, Everyone would run away in terror whenever she showed her demon appearance, no matter how close they might be. Why wasn't this man scared at all? She began to walk around Link. Hey, I am a demon. Why don't you react to this? No, you're not really a demon. Link shook his head softly. You may look like a demon, but in my eyes you are still the same Selene, the kind girl who took care of me for a month after I broke my arm. With these words, her playful mood on her face disappeared and her voice became cold and distant. Man, you are not so naive as to think that empty words of flattery will have an effect on me, are you? I've seen too many people like you in my time. The real Link would have run away in fear at Selene's cold and distant behavior. But this Link knew why Selene acted the way she did, and the words she spoke once again proved this. She took off her mask of mischief and put on a mask of indifference because it made her feel safer. Thus, she was simply trying to protect herself. She, as a half-blood demon, was actually very lonely and sensitive, and it made sense, given her background. She saw her mother being killed by demons sent by her own father, 
It was already a miracle that she didn't go crazy. A real demon wouldn't have saved me and certainly wouldn't have gone on a rant with me. He would simply tear me apart and eat my soul. Celine, I see pain and loneliness in your eyes. Can you tell me about yourself? Link asked. He didn't back down. Celine shuddered. This was the first time someone had said something like that to her. Before that, people ran after her only because of her attractive appearance. And as soon as she revealed her true appearance to them, they immediately rushed away. No one had ever thought about her feelings before. But this man seemed to see right through her. Every word was true. Celine was confused. There was no trace left of her mischief that had been present before. Taking a few steps back, she turned away and silently looked into the darkness under the clock tower. Link was silent, patiently waiting for an answer. At the top of the tower, gusts of the night wind caressed her thick black hair. Celine stood motionless, like a beautiful statue of a goddess. Childhood memories came flooding back to her. Mommy, what are these things on my head? Celine asked delightfully, stroking the little horns on her forehead. She was only five years old. Every time the scene was repeated in Celine, his head, her mother, his beautiful, gentle face was distorted with disgust. It saw from your father, she quickly answered. Mom, I don't want to train anymore. I'm very tired. Celine collapsed to the ground from powerlessness. She was only seven years old. Her mother spent a lot of time raising her, but when it came to training, she became completely insensitive. You must become stronger as quickly as possible. Your father won't let you go. Her mother was quite rude about this, despite the sadness hidden in her eyes. Ah, mom, what happened to you? Who you are? Her mother lay in a pool of her own blood with many open wounds. She was on her last legs but was able to say a few words. Celine, my daughter, no, give up. Celine was 14 years old at the time. She couldn't finish speaking. Several terrifying creatures shrouded in miasma mercilessly beheaded her. My princess, the Lord ordered you to be returned home, said the ugly creature. Die! Celine studied martial arts for many years. She was already very strong. The demons were completely defenseless against her, and she easily dealt with them. She had to survive on her own, and she learned to disguise her true nature. To hide from her father's servants, she wandered around the world. Three weeks ago, she arrived at Fleming's Academy of Magic. She had never thought about becoming a magician, but only showed a passing interest in magic. Celine remembered the time she spent with Link. Mr. Morani, I think it is inappropriate to do that. Stare at the lady like you do. That was two months ago. The first time the young man saw her, he was as if fascinated by her. Of course, Celine did not attach much importance to this. She had seen so many others like him during her travels. However, the fact that such an inconspicuous youth would take her out of the academy at the risk of his own life was completely beyond her expectations. Nevertheless, he did it. And quite successfully. At that moment, Celine could not help but admit that this man now occupies a special place in her heart. She hid her secret from everyone for too long. When Link raised this question, she was silent for a while. But then she spoke, unable to keep everything in herself. My father is the Lord of the Abyss. He wants me to return to the Abyss and submit to his will. To do this, he sent his subordinates all over the world of Firamun to catch me. All that remains for me is to constantly hide. My mother, a beautiful woman, was torn to pieces before my eyes. She tried to protect me. For the sake of my mother, I cannot become a puppet of darkness. Celine was saddened and lowered her gaze. She sighed heavily. She was a demon, a symbol of darkness and horror an enemy of the Society of Light. However, Selene grew up in the human world and considered it her home. That's why she was cursed to live a life of pain and loneliness? Sounds very sad and lonely, Link said in a voice full of sympathy. Selene was a little disappointed by Link's silence. She said with a bitter smile, You don't believe me, because I am a demon, and demons always lie. In all the ancient chronicles, demons were considered the most evil and cruel creatures in the world. Even in the game world of legend, the appearance of a demon was accompanied by a sea of blood and destruction. I believe you, Link said, his voice calm and confident. This Selene was different from the one he knew in the game. That Selene was cynical and eccentric, and she loved to mock and play with the feelings of others. But Selene in front of him looked more like an ordinary girl. She was still innocent, trusting and in need of a friend. I only met her in the game twenty years later, and all this time she was constantly hiding alone, completely alone. It is not surprising that this left such an imprint on her life. But now, there is a chance to fix everything. Link, looking at Celine, his beautiful and sad eyes repeated, 
I believe you? Why? You're only saying this because you're afraid of me, right? Celine looked at him with suspicion. But there was hope in her gaze. She wanted it to be true. As she heard the sincerity in his voice, but past experience made her doubt the human words. Link shook his head, and without thinking twice, said Celine's oft used quote from the previous game world No one can change the place of his birth, but he can choose his own path. And even if it is full of dangers and obstacles, this is the path where you find true freedom. Celine was silent and thought about his words. Her face lit up with a smile and her eyes lit up. Yes, I'm free. My father will never bend me to his will. There was incredible confidence in her voice. She chose her path. She looked at Link and said with sincerity, Link, you are truly wise and generous. I will remember your words, my friend. I'm glad I met you. Thank you for selling saving me. Otherwise I would already be dead, Link said with a smile. Ha ha ha. Celine laughed joyfully. She suddenly felt relaxed, as if she no longer had to pretend. There was no trace left of her previous mischievous behavior. Now she seemed like just an ordinary carefree girl. She couldn't wait to find out what had changed Link so much. Laughing, she asked curiously, You seem completely different today. What happened to you? Link scratched his nose. How can I better explain? Should I tell her that I came from Earth, and that my soul crossed several dimensions and then entered this body? About a game server? This is out of the question. After thinking a little, he tried to explain. In fact, my understanding of magic is at the same level as before. But for some reason unknown to me, my mana reserve became much larger, and with it some magical memories appeared. In truth, all I know about magic is just how to use it, but I still have no idea where it comes from or how it works. For this reason, he was only an ordinary second-level magician, not an elite one. It was quite awkward. For the same reason, all of his spells were simple. As for higher magic spells, he didn't have any, and he had no idea how to acquire them. Celine couldn't help but laugh when she heard Link's explanation. What an awkward situation. It looks like you should learn magic properly. Yes, I think so too. Ever since Link saw Holmes's magic spells and techniques, he realized that he needed to become much stronger. And he already had a plan. When Gladstone is saved, I will enter another magic academy. Oh. Any specific academy? East Valley High Magic Academy. It was the most famous magic academy in the Norton Kingdom. The head of the academy was a seventh-level mage. At this time, seventh-level mages were the highest beings in the world of Firamon, and only a few possessed such power. Selene was speechless for a moment, but could not help but smile. Would you like to? Let me ask, what is the composition of the fireball spell? I don't know. Link shrugged. What about the whirlwind spell? You don't know this either? Well, you should know the composition of the simplest Earth Spike spell. I've seen you use it quite effectively. If you know magical theory at this level, I think there is no point in studying at the East Valley Academy of Magic. Celine spread her hands. The East Valley Magic Academy was the best magic academy in the kingdom. It was not for nothing that it was the ultimate academy. She will not even consider students who have large gaps in the theory of magic. And even if they get in, they will soon be expelled, as they cannot cope with the colossal workload. Even Celine was not sure that she would get in there. Link was a little shocked. Fruman's real world was different from what was in the game after all. He was too self-confident. One way or another, it was worth trying to enter the Eastern Valley Academy of Magic, and then we'll see. Of course, there. No need to think so much about it now. Okay, not yet. Gladstone is still in danger. We need to save him. Celine burst into loud laughter when she heard Link says words. What can you do with your current strength? I had to work hard to get you out of there. Why don't you just stay here? Celine was a level 5 warrior with exceptional talent in magic. Even she couldn't defeat an army of dark elves, let alone Link. Uh, I have a plan. Link smiled sarcastically. He had long ago come up with a plan and was ready to carry it out alone. But now that Selina was with him, his chances of success had increased significantly. Tell me. Selene had no idea what they could do. If Link suddenly gained power equal to the head of the East Valley Academy of Magic, then maybe there would be a chance. I need to inspect the Fleming's Academy of Magic. This is an important part of the plan. The Academy had everything a magician might need, medicine, equipment, and much more. But Link was most interested in one subject, which was located at the Academy, a powerful item that could instantly change the tide of battle in favor of the city's defenders. 
That was his goal. I can take you there. But I want to know something. Why are you willing to risk everything for Glaston? Selene still couldn't understand it. It seemed to her that it would be enough if the two of them ran away from the city. Why fight if the city is already doomed? Link didn't answer. He just silently looked towards the city barracks. The barracks were brightly lit. Orderly rows of soldiers carried torches as they left the barracks. It looks like Annie has already taken control of the garrison. In the city, the dark elves were no longer a threat. He looked north again. The night wind carried an incredibly strong smell of darkness. The dark force was getting closer and closer. Finally, the dark elf army had arrived. From the looks of it, they would launch an attack on Gladstone in half an hour. The dark iron garrison was more than 100 kilometers away from Gladstone. In order for the garrison troops to have time to help, it is necessary to delay the Dark Elves for another hour. At this moment, Link had a new mission. Last mission. Final battle mission description. Protect the city of Gladstone. Make sure he is not captured by the Dark Elf army within the next hour. Mission reward. 100 Omni points. Link accepted without hesitation considering such a large reward, despite the difficulty of the mission. What he experienced today made him realize something important. A person is determined by the path he chooses. Link wanted to be an all-powerful Archmage in the world of Ferumen, so he chose a thorny path that is full of battles and battles. Having accepted the mission, Link looked at Selene with determination and fire in his eyes. Yes, nothing connects me with this city. I may die, but I can also become stronger. Selene, I will become the most powerful magician in the world. He left out one point, namely that he wants to gain power equal to that which he possessed in the previous game world and defeat the demigod Nazama. Selene was amazed by Link's words. She thought Link was a little crazy, but in her heart, he was already her true friend. She extended her arms and shrugged, that's very brave of you. Okay, I'll take you to the Magic Academy. I will take you away from Gladstone when you fail. Thank you. The light in Link? His eyes faded. The young magician fully concentrated and got rid of extraneous thoughts. Composure and calm took possession of him. Today, he will give it his all. Lord, who was thirty-five years old, was the youngest warrior of the sixth level in the country of the Dark Elves, Pralink. The warriors of the world of Firuman at the third level possessed combat chi, combat aura. At the sixth level, they could already release their combat aura outside their bodies for long-range attacks. If a warrior who had not reached the sixth level tried to fight a mage, his main task was to close the distance between himself and the mage. While the magician was at a distance, the warrior could only steadfastly endure the magician, his attacks. But everything changed when a warrior reached the sixth level, then they mastered the strength necessary to resist magicians at long distances. In the world of the Dark Elves, strength was equivalent to their status. The young genius of the Dark Elves, Lord, was appointed general of the Dark Elf forces, preparing an attack on Gladstone. The Dark Elf army was only ten kilometers from Gladstone, and could see the high walls of the city, and the spire of the city clock tower. Things did not go as smoothly as expected, represented Lord. The scouts he had sent returned with news that made Lord's expression grow darker and darker. General, there are still guards on the walls of Gladstone. General, the northern gate was not open. General, the city walls are protected by at least 2,000 guards. All the defensive weapons and mechanisms along the walls were activated. Lord and the other commanders were silent. The silence became increasingly frightening. The Dark Elf messenger who had arrived earlier did not tell them anything about this. All he said was that most of the prominent figures in the city were killed, and that the magicians of Gladstone City were destroyed. During this entire operation the only setback was the destruction of the main tower at the Academy of Magic, where the portal was located, and so they had no choice but to send messengers. But now it looked like there had been some major changes in the last couple of hours. Lead here's the messenger, Lord growled, barely restraining his raging rage. The Dark Elves messenger soon appeared before Lord. Seeing the expressions on the faces of Lord and his captains, the messenger realized that things were bad. His legs gave way, his whole body trembling, he stumbled. The messenger immediately hurried to get up. On trembling legs, he approached the general and said respectfully, General, did you call me? Lord, his handsome face darkened. It seemed that a little more and he would turn black with anger. His cold red pupils lingered on the messenger. This is your last chance. Are you hiding something from me? The messenger trembled even more. A few tense seconds later he stammered, Captain Jiggs. Dead. He was killed by a young magician. The same magician who destroyed the main tower. When I arrived to you, Mr. Holmes had already gone in search of this magician. 
The Lord? His eyes narrowed. A young magician? The captain standing next to him said quietly, General, apparently, Holmes could not compete with that young magician. Most likely he had already lost to him. It was a war. Defeat meant death. Lord felt a headache. Holmes was a member of the Silver Moon Mages Guild, and not some ordinary soldier. Holmes's mission was to use the portal in the main tower to transmit a message, not to fight the magicians. Now that Holmes was dead, the magicians from the Silver Moon Council would come to him for an explanation. Lord looked at the messenger coldly, his blood boiling with rage. So why didn't you tell me about all this right away? Huh? The messenger collapsed to the ground and begged for mercy. He knew what awaited him now. Lord waved his hand. Two subordinates arrived and dragged the messenger away. Soon a heartbreaking scream was heard. The messenger was dead? General, what now? asked one of the commanders. Lord grinned. All Gladstone's leaders are dead. These two thousand defenders are just a useless crowd. Hurry up with the attack. Start the siege. He had twenty thousand warriors, and he himself was a sixth-level warrior. He was also assisted by commanders, each of whom was strong in his own right. All of Gladstone's leading men and officers are dead. The two thousand people guarding the city were ordinary soldiers. Who can stop them? Lord was sure that with an army like his, he would definitely not face defeat. He had no doubt that he would be able to occupy Gladstone before the arrival of reinforcements from the Dark Iron Fortress. By the time the warriors from the Dark Iron Fortress arrived, Lord would have the city walls at his disposal. When the sacrifice ceremony takes place in the city, he will become one of the greatest warriors in the history of the Dark Elves. General, in that case, we will have to take some risks. If, the commander tried to advise, if they fail to capture Gladstone before the arrival of the warriors from the Dark Iron Fortress, they will be in great danger. You dare challenge my orders? Lord looked at the commander, sparkling red pupils. Among the Dark Elves, strength was the key to respect. The commander immediately backed away. No, of course not. Your word is law, General. Lord snorted and gave the order. The army of Dark Elves accelerated their advance towards the city. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. In the east, the warriors ran at a fast pace along a wide road towards the north. Their commander-in-chief was General Alonso. Alonso was also a sixth-level warrior. Having received news from the MI-3 reconnaissance detachment that the city needed help, he immediately moved out with his army from the Black Iron Fortress. The fortress garrison numbered 15,000 soldiers. Alonso led 10,000 soldiers into battle, leaving 5,000 soldiers to defend the fortress. From the letter asking for help, Alonso realized that Gladstone was in grave danger. He immediately sent this news to the capital and moved with his army to the rescue. Alonso was confident that if he reached the city before the Dark Elves began their siege, his troops would be able to repel the enemy attack. If he managed to hold the city until help arrived from the capital, the Dark Elves' army would have no choice but to retreat, or it would destroy it. Speed up your pace, Alonso commanded. They had little time. Every lost second could decide the outcome of the battle. Will the Dark Elves be able to capture Gladstone, or will the Dark Iron Garrison and the city's inhabitants defend it and drive these Dark Elves away? It all depended on whose troops would be the first to enter Gladstone. Whoosh, whoosh. A strong wind blew from the sky. These were the Griffin Riders from the Black Iron Fortress, a special combat unit. In the sky, fifteen griffins flew in battle formation one after another. The leader of the detachment was the magician Osmu. He clutched a magic wand in his hands, emitting a slight glow. A squad of war griffins, following the light, flew to Gladstone. Osmu, a third-level magician, had excellent command of elemental magic and was a battle mage whom the Violet Council sent to the Dark Iron Fortress. Griffins were not usually suited to battle in the dark, but under the guidance of the magical glow of Osmu's wand, the huge, ferocious beasts quickly carried fifteen of the strongest warriors to their destination. These were the best warriors selected from among the troops of the Dark Iron Garrison to form a special unit. Their goal was to keep the Dark Elf army away from the city. It was an incredibly dangerous mission with little chance of survival. The name of this squad was Suicide Squad, and therefore all the powerful fighters were at least third-level warriors. The strongest among them was Mink, a fourth-level warrior. In the Dark Iron Fortress, he was a major, but in addition to this, he was also a knight and the younger brother of Lord Derek, the head of the Southern Maple Leaf. The mage Osmu had no intention of engaging in combat unless the enemy also had a battle mage. Having led the party to its destination, he had to leave Gladstone. No one was going to force him to participate in battle, since battle mages were too rare and could not be risked needlessly in ordinary hand-to-hand -hand combat. 
This rough work fell to the warriors, the griffins flew incredibly fast. Half an hour later they already saw Gladstone. From the height of their flight it was clear that the northern wall of the city was brightly illuminated. The people on the northern wall were preparing to defend the city. And further north, a huge shadow was quickly approaching Gladstone. The good news was that the city had not yet fallen. He even managed to strengthen his defense mechanisms. The bad news was that the Dark Elf army had already arrived. The mage Osmu slowly sank down. When the squad descended to a height of 100 meters, he used a spell and fired a beam of light from his wand. The griffins flew down, following the light. Ozma cast the protective spell Stone Armor on each passing warrior. Stone Armor level, two spell effect. The earth element forms durable stone armor. It protects well from physical attacks. While he was casting spells, the darkness of the night was illuminated over and over again by flashes of magical light. The warriors, surrounded by an amber glow, felt how strong earth and armor appeared on them. A yellow glow enveloped them like bright yellow crystals. After Osmu used a second level spell fourteen times, a good half of his mana was spent. While the others sank closer to the ground, the magician shouted, Mink, good luck in the battle! Don't worry! Mink grabbed the shield from behind his back and ran to the city wall. Osmu watched the retreating silhouette of Mink. After making another circle on the griffin, he flew to the Dark Iron Fortress. The rest of the griffins followed him. He completed his mission, sending the Suicide Squad to their destination. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Meanwhile, Link and Selene reached the Fleming's Academy of Magic. How to quickly increase the military power, with the help of equipment, potions, and magic. All this could be found in the Academy of Magic, and he came here for the sake of power. Fleming's Academy of Magic. There were still a couple of dark elves in the Academy, but Selene got rid of them with one swing of her sword. She and Link carefully searched the entire Academy, the Library, the Headmaster's Tower, and other secret towers but did not find a single valuable magical item. There aren't even the lowest level magic wands left in the student dormitory? That's too bad. The Dark Elves took everything away? Link sighed. Almost all the valuable items were stolen. They only managed to find more than 50 books about the basics of magic and 1,300 gold coins. Link could not carry all of this and therefore gave everything to Selene. The Demon Princess had several magical items with a spatial dimension inside, allowing her to store things there. She could easily fit everything she wanted in there. Similar items existed in this world, but they were incredibly expensive. A normal ring with a pocket dimension was worth 3,000 gold coins. Link could not even dream of such a thing yet. Finally, all that was left to search was the Alchemy Tower. The doors to the Alchemy Tower were broken. Going inside, they saw several corpses lying on the floor. Everything was in complete chaos. Cabinets and tables with valuable magical materials were completely torn apart and many valuable items were stolen. There was too much heavy equipment here to practice alchemy, so the Dark Elves simply broke everything they could. But since the Dark Elves did not have much time, some things remained intact. One of the drawers in the potions cabinet was slightly open. Link walked over, opened it completely, and saw a crystal vial with a blue liquid. The following information appeared in front of Link. Low-level mana restoration potion quality. Normal effect. After consumption restores 100 mana points. Finally, all that was left to search was the Alchemy Tower. The doors to the Alchemy Tower were broken. Going inside, they saw several corpses lying on the floor. Everything was in complete chaos. Cabinets and tables with valuable magical... This was a side effect of the potion. But at the same time, he felt a kind of refreshing wave spreading throughout his body. Link immediately felt unusually collected and attentive. Looking at his statistics, he found that his mana had recovered to 145 points. Not bad. This should be enough to defeat a couple of opponents, but it is clearly not enough to delay the advance of the Dark Elf army. Link rummaged through the cabinets of the Alchemy Tower and found one crystal vial with a green liquid. Low-level mana regeneration potion. Quality. Normal effect. After consumption, the mana regeneration rate is doubled for two hours. Note, the effects of two such potions do not stack. Link. I drank the potion without thinking. His mana regeneration rate increased to 27.6 points per hour. But this was still not enough. In the Alchemy Hall, only ordinary potions could be found. After all, Fleming's Magic Academy was considered one of the weakest academies. But no matter how much they conceded, all magical establishments had their own treasures.
The Alchemy Tower contained the most valuable items in the Academy, and that's why Link returned here. He studied the Alchemy Tower carefully. Finally, he stopped at a tapestry at the edge of the central hall. Link tore it off, revealing a smooth wall behind it. If Link was not mistaken, it was a magical door. Magic Door Level 3 Spell Effect Creates a reliable protective screen that blocks passage to secret places. The magical door was cleverly hidden, it merged with ordinary walls. People who did not know magic would not be able to recognize it. The Dark Elves did not know magic so none of them noticed this magical door. Link felt relieved. If no one touched the magic door, it means that the Academy. Its magicians did not have time to use their main weapon. Selene, can you open this door? Link asked. Of course. No problem. She smiled. Taking out a blue crystal sword, she walked over and slashed at the door. A loud sound was heard. The jade surface at the magic door broke with a crash from Selene's powerful blow. A simple third level spell. For Selene, breaking such a door was no more difficult than breaking a chicken egg. Behind the door was a spiral staircase. Link walked inside and began to climb the steps, ending up in a small secret room on the second floor. There was no one in the room. In the center stood a square chest measuring approximately one square meter. The purple chest was made of valuable precious mahogany, and its edges were decorated with gilded carvings. The chest looked luxurious. Seeing it, Link felt relieved. In the game world, the chest looked much simpler than here, but all the basic details remained the same. He had read about this treasure chest on gaming forums. It was said that a novice mage had somehow managed to break through the protective spell during the escape from Gladstone. According to rumors, on the second floor, he discovered a secret room, and in it, this chest. When the player opened the chest, he discovered a bottle with an incredibly powerful potion. After drinking it, he gained incredible power, which allowed him, during his escape, to defeat and kill all the Dark Elves on the territory of the Academy, including the Magician Holmes. Link immediately tried to open the chest, but the chest was covered with a thin layer of light, like a layer of water. It was a magical seal. With his current powers, Link couldn't break it. Let me. Selene walked up to the chest, preparing to break the seal with her sword. Don't! Link hastened to stop her. Although the seal was unfamiliar to him, he felt the pulsations of mana emanating from it. It seemed to him that if he tried to break the seal by force, the magical energy contained in it would cause an explosion. Even if it is not too strong, it will be enough to destroy the contents of the chest. And he will be left with nothing? Then what should we do? There is definitely something valuable in this chest. Let me take a look. Link closed his eyes, feeling the magical energy of the seal. After five seconds, he used his wand to point to the three runes depicted on the chest. These three runes must be the key to opening the chest. If they were destroyed at the same time, the magic seal would disappear. Link didn't base his assumptions on any specific knowledge. He just felt that these runes were the main runes in this magic spell. Destroy them? Simultaneously? Selene asked uncertainly, frowning. If you destroy them within one split second, then no chain reaction will occur? Link explained. Well, then it is very simple. Selene walked closer to the chest, and her sword flashed in the air. She struck three times in the blink of an eye, making small cuts on each of the runes. A second later, the magic seal was broken. A small hole appeared in the layer of light. It gradually grew, and eventually the magical seal disappeared without a trace. Link immediately opened the chest. It was almost empty, but in the center was placed a single item. A crystal bottle of an amber potion that emitted an amazing moonlight. It was unimaginable. Information appeared in front of Link. Whisper of Magic. Legendary Potion. The most precious potion of Fleming's Magic Academy. Effect. The drinker of this potion is given the blessing of Whisper of Magic. With its help, any spell will be 100% more effective, and the speed of casting the spell will be increased by 30%. Mana will be fully restored, and the maximum mana reserve will be increased to 1,000 points. Mana regeneration rate will be increased to 1,000 points per hour. Also, the effect of medium magic armor will be applied to the drinker of the potion. The blessing lasts for two hours. When the blessing ends, the person who drinks this potion will be under the influence of magic weakening, and for three months all of his magic indicators will be reduced by 90%. What a divine potion. Although the side effects were terrible, receiving such power for two whole hours is completely compensates. No wonder that newcomer was killing dark elves left and right after drinking this potion. Link had a lot of spells in reserve and besides. He had 40 Omni Points. It's scary to imagine what kind of monster he will become after using this potion. 
but Link did not drink it. He gave it to Selene. You are much stronger than me. Drink it. If Link could become like a tiger with wings thanks to this potion, then Selene, a fifth-level mage, was like a nuclear warhead. Selene turned away awkwardly. Honestly, I'm not very good at magic. What about the obsidian barrier? Link asked in amazement. These are my innate abilities. I mainly rely on combat skills. It's a magic potion, right? It won't do me any good. Moreover, I am a demon. I'm afraid? Ah, uh, right, sorry. I didn't think about that. Link understood what Selene meant. She was not allowed to manifest a demonic essence, otherwise she would have problems. So this potion could only be consumed by Link. Having pulled out the stopper, he drank the entire potion in one sitting. As soon as the potion was in his mouth, Link thought it was soda. But the effervescence of this liquid was superior to any ordinary soda. As the potion flowed down Link's throat and into his stomach, he felt as if there was a fireball in his stomach. Bam! Link felt as if something had exploded in his stomach, but there was no pain. After this explosion, pure energy spread through his veins. His limbs and bones seemed to have become stronger, and his consciousness became surprisingly unclouded and pure. The effect of medium magic armor was also activated. Link's clothes were covered with countless magical runes. In addition, his body was covered with a protective layer of amber crystal 1cm thick. This was a fifth-level protective spell. It was similar to the protective barrier, but the light from the fifth-level spell was much brighter, and the effects of the spells were different. This spell did not protect well against magical attacks, but did an excellent job against physical attacks. It was as if Link was wearing strong metal armor. For a second, Link felt invincible. He looked at his statistics. Link Morani, noble, normal mage level. Two mana regeneration rate, 1,027.6 per hour mana reserve. 1241 current amount of mana, 1241 current equipment, fire crystal staff, current status, low level mana regeneration potion, whisper of magic, high mana regeneration rate, large mana reserve and 1241 mana points, and even within two hours, Link had a feeling of DJJ Vu, as if he had become the same archmage of magic again. Besides this incredible strength, he also had 40 omni points. What to spend it on? Seeing the incredible speed of mana regeneration, Link without a doubt bought the fourth level spell. Fire explosion, wave fire explosion, wave level. Four spell mana requires, 320 effect. Creates a huge fire over an area of more than 50 meters. Note, let the flames consume, that's it. Without superior magical technique, even Link would have needed three seconds to use this fourth level spell, taking into account the cost of 320 points of mana but these three seconds were completely compensated by the terrifying power of the spell. Moreover, Link had a 10% acceleration from the Fire Staff Crystal and 30% acceleration from the Blessing of Whisper of Magic. If you add everything up, it turned out that it would only take 1.8 seconds to use one Fire Explosion Wave. Moreover, with the help of a Magic Staff and a Potion, the power of the spell would be increased by as much as 130%, far exceeding the usual Fire Explosion Wave spell. It was no worse than an excellent magical technique. Yes, when the potion's effect came to an end, Link would not be able to use this spell freely. But it was worth it. This night, Link was going to drown the enemy in a sea of fire. Let the flames consume everything. The time was. 3.35. Morning. Early autumn brought with it incredible cold. When breathing and talking, cold air began to come out of her mouth. Northern city walls of Gladstone. When Annie saw a horde of dark elves approaching Gladstone. Her face turned pale. There were too many of them. The enemy army numbered at least 15,000 soldiers. She reached the barracks and took control of about 15,000 soldiers. With their help, Annie quickly cleared the city of the Dark Elf Killers, and even managed to replenish the ranks with citizens capable of fighting. She tried her best to gather more people, but time was running out. Now the city walls were defended by only 2,000 people, and most of them were ordinary citizens who had never held weapons. Annie looked around. A mixture of excitement and fear was visible on people's faces. Some were even shaking. Each of them understood that, in this battle, the chances of survival were almost zero. She suppressed her fear in her heart and tried to encourage the defenders, everyone in their places. Let those damned red-eyed bastards taste our strength. We have a high city wall, crossbows and trebuchets. We have nothing to fear. But before she could finish, a terrible battle cry rang out from the army of dark elves at the city wall. Kill! This voice rolled like thunder throughout the entire area. After this battle cry, which was issued by one elf, the entire battlefield seemed to be engulfed by an unknown trembling. Annie's heart trembled with fear. 
As the daughter of a duke and head of MI3, she had a wealth of knowledge and experience. She immediately determined the enemy, his level just by his voice. Damn, this enemy is level six. Compared to him, she was just a baby. If he personally leads the army into an attack, it will be impossible to stop him. The army of dark elves immediately shouted after him, Kill! 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 Their battle cries were like tsunami waves, and the 2,000 soldiers on the walls were like small boats drifting on these terrible waves, ready to capsize and collapse at any moment. There are too many of them. We can't hold out. No, I don't want to die here. Let's retreat. These screams came from the recently recruited defenders. Although the soldiers from the garrison were also afraid, they had undergone special training, so they were able not to show their fear. One of the new recruits tried to escape. Annie didn't even have time to give the order before one of the military commanders caught up with him and beheaded him with one blow. Annie looked away. She had not yet gotten used to the cruelty on the battlefield. She could be cruel and merciless to her enemies, but not to her people. Realizing that this was a necessary measure, she calmed down and shouted, We are Gladstone, last line of defense. Death awaits those who escape. No one thought about escape anymore. Order has been restored on the city walls. At the city walls? Just look. On the wall there is some little thing in charge of the cowards. Yes, it's easier for them to open the gate and let us in. What can they do to us? The eyes of the dark elves allowed them to see well in the dark, and with the help of his keen vision as a sixth-level warrior, Lord could carefully see everyone on the city wall. All the commanders also took a closer look. Those who had hesitated before immediately became inspired and were ready to be the first to rush into battle. General, let me lead the attack. Everyone wanted to take all the credit for such an easy battle. Not only was the enemy outnumbered, but he was also weak. Compared to the warlike and inspired dark elves, they seemed like small midges. Lord laughed arrogantly and randomly chose several of his commanders. You, 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 and you. Begin an attack on the city, yes, General? The four commanders immediately began to carry out the order. Each of them led a detachment, which had special grappling hooks and a strong steel rope, and led it to the city wall. In the kingdom of Norton, Gladstone was considered a small city. The city walls were not high and reached only 30 meters in height. The commanders chosen for the attack were level 3 warriors, and one was even a level 4 warrior. If they manage to climb the wall, then no one will be able to stop them. Annie watched as the dark elves began to furiously attack the fortifications, climbing onto the walls. Each of them possessed a martial aura, key, that covered them, causing their bodies to emit light that was very visible in the darkness. One warrior's combat aura was especially bright. This put a lot of pressure on her. He's much stronger than me. I can't handle him. We can't let him get here. Annie began to panic and shouted loudly, Attack! The archers began to shower the dark elves with a hail of arrows. Several special crossbows fired long spears over two meters in length at them with a loud sound. Trebuchets began to throw huge stones into the even ranks of the enemy. As a result of this lightning-fast and extensive attack, they managed to wound a dozen dark elves. But unfortunately, the strongest warriors and commanders of the enemy, who posed the greatest threat, were not harmed. With a fighting aura enveloping their bodies and carrying heavy shields in their hands, the elves easily deflected the projectiles. They didn't even slow down and were already close to the wall. The commander of the fourth level of elves managed to throw a hook with a rope onto the wall. Several defenders rushed towards him and began to furiously slash at the rope. The rope turned out to be very strong. Ordinary swords could leave small cuts on it. It will take them at least five minutes to completely get rid of it. Give it to me, Annie shouted loudly, running up to them. But she immediately saw that it was only the first hook and rope. As soon as she reached him, more hooks landed on the city walls, which were thrown by the dark elf commanders. Covering her dagger with the hidden shadow, Annie slashed at the rope with her sword and cut it completely. With a sharp sound, the fourth-level warrior, who had almost climbed onto the wall, flew down, but it was only one rope, and three more hooks with the same strong rope landed nearby. Three heavily armed Dark Elf commanders took the opportunity to scale the wall. They were all level three warriors. Climbing onto the wall, they drew their shields and swords and stood guard over the ropes so that other Dark Elves could climb them. More and more Dark Elves climbed the walls, including the fourth-level warrior who had just fallen. Annie also had a fighting aura and was a third-level warrior, but she was an assassin. In an open battle, warriors had more advantages than assassins. Apart from her, no one else could stop the Dark Elf commanders. So she gathered her courage and headed to one of the commanders, who had already begun to mercilessly kill defenders in a row. At that moment, she thought about Link. 
He remained to fight the Dark Elf Mage. By the time she took control of the city barracks and returned back to help, she found only Maria, Artivan, and the others seriously wounded. The Mage, the Dark Elves, and Link were no longer there. As she rushed towards the enemy, sounds sounded in her head his last words, Stop worrying and go. Even in his last moments, he escorted her to her destination safe and sound, and thereby kept his word. He didn't die, did he? Annie thought with bitterness in her heart. She understood perfectly well that she could not cope with the commanders of the Dark Elves. Even if she and the defenders managed to defeat them, then their general would still remain. She would most likely die in this battle, but she was already mentally prepared for this. Annie slipped behind the Dark Elf commander and swung her dagger, aiming straight for his neck while he was distracted by one of her soldiers. Just as she was about to plunge the dagger into the warrior, he quickly turned around and tried to push her away with his shield. Annie immediately realized that she would be thrown into the air by his shield before the dagger could reach him. She had no choice but to duck and dodge. But just as she did, someone jumped onto the wall behind her. This was a fourth-level warrior. He had been waiting all this time for his chance to strike. Taunting, he rushed towards her. Die, little one. Annie had almost no chance against such a powerful opponent. Is this really the end? Her heart was filled with powerless despair. Father, I did everything in my power. The image of the magician resurfaced in her memory. You must be lonely there? Don't worry, I will follow you soon. Activating her hidden shadow, she rushed towards the fourth-level warrior. She will fight to the end. But then, from the direction of the stairs located outside the city walls, a figure dressed in an amber glow jumped out. With a strong gust of wind, a yellow flash crashed straight into the fourth-level warrior. Combat skill. Charge. Bang. The Dark Elf commander was taken by surprise and was sent flying down the city wall by the impact. He fell straight to the ground and was completely immobilized after the fall. The amber silhouette immediately ran up to a special crossbow and fired from it. His shot was extremely accurate, aiming at a level 4 Dark Elf warrior. A second later, the level 4 commander was dead. Only then did the man dressed in an amber glow stop and look at Annie. A young voice rang out. Princess Annie, I have come to your aid. While he was speaking, people dressed in the same amber glow were ascending the stairs one after another. They were all warriors from the suicide squad sent from the Black Iron Fortress. The voice seemed familiar. Annie took a closer look and screamed, Min, what are you doing here? Annie was the daughter of a duke, and therefore King Leon was unusually polite and caring towards her. She grew up in the Imperial Palace, and Min, as the son of an earl, was also a member of the aristocracy of the Norton Kingdom. When Min was very young, he traveled a lot and once attended a ball in the Imperial Palace. That's why they both recognized each other. This is an order from General Alonso. The main forces are approaching. We will help you protect the city. At this time, Mink was already rushing towards another warrior of the third level. His words were like a soothing balm. Hearing that help was on the way, the defenders instantly became inspired. With the help of fourteen third-level warriors, they managed to quickly destroy the Dark Elves remaining on the city walls. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. At the city walls, Lord looked gloomily at the retreating Dark Elves. He took a deep breath and took his sword out of its sheath. His sword had a name, Bloody Pride. Forged personally by the great blacksmith Andrew, and enchanted by the great magician Mason of the Council of the Silver Moon. This powerful sword was personally given to him by the king when Lord became a sixth-level warrior. As soon as Lord drew his sword, a dense bloody fog covered everything around him. The time has come. Silence fell in the ranks of the elves under the walls. They began to retreat to such a distance that the archers of the human army could not reach them. Ten minutes later, Lord broke out of the elves' formation. The armor that he was wearing emitted a light red light. The same light, only brighter, came from his weapon. The light from the weapon was so thick that it seemed as if fire was about to burst out of it. He took a few steps forward and pointed his sword at the city. His low, deep voice rang out across the battlefield. Time to put an end to all this. Before he could finish, five dark elf generals, dressed in superior armor, stepped out from behind him. They glowed with different colors of battle aura. From the mere fact that their auras glowed brightly, one could conclude that they were all very powerful and strong. The vanguard of the Black Iron Garrison has already arrived. Reinforcements would also be here soon, leaving the Dark Elf armies with little time. Lord did not want to test Gladstone's strength. He wanted to gather all his forces and quickly take the city. Warriors, follow me to the attack. Lord rushed first. The generals covered him. One of them was right behind him, 
the other four scattered to different sides of the city walls and attacked them. Their opponents in the human army were mostly third-level warriors, only occasionally there were fourth-level fighters among them. Considering that the five generals attacked them from different directions, it was impossible to stop them. They were accompanied by countless dark elf warriors. If any of the generals captured part of the city walls, countless warriors from the dark elf army would break through and increase the territory by where they stood. The human army had such a pitiful defense against them, so they could take the city as soon as even one such weak point appeared. On the city walls, command had already been given to the strongest warrior among the human army, Minghu. His tall figure and the magical glow from the stone armor attracted attention to him. He gained respect among the human warriors as soon as he struck a blow to the strong dark elf general under the walls. As an assassin, Annie had already disappeared into the darkness. Only in the dark was she really good at fighting. Seeing Lord, Min felt trouble coming. As the head of the Black Iron Garrison, he had access to a list of the real Dark Elf generals. The one who stood in front of him glowed with a dark red battle aura, was 190 centimeters tall and was holding a blood-red broadsword in his hands. It was definitely Lord, the youngest marshal of the Dark Elf state called Prylink. Lord, better known as named Demon with bloody hands, he was famous for his cruelty and ruthlessness. When he was younger, he often attacked human villages, leaving only death behind him. Unfortunately, he not only brutally dealt with his victims, but also took pleasure in torturing them. Fall into his hands and you'll be done for. But Lord could afford to be so cruel. He, a powerful sixth-level warrior, also held an epic weapon, Bloody Pride. Mink was simply a fourth-level warrior. He would not have been able to resist Lord. But this was war. War does not allow anyone to choose their opponents. He was ready to fight until his last breath when he flew on the griffin to Gladstone that night. Thinking about this, he gave orders to the two third-level warriors behind him. The three of us will stop him, as much as possible. Yes, General! Doom was visible on the faces of the two warriors. They already knew that their death was near. The rest of you, spread out in groups of three. Each group is for one Dark Elf General. Annie, help them when you can. Min hurried to outline his plan as quickly as possible. The soldiers immediately obeyed. Seeing that Lord had entered the area where the crossbow charges could reach him, Min shouted, Shoot! Shoot the one with the red sword. Lord could not be confused with anyone. The arrows aimed at him. Loud shots were heard, and huge bolts flew towards Lord. Laughter, and that, saw all. Lord chuckled. His voice rang out clearly and loudly over the entire battlefield, which raised the morale of his army, and on the contrary, depressed the army of people. Lord did not even try to dodge the huge bolts that were flying at him. He deflected them by swinging his sword. Click, click click. It seemed as if the loud clanging would never end. Every time a bolt hit the sword, the bloody pride in Lord's hands flashed red, cutting the bolts in half. Min watched, his heart beating fast. Such power was much greater than his own strength. I'll probably be killed with one blow. Mink smiled bitterly. The Marshal of the Dark Elves was much more powerful than Alan's from the Black Iron Garrison. He had powerful magical weapons, which Alan so lacked. He was also younger and in better physical shape than Alan's. As his opponent got closer, he shouted, Shoot! Stop him! Shooters on the city walls attacked Lord. The whistling arrows rained down on him, leaving him with barely enough room to dodge. But Lord's defense was simply amazing. Perhaps he was still wary of crossbow bolts, but he paid no attention to ordinary arrows. Casually raising his hand to deflect a few arrows that posed some threat to him, he did not pay attention to the rest of the arrows, which simply bounced off his armor. Jin! Click! Arrows rushed towards him in a hail of thunder. Many arrows left white dots on Lord's armor. This alone gave away the fact that he was being attacked. Ordinary arrows did not do any damage to him. Lord quickly rushed away from the city, ending up about 130 feet from the walls. Then he stopped, letting his generals take command. Go ahead, I'll catch up with you, he commanded. He was the marshal, the leader and the soul of this army. Nothing could happen to him. Attacking the city alone would be too dangerous. Someone was needed to divert the fire. Yes, Marshal! The Dark Elf generals nodded, and without hesitation they continued the attack on the city walls. Phew. 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 The generals threw and hooked many hooks onto the top of the walls. A few seconds, and more than twenty strong ropes hung from the stone structures of the walls, which allowed the Dark Elf warriors to stream towards the city walls past Lord and climb on them. An ordinary average warrior of the human army was relatively equal to a dark elf warrior in a fight. 
Perhaps the human warriors had the advantage in terms of strength. However, the Dark Elves were more dexterous. They had equal chances of winning or losing in a fight with each other. But there were too many Dark Elf warriors on the city walls. Among them, there was even a level 4 Dark Elf warrior. And a level 6 warrior was watching the battle from below. Warriors from armies of men could not resist them. Their morale was at an all-time low, and it seemed as if their defenses were about to be breached. A level 4 enemy army warrior was approaching them. Knowing that he was making way for Lord, Mink could do nothing but rush towards him and try to stop him. He caught a glimpse of Annie in the shadows under the city walls. She'd already taken off her mask. The moment Min saw her, a girl with deep sadness and regret in her dark blue eyes, biting her lip, he suddenly realized something. He knew what she was thinking. When he tried to hold off the fourth level Dark Elf warrior, the marshal below would slip past him. And then no one will stop this powerful elf. He will brutally deal with the army of people. When Lord steps on the wall, Mink will definitely die. The entire Suicide Squad will die. Annie will die. And Gladstone will surrender into the hands of the enemy in a matter of seconds. And then the inhabitants of Gladstone, hundreds, thousands of people, will be brutally killed by this demon. This will be the most tragic night in the history of mankind. The situation was clear to him as day, but he could not do anything. Running past Annie, he said, Annie, run! Run away from this city! She grew up before his eyes, and he always saw his little sister in this proud, strong girl. If Gladstone was doomed, he would die with him. But he hoped Annie would continue to live. He didn't think Annie would shake her head in response. Her face expressed sadness and determination at the same time. She had long ago accepted her fate. When Minya's shield came into contact with the Dark Elf General's sword, the Dark Elf Marshal's mad laughter thundered from beneath the city walls. Ha 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 ha, let the flowers of fresh blood bloom. His figure became like a blood-red mist, and he rushed to the beginning of the wall, preparing to climb it. The warriors from the army of people felt despair. No one noticed that one of the rifle towers between the battlements of the city, a shadow penetrated. The shooters were stunned by the mere sight of a figure approaching straight towards them through the air. Fortunately, this young man was a man, otherwise they would have had to attack him. Shh. The young man smiled and signaled to the shooters not to make any noise. From behind him, a girl appeared, so beautiful that it seemed that she was not a person at all. The young man was Link, and the girl was none other than Selene in her human form. Given that she belonged to a special race, she could not take part in battle but she could protect Link. Standing on the shooting tower, Link could see how the Dark Elf Marshal prepared to climb the walls. Link's face remained calm, despite the rage raging within him, Manu. The corners of his lips turned up, and he raised his fire crystal staff. Sixth level warrior, right? Why don't you try my enhanced flame burst? Let the battle between magic and battle aura begin. Lord quickly descended to the beginning of the city wall. And once he was there, he pulled on the rope to gain energy and fly into the air. A hail of arrows rained down on him, and human soldiers threw down huge boulders to slow his ascent. How did they get it, Lord thought. He could ignore the arrows, but each boulder weighed several hundred pounds. They were hard to avoid. Even he would not be able to ignore the injury caused by such stones, but he still knew how to deal with them. As the boulder crashed down, Lord swung his sword, called Bloody Pride, with a furious cry. A beam of blinding red light spun the blow no more than a foot wide, fired from the sword and flew thirty feet into the air, slamming into a large falling rock. With a creak, the boulder, the width of a man, as waist, split into exactly two halves. But that was not all. The red light rose even higher and cut the soldiers in half who were standing behind the falling boulder. The beam could reach a distance of up to a hundred feet. He's using his aura. A true master. How can we fend off such a blow? The soldiers' faces showed painful frustration as they realized the inevitable end of the battle. Min was still fighting with one of the army's general's dark elves. His comrades tried to come to his aid, but could not do to the influx of dark elves under the city walls. Thus, Minghu had to defend himself. As soon as he saw the blinding red light, his heart began to beat faster. This is the end? Annie fought alongside two third-level warriors against the dark elf general. Seeing Lord using her aura so easily, she felt depressed and desperate again. She attacked her enemy as if she were possessed. She knew that they would not be able to hold their own against the Marshal of the Dark Elf Army, even with the help of the Suicide Squad. All they could do now was try to delay the Dark Elves' invasion. However, the soldiers of the Dark Elves' Army reacted differently to this. The demonstration of their Marshal's invincible power increased their morale, and they began to attack as fiercely as never before. 
Up to this point, everything was as Lord expected. But then suddenly something happened. A dark blue light appeared from a nearby rifle tower. At first it was barely noticeable, but it became brighter and brighter, almost blinding those who looked at it. Despite the dark night, it, like the sun, illuminated the entire horizon. Another moment, and it flashed from the rifle tower like a bright flash of lightning and left white circles in the eyes of everyone who saw it. Eh? Hey, what was it? Lord asked loudly. This flash suddenly struck at the most important moment, just when he could not land another blow with his aura scythe. The next moment, a blue ball of light crashed into him. Boom! Deafening explosions, blinding flashes and blue flames were reflected across the, the entire sky. The battlefield was as bright as day due to the light that the flames cast. Seeing the terrifying attack, Lord, frozen in the air, put all his remaining strength into the battle aura. The battle aura gave the warrior amazing strength and agility, and despite the fact that it did not protect against physical attacks, the aura provided very good protection against magical attacks. Lord easily avoided the possibility of being roasted alive and turned into ashes, which the Dark Elves' warriors could not, but he had to fear not only flame. Lord felt a wave of powerful force crash into him in the scorching waves of flame. It was huge, colossal, much stronger, something he could deflect. Moreover, he had nowhere to go, because he was still in the air. Powerful shockwaves from the explosion. The flame explosion spell wasn't just about the explosion. There was a huge wave of energy behind him. Even despite his outstanding physical form and strong armor with protection from magic, Lord could not resist this attack. He felt the obvious force of the explosion. At that moment, the elf felt that he was sick, as if he was swollen from the inside, as if the blow had affected all his organs. He was wounded. Lord was thrown a hundred feet, and with a dull sound he fell to the ground. Dust swirled around him. The force with which he fell left a crater in the ground. The battle between magic and battle aura, between Lord, who was a sixth-level warrior, and the enhanced fourth-level spell, Flame Explosion, ended not in the Dark Elf's favor. Why did this happen? The reason was simple. In the world of Firamon, mages were much more powerful than warriors. When mages took energies of all types from the outside, and did not use only internal mana, they could call on any creatures to help. For example, they could use nature magic, soul power for mystic magic, and summoning magic. Flame Explosion was a nature magic spell. During its casting, a frame of mana first appeared, into which a large amount of fire was collected, which condensed into a very hot ball of flame. Since the mana was also supplemented with energy from the outside, the magic that was obtained from this spell was naturally much greater. The warriors acted on the contrary. They could only rely on internal mana. The first called upon the powers of heaven and earth to help him, while the second could only rely on his own strength. And of course, the former had an advantage. If the warrior and the mage met face to face, the warrior's aura would disappear after a few spells, and the mage would still have enough mana left. Lord, being a sixth-level warrior, withstood one hit from the flame explosion, wasting almost a third of his aura. Maybe it wasn't fair, but such is life. The magicians fought wisely. The spells they cast were always the most powerful in the entire Fearman world. However, Lord remained conscious. Even though he was wounded, he knew that as a marshal he could not afford to show his weakness. He immediately stood up. Which of the mages attacked me on the sly? He shouted decisively, clearly not as a wounded man would shout. His pupils constricted as he saw the tragedy unfolding under the city walls. The dark elves, who had been victorious before, gathered more than a thousand of their troops under the city walls, where they were in range shockwave from the flame explosion. Ordinary soldiers, not protected by aura, were only slightly stronger than an ordinary person, so they were defenseless against a powerful fourth-level spell. The waves of flame only reached them. There were more than three hundred burning corpses and scattered body parts on the ground. Lord, although he was strong in spirit and known as Bloody Hand due to his cruelty and ruthlessness, was still trembling. He only brought twenty thousand soldiers. The fact that three hundred of them died in one moment hung over him like a dark cloud. Only then did he see the magician who attacked him on the sly. He stood on the rifle tower, still casting spells. A seemingly endless chain of bright blue small balls of flame flew from his staff. Each small ball burst into flames that spread over a foot and claimed the life of at least one warrior of the Dark Elf army. Lord immediately recognized this magical staff. It was Holmes's fire crystal staff. It was that young magician who ran away. But he is so young. 
Where does he get such strength? Lord didn't understand. The magicians were strong, but this power was achieved through years of hard training and practice. The powerful mages from the Silver Moon Magic Council in the Prowling Kingdom were all middle-aged or elderly elves. Considering this magician's young age, he could reach the maximum status of a second-level magus. And even this was already considered an achievement that only the smartest of the smartest could achieve. But the flame explosion spell he used was simply amazing in its power and scope. It could be compared to a spell of at least the fifth level. How was this possible? Even as Lord stood frozen in amazement, another group of Dark Elf army warriors were attacked by this mage, Fireballs. Their loud, piercing screams stunned Lord. As he looked at the young magic caster casting spells as if his mana was infinite, Lord knew that he would have to kill this mage if he managed to capture the city today. The marshal's wounds were healing very quickly. It took less than half a minute for most of his wounds, which were not severe to begin with, to heal. The only problem was that he only had a little more than half of his battle aura left. It could not be restored quickly. And yet, Lord was confident that he could defeat the mage even with the remaining half of his battle aura. He was too careless. This time, he will be more careful. On the city wall, Min, with the help of Link's fireball, was eventually able to defeat the Dark Elf, a level 4 warrior, whom he was fighting. He watched with his mouth agape in awe as Link confidently cast his spells. Since when did such a young, powerful magician appear in the kingdom? Mink thought to himself. That spell he did was flame explosion, right? Min wasn't sure about this, since this spell was more powerful than all the flame explosions he had ever seen. Annie saw Link too. Her eyes, full of surprise and joy from seeing the young mage calmly cast spells, turned red. The soldiers on the wall perked up. Such amazing magic, performed by such a powerful mage, and of their race too. Link easily knocked back the Dark Elf Marshal. Finally, they had a chance to win. Panic began in the ranks of the Dark Elves. They were terrified by the flame explosion that sent their marshal crashing to the ground. Many of them jumped off the wall in fear, despite the risk of breaking something. Others simply turned around and ran away. The only ones left from the Dark Elf army on the city walls were the fourth-level Dark Elf generals, and even they were scared. In a battle against magic, they would all have to take a defensive position. Lord saw how the morale of the Dark Elf warriors was rapidly falling and his voice resounded across the entire battlefield again. My warriors run away from this mage. Distribute! His thunderous cry rang out over the battlefield, and the elf himself activated his battle aura at full power. The bloodlight emanating from it became brighter than usual, and its speed became limitless. He rushed like a red arrow towards the archery tower where Link stood. This mage's spells were powerful, but their power was less dense than Lord's. When he gets to the mage and releases his aura, he will be able to take the mage's head off with one blow. Link looked down from the shooting tower at Lord, who was aiming at him. He calmly asked Selene, Can you stop him? Selene? His graceful eyebrows frowned. He is stronger than me. I can only delay him for no more than three strikes of his sword. Hearing this, Link was convinced that Selene was probably level five. It would be difficult for her to fight against Lord, who had reached the sixth level. She must have been able to block three of his blows just because she had demon blood flowing in her. He tested his mana. Thanks to the rapid mana recovery he received from the Whisper Magic Potion, he now had 1,010 mana points, enough for three more uses of Flame Burst. He thought about it, and almost immediately a solution came to his mind. It will be enough to detain him just once. He turned to the archers on the tower. Get out of here, and tell all the warriors to leave too. Link's flame burst earlier cemented his status. The archers hastened to carry out his orders. The human warriors quickly left the rifle tower. Lord had already reached the bottom of the city wall. Seeing that their marshal was safe and sound, the warriors of the Dark Elf army began to attack again, following Lord. However, they moved much more slowly than before. A feeling of crushing uncertainty and fear of terrifying magic crept in. After all, the charred bodies that were still burning in front of them eloquently showed the amazing power of magic. As long as this mage loomed on the horizon, they felt fear. What if the mage uses flame explosion again? Lord rushed to one of the ropes and quickly climbed up the wall along it. The other Dark Elf warriors followed suit, taking some of the attacks their marshal had suffered. The human warriors on the wall above were throwing huge boulders off the wall to prevent them from climbing up. This time, Lord dodged and dodged the attacks without using his aura scythe. He had learned a good lesson last time. He must be on alert and watch out for the mage's attacks. As he climbed the rope, Link quietly explained his plan to Selene. 
He spoke quietly, but clearly and clearly. Obviously, the young man remained calm, despite the fact that a strong enemy was coming towards him. Celine listened to him carefully, and her eyes flashed brightly. Stealing a glance at the guy next to her, she saw his black eyes as dark as her own. At that moment, these eyes seemed deep and clear to her, full of a cold glow, like a blade in icy water. It was the light of wisdom. Celine, his heart trembled. The guy who seemed ordinary before suddenly became very handsome. Do you understand? Link asked, having finished explaining. Yes? Celine nodded. At that moment, Lord reached the top of the city wall and defeated the human warriors surrounding him with just a few blows of his sword. Then he headed towards the rifle tower. Melee grad! Link's voice was weak, as if an ordinary soldier was heading towards him, and not a mortal enemy. The white light that flew from his staff enveloped the shooting tower in a hailstorm. He caused the hail not to injure Lord, but to limit visibility. Lord realized that he could not accurately determine the position of the magician due to the strong hurricane between them. He will no longer be able to use his aura scythe so easily. If his aura scythe fails to hurt the mage, he will waste a lot of his aura and will have to go on the defensive. Hmm. Do you think this can stop me? Lord thought with a grin. He could kill the mage even if he didn't have to use his aura scythe. And he was not afraid that the mage would use flame burst again. This time, he will be ready. He neutralizes this attack with a blow from his sword as soon as it reaches him. Lord was getting closer but the mage did not take a single step from the moment he used small hail. All the soldiers on the battlefield turned their gaze to the battle between the Dark Elf Marshal and the Human Mage. The pace of the battle slowed down noticeably because of this. The hope that their marshal would kill the Human Mage grew in the hearts of the Dark Elf warriors. But the human soldiers began to worry. Lord was too fast. People couldn't keep up with him. Since they could not help, they could only watch the battle. Min glanced at the rifle tower while fighting with the Dark Elf warrior. The silence and inaction of the magician worried him. Has he run out of mana? He's so young. He must have put all his strength into the flame explosion and is now exhausted. But he cannot lose. If the magician dies, the morale of the human army will die with him, and their defense will collapse. Mink understood everything that was happening on the battlefield, but he was only an observer who had no opportunity to change anything. It was hurt. A feeling of absolute helplessness took over him. Annie reacted instantly. Grabbing her dagger, she took off with her speed dash and ran towards the tower, not paying attention to what was happening next to her. Even if it gave Link even a split second, she wanted to buy it even at the cost of her own life. Her life belonged to him. The girl had already owed the young magician twice, and yet she was too slow. She couldn't reach the Dark Elf Level 6 warrior, who was moving at top speed. In the blink of an eye, Lord reached the shooting tower. Pushing off with the momentum of his power, he flew into the air. The sword he was holding, bloody pride, shone brighter than ever. In the air, he was ready to use his aura scythe at any moment. At the same time, Link jumped out of the small city in the other direction. He moved quickly like a dart. The first level spell, Agility of the Cat. Landing, Link cast another spell on the shooting tower. Vector Barrier. Boom! The rifle tower shook. The rebounding force threw Link away from the tower. At this time, his staff glowed blue. He cast another spell. This time, it was the second flame explosion. But Lord, being in the middle of the small city, could not see Link. In fact, as soon as he reached the tower, he came under serious attack. A glowing sword with a blue crystal stabbed into him. He was amazingly fast. During the attack, closely welded lightning sparks gathered around the approaching sword. This strike was amazingly powerful. Ha! Who is this? Lord. Taken by surprise, had no other choice. He took out his sword to repel the attack. Clink. The explosion followed the clash of swords. Lord felt his wrist go numb, but he managed to block his opponent's attack. Selene was not as strong as him. Having won this duel, Lord finally made his way through the storm to the rifle tower. The second level small hail was just ordinary gusts of wind with frost. It simply could not penetrate his defense. Its only function was to limit the enemy's visibility and it fulfilled this function. Where is the magician? Lord was perplexed. In front of him stood a girl from a race of people of unearthly beauty. She was holding the same sword that stopped him a few seconds ago. Who are you? Lord asked curiously. Selene did not answer and used her blood talent, level 5 obsidian shield. Like all blood magic, this spell was imprinted deeply into every drop of her blood. She used it almost immediately and a powerful crystal shield appeared around her in literally one-tenth of a second. 
Lord was amazed. First hold back the attack and then hide behind such a shell? What kind of fighting style was this? During this battle, a dark blue beam of light cut through the night sky and hit the shooting tower directly. Boom! Another incredible explosion of flame rang out in the air. The shooting tower on the city wall was all sparks and flames. The fire raged. Stones flew out of it. Two figures flew out of the chaos. One of them was Selene. Her obsidian shield took most of the damage while the rest was absorbed by her demonic aura. She was ready for the flame explosion. Having received a jolt of energy from the explosion, she stayed as far away from Lord as she could. The other figure was, of course, Lord. Faced with the sudden attack of the flame explosion in order to defend himself, he was forced to fully use his battle aura again, expending a good portion of his remaining power. Falling in the air, Lord felt his aura weaken sharply, its power being only a third of what it was before. The elf broke into a cold sweat. His aura could end at any moment. It would not be enough for a further attack on the city. He will have to stop, otherwise he will simply die in Gladstone due to the depletion of his aura. If this happens, his name will be branded with shame forever. Being a warrior, Lord could die in battle, but not such a shameful death. Having fallen, he finally saw the magician which had previously disappeared from his field of vision. Like himself, the magician flew. However, the magician was already about to land. Judging by his trajectory, it could be assumed that the young spellcaster would land on the city walls. The magician also looked at his opponent, those deep, dark, bottomless eyes. Lord saw no emotion or tension in them. Absolutely calm mage, I don't stand a chance. Just looking at the magician, Lord lost all hope of crushing him but the magician was not going to let him go just like that. There was a blue glow around the magician, staff. He cast a flame explosion that thundered over 130 feet away from Lord. Lord's heart began to beat faster. The flame explosion did not travel in a straight line. Lord couldn't predict where he would fly. Damn. He didn't dare use his aura scythe, as it consumed a lot of power. If the elf used it, he would have almost no aura left. Moreover, if he missed and the mage used another flame burst, he would be in mortal danger. He could not use his aura scythe on this mage, even if he had enough aura. They were too far apart. There was just over 150 feet between them, and Lord's aura scythe had a range of 100 feet. Lord had no choice but to prepare to defend himself from the attack. Boom! The flame explosion hit Lord directly. It was as if the sun had suddenly appeared. The flames lit up the entire battlefield. Lord's body was thrown out of the flames like an arrow and it fell with a roar 200 feet from the point of impact. The elf received several wounds from each flame explosion that rained down on him. This time he used almost all of his aura. As he landed, he felt a bitter taste in his throat. Unable to control himself, Lord opened his mouth and vomited a decent amount of blood. Immediately, the Dark Elves' warriors gathered around him. Their faces darkened at the sight of Marshall, who was in such a state. Marshall, are you okay? Lord, as closest advisors approached him and helped him stand up, I am fine. Lord stopped his advisors and stood up himself, but this time his movements were slower, his voice became weaker, but his wounds were not weak. Rising to his feet, he looked at the city walls of Gladstone, where the magician stood silently. The fire crystal staff, which he held in his hands, glowed with fire, and his robe seemed to shimmer with a clear magical light. The caster's face expressed courage and indifference. At that moment, the young mage looked like a god descended from heaven. Suddenly. A loud horn sound was heard coming from the northern part of Gladstone City. This sound, although it was harsh and cold, pierced the hearts of the human soldiers. They rejoiced, and the Dark Elves were seized with panic. Reinforcements for the human army are already here. At the same time, the darkest part of the day before dawn has ended. A golden ray of light appeared over the horizon, and the walls of Gladstone were bathed in gold. Don don don. It was the ringing of a bell. It was exactly five o'clock in the morning. The long night had finally ended, bringing with it a new day. We retreat, Lord commanded. He let out a long sigh and his pride turned into a deep sense of humility. Finally, a new day began. While the Dark Elf army retreated, Link also sighed, but this time with relief. The effect of the whisper of magic was soon to wear off. He could already feel the exhaustion creeping into his body. He would be in a state of magical weakening for three months, which left him with only one option to seriously reconsider his plans for this time. Last night he attracted too much attention to himself. The Dark Elves definitely won't let him go just like that after what he did. Surely he would have to face countless attempts on his life from the hand of death during these three months.
Gladstone was located very close to the Black Forest. The further he was from the city, the safer he would be. Looking at Annie Abel, Link became happy. He not only saved the city of Gladstone, but also kept the future legendary assassin safe, thereby truly changing the fate of the Firaman continent. Annie approached him. Link smiled at her and nodded. Then, as he jumped from the city walls, Annie watched him with a look of shock as he cast Vector Barrier once again. The ricochet from this spell caused Link to land in one of the small alleys of Gladstone City. He still had the effect of the cat's agility spell, so he landed softly. Link completed his mission and got what he wanted. Every second now spent in Gladstone meant greater danger for him, and there was no need for goodbyes. Celine was already waiting for him in the alley. We were leaving, Link said, smiling. They agreed on this in advance. Celine nodded. They walked along the alley and then turned onto a small path. When they sneaked out of the city and no one was visible nearby, Celine took on her demonic form. Preparing for the long flight they would have to take, she approached Link. He tried his best to remain calm, because flying in such a position was very dangerous. Spreading her wings, Celine soared into the skies. Gladstone did not yet know about Link's disappearance. They were still looking for the powerful magician who saved their city. Of course, they found no one. Tales of the magician spread throughout Gladstone. Someone said that he was a messenger of the God of Light. Others claimed that he was simply a magical genius. There were also those who thought that he was a master of fire. All these versions were just guesses. The truth had already been hidden by the sands of time. The only thing people knew was that this mage was from Fleming's Academy. Therefore, a large, tall monument was erected in the flower gardens of the restored academy. It was a statue of a young man. His facial features were unclear. In a gray robe and with a magic staff in his hands, he looked into the distance. The statue was called the Guardian. Below was a modest inscription. He saved Gladstone. But all this was yet to come. As Selene flew over the border of Gladstone, two new notifications appeared in front of Link. The first was the following. Mission accomplished. Save Gladstone. The player receives 100 Omni points. Super. And the second one read, The effect of Whisper Magic has been exhausted. The player will be in a state of magical weakening. All character parameters are reduced by 90% for three months. Horror. Link sighed quietly and checked his condition. Link Morani. Noble. Normal mage level. 4 mana recovery rate. 0 0.92 maximum mana reserve. 24.1 weapon. Fire Crystal Staff, Greater Magic Skills, None Condition, Magic Weakening, His Mana Recovery Rate and Maximum Reserve. Mana return to the level of a regular Mage Apprentice, and they will remain like this for the next three months. Oh crap. And although he had the status of a level 4 Mage, it was only written in the name, and mostly only thanks to the Flame Burst he had used earlier. The level of a Mage on the Firaman Continent equated to the highest level of magic he could perform. In truth, Link only had a rudimentary knowledge of magic theory. He had a long way to go to become a great archmage. Are you sure you want to go to Eastern Bay Academy? Selene asked. Yes? Link nodded in response. He looked through many books on basic magic in the Fleming's Academy library. He had to be able to quickly read and absorb information. Once he knows enough about the basics of magic, he will apply to enroll in the Academy. And then he would probably not lag behind the others. But there was also another important reason to enroll in the Eastern Bay Academy. In the game, over the past six months after the change of the Blood Moon, a terrible incident occurred. The demon Thurlovs escaped from his three-century imprisonment at the Eastern Bay Academy. Turlwes was a real demon from the depths. He possessed almost legendary strength. The only reason he was kept captive was because one man, a magical genius known as Bryant, had defeated him. Bryant managed to achieve legend status despite having low mana density at his age. He fought long and brutally with Turlwes. The battle lasted two days and two nights. Its result was a deep valley, where the Eastern Bay Academy was now located. However, now the powerful mage had not been alive for many years. Turlwes still possessed the impressive strength of a level 8 demon, even though the magical barriers that Bryant had created 300 years ago had weakened him. Because of his escape, a lot of blood had been spilled in the Academy. Dean, a 7th level master mage, at the cost of his own life, attempted to stop Turlwes with the 8th level spell demon cage. And still, less than half of the academy, Issa magicians survived, and the valley was razed to the ground. This event became the most significant since the change of the blood moon. It was called Magic Tribulation. Two strikes in quick succession knocked out the Norton Kingdom. In each subsequent battle, 
it lost to the armies of the prowling kingdom. In just three years, the fate of the once very powerful kingdom began to hang in the balance. He had no choice but to move the center of power. The monarchy moved south to take refuge with the Free Trade Confederacy. However, the fallen Annie Abel killed King Leon three years later, which caused the complete destruction of the Kingdom of Norton. Therefore, the Free Trade Confederation, which was previously protected by the army of the Norton Kingdom, had no choice but to come face to face with the forces of the Dark Elves. Indeed, the future of the human race seemed very dark. Considering the operating mode of the game server, any missions related to the demon Turlwes would be very important to Link. By completing them, he could earn a lot of Omni points. Okay? But I still do not understand you, Selene replied. Despite this, Selene held Link as she headed north. The Dean of East Bay Academy is Earl Anthony. He's a level 7 Master Mage, she began to explain to him. Powerful rune barriers have been erected around the Academy. Even the Forest of Gerwent is guarded by a tower. She recognizes any dark magic. It will be very difficult for me to go unnoticed there, so I can only take you to the edge of the forest. Link didn't expect this. He thought that Selene could come to the academy with him. If so, then they will have to separate. Feeling the soft, warm body behind him, Link, full of doubt, remained silent. Sensing this, Selene, laughing, remarked, I would have to leave even if there weren't on these rune barriers. You know, ever since I showed my true form, my father's servants have been pursuing me again. We need to get rid of them first? Be careful, Link grumbled. Yes, it was not the best time for romance. Selene was constantly in danger. He should get stronger as soon as possible. Don't worry, I'm used to it. They are complete idiots, Selene giggled. During the flight, they chatted. Selene flew very quickly. Half an hour later, a large space filled with rubber trees appeared below them. This was Gerwent Forest, also known as the Courtyard of the Gods. The lush green trees and bushes, dappled rays of sunlight, chirping birds and the smell of flowers amazed them. A wide, straight path stretched through the forest. Near it, clearings could be seen here and there. This was forest land. A little deeper, in the middle of the forest, was a bustling, noisy town, the city of River Bay. A clear stream flowed right in the middle of it. Up there, Link felt his heart fill with joy albeit with a tinge of regret, at such a picturesque view. In Legends, the Dark Elves used some kind of god-level item to conquer the South. When the Dark Elves reached Gerwent Forest, East Bay Academy, which had just been rebuilt, was forced to use strong magical barriers to prevent the Dark Elf army from passing through. Caught between two forces, the beautiful forest of Gerwent turned to ashes. This time Gladstone was saved, and Annie was alive. Will this change history? Link had no idea. But he had a vague feeling that all he had changed were some minor, small details. The main branch of the story was not so simple. Soon they reached the western entrance to the forest where Selene landed. This is where I will leave you. Thank you very much. Link smiled. He didn't want to part with her, but he knew that in order to walk alongside the demon princess in the future, he would first have to catch up with her. Selene was also sentimental. Deep in her heart, she saw a true friend in Link and the girl was worried about him. After all, he was in a state of magical weakening. Gritting her teeth, she pulled out three feathers from her wings. She winced in pain every time she had to pull the feather out. She gave the soft feathers to Link. Take them with you. If you are in danger, just burn one feather and I will come to save you. Link took her blue-black feathers. A notification appeared in front of him. Feathers of the Demon Princess Selene Flander quality. Epic effect. Summons the demon princess to your aid if you burn one feather. Notes. Symbol of friendship. Link carefully pressed the feathers to his chest, causing a slight blush to appear on Selene's cheeks. I'll remember. This, he said. Selene took out a pendant made of mystical silver, a pendant that provides additional storage space. This is where most of Gladstone's books are located. You will need to hide your new moon stick and fire crystal staff. You can put them here. Items that expand your inventory were very expensive. Such a pendant probably cost her more than 2,000 gold coins, but Link really needed it, as did the books inside it. He was in a hurry at Gladstone and didn't have time to look through the magic books, but now they would be very useful to him. He was pleasantly surprised that Selene prepared all this especially for him. You? I'll take it. Link wasn't... shy. It's just that the most generous services do not require gratitude. Selene watched as Link put on the pendant. Then she suddenly walked up to him and kissed him on the forehead, then took a few steps back, 
her smooth white face turned red. My friend, I must leave you. Link felt a tingling sensation on his forehead. He nodded in amazement. When he came to his senses, Celine was no longer there. He felt as if she had taken a part of his heart with her. He touched the pendant that rested on his chest, as if Celine was still with him. Feeling strangely calm from this, he stepped onto the forest path. The wide forest path was also known as the King's Path. It went northeast through the town of River Bay, surrounded on all sides by the Gerwent Forest, past the East Bay Academy, and led to the capital of the Kingdom of Norton, the City of Springs. This was the only road along which one could get from the south to the capital. Must? Maybe the City of Springs is in chaos right now? Link sighed. In the game, the Kingdom of Norton fell apart not only due to attacks on it, but also due to internal strife. The capital was in a state of chaos, mainly due to the fact that King Leon and his younger brother, the Iron Duke, were facing off. The chaos from the capital quickly spread throughout the country. For example, the beautiful forest of Gerwent, peace and tranquility reigned in it. But this was only an external impression, and in fact, danger awaited him inside. And Link encountered this danger twelve miles after he entered the royal path. A thin, bony old horse was lying near the road, with a knife cut on its throat. The blood had not yet dried, so she most likely died not long ago. Listening carefully, Link heard a noise coming from the trees near the road. It seemed like someone was fighting. At that moment, a new notification appeared in front of Link. Mission active, help and rescue mission details. Rescue the old horse's owner reward for completion. Five Omni mission points. Letting his curiosity get the better of him, Link accepted the task without hesitation. Then, using the silence spell on himself, he followed the sounds that came from the depths of the forest. After two or three minutes, Link saw the battlefield through a sparse thicket of rubber trees. Seeing what was in front of him, Link felt his heart begin to beat more often. Three robbers in masks made of blood-red fabric attacked a guy of about seventeen or eighteen. His face was indescribably beautiful. Okay, if a person's features were a little more handsome than normal appearance. But this guy's features could not be described with the word, a little. He had gray hair the color of dark storm clouds, eyes of a deep, dark green shade, and almost perfect facial features. In this regard, he was worthy of any compliment. His name popped up in front of Link on the game interface. Half-Elf Eliard. Eliard, a legendary character born from the connection of a human and a high elf, has an amazing talent for magic. In the first twenty years of the game, darkness consumed everything world. But at the same time, this half-elf grew up and was brought up, who reached the title of legend. If we talk about the world of Firamin without taking into account the players, mentioning only the built-in NPCs, Eliard could be called a typical immortal hero. Of course, at the moment, the journey of this genius it hasn't started yet. So far, he was just an ordinary guy. Even though he had some fighting skills in one-on-one -on -one combat, he was still in bad shape. Having come face to face with three ordinary bandits whose skills were the same as those of average street bandits, Eliard managed to dodge here and there, and a couple of times he was on the verge of death. Blood flowed from multiple wounds throughout his body. It seemed like he would fall at any minute. Link had a mission to complete. Seeing that Eliard was almost captured, he rushed to the attack. Only a couple of robbers attacked the half-elf. On each of them, Link conjured a fireball from behind a tree, without even showing his face. And although his magic was weak and he cast spells without a wand, the fireballs were still a powerful blow. Link used his old trick. A fireball exploded next to the ears of each of the three bandits. Bam! 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 One of the bandits fell unconscious, and the other two began to stagger as if drunk. Elliard was fast and agile, and he also knew some martial arts techniques. However, he could not be called a bloodthirsty fighter. So he struck each bandit in the neck with a slashing motion, knocking them out for good. He then glanced in the direction where Link was standing. Not without caution, he shouted, Mr. Magician, thank you for your help. He was too cute, too handsome. Because of his mixed blood, Eliard was left in an orphanage, and he grew up encountering many falsehoods along the way. Many people had evil thoughts about him because of his exceptional appearance. He was practically sold to noble people as an escort. The goal of the three bandits who attacked him was obvious. They wanted to kidnap him and sell him. Because of his past experience, he was very wary of help from strangers. The magician appeared just at the most important moment, when the robbers practically took him prisoner. There was something strange about it. Maybe he was too suspicious. But it was this suspicion that had helped him survive until now. 
Not knowing what thoughts were spinning in Elliard's head, Link came out from behind the tree and smiled at him. No? Why? A couple of gestures. And that does it. I'm Link. Can I also know your name? Elliard hesitated. But after all, the mage saved him. So he said his real name? My name is Elliard. Link smiled. He remembered a random secret mission he had once heard about. People on the game forum said that a young and incredibly powerful NPC mage had appeared somewhere near East Bay Academy. This NPC would appear randomly, offering the player missions in which they could collect various alchemical ingredients and materials. These missions were not difficult, but rather tedious. By completing the last part of his quest, the player could receive epic magic crystals from the mage. In the game, good and excellent quality items were common, but epic quality items were considered precious. Even during the next 20 years, when the world's mana density was much higher than normal, it was still considered an achievement to be able to obtain a full set of epic quality armor. The NPC mage was Elliard. All those who completed the secret mission said that the half-elf was a quiet, generous guy who returned kindness for kindness. Link knew that the stories must have been true, since Elliard had such clear eyes and gentle features. It would probably be good to befriend a talented character who would become a legendary. But Elliard looked wary. Most likely Link will have to use a couple of tricks to win him over? Okay, I'll memorize. And now I also need to leave because you are safe? Link said goodbye to Elliard as a mage and turned to leave. He knew that Elliard would stop him. And even if he doesn't stop him, they will meet again at East Bay Academy. After all, Elliard had to attend school in order to learn magic. Wait, Elliard really stopped him? Mr. Link, are you a magician from the Eastern Bay Academy? Link stopped and shook his head. Not yet. But I'm going there to learn magic. You? Elliard? His dark green eyes ran up and down Link's figure. He saw a pair of dull eyes, which was a result of his magical weakness state. A plain gray robe and only a slight hint of mana around him. This mage was probably just an ordinary mage apprentice. As far as he knew, East Bay Academy had very strict admission rules. After all, the Academy was a place where important people from all over the Norton Kingdom gathered. Only geniuses or real mages were accepted into it. This Link knew some spells, but he clearly did not have enough talent. Surely he will not be accepted into the Academy and will be deployed right on the doorstep. What? Is there something wrong? Link asked, smiling. Sir, I heard that East Bay Academy has very strict rules for selecting applicants. I'm afraid that you won, uh, be able to pass, Elliard said carefully, trying his best not to offend Link, Sis self-respect. Now he was not so suspicious of him. Link understood what Elliard was talking about. His lips twisted into a crooked smile. Due to the effect of the weak magic state, others could tell that he had no magical talent just by looking at him. I took a few books about magic with me. First, I'll try to get into the academy. If I don't succeed, I'll learn a little myself, and when I get better at it, I'll try again. Link. Smile was sunny and cheerful. At that moment, Elliard felt pity. In his eyes, Link was someone who was not blessed with talent, even though his heart lay in magic. There were many such people in the kingdom, but there was an obvious difference between expectations and reality. Many of them studied magic with enthusiasm, but in the end it turned out that they were simply wasting their youth in nothing. After thinking about this, Elliard said, I was also going to go to East Bay Academy. Why don't we go together? The young mage apprentice saved his life. He owed Link. I can help him with magic even if I can. To help him get into the Academy, Elliard thought. About himself, he was sure that he could get into East Bay Academy thanks to his amazing talent in magic. All the mages he met said the same thing, and he himself could feel it. Link's heart jumped out of his chest with joy. Everything went as he planned. He managed to get closer to Elliard, and now the glow of immortal luck appeared above him. Following Elliard was definitely a good idea. A notification appeared in front of Link. The mission is completed. The player receives five Omni Points. The follow-up mission is activated. Mission. Admission mission details. Enter the Eastern Bay Academy and study magic there. Master a level zero spell. Reward. Five Points Omni. Great. Smirking. Link accepted the mission. They walked together. They both wanted to enter the Eastern Bay Academy. The robbers left many wounds on Elliard's body, however. In terms of their skills, they were not far from ordinary street thieves. The wounds were not deep, and the blood stopped flowing from them, even without the use of first aid. Having bandaged the wounds, Elliard changed into clean clothes, which he took from the packs that had fallen from his old horse. He looked much better now? Here. This is a regular healing potion, but your wounds will heal faster if you drink it. 
Link said, taking out a bottle. He found it in the alchemy tower of the Magic Academy in Gladstone. He only had two. Elliard hesitated. He had just met Link and still couldn't just drink what the man he had just met was giving him. He looked at Link intently. Seeing how openly and calmly the magician behaved, he relaxed a little. After all, it was an act of kindness, and the half-elf couldn't just refuse it. He took the bottle and took a sip from it. Feeling that everything was in order, he drank it to the bottom. Thank you. Elliard felt a pleasant warmth envelop his stomach. At that very moment, he realized that it was in fact nothing more than a potion of excellent quality. You are welcome, Link replied happily. Let's move on. The Academy of the Eastern Bay was located in the northeast of the Gerwent Forest. They entered the forest from the west, which meant they had to go through more than half of Gerwent Forest. Luckily, it wasn't that big, only thirty or forty miles wide. In addition, the King's Path was paved smoothly, which of course made their journey much easier. They chatted along the way. After three or four hours, they had already become better acquainted with each other and the town of River Cove appeared before them in the distance. In Elliard's eyes, Link, despite the fact that he was an ordinary mage apprentice, seemed to be an interesting, positive, and generous guy. Under the sun, they talked about almost everything. Often it seemed that Link could share his thoughts and stick to his own thread of reasoning. Such smart people are really rare. Because of this, he almost forgot about his own awkward situation. Yes, he was now quite pathetic, especially when it came to money. As an orphan, he never received support from others in his quest to learn magic. He had no choice but to try his best and take whatever job he could find. He barely saved enough to pay for his studies at the Magic Academy. As for his other expenses, he could only save money so as not to start starving. I am so lucky to have such a friend now. Elliard was happy. Link felt the same. Elliard was truly a child prodigy. Thanks to his magnificent mind, he picked up many jokes from Earth on the fly when Link told them to him. But there was still one thing that still bothered Link. He looked quite ordinary. His body was weak. Wearing an ordinary grey robe and without his wand, he looked like an old peasant on the streets. Elliard, on the other hand, was stunningly handsome, tall and in good shape. The ordinary clothes Elliard wore could not hide his magnificence. Link looked like Elliard's servant as they stood next to each other. Now I am a leaf of a tree, against which the flowers look even brighter, Link lamented. And in fact, Elliard attracted the attention of all the people in the town of River Bay, especially he was popular among the ladies. Their eyes burned like those of wolves as they followed him with their gaze. But Link was not noticed at all. At the hotel, the owner of the establishment approached Elliard and asked him, Do you want to stay here for the night, sir? Elliard nodded. Gritting his teeth, he paid for two rooms. Link was his savior. He couldn't afford to pay him. By this time, Link knew everything about Elliard's living situation from their conversations. He stepped forward and placed a gold coin on the counter. Your two best rooms, please. And thanks. Turning to Elliard, he casually told him, and Don argue, take this as my gratitude for those drinks. He knew Elliard was tight on money, and although Elliard expressed his desire to travel at night, they came to this inn because Link had not slept properly for two days. The so-called gratitude was given in such a way as not to offend Elliard in any way. At first this puzzled Elliard, and then he understood. His heart filled with gratitude, and he nodded. And although he did not say a word, he remembered this favor for the future. The years he spent traveling showed him the coldness and evil of this world. Pure good intentions like Link's were very rare, and he remembered each of them, hoping that one day he could repay his debt in full. They had dinner in the inn hall. Link paid the bill, and they both returned to their rooms. Returning to the room, Link took a bath and went to bed but he tossed and turned and could not sleep. He decided to see what Celine put in the pendant she gave him. This pendant was too expensive and important for Link to show it to everyone. He could only look at it when he was alone. His consciousness looked into the pendant and found itself in a dark gray place, about thirty feet high and thirty feet wide. Heaps of objects were flying around. The first thing he saw was a stack of magic books, about sixty-four in number. The most valuable books of Fleming's Magic Academy were collected here. There were also several low-level potions. There were not many of them, seven or eight bottles, and he found all of them in the alchemical tower. But there was still something left in the gloomy space, a handful of gold coins. There were 1,315 gold pieces. Celine left him all the gold, and although they had not seen each other for less than a day, Link already missed her very much. 
I wonder if she managed to get rid of the demons from the depths. She is all right? Questions were spinning in Link. Head. He felt that he was sad and worried for the first time. I'm still too weak. Link sighed. Even if he were by her side, he would only be a burden to her. He rubbed the pendant with one hand, clutching the feathers that he hid on his chest. This calmed him down, as if Celine was next to him. He was very tired and fell asleep half an hour later. When he opened his eyes, it turned out that it was still very dark. Link took out his pocket watch. Two o'clock in the morning. He slept for about six hours, but thanks to these six hours, he felt rested. Link felt the warmth return to his fingertips, just like during the hot spring. This calmed him down. His mind was clear and he thought faster than usual. He no longer felt lethargic as he had before sleep. The young man could quickly and systematically analyze any tasks that arose for him. He answered questions regarding magic that the previous owner of this body had, without difficulty only paying a little attention to them. Is this all I can do at my peak? If I took an IQ test, the old Link would have scored a maximum of 90. I would have gotten about 130 there on Earth, a little better than average. But now I definitely have more than 250. No, 260. Who cares? This mind cannot be defeated. It would be a shame if such a sharp mind were not put to good use. Link took out a magic book from the pendant. It was called Spell Structure. He flipped through the book to the alphabetical index. It contained the usual zero-level spells. Earth Spike, Fireball, Airblade, Slide, Weak Invisibility. Each of them was described in detail in the book. It was just what Link needed. As they say, one morning hour is like two evening hours. I'll start studying magic right now. With his head buried in the book, he began to read diligently. Link would never have thought that, as a poor student on Earth, he could sit quietly and intently read a book written in dry and formal language about magic and spells. In fact, he spent almost the entire day reading books. At first, he had to make an effort to concentrate. At the beginning, it was akin to torture. His eyelids grew heavy from the sight of endless numerical mana formulas and a huge number of magical runes that he had never encountered before. But as his focus gradually became accustomed to the topic of the book, Link became more and more interested to study the contents of the book. And at the end, the young man was simply delighted. His actual experience of reading magic books was completely different from what he experienced while reading Mana Swirl Theory in Celine's room last night. Yesterday, he only glanced quickly through the book. He wasn't focused on the content or trying at all. But this time, Link put all his strength into reading this book. He slowly scanned through each page, sometimes even stopping between pages to carefully think about what he had just read. According to the book, spells could be divided into six main types. Nature magic, secret spells, witchcraft spells, summoning spells, witchcraft spells, and alchemical spells. For spells of the third level and below, the difference between these types was not very noticeable. The magician could develop his skills in using all types of spells, but once a mage reached the third level, he needed to decide on his specialization, that is, decide what type of spells he would like to learn. Typically, a mage could develop and improve his skills in only one group of spells. Being an expert in more than one type after level 4 was virtually impossible, and exceptions were extremely rare. In the book Basic Spell Structure, Fireball and Earth Spike were cited as examples of nature magic spells, and Weak Invisibility was cited as an affliction spell. As for secret spells and summoning spells, there were no examples of them in the book, since both of these types were very unclear objects for reasoning. It was very rare to learn about them only from books. The only way to learn about them was to have a private lesson with a teacher. After finishing reading about the magical structure of the Fireball, Link took out his Dark Moon wand and tried to cast the spell. Casting the spell involved three steps. First, to gather mana. Second, to create the structure of the spell. And the third was to release the spell. The most important step was the second, where it was necessary to create the structure of the spell. The success of the spell depended on this step. Link concentrated and followed the instructions in the book exactly. Two seconds later, the end of the Dark Moon wand began to glow, and a tiny blob of light appeared in the void next to the end of the wand. This was the prototype of the fireball spell. The tiny blob of light was no bigger than a grain of rice. It stayed in the air for no more than a second, and then, poof, disappeared. If the mage created the structure of the spell incorrectly, its casting was immediately interrupted. This can be quite difficult. Link pursed his lips. He realized that this way of learning spells was completely different from the way he had learned spells using the Omni points he had acquired. Now Mana was wild and disobedient, like a child. 
When he wanted to direct her to the left, she stubbornly moved to the right. When he wanted her to calm down, on the contrary, she became more active. It was almost impossible to control it. Link tried again. Three seconds later there was another poof, and a ball of light the size of a pebble appeared again and slowly faded away. Another unsuccessful attempt to conjure a fireball. Link felt a hot stream of air hit him in the face. He was lucky that he was only training a level zero spell. If it was a level four spell, flame explosion, and he made a mistake while casting the spell, he would be fried to a crisp. In this world, magic was considered the most powerful force. But it was a double-edged sword. The stronger the magician became, the more careful he had to be when casting a spell. So said one famous mage master, with whom Link now readily agreed. If a mage could not withstand a miscast fourth-level spell, then a legendary spell could even kill him. In truth, mages who wanted to learn high-level spells must use various means that could help them. The most important among such means was a fully functioning magic tower. A magic tower could help a magus by controlling the area surrounding the tower, and items inside the tower could be used to protect mages while they experimented with new spells. However, such towers had their downside. The price. To build an ordinary magic tower, a lot of magical and anti-magic materials were required, totaling 10,000 gold, an exorbitant price. Power always came at a price. Magic was like an expensive hobby that eats up your money at a speed that is even impossible for an ordinary person to imagine. Of course, Link was not yet thinking about magic towers at that moment. Fireball was nothing more than a null spell. He could safely experiment with it without worrying about his safety. The third, fourth, fifth attempts to create the spell failed. But on the sixth time, after five seconds had passed, a pearl-sized glass ball finally appeared at the very tip of the wand. Link now understood and experienced the entire process of creating a spell from scratch. Mana is collected, the spell design is created, and the fire element is added, which creates a stable structure. What a beautiful process. He felt a warm breath of air from the small fireball in front of him, and Link's heart filled with pride at his small achievement. Fireball was the first spell he really learned, but then Link laughed at himself. It was only a level zero spell, and I still need five seconds for it. Besides, my fireball is only enough to light a match. In the game, he could create level zero spells in 0.1 second. They would only be useful in battle at that casting speed. However, Link believed that with time and practice, he would improve his skills. Link also didn't have to worry about using all his mana while practicing. He made sure to reabsorb the mana used for the spell, so that when the fireball slowly disappeared, the energy spent on it was returned to Link's body. Link then channeled some of the mana into the wand creating the structure of the spell again. This time it took him four seconds to create the fireball. Link began to understand and grasp the essence of it all, and continued to train over and over again. He was so passionate about it that time flew by. The young man cast the spell again and again, not realizing that the casting of the spell using his own abilities and the casting of the spell he received for Omni Points merged together, and they could no longer be distinguished. Flash. A steady fireball appeared at the end of his wand and then poof, the fireball disappeared and the mana returned to Link, as body. It all happened quickly, as if someone had turned a light on and then off. Without realizing it, Link had improved his spell casting skill to less than 0.1 second. Link felt that in one second he could create at least 20 fireballs. Now he was in an unusual state, because he was still receiving help and improvements from the game, but he could also feel and understand every step in this spell casting process and the deep structure spells. Have you improved my spellcasting skill? Link asked the game. He himself would not have been able to advance in this so quickly thanks to his abilities alone. The game answered, certainly. Constantly practicing casting just one spell would only waste the player's energy, but would not help him understand magic itself. Once the player has mastered the basics of a spell, the system will improve their spellcasting skill to speed up the entire spellcasting process? Then at what exact speed can I cast level zero spells? 0.0512 seconds. This is the maximum speed for creating fire spells. It is impossible to pronounce them faster. The time for creating nature spells was divided into two parts. The first is the time it took to create the mana structure. It depended on the magician. This quick thinking, which of course could be improved with training. The second is the time during which the elements of the elements accumulated and lined up in the correct order. The speed of this depended on the concentration of elemental elements in the environment. For example, if you compare the snowy lands of the north and the deserts of the south, 
In the second location, the elements of fire will accumulate ten times faster than in the first. In the room Link was in, it took 0.5 seconds for the fire elements to accumulate, which was the fastest speed a spell could be cast at. Oh, then that means I'm pretty fast. 0.0512 seconds, fast as lightning. Link was pleased with this progress. The next time he trained to create fireballs, the young man did not pay too much attention to the stability of the spell's structure. Instead, he put all his energy into accumulating fire elements. More than ten minutes passed, and doubt began to creep into Link's mind. There are flaws in the structure of this spell. Link had already practiced and gained enough experience. Now he began to have questions. He now understood the entire process of creating a spell, and he could see some flaws in the structure of the fireball spell. He carefully examined the structure of the spell, and came to the following conclusions. The process of accumulating fire elements from the environment itself was not ideal or very effective. However, it is very stable and is the simplest and easiest to develop. But this is not what I need in my spells. Maybe I can change and improve it. Link was a man of action. As soon as he had an idea, he immediately set about executing it. But at that moment, someone knocked on the door. It was Eliard. He said loudly, Link, it is time for us to go. Link turned around and looked out the window. And only then did he realize that it was dawn outside. Wait, I'm on my way, Link hastily replied. Putting away his wand, he hastily washed his face and tried to give himself a more energetic appearance. But based on what Link saw in the mirror, no matter how he looked at himself, the young man reflected in the mirror looked like an ordinary person. Obviously, the magical weakening was making itself felt. Opening the door, he saw Elliard. Now Link was even more worried. Having slept well at night, Elliard changed into new clothes. Now he looked even more cheerful. He seemed to glow. His light green eyes were clear but expressed deep thought. They seemed to glow. Anyone who saw him would know that he had a strong spirit. In magic, there was a spell called Detect Aura, which could be used to measure the aura emanating from a target. Link had not yet learned it, but he was sure that if anyone... I wanted to test Elliard using this spell. He would see that Elliard is glowing with the magnificent power of mana. Oh, what can you say about the number one most talented wizard and the first handsome man in the entire game? His appearance was truly striking. No one could compare with her. Link couldn't help but feel sad about this. After having breakfast in the hall, they set off. East Bay Academy was located 30 miles southeast of the city of River Bay among the rocks. It was relatively close as the road was level. They only had to walk for two hours, and they already saw the entrance to the bay. At the entrance there was a heavy stone slab. On it the name Eastern Bay High Academy of Magic was written in large letters. At the top of the stone was a coat of arms, in the center of which was a lion's head and crossed wands below it, a symbol of magic in the service of the Kingdom of Norton. Next to the stone slab stood a small two-story wooden building. Directly in front of it was a courtyard where a gray-haired old man, dressed in a blue-gray mage's robe, was sunbathing on a lounger. As soon as Link turned to the old man, a notification appeared. Vincent, regular mage of the second level. Status, determines permanent auras. Position, conducts qualifying tests for admission to the Eastern Bay Academy. Seeing Link and Elliard, Vincent examined them and asked, You both want to enter the Academy? Yes, they both answered politely. Vincent raised his wand, pointed it at Elliard, and nodded. You can enroll, if, of course, you can pay the tuition fee. Pointing his wand at Link, he shook his head. You, your innate mana level is too low. Only if you can prove that you have enough knowledge in the field of magic will you be able to enroll. If not, go back to where you came from. This gatekeeper definitely speaks his mind. Luckily, Link was prepared for this scenario. Right now, his maximum mana level was 24.1, which was very low. This was the level of an average apprentice magician. It was only through a miracle that he could enroll in this academy. Of course, he still had 105 Omni Points, and he could spend all of them on increasing his maximum mana level. Even if 90% of the magic weakening effect remained, he could increase his maximum mana level to 129.1 by exchanging one Omni Point for 10 points of maximum mana. Then his level would be equal to the maximum mana level of an ordinary second level magician, and he would be accepted into the academy. But that was stupid. Yes, he could gain the power of a second level mage, but he didn't have nearly enough knowledge for that status. And even if he entered the academy in this way, he would be assigned to classes for second level magicians classes that he would definitely not be able to cope with. What then is the meaning of all this? 
It must be admitted that Link was only testing his luck here. The guy knew that if he was not accepted, he would simply return to the hotel, where he would learn the basics of magic himself, and then try again. He wouldn't be too upset about not being accepted, so Link returned Elliard's sympathetic look with a smile, showing him that everything was fine. However, the experience taught him a valuable lesson. He never thought that it was possible to enter the Eastern Bay High Academy of Magic simply by writing a report. On Earth, the game never talked about this. In fact, in the game, once you reached a certain level, you could just pay a certain amount of money and bam, you are already a student at the High Academy of Magic. Whereas my friend can confirm his level of magic, Elliard asked. Vincent burst into tears, carefully examining Elliard from head to toe. He quickly examined the young man, his attire, and answered mockingly, Take care of yourself, boy. You know that the tuition fee at East Bay High Academy of Magic is not that low, right? Vincent saw all levels of society, and this allowed him to accurately judge a person's life situation based on his appearance. Just by looking at them, he could definitely see the difference in the quality of the two young men's clothes. This undistinguished young man may have been wearing an ordinary gray robe, but it was made from squirrel fur the value of which was at least ten times higher than the shiny clothes that this handsome guy wore. Having valued them in this way, he realized that the guy, who looked ordinary, was probably of noble birth. On the other hand, his companion was nothing more than an ordinary commoner. As for money, Elliard, of course, prepared. Before preparing to train in magic, he thought over and over again about different ways to make money. Fortunately, he had a smart brain in his head, thanks to which he found a way to save about two hundred gold coins. This was the exact amount that was needed to enter this academy, or so he heard. I mean two hundred gold? I have them with me? Elliard answered, laughing. But to the young man, to surprise, Vincent shook his head and laughed. He raised two fingers and said, No, no, you got it all wrong, my boy. For you it will not cost two hundred gold. This is the price for a student of noble birth. And for commoners the price is three hundred gold. However, unfortunately, too many students entered the academy this year so there are no places left. If you go to the academy, you will be given an additional place, so you will have to pay for additional preparations and materials, which, of course, will cost money. Since you are a commoner, you are not entitled to any discounts or benefits, so in total, the tuition fee will be about 2,000 gold coins. Elliard was shocked, his eyebrows furrowed. It can't be ten times the normal fee. Just funny. How many commoners would be able to fork out and give 2,000 gold coins? Only the rich merchants of the free northern region can afford such an outrageous amount of money. This was nothing more than a thinly disguised attempt to prevent commoners from learning magic. However, Link knew that the Magic Academy was not trying to frame them. For a magician, money was necessary. What commoners considered a huge sum could be spent on some magical item in an instant. For example, the Dark Moon wand that he holds in his hand. This wand alone would have cost him a thousand gold pieces. And speaking of the fire crystal staff, it would be worth more than three thousand gold coins. He had encountered a similar situation in the game back on Earth. You had to spend money as soon as you chose your path to becoming a magician. Only for practicing magic one had to pay more than for practicing other professions, not to mention the special items that were needed for practicing magic. According to Vincent, two thousand gold coins was not just a random number that first came to his mind. This was an accurately calculated amount needed to study magic, but of course he knew that this explanation alone could not hide the dishonest treatment of commoners by the academy. But Elliard was not familiar with the world of magicians, so he became angry. Vincent remained relaxed. Not a muscle moved on his face. The man spread his arms, lay down on the sun lounger and said briskly, I can do anything about it. I don't set the price. Orders are issued by the dean of the academy. I'm just passing them on. However, Elliard had another ace up his sleeve. He took out the letter. I have a letter of recommendation from Duchess Alice. Vincent looked at it and saw the wax seal on the letter, instantly recognizing the emblem of a blooming rose. Indeed, it was the seal of the very same Duchess of the Kingdom of Norton. He looked at Elliard, stunningly beautiful face, and laughed. Oh, what a blessing to be born beautiful! He laughed. You can even ask a nobleman to write you a letter of recommendation. Well, according to the dean's orders, a letter of recommendation from a person of noble birth gives you a discount of 500 gold coins, so you have to pay one and a half thousand gold coins. Seeing this letter, Link suddenly realized how smart this guy was. No commoner could earn 200 gold coins, even if he worked until exhaustion all his life. And yet, this guy was somehow able to earn this amount by the age of 17. 
On top of that, he also received a letter of recommendation from the Duchess. Link knew that this could only be achieved through great sacrifice, but one and a half thousand gold coins was still an unaffordable amount for Elliard. He could no longer contain his anger and finally lost his composure. This is robbery, he exclaimed through clenched teeth, his face red. Vincent shook his head indifferently. Warning you, boy. You are lucky that I am in a good mood today, so I'll forget about your recklessness, he said ominously calmly. But if you ever say such nonsense to a magician who is not as generous as me, I assure you, you will pay for it in blood. Sensing that Elliard was about to continue arguing with the gatekeeper, Link quickly pulled him back. Now they were nobody, and the Eastern Bay High Academy of Magic was, on the contrary, the most prestigious academy of magic in the Norton Kingdom. The Dean of the Academy was a level 7 Master Mage. If they lose their temper here, they will achieve nothing, but will only leave a bad impression of themselves on the Dean and the Academy. Elliard was a commoner, and he did not have enough money to pay the tuition fees. And although there was indeed dishonest treatment of commoners on the part of the Academy, it was simply a fact of life. No amount of arguing and shouting could change anything. Then, on Earth, in the game. Link became an archmage only because he was able to completely control his emotions. He never complained, never judged anyone, and never got angry without a good reason. When faced with a problem, he remained calm and collected, trying to solve the issue logically. Indeed, thanks to his strong character, Link became the first archmage. And for the same reason, when the God of Light threw him into this strange, unfamiliar world, Link was able not only to get out of Gladstone alive, but also to save the city from destruction. And just like then, his character was just as strong. Link realized that in order to put an end to this unfair rule of the Eastern Bay High Academy of Magic, two dissenting voices were not enough. The only way to really change something was by making everyone see the absurdity of this rule. Thanks to Link's push, Elliard slowly came to his senses, but his eyes had already turned red. It wasn't like he had never encountered dishonest treatment of commoners in society before. In fact, under normal circumstances, he would not have lost control of his emotions so easily. But this touched his heart. The young man couldn't just give up. He fought with all his might to get to this point. He had to endure unimaginable pain and go through many hardships just to earn 200 gold coins. To earn this amount, he took on dangerous missions. Since he had no combat skills, Elliard was forced to conduct dangerous investigations, during which he had only a 1 in 10 chance of survival. In addition to such missions, he also took on any kind of work, often being subject to threats of extortion from thugs and crooks, and yet he managed to accumulate this amount, copper by copper. From the time he was ten years old, except when he was invited to dinner with friends, he ate only three plain wheat cakes a day. Sometimes, feeling that he was not getting enough nutrients, he would go to the river in the dead of night and catch small fish and shrimp, which he then ate. Eliard could only fish at night because he had too much work to do during the day. He had been wearing the same clothes for three years. Even that old horse wasn't his at all. In fact, it was a parting gift from a friend. After hearing about the prejudice against commoners at the Eastern Bay High Academy of Magic, Eliard realized that he needed to obtain a letter of recommendation from a noble person by any means. To do this, he tamed his self-esteem and slept with her a terrible fat duchess for a whole month. Every night he endured this humiliating and humiliating act, temporarily suppressing his sense of self-worth. He had to go through hell, sacrificing everything that was so important to him in an attempt to keep up with his dream of becoming a magician. The young man made every effort to ensure that his natural talent did not go to waste, and to prove himself and stand out from the crowd of others. But now that he had finally earned a sufficient amount of money, received this letter of recommendation, came to the academy, full of hope. Reality again dealt another blow to the gut. Just voiced, ordinary words raised the goal of entering the academy to unattainable heights. In the end, all his work was in vain. Should he start over and try to earn more money again? By the time he earns 1,500 gold pieces, he will already be over 20 years old. And if luck turns its back on him, he may simply die early while carrying out missions. The next few years of his life were very important for learning magic. How could he just throw them out of his life? At that moment, the enraged, insulted young Elliard, who had not an ounce of hope left, looked up at his dream right in front of him. However, between him and his dream, there was an impregnable ditch that created an obstacle for him. Involuntarily, his eyes began to turn red. A commoner who was chasing his dream. What could be more difficult than such a simple task? Elliard clenched his fists, raised his chin, and did not allow himself to show his tears. 
he wouldn't make a fool of himself in front of this overdressed guard dog. But Vincent had seen right through him for a long time. He shook his head, and laughing, coldly said the following words. Can I offer you a great solution to your difficulties, boy? Why don't you go back to Duchess Alice and serve her properly? Who knows? Maybe she will pay all the expenses for you in the end. Elliard was trembling with anger. This was what he was most ashamed of in his life. Vincent's words cut right through him, leaving a terrible scar in his heart. His face turned purple, and his heart was beating so fast as if it was about to burst out of his chest. He clenched his fists tightly, thinking of only one thing. He would now beat this old man half to death, no matter what the consequences of this would be. When his rage had already reached its peak, someone took his hand. He tried to free himself, but someone squeezed his hand even tighter. Let me go, Elliard demanded. Through the fog that shrouded his thoughts, Link, his voice broke through. Elliard, don't you dare ruin everything. This voice was like a stream of cold water in the face. Elliard gradually began to resist less and less. Elliard turned and came face to face with a guy who silently looked at him, slowly shaking his head. Link's eyes glowed dimly. His face was ordinary, unremarkable, however. This young man radiated a spirit that could calm the most irritated person, as if nothing in the world could anger or disturb him. Calm, like water in a quiet lake, piercing, like the tip of a blade. This moment, this moment was forever imprinted on Elliard's heart. Many years later, Whenever he became angry, doubtful, or despairing, the image of the magician who showed him how to behave when faced with a cold, cruel world appeared again and again in his memory. Elliard calmed down, and although he was still sad, the young man was able to bring his feelings under control. Making sure that Elliard would not lose his temper again, Link took a step forward and bowed respectfully to Vincent, like a magician? Mr. Vincent, may I ask how I can show your knowledge of magic? He asked politely. Very simple. All you need to do is write a report that will show your perception of the world and the universe. Vincent closed his eyes and lazily swayed in his chair. This handsome young man calmed down, but to be honest, the watchman was a little disappointed. If this boy dared to lay a hand on him, Vincent would happily carve a couple of magical runes on his handsome face. Oh, can you tell me more about that? Link spoke with respect and Vincent liked it. Your essay may not be about magic provided that you show a unique worldview and deep mastery of deduction. If your essay receives approval from one of our teachers, you will be accepted into the academy. But, of course, the tuition fee will remain the same, 2,000 gold if you are a commoner, or 1,000 gold if you are from a noble family. I see. Link thought for five seconds and an idea came to him. He said respectfully, Mr. Vincent, sir, thank you very much for the explanation. Ha. Huh. This young man is good enough to be a magician. Vincent leaned back on his lounger. He nodded slightly, looked at Elliard and said, You are too impulsive? Your ardor should be reduced, otherwise you will regret it when it is too late. Elliard snorted and turned away. He felt his blood boil in his veins at the mere sight of this cocky old brat. Link took a couple of steps back and found himself next to Elliard. We need to go back for now, he said softly. Elliard nodded. His face was pale but the young man still followed Link. He felt that he could not look his friend in the face. He thought he could get into the academy and then help Link. But now all his plans were ruined. When they were a hundred feet away from the academy, Link gave Elliot a smile. Come on, stop being angry. He's just a second-level magician. Once you enter the academy, I'm sure you can easily outshine him with your level of talent. And when that time comes, he will definitely run after you on tiptoe like a suck-up. I am afraid I won. Want to be able to enter the academy. I'll never be able to get 1,500 gold pieces. It's just too expensive. Elliard? His face expressed despondency. He encountered a huge obstacle on his way and had already given up hope. I have 200 gold coins. I can lead a wealthy life as a commoner, marry a beauty, lead a decent life without becoming a magician. Is that really so bad? Slipped through his head. While these thoughts were spinning in his head, Elliard took a deep breath. All these years, magic was the only goal in his life, and yet it brought only pain and disappointment, and not a drop of joy. He just couldn't stand it anymore. Link, seeing how Elliard looked, guessed what was on his mind. He lightly touched Elliard, shoulder, smiled, and said, Don't worry, my friend. It's just a matter of money. There's no need to be so sad. I still have 1,300 gold coins on me. I can lend them to you. 
you will add them to your 200 coins and then you will have enough money to enter the academy. What did you say? Elliard opened his mouth in amazement. He thought he heard it. He had 1,300 gold coins. Not silver, not copper, gold coins. It was an amount of money that an ordinary person could never even dream of. This amount could feed several thousand commoners in River Cove City for a year. And now this guy he had just met was offering him this amount. He was dumbfounded and didn't know what to think. There was a storm of emotions in him, joy and anxiety and doubt and worry and resistance. Link was still smiling. Are you afraid that I will ask something exorbitant for helping you? Elliard was silent, but this silence meant agreement. He was not a naive child who had not experienced such things on his own skin. He knew that no one would offer help and kindness for free, and money would not fall from the sky directly into his hands, especially if this money was from a person of noble birth. That's what Duchess Alice taught him. Even though she was as beautiful as a pig, in the month he spent with her, Elliard actually learned some useful lessons. Link understood what thoughts were running through Elliard's head, and so he explained, You know that I am the son of a Viscount. But I am the third son. I have no rights to the inheritance of his title. I only got a modest amount of his money. In this regard, I am the same as you. I must rely only on myself and achieve everything myself. You know, if you choose between the two of us, you can easily enter the academy. So I think that if you can get into the academy first and then become a brilliant student, then maybe you can recommend me or help me find an opportunity to get into the academy too. As for the tuition fees, don't worry. My father is a Viscount after all, isn't he? They had only known each other for a day, so Link knew not to spew nonsense about friendship and loyalty. If he said something like that, it would only make Elliard more suspicious. So he laid out his plans honestly and clearly. He believed that his plans were quite logical, and was confident that Elliard would understand that this was a win-win situation for them. But even so, there was no doubt that this was a good deed on Link's part. You're not afraid. Am I just going to run away with this money? Elliard was touched, but he still didn't understand why Link would risk doing this. Besides, they had only known each other for one day. Why did Link trust him so much? He understood that 1,300 gold coins was a huge amount, even for the son of a Viscount. He suspected that this was all of Link's inheritance, and if Elliard ran away with the money, Link would be left with nothing. Link's father would not lift a finger to help him. Elliard was sure of that. He knew people of noble birth well. He knew how heartless they could be. Link smiled, looked Elliard in the eyes, and simply said, Elliard, you have a huge talent in magic. I can clearly see in your eyes that you are completely connected to magic. I know that if you have the chance to learn magic, one day you will become a master magician. Is the honor of being a master magician worth 1,300 gold coins? If it turns out that yes, then I will only blame my views and my own stupidity for this. Elliard could not say anything for a long time. He then bowed deeply to Link, his striking face becoming serious. Link, from this day forward, you are my friend for life. I will never betray your trust. Link patted Elliard on the shoulder and said, Don't worry, my friend. It's not as bad as it seems. I know several aristocrats. They will write me a letter of recommendation. Besides, I have already figured out what I will write an essay about, with the help of which I can prove my knowledge in the field of magic. Oh, and what will it be about? Elliard asked interestedly. Link picked up a stone from the ground, threw it, and after a few seconds the stone fell to the ground. He looked at Elliard and asked, Do you know what this is? Elliard stared at him with wide open eyes. He thought and thought. But in the end he got confused, so scratching the back of his head he asked, And what is this? Why do you think the stone fell to the ground? Link answered. He was from Earth, so he knew the basic scientific theories, although he was not a nerd there. But now that he had a more energetic soul, he could easily understand what had bothered him so much before. To write an essay that would give him the opportunity to enter the academy, Link could choose any topic from the entire variety of knowledge presented by the geniuses of science on Earth, so he wasn't worried at all. But with this one question he took Elliard by surprise, and he seemed to have fallen into a bottomless pit. At first he thought the answer to this question would be obvious, but the more he thought about it, the more confused he felt. His face expressed puzzlement, and he repeated Link, words, you? Or right. Why does the stone always fall down to the ground? Why doesn't it fly up? Why doesn't it tend horizontally along the surface of the earth? What kind of force constantly pulls him down? With the help of Link, 
Elliard managed to get one and a half thousand gold coins to pay for his studies. Since he also had amazing talent in the field of magic, he was immediately accepted into the academy without reservation. Link, on the other hand, fell on hard times. He had given almost all of his money to Elliard, and he only had six gold coins left. Even though he already had an idea for an essay, Link knew that such scientific talent was not something to shout about in the current world. He wasn't the worst student, but he was far from the best, and he only had a basic understanding of the things he had learned. He might be gifted with a prodigious mind now, but it still took him a lot of time and mental effort to write a deep essay. Consequently, he had no time to think about how to make money. To save what he had left, he moved from the best room in the River Cove Hotel to a small attic on the top floor. The rent for the attic was very small, only 50 copper coins per day. It was a small, drafty room, hardly more than a hundred square feet. There was no bed in it. Initially, there was no table in it, but Link was able to persuade the innkeeper to place a table and chair there on the condition that he would pay half the monthly rent for the room for each piece of furniture. The deal was not fair, but Link did not object to it, because he did not need luxury to survive. A place to sleep, a roof over his head, and he is happy. He went to a sundry store and bought a quill, ink, and a goatskin scroll. All this cost him nine silver coins. He then purchased some necessities until finally he had only one gold coin and one silver coin left in his wallet. One gold coin is equal to ten silver coins. He still needed money for food, so he had to start saving even more. At that moment, he had two main problems. The first was an essay that he needed to write, and the second was one and a half thousand gold tuition fees. Well, I think I'll write the essay first, and then I'll worry about the money. I'll think of something when the time comes. Elliard, of course, knew about all the problems Link had to face. Now he lived in the Academy dormitory and began to study magic. East Bay Academy had a closed-door policy for students. Once you have entered, you will not be allowed to leave without special permission. So Link won to be able to see Elliard for a long time. They could only communicate through letters. But Link was fine with that, because he didn't want Elliard to know about all the problems he was facing. Having cleaned and settled in his new room, he sat down on a shabby little chair and began writing his first essay. He dipped his pen in ink and stared out the small window in the attic. He saw the Gerwent forest, all flooded with sunlight. What should I write about? Link muttered. The young man thought for a few minutes and then wrote down the following words on paper. From falling stones to the sun, moon, and stars, the theory of the interacting forces of the universe. Since he was going to write a report, he could set his sights on something great. Try to write what? Something grandiose. So grandiose that it will definitely attract everyone's attention. Link remembered his life in the previous world and was surprised how accurately and clearly he remembered this distant place. Memories were not mixed up. There were not even fragments of memories. He thought that he would completely forget everything about the law of gravity. But in fact, when he tried to remember it in detail, he realized that these pieces of knowledge were like treasures buried in his memory, just waiting for him to apply a little effort to dig them out. In the world of Ferumen, there was also mathematics. In fact, their mathematics reached unimaginable heights, although not in the same way as mathematics on Earth. Here, mathematics was just a branch of the science of magic, just a tool for research. To be precise, the science of magic affected every field of knowledge in Ferumen, and mathematics was just a small branch from it. The young man in whose body Link was now content studied at Fleming's Academy for a long time. He may not have learned real magic, but he had a good understanding of its basics. The amount of knowledge that the young man received was enough for Link to begin writing his essay. And probably due to the fact that he had a good understanding of the basics, he was good at analyzing and drawing conclusions. He found that he could focus his attention without difficulty, easily ignoring other thoughts or distractions, and all his mental processes were tuned only to writing the work. Because of this, when Link began to write, he was completely immersed in the task, losing track of time. Thinking carefully, the young man began to logically analyze the hypothesis of mutual gravitation of ubiquitous forces, which he had formulated earlier. At first, Link thought that everything would go according to plan. He would do his best to write an impressive essay that would leave everyone in amazement, then he would find a way to get money to pay his tuition, and voila, we'll go straight to East Bay Academy. But as expectations and reality collided with each other, Link realized he had a problem as he drew conclusions in his work. 
Link knew that he would eventually come to the law of universal gravitation at the end of his essay. He thought that it would not be difficult to come up with the last mathematical equation for the law of universal gravitation. But in fact, the further he moved along the path that logic laid out for him, the more he realized that he actually falls into an incredible rabbit hole. Returning back to reality, he saw that the goatskin scroll was full of records of mathematical formulas, formulas of mana runes, and he was practically on the verge of madness. I was just trying to deduce the law of universal gravitation, but damn, what did that lead to? The ghost of the law of universal gravitation did appear on the paper, but there were also traces of the theory of relativity and many other confusing things that Link knew nothing about. So, well, naturally he was puzzled. He did not know how to write his work further along this line of reasoning. He did not understand how all statements, for example, the law of universal gravitation or the theory of relativity, if analyzed thoroughly, down to their logical roots, could not perfectly determine the nature of the structure of space and time. They could, of course, describe nature in amazing detail, but in the end they had gaps, shortcomings, and they could hardly be called universal. There are always exceptions and circumstances in which laws are broken and rendered useless. Link also didn't realize that his true mental capacity was much stronger than he had imagined. In fact, it was even frightening. Following the path of pure logic, his mind automatically corrected the gaps and shortcomings of theories until he discovered several new equations, the importance of which even Link did not realize. But even when these strange equations described the nature of reality, they were still far from describing them perfectly, and it was this incomprehensible imperfection that was confusing. For the inexperienced Link, this was too much. No wonder he was overwhelmed. The young man tapped his fingers on his warm forehead, then completely freed his head from complex, deep thoughts and folded the sheets of paper into a neat pile. His stomach was growling, so he decided to have lunch. Then he would go out to get some fresh air. Maybe then he could find solutions to the problems that arose while writing his work. That's how Link was. When faced with a problem, he never gave up. Instead, he simply took a step back and thought about how best to solve the problem. If the problems were so big that there was no light at the end of the tunnel, then he still moved forward forward, slowly, like a snail, but surely. Rome was not built in a day. I also cannot expect that I will be able to finish a huge job in a day. Maybe I need to rest now, he thought, calming himself. As soon as he went down to the hotel hall, he ordered a loaf of simple wheat bread and a glass of water and sat down at the table alone. When his stomach was already full, Link stood up and headed to the embankment of the city of River Cove. In the Gerwent Forest, a clear river flowed with a fast current. The sun was still shining. A fresh autumn breeze was blowing. The forest itself was filled with the sounds of birds chirping. All this helped him relax. After half an hour, Link suddenly came up with an idea for a topic for an essay. He ran back to the hotel attic and immediately went back to work. But after a few hours, he was stuck again. And no matter how hard he tried to think about his work, the young man still could not find a solution to the problem he was facing. He realized that it was already dark, so he had dinner and decided to rest. The boy pulled out the book from the pendant and began to read. Link had already perfected his level zero fireball, but he discovered some flaws in the magical structure of the spell. He wanted to try to fix them, but he was distracted by Elliard. This time no one could stop him, and he completely immersed himself in solving the problem and began to experiment. With the dark moon wand in his hand and trembling in his heart, he channeled mana into the wand and its tip began to exude a dim, magical light. Suddenly, Link began to concentrate on improving the magical structure of the fireball spell. Little by little, mana flowed out of the end of the wand and began to create the structure of the spell. Once the main magical structure was fully formed, the fire elements began to fuse together. Link then began using his altered magical structure, but he lost control, and the half-formed fireball burst and disappeared into the air. It was amazing, but Link knew that he still wouldn't get it all right the first time. The young man began to reanalyze the process he had changed, and as soon as he was confident in the corrected version of the process, he repeated his experiment. Pop! Three seconds later, the fireball that had not fully formed burst again and disappeared. Again, another clap. But this time he lasted four seconds. This means that there has already been 80% progress. Okay, again. Pop. Once again. Clap. He repeated the spell process over and over again, about 50 times, but not once was he able to create the correct ball. The fireball eventually burst when it was about 98% formed. Link decided to temporarily pause the experiments. Why do I always lose control of my mana at the very end? He was surprised. I must be doing something wrong. 
He thought about the moment when there was some change in mana during the experiment. He thought carefully about this situation for more than half an hour, and suddenly simple explanations that he had already encountered in a magic textbook came to his mind. Link hurriedly searched the room, trying to find his magic textbooks, and a few minutes later, he finally found three textbooks, The Nature of Mana, Theories of Mana Swirl, and The Distribution and Interaction of Mana. He relied on the hazy memory of the original Link as he leafed through the books, page by page. And almost immediately, the young man found what he was looking for. The equation for the spread of mana and the diagram of the interaction of structures, the nine conditions under which the vortex of mana occurs. Well, of course, I made so many mistakes. After finishing reading, Link realized how crude and superficial his understanding of the nature of mana was. Indeed, it was very foolish to try to improve the magical structure with this level of knowledge. My predecessors provided me with so many steps to climb. I'd be a complete idiot if I didn't use them. Even the great scientist Newton once stated that he could see so far because he stood on the shoulders of giants. So why shouldn't Link do the same? Not to turn to the great works that were done long before him, and to try to invent something from the very beginning himself, is the path of a real fool. Magic was a very exact science. What was written in the books was proven many times by experiments. Why was this so important? For one simple reason. Any mistake made when casting a spell could lead to serious consequences. It was a matter of life and death, and those magicians who were not diligent enough in their experiments were automatically destroyed due to accidents that they themselves caused. Link decided to put aside his desire to correct and improve spells and began to carefully read books on magic, absorbing wisdom and the knowledge passed on by his predecessors. Reading completely absorbed him. He even forgot about the work that needed to be written. There were 63 books in his pendant, and all of them were about the basics of magic. The facts written in these books were approved by all magicians, and proven by hundreds and thousands of experiments. So even if the level of knowledge was low, the books were a collection of knowledge and wisdom accumulated over many years. Some even had to pay for them with their lives. Link read carefully, and his outstanding memory recorded every detail. His newly acquired intelligence also allowed him to easily understand the philosophy described in these books. He even forgot to sleep and eat. Two weeks later, Link was noticeably thin, having eaten only three pieces of plain wheat bread a day. His eyes became sunken, and Link himself looked exhausted. But his black eyes now resembled a quiet lake filled with wisdom, in the depths of which there was a sense of peace. During these two weeks, Elliard wrote him two letters in which he talked about his successes at the academy. Elliard truly had remarkable talent. In a short period of time, he had already mastered one level zero spell, and a fifth level mage teacher named Moira accepted him as her prot. After reading this, Link muttered, Moira seems like a girl. Name. How lucky he was that he was born so handsome. But Elliard was settling in well, and that was good news. On the other hand, Link was telling Elliard interesting news from the town of River Cove. He always tried to write a letter in high spirits. Not once did he talk about the difficulties he had to deal with. Also in the letters, he asked Elliard questions about magic, hoping that he would help him resolve them. Of course, Link did not expect Elliard to answer them himself. Didn't this lucky asshole have a teacher who could help him right next door? When Elliard received letters from Link, his feelings of guilt and anxiety weighed on him significantly less. While he was settling into the academy, he constantly worried about Link and anxiously awaited news from him. But now that things weren't so bad for Link, Elliard felt much better. As for the questions Link asked in his letters, he didn't understand most of them, and yet he still wanted to help Link in some way. In truth, any opportunity to help his friend made him happy, so he turned these questions to his mentor Moira. Moira took special care of Elliard. She answered any questions he asked her, and Elliard did not even notice the special privileges that he received. Elliard then wrote down Moira's answers to questions in his letters to Link. Thus, it was as if Link also had a level 5 mage to mentor him during his training. It was this communication that was the most important reason why Link was able to read 63 books in two weeks. Carefully turning the last page of the last book on magic, he read, The Way of the Mage. On the book was written the name of its author, Bryant, the Mage Master, who lived 300 years ago. He was the only person to become a legendary mage. My followers, we transcend the barrier of time and communicate through words. And here are my words to you. Remember, magic can give you everything even immortality. Make your way along this road, move forward, and maybe one day we will meet. It seemed that there was a hidden meaning in this message, but Bryant died 300 years ago. All the nobles of the kingdom of Norton attended his funeral. 
The historical documents were clear records of this event. There was no reason to doubt the authenticity of these documents. So Link took this message as a witty remark from a dead man and thought no more about it. He carefully placed the path of the mage with the rest of the books he had read. Link not only finished reading them, but he also remembered every detail of them, and understood and digested all the information he received. Now Link was neither a simple beginner in the field of magic, nor an underachiever student at the Fleming's low-rank magic academy. Now he had truly grasped the most important knowledge, which is the basis of magic. So it was time for Link to try again to improve the structure of the fireball spell. He had many new ideas to start with. The young man pulled out his dark moon wand, closed his eyes, and concentrated. All the knowledge he had acquired during those two weeks immediately appeared in his mind. Then, like hot oil and fire, this knowledge combined with his knowledge of the structure of the fireball spell, and the result was an explosion of ideas and inspiration. Five minutes later, thanks to Link's amazing power of imagination, he completely created a new spell structure in his mind. Link then opened his eyes. And at the same moment, the eyes, clouded due to magical weakening, came to life. He extended his hand with a wand into which mana flowed. The runes on the wand lit up one by one, until finally the new moon at the end of the wand also lit up. A clot of light appeared in the air right in front of the wand. If you look closely, you could see how the elements of fire were spinning very quickly in this clot, but they were spinning in an unusual way. It was an endless rotation, the structure of which resembled a whirlpool. It seemed as if in the very heart of this clot of fire elements, there was a black hole that was sucking out the fire elements that were in the environment, and with the help of such rotation, the elements maintained the stability of the structure. A second later, the grain of light was already the size of a glass marble, the usual size of an average fireball. And yet there was some difference. The fireballs that Link used to create were white and usually had waves around them that emitted a dim light. And this ball had a blue core, the surface of which was very smooth and no heat escaped from it. It looked exactly like a glass ball. The spell worked. Link opened the window in the attic. The sun was shining brightly outside. He aimed at a rubber tree a hundred feet away. He then pointed his wand in the direction of the tree and instantly shot out a fireball. Boom! There was an explosion and a fireball flew out of the window and hit the tree. The wood chips were scattered around the tree, which had a hole the size of a mug in its trunk. Normally, the fireballs could travel no more than sixty feet. Even if the fireball was enhanced by the action of the wand, the impact would not be much stronger than the impact of a large firecracker, which could, at most, strip the bark from a tree. This unique fireball from Link was absolutely beyond the power of a regular fireball. It was different not only in the distance which overcome, but also with its destructive power. It could overcome a maximum of 200 feet, and its strength could be compared to a level 1 fireball. If I used the fire crystal staff, the strength and distance could be increased. This spell also consumes little mana, so even given my condition, I could create 24 of these balls in a row. However, the casting time of the spell increased. This is the only negative. Link could create regular fireballs at the speed of one ball in 0.5 seconds using the game's system. But now the improved fireball had a more complex structure. It was not yet stable. Link had to try harder to maintain its shape. It took him eight seconds the first time he used this spell. Nothing. I'm sure that with practice I can create them faster. Once he focused on something, he instantly immersed himself in it. The young man began to train himself to create an improved fireball in the same way as he had previously practiced the normal fireball spell. He collected the elements at the end of the wand and then absorbed the mana back without even realizing it. He continued to train and put all his attention into this process. Half a day had already passed and the results were amazing. Link waved his hand lightly and immediately a blue glass fireball appeared at the end of his wand. Then he raised his wand and the ball disappeared. Then he waved his wand again and the ball appeared. He raised his hand, and the fireball disappeared again. It happened so quickly that no one would have believed it. He did it just as fast as he could create regular fireballs. But in fact, Link knew that it was still slower, although not by much. While creating a regular fireball took 0.5 seconds, the maximum speed for creating an improved one was version was approximately one ball at 0.7 seconds. The more complex the spell structure, the longer it would take to create and therefore the spell would take longer to create. It was a simple universal principle. However, the creation time of this improved version of Fireball could be longer than 0.7 seconds, but the energy collected in it was the same as that of a first-level spell. 
the difference in size was almost imperceptible. It could also travel an impressive distance, around 200 feet, and had the same mana consumption as a normal fireball. Indeed, it was an amazing spell. And yet you can still speed up the process of creating a spell. I'll practice a little more. Reducing the casting speed even just a little was still very important, since it could dramatically change the course of the battle. Therefore, Link couldn't calm down and tried to improve his speed as much as he could. So he continued to train. Link spent the next three hours improving the fireball spell. He practiced creating it until he felt there was no more progress, until he reached his limit. Link then noticed that a notification had appeared. He checked it. It turned out that this was an announcement from the game system. The player had successfully upgraded the level zero fireball. Please enter the name of the spell. Link grinned, clearly amazed and delighted that he had the power to name spells. He imagined what the improved fireball looked like, strong, glassy, and said, Let there be a glass ball. Link's glass balls, haha. The spell is called glass ball. The player has successfully upgraded a level zero spell. Reward. One omni point. Ha, huh, I even got an omni point for that, not bad. Now Link had even more motivation. Now he had 106 Omni Points. But due to the fact that he was still under the influence of magic weakening, even if he spent all his points on improving his maximum mana reserve, he would only gain 106 points of maximum mana reserve. Everything will return to normal in only three months. He didn't need much mana right now, so he decided to save his Omni Points for later. Each point was his ace in the hole, so Link figured it would be wiser to save as many Omni Points as he could. After finishing reading books about magic and having successfully improved the fireball, Link's mind finally returned back to his writing. Since he had gleaned many new ideas from books, this time he continued to work on the law of gravity. He succeeded very quickly until the process of creating conclusions went so deep that the law turned into something unrecognizable. In the end, he could not even understand the conclusions to which his own conclusions led. But this time Link, his thoughts ended faster than he expected not for lack of ideas, but because he had run out of goatskin scrolls. The ink also ran out. It's time for him to replenish his supplies of office supplies. He groped for his wallet and was embarrassed by the situation in which he found himself. He had very little money left, about three silver coins. He needs to earn money. His wallet was almost empty. If the young man did not leave home now and earn money, then most likely he would soon have to beg on the streets. He knew only one way to earn money, to use magic. In order to use magic, Link needed a wand. He currently had two wands, the New Moon Wand and the Fire Crystal Staff. The first was the recognizable work of a master mage, while the second was a powerful contraption with obvious features of the work of a dark elf. But none of them were worth showing in public. After carefully examining them, Link decided to use the Dark Moon Wand, but of course, he disguised her first. The young man then decided to spend one Omni Point to buy a new spell. Polymorph, zero level spell effects, low level witchcraft spell, transforms the appearance of one object into another without changing the innate nature and form of the original object. Once he received the spell, Link wrapped the Dark Moon wand in layers of linen rags, completely obscuring its original appearance. Then he scattered rubber branches and placed a tightly wrapped stick on the branches. He raised the fire crystal staff and cast the polymorph spell. A pockmarked, translucent ball of light appeared at the tip of the staff. Link pointed to the Dark Moon Wand, transformation. The ball of light hit the wand. The brown surface of the rags began to slowly change, and faint outlines of wood texture began to appear on it. But this was not enough. It was impossible to cast the polymorph spell just once and have the rags completely transformed into a wooden stick. Transformation! 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 He quickly cast the spell five times in a row. Now the rags covering the stick have completely turned into an ordinary wooden stick. This wand had a lot of holes, so it wouldn't affect the magic at all. However, the surface was a little rough, so he polished it with sand grains. Now the once magnificent new moon wand has completely turned into an ordinary wooden wand. Like this. Now I can use it. When Link finished disguising his wand, he suddenly felt hungry and went to the inn hall as usual, taking a long loaf of simple wheat bread for five copper coins. But he thought he should have a drink to celebrate the occasion, so he spent another ten coppers on a mug of ale. He had been eating the same thing for half a month, so his tongue must have forgotten what it was like to taste. A mug of ale would certainly be a welcome change from his diet. Hey, Link, what's wrong with you today? The waiter teased, handing the young man a mug of ale filled to the brim. Another voice was heard from the other side of the room. Link, 
you will soon become as thin as a bamboo rod. You can, to continue to eat like this, you understand? It was the drunkard Tormen. He was a hotel regular who would spend the first coin he earned on alcohol. One day, while drunk, he returned home and beat his wife. The two argued for a long time about this habit of his, until his wife could no longer stand it and ran away with another man. This did not stop Tormund from returning to his old habit. After all, alcohol was his true love. Tell me, Link, you've been sitting in this little attic all damn day. What did you do there? Come on, tell us. Another regular chuckled. He spent half a month there, so everyone in the inn knew Link. In fact, now the whole city had heard about this strange guy living in the inn. Link could only answer such ridiculous questions with the truth. I am a magician, and I am training my magical skills. To his surprise, laughter rang out in response from the entire hall. Ha! If you are a magician, then I am a wise thinker, Tormund the drunkard said indistinctly. The others continued laughing. Link had told them the truth before, but no one had ever taken him seriously. Due to River Cove's proximity to East Cove High Academy, the city's residents were accustomed to seeing mages from that academy. In their eyes, magicians wore magnificent clothes, spent their money lavishly, always carried sticks with them, which they themselves called wands. There was some kind of mysterious halo around them. They seemed to be shrouded in a mysterious aura. This link, on the contrary, wore tattered rags instead of a robe. He sold the gray robe for money. His body was thin and fragile, like twigs, and his skin was pale like boiled cabbage. Besides, no one had ever seen him cast a spell before. Only fools took the claim that he was a mage seriously. Link knew all of this, and that's why he never argued. It didn't matter to him what the townspeople thought. As long as they didn't interfere with his quests, the entire city could mistake him for a beggar, and he wouldn't lose sleep over it. The young man knew that it was all underneath him. The eagle never cares what the chickens think of him, so he never tried to explain anything to them. So, Link just laughed, then took his food to a place in the corner, sat down and began to eat. He took a bite of bread, then washed it down with ale. Throughout this entire scene, his face was calm and completely serene. The crowd of the hotel hall from time to time made some remarks regarding Link, but without receiving any reaction or answer from him to this, people simply muttered something under their breath and moved on to city gossip. Suddenly, heavy footsteps were heard outside the door. The light outside went out. Darkness instantly spread throughout the room, silencing everyone inside. Everyone turned to the door. Even Link turned. There, at the entrance, stood a huge lout who, walking loudly, entered the hall. He was almost seven feet tall. His arms were larger than Link's hips and his hair was unkempt. The man's face was rough and cruel, and his beard was thick and long. He wore gray leather armor with metal plates over his heart and ribs. The man also carried a war hammer on his shoulder, made of pure iron. Its arm and head were eight inches long. It weighed at least 150 pounds. But that wasn't the only thing this lout was carrying. On his back was a thick metal shield that was at least two inches thick and also made of pure iron. It was clearly not easy to wear either. Link could have sworn that if he was ever lightly hit by that hammer, he would definitely kick his skates away. The dork entered the hall as if he were a battle tank invading enemy territory, each heavy step on the wooden floorboards echoing loudly. Only when the man entered the hall did everyone notice two people behind him. One of them was a shooter who was about thirty years old. His strong body was also completely covered in leather armor. The other figure was a girl, 27 or 28 years old. Her face was framed by fiery red hair. She wore full leather armor that hugged her figure, revealing alluring curves on a body so stunning that she could easily stir up any man's hormones. Every pair of eyes in the hall was glued to them. The wretched drunkard Tormund could not take his eyes off the woman as soon as she appeared. He didn't even notice how drool began to flow from his mouth. This drunkard had not touched a woman for several years. He would even stare at a sow, let alone a beautiful woman. The woman turned out to be a warrior, judging by the one-handed sword hanging on her back. She felt very well the people around her, including the gaze of the drooling Tormund. She immediately looked at him with her cold, dark blue eyes. Tormund was scared. He sighed and dropped the drink he was holding in his hand. Tormund did not dare look at the warrior again. The rest of the crowd in the inn was also scared, and none of them dared look at the people who had entered anymore. These three are definitely professionals, Link thought. This woman has a strong killer aura. She must have killed a lot of people already, but I don't sense any darkness or evil coming from them, so I think they're probably wandering mercenaries doing missions for money. Seeing that the hotel crowd was intimidated by them, 
Those who entered ordered food and began to talk as if there was no one else around them. They were noisy, they weren't modest, so Link heard every word they said clearly. We would never have fought him. Never. That bastard Victor is a worthless little coward. He just hid in his little cave and never came out. It's too dangerous for us to go there. My bow won't even go through it. I want to be able to aim properly. It's simply impossible, the gunslinger said irritably, taking a bite of smoked beef. Hey, don't be so gloomy. Of course, it's a little more dangerous than usual, but don't forget how sweet the reward will be. And we've already walked a hundred miles. Are we really just going to give up now? The girl answered. Then she turned to the huge lout. What do you say, Jacker? The lout had an angular face, but he behaved surprisingly gently. He carefully cut off a piece of meat and put it in his mouth, then chewed the food slowly. Hearing the girl's question, he thought about it for a while and then said, We need an assistant. Victor is a third-level killer, and he has also upgraded his combat aura. Now that he has resorted to decisive action, he will be a terrible opponent. Assistant? The shooter laughed. What help can we find here in River Cove? If only. If we could get one of the mages from East Bay Academy. Gildern, are you crazy? The red-haired girl immediately objected. What kind of magician can we afford? Even if we give him all the reward we receive, the magicians will still not pay any attention to us and will not even think about risking their lives side by side with us. I was joking. The shooter pursed his lips, then lowered his head and focused on food. Then the three mercenaries continued chatting. They mostly talked about things that related to their mission and the purpose of the mission. Victor's name was mentioned very often, but even after discussing this matter for half a day, they did not seem to come to any common decision. But it was Link, who listened carefully to their dialogue, who found a solution to the problem. He remembered where he had heard the name Victor before. Victor, leader of the Dark Brotherhood, a group of outcasts, bandits, and hooligans. The most recognizable feature of the Brotherhood was their blood-red masks. In fact, the bandits who attacked Elliard in the forest were members of this Brotherhood. At that moment, the Dark Brotherhood was devastating the western part of the Gerwent Forest. This was the most powerful underworld group west of Gerwent Forest, and Victor was in charge. His words carried more power than the orders of the mayor of River Cove. If he wanted someone to die, just one word and that person would not live to see the next sunrise. But of course, like any criminal organization, the reason Victor could become so powerful in a city nearby to the City of Springs was that he had powerful political connections in the capital. Link remembered exactly who at the top of the social ladder he had connections with, the Iron Duke. The point is not that the Iron Duke directly supported the Dark Brotherhood, but even so, he received part of the loot and treasures from Victor, and therefore turned a blind eye to the criminal activities of the Brotherhood. Naturally, this made Victor even more bold and unscrupulous. While thinking about all this information, he suddenly remembered Victor's treasure. As the leader of the underworld, Victor was naturally paranoid about his own safety. He never kept his treasures on the shores of the Kingdom of Norton. Instead, he hid them in a secret place, but he did not keep all his treasures in one place. Instead, he, like a squirrel, hid pieces of his treasure in various places throughout Gerwent Forest. In the game, if the player was lucky, he could receive a map to find the map of Victor's treasure. In fact, Link once found one such card, and when he followed the marked path, he eventually found 100 gold coins, which was equal to about $1,500. A huge amount of money indeed. The locations of the treasures shown on the map were random, but according to statistics on the game forum, there must be at least 20 or more places where Victor buried his gold coins. If there were 100 gold coins in one place, then he could collect enough money from 20 or more places to pay for the Academy's tuition. Therefore, Link immediately became interested in this mission as soon as he heard Victor's name. His financial situation had become really difficult, so he listened carefully and paid close attention to the three mercenaries. That's when he received the notification. Mission activated. Assassination mission details. Kill the leader of the Dark Brotherhood, Victor. Completion reward. Ten Omni points. Ah, I can't refuse a mission like this. He waited patiently for the three mercenaries to finish their lunch. As soon as they stood up, Preparing to leave the inn, the young man quickly stood up and followed them. As soon as they left the inn, Link sped up and caught up with them. Hey, stop! He shouted. Is it true that you guys need an assistant? In front of the entrance to the River Cove Hotel, the three members of the Flamingo Mercenary Group heard a voice and turned around at the same time. At the entrance to the hotel, they saw a black-haired youth aged 16 to 17 with a weak and emaciated figure. 
It was so fragile that it looked like it was actually about to be blown away by the wind. He was dressed in a dirty and shabby linen robe. His old and worn leather boots were also covered in dirt. Ha! Huh. Gunner Gildern grinned. Boy, if you want to play mother-daughter, then you will have to find your brothers and sisters first. The red-haired warrior girl decided not to even waste effort on ridicule. She immediately refused help. Young man, you should not interfere in this. Stands. Only Jacker was silent. He carefully examined Link from head to toe. Link didn't pay attention to the gunslinger and the warrior girl. Instead, he focused on the brute who was called Jacker. He knew that this warrior was the most important member of this mercenary group. If his guesses were correct, the one called Jacker should be their leader. What can you do? Jacker felt that there was something special about this young man. He was too calm and collected. His black eyes were too deep and penetrating. He did not look like an ordinary person. I am a mage, Link answered laughing. Gunslinger Gildern and the red-haired warrior girl were amazed to hear this. They began to carefully study Link with new interest, but the way they looked at him was not important. They had simply never seen such a frail mage before. Jacker doubted Link's strength and abilities, but still he did not dare to underestimate him. He asked, What spells do you know? In the eyes of the average person, magicians were mysterious and powerful. But Jacker was far from a normal person. He was a strong third-level warrior, and also a mercenary. He saw unusual things that some could not imagine. Therefore, even if he had never experienced magic spells before, he had seen as many great and divine master magicians as decrepit and desperate wandering magicians. Even if this young man's claim that he was a magician was true, it still did not ensure that he possessed enormous power. Most likely, he could only cast some level zero spells and little more. Wait, I'll go get my wand, Link said hastily. His wand was actually in the item storage pendant, but he couldn't openly display his storage items, so he turned around and ran to the attic. When he left, Gunnar Gildern pursed his lips and said, I didn't expect he even had a wand. It will be, I'm impressed. Hey, Lucy, want to bet? Lucy was a red-haired warrior girl. She laughed and said, Argue about what? About how many spells this booger knows. I bet he only knows a few level zero spells. No way, who would argue with that? How powerful can this boy who looks like that be? If he knew some first-level spells, he would be at East Bay Academy. Gildern chuckled and said, Who knows? Didn't you hear what happened at Gladstone? It is said that the wizard who saved the city was a young guy like this magician of ours, but he could cast the Flame Burst spell, which single-handedly defeated the Blood Devil. Lucy pouted her lips and said, Do you think such geniuses will walk around just like that? Enough, stop arguing. I think there's something special about this young man, so don't be so quick to underestimate him. Jacker waved his hand, stopping his comrades. Ridicule of the guy. They fell silent. They both treated Jacker with great respect. Immediately Link returned from the inn, and in his hand, he was holding a wooden branch, which must have been his wand. Is this his wand? It's just a branch, Gildern whispered. Link pretended not to hear him. He walked up to Jacker, smiled, and said, So far the only spell I have mastered is Fireball, but I think my spellcasting skills will be useful for your mission. Just a fireball. Jacker was disappointed, since it was indeed a zero-level spell. To him, summoning a fireball was like fireworks. Simply put, it was a completely useless spell. This was the expected reaction, so Link explained. My fireballs are not like regular ones. I modified them with a higher magic skill. Is that so? Jacker wasn't impressed. He had heard that spells could be improved by higher magic skills, but even if he had the ability to modify and improve spells, a level zero spell was still a level zero spell. Can it ever rival a level one spell? How about we go into the forest and test my spell so you can see for yourself? Link suggested. He really needed the money, but if he faced Victor alone, the likelihood of defeat would be high. And with the help of these three mercenaries, he might have a chance. He wasn't at all worried that these three might betray him, and even if they tried to kill him after the mission, he believed that he could easily defeat them all with his fireball. Even a level three warrior is no match for him. The three mercenaries looked at each other, then nodded. If the young mage's skills were useful to them, then they would gain another comrade, and it wouldn't be so bad after all. So, the team found a clearing in the forest, then Jacker raised his thick iron shield in front of him and said to Link, Point your fireballs at my shield, then I will understand how strong you are. Link nodded, but he was in no hurry to attack. My fire! The ball may go around your shield, so you might not be able to deflect it, he said with a smile. It doesn't matter. Just hit me with all your might. Jacker's face turned serious, his shield glowing with a fighting aura. 
It glowed with an earthy yellow hue, meaning its battle aura was composed of the earth element. It was great for defense. In truth, Jacker didn't think much of Link's warning. After all, it would only be a level zero spell. One day, in the north, Jacker fought against an enemy who had bought a magical scroll of fireball. When he launched a fireball into Jacker's body, the only damage it did to the warrior was to leave a scorch mark on his leather armor. Seeing that Jacker was preparing to attack, Link said, Well, I am starting. Come on! Jacker nodded. Gildern, standing to the side, became more and more impatient. Come on faster, guy. It's just a fireball, so stop talking. Just make sure I hear a good bang. Before he could finish his sentence, Link made his move. In an instant, the smile on Link's face disappeared, his gaze becoming serious. His body radiated seriousness and indifference. In such a calm, focused state, he created spells. Link waved his wand lightly in the air. Then a dimly glowing light blue ball appeared. Not even one, but two. Then three blue balls appeared simultaneously. Three glass balls leaving three zigzag trails in the air behind them. They seemed to move chaotically, and yet they simultaneously targeted Jacker, surrounding him from different sides. One glass ball crashed into the shield, another came from the side of Jacker's ear, and the last one targeted his lower body. The fireball moved at hypersonic speeds. In an instant, Jacker's pupils shrank to the point of impossibility. He felt a serious threat. It was not like a spell from Magic Scrolls. Is this how a real wizard casts spells? How is it even possible for the spell speed to be so fast? And why didn't they look like regular fireballs at all? Why was this spell so agile and fast? What Jackara saw in front of him was beyond his expectations. For the first time, he felt like he was in serious danger. It was definitely not like the fireworks he had seen. These fireballs were clearly aimed at hitting their target. Could this be the true power of supreme magic skill? Jacker's gaze tried to follow the movement in this chaos. He realized how limited his knowledge of magic spells was. The man saw those chaotically moving fireballs approaching him and let out a loud roar, then raised his shield with one hand to deflect the fireball and used his other hand from which a battle aura was emanating to deflect another fireball that was already rushing towards his ear. As for the fireball that was heading towards his lower body, he could only squeeze his legs tightly and hope that the impact wouldn't cause too much damage. Bam! First one fireball crashed into the shield. Even though the shield completely deflected the blast, the force of the blow still hit Jacker's hand. This is bad! Jacker began to panic. The fireball that hit his shield did not pose any danger to him, but due to the force of the explosion, he knew that if his body was closer to him, it would have been a serious blow. The warrior wasn't sure if his hands could handle another fireball flying towards him. He braced himself for the oncoming blow but the fireball exploded just a foot away from his body. Bam! Bam! Two explosions sounded one after another, and Jacker felt a gust of hot air hit him. He knew that Link had weakened the attack and was now safe. The warrior sighed with relief. Thank you. Jacker felt a new wave of respect for Link. There really was something about this young mage. Yes, his fireball was terrifying. His strength was enormous, but this strength could not be called outstanding. In fact, it was this magician's dexterity in creating the spell that frightened Jacker. Although it was indeed a level zero spell, in the hands of this young man, the spell literally came to life. It was as if he was being attacked by an almost unstoppable flow of spells. At the moment of impact, Jacker smelled his own death. Gildern and Lucy did not understand what really happened. So they asked, Well, Jacker, how good is he? Jacker didn't answer. He just looked at Link and said, Let them try too. These two wouldn't understand real power if it hit them in the face. Of course, Link didn't mind. According to his plan to confront Victor, he was supposed to lead their gang, and three mercenaries would become his assistants. In this position, he would naturally have to show his strength to earn their respect. Link waved his Dark Moon wand in the air twice, and two glass balls flew towards Gildern and Lucy. The speed of the fireball he released was fast. So fast that Gildern didn't have enough time to draw back the string. Bam! The glass ball exploded close to Gildern's ear, and the explosion hit him directly. Before this noisy gunslinger could utter a word, he collapsed. Link controlled the strength of the energy in this fireball so as not to cause him serious harm. Ah. Lucy was amazed. She immediately pulled out her sword, and the blade reflected the beam of light that appeared from the glass ball as she cut it. Link had no control over his spell to evade her attack. He allowed Lucy to cut the glass ball with his sword. Lucy was only a level 2 warrior. That was enough to make her feel the power of the spell. There was no need to hurt her. Bam! 
The fireball exploded right at the edge of Lucy's sword, and it absorbed the recoil from the ball's explosion. The glass ball's power was comparable to that of level 1 fireballs, and the explosion of level 1 fireballs could also be compared to the effect of a grenade. Thus, the impact from the explosion of Link's glass balls was equal to the shockwave from the grenade. Such a force was naturally so fast and moved so chaotically that a professional warrior like Lucy could not resist it. Ah! Lucy screamed in horror. Her sword seemed to be electrocuted, vibrating violently until her wrist went numb and she realized that she could no longer fight. Although she still held her sword in her hand, the girl knew that she no longer had the energy to fight further. One more fireball attack and she'll end up on the ground, just like Gildern. I lost. Lucy surrendered. She didn't wonder why exactly Jacker had that expression on his face. This magician's fireball was truly a force to be reckoned with. How's Gildern doing? Jacker looked at the archer who had fainted. He's fine, but sometimes he can be too talkative. Link laughed. Jacker and Lucy stared at each other. Now they realized that the young man in front of them was not at all the same, who he seemed to them at first glance. Despite his skinny and frail figure, his skill in sorcery was something that all three of them could not match even if they combined their powers. He is a diamond in the rough. Jacker and Lucy glanced at each other, and both realized that they had the same thought. Now let's discuss tactics. Link smiled, softly waving his arms and nimbly twirling his wand in his hand. The Flamingo mercenary gang accepted Link, and they decided to set off immediately as soon as the archer Gildern came to his senses. Before this, Jacker had already managed to make some inquiries regarding the mission and their destination turned out to be in the northwestern part of the Gerwent Forest, called Echo Bay. When they went to Path, Jacker told Link about the situation they would face, according to the secret information he had received. Members of the Dark Brotherhood will guard the entrance to the bay, guarding the surrounding hundreds of yards. There is a cave there, which, according to the information we received, is Victor's permanent hideout. Several bodyguards guard him inside the cave, each of them an elite member of the Brotherhood with good combat skills. Guys, do you know how many people there are? Link asked. There must be at least 60 people patrolling the bay. I'm not sure how many bodyguards are inside the cave, but there must be at least 30, Jacker explained. There are only four of us. So storming the lion, Sten in the open is a bad idea. Our original plan was to keep an eye on the entrance to the bay. Victor, leader of the Dark Brotherhood. Such people cannot hide in a cave all the time. He must eventually come out. And when this happens... We will ambush him and kill him? Unless you take into account that we spent half a month in ambush and never even saw his shadow? Gildern raised his hands to the sky. There was despondency on his face. Link felt that he was still missing some key points, so he asked the most eloquent of the three, Lucy. What's the matter exactly? Lucy explained every detail to him from the very beginning to the end, and now everything became clear to Link. It turned out that the Flamingo mercenary gang had formed in the north. But since the Dark Elves attacked Gladstone City, Jacker, who was the leader, felt that it was unsafe to stay there. The likelihood that they would encounter an army of Dark Elves was too high, and these bloodthirsty creatures had never shown compassion towards humans before. They will kill you on sight, no questions asked. In this situation, they would be putting themselves at risk by tempting fate if they stayed there. So they moved south. Just twenty days ago, these three reached Gerwent Forest. They then received a mission from River Cove Town Hall. Subsequently, they sniffed out enough information and decided to keep an eye on Echo Cove. But in the end, the ambush was a futile exercise. For two weeks, they saw no sign of Victor. Link tapped his forehead lightly with the tip of his wand. He thought for some time, and soon an idea came to him. Victor can hide in a cave all the time. Since you never saw him come out of it, it is possible that he is not there at all inside the cave. Either that, or there is another way out of the cave. Impossible, he is definitely there. This is his old lair. All the Brotherhood members we caught say so? Jacker exclaimed. Then the second option remains? Link pulled down his sleeves. I heard that cunning rabbits dig many exits from their holes. Victor himself is a deadly cunning man. I'm sure he will never allow himself to be trapped in the middle of the bay. If my guess is correct, there should be another exit inside the cave. In fact, in the game, there was a cave in Echo Bay that was an exact copy of it, called the Silent Mine. The passages in the cave were an intricate interweaving of different dead ends, like a labyrinth. There were at least three different exits. Many players who entered this copy for the first time got lost, wandered there for half a day, and they still could not find any traces of Victor. And it was because of this 
that the copy was usually called the Silent Labyrinth. Now, since it was a real world, the state of the cave could be only worse. What Link said was very logical, and he managed to convince the mercenaries. Lucy frowned and said, Then Victor, this secret exit should be more guarded than other points, and only the most important members of the Brotherhood know about it. We will never be able to find him. Damned brute, cowardly rat! Gildern shook the arrows in his hands with rage. He thought about the wasted two weeks waiting at the mouth of the bay like idiots, enduring the rain and cold. And this made the gunslinger even more angry. Jack turned to Link. Do you have any ideas? Jacker gradually began to respect Link, firstly because of his strength, and secondly because of his intelligence. Link had an answer for a long time. Laughing, he said, Well, let's go. When he said that, the three mercenaries opened their mouths. Jacker frowned. Gildern's face expressed puzzlement, and if he had not learned his lesson earlier, he would have cursed now. But Lucy had a wry smile. Link, there are only four of us. There are thirty times our number. Link just laughed and didn't answer. He was thinking about how to spend his Omni Points. He currently has 105 Omni Points. According to the rules for exchanging Omni Points, one point could be exchanged for ten maximum mana points, but now that his magic was in a weakened state, the effect will be reduced by 90%. One Omni Point for one point of max mana might seem like a bad deal, but he had a decent amount of Omni Points. After thinking about it, Link decided to trade 75 Omni Points for max mana points, so now his max mana level was 99.1. He also had a bottle of low-level mana potion with him, which could quickly increase his mana by 100 points. By drinking one bottle, he could completely replenish his mana, which meant that today he could spend 198 units of mana. A single glass ball spell would require one point of mana. This means that he could create 198 glass balls, plus he had three assistants, and one glass ball per robber was not a problem. He could also supplement his attacks with other spells and combat tactics so that, in essence, breaking into the cave was not an impossible task. But Link did not increase his maximum mana level by all Omni points for only one reason. He simply had no other choice. He thought about it. Just a level 4 spell like Flame Burst would cost him 320 mana points. In his current state, the young man could not create even one flame explosion. But when 75 points were added, and the magic weakening effect disappeared, he would have 991 mana points. Not to mention, by then his Omni points would also increase significantly, so he would be able to acquire 4th or even 5th level spells. Moreover, he will be able to use them immediately instead of waiting for his maximum mana to increase. Even if he does not have enough Omni points, he will still have one Flame Burst spell left. It is not such a bad idea to save his Omni points. The assault on Echo Bay still involved significant risk. If he ran out of mana, he would be in big trouble, and if he ran out of Omni points, he would surely be finished off. So he decided to save the 30 Omni points that he had saved for a rainy day. A process of increasing mana points took place in Link's head. It took literally a second. Then he smiled and said, If the three of you went, this mission would certainly become suicide, but with me that's absolutely no problem. Jack and his team silently stared at each other. Those words hurt their egos, but when they thought about the power that Link had shown them earlier, they simply couldn't argue with him. They only saw this young mage use the fireball spell, but who said he didn't have any more aces up his sleeve. But still, it was just too ridiculous. It seemed like the three of them still weren't convinced. So Link waved with his wand back and forth and said, It's already dark. We must make a decision now. I myself only have one life. I wouldn't send us all to death, would I? It was very logical. Jacker believed that such a strong young magician would not fool around. What should we do then? He asked. Link had a plan. First, he acquired the physical avatar spell. Physical avatar first level earth elemental spell effect creates a shadow avatar. The avatar can imitate the sounds of footsteps, speak, and emit smells indistinguishable from a normal person. Note, can't swim. Don't expose him to rain unless you want your deception to be discovered. A mage wouldn't fall for such a trick, but this spell could easily fool any of these stupid Dark Brotherhood thugs. Once the spell was ready, Link began planning battle tactics while pacing back and forth. The mercenaries listened intently, their eyes flickering in anticipation. When Link finally summoned the physical avatar, creating the perfect double of Jacker, the three mercenaries were left with not the slightest doubt about the young mage's plans. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. While Link and his entire team were preparing to storm Echo Cove, Victor received a special guest in the Silent Mine. 
The guest was wearing a cloak with a hood. His hands were in gloves. Not a single part of his skin was exposed. The only thing that gave any information about the guest was the blue precious wand that he held in his hand. On the table in front of them was a pouch and a crystal that emitted a blackish purple light. Because of the crystal, the cave seemed shrouded in mysterious darkness, although it was lit by many candles. Victor, this bag contains precious stones worth more than 500 gold coins. This is your reward. You need to find a way to deliver this crystal to the wizard at the Eastern Bay Magic Academy. To any wizard who has shown an interest in black magic? Yes, my lord? Victor, his hand squeezed the pouch tightly, his eyes flashing with greed. All his life he cared only about money. When he received them, he hid the coins in a secret place. Every time he hid his money, his heart was filled with intense satisfaction. In truth, he would not feel much remorse from selling his own relatives if they were given a high enough price for them. Don't let me down, Don, and let the master down. The voice of the man in the black robe was hoarse. If Link had been there, he would have noticed that the mysterious man was using magic to hide his real voice. I will do everything in my power. Victor knelt down, demonstrating his serious attitude to the situation. When he raised his head, the man in the black robe disappeared as suddenly as he had appeared. Victor remained in a state of awe. What a terrifying skill. He grabbed the bag from the table and opened it. In the light of the fire, the gems in the bag shone brightly and dazzlingly. Oh, cat's eye, blue gem, fire diamond. What a beauty. Five hundred gold coins per mission. Yes, my lord, of course, is generous. Victor admired, carefully examining each precious stone. He was very happy. The maps of the real and game worlds were very different, even though all the landmarks were located in basically the same places. If you looked closely, you could see huge differences. All Link knew was that Echo Cove was in the western part of Gerwin Forest. But how to actually get to this place? Link had no idea. There was no such lush vegetation in the game. The thickets were taller than the people, and the thorny bushes grew thickly. For someone who came from the modern world, walking into the forest was like walking into a treacherous labyrinth. Fortunately, Jacker and his team were experienced mercenaries. They became a kind of living maps. Along the way, Jacker was always the first to go, followed by Lucy, then Link, and then finally the shooter, Gildern. It was Link's idea, and he had his own reasons for it. He had only recently met this group mercenaries. While it did appear that they were decent people, Link knew that there was nothing more incomprehensible than the human heart, so he thought it wise to be careful, just in case. Jacker and Lucy were more reserved, so Link had a hard time judging their thoughts. Gildern, on the other hand, was different. He was always honest and forthright, so Link knew that although he could be cocky at times, Gildern still had no bad intentions. Gildern was the only person in this group that Link trusted enough to allow him to follow him. But while he was suspicious of the mercenaries, Link did not know that the mercenaries themselves also doubted Link. This magician was obviously powerful and so mysterious. They were naturally afraid of him. The mercenaries didn't know if he would betray them, catch them, or kill them after it was all over. They all seemed to feel some kind of tension in their hearts. And so their journey began, in a tense atmosphere where each side feared the other until they stopped 200 yards before Echo Cove. At this place stood a huge cinchona tree, which was almost 200 feet in height. Its trunk was so large that three people could hug it without even reaching each other with their hands. It had a very dense crown, so all four climbed the tree, hid in its foliage, and from there watched the bay. The entrance to the bay was closed by a huge stone. Thick vines crawled along it, and dense bushes grew at the very base of the boulder. It was simply impossible to see and determine the exact position of the passage into the bay. Gildern drew Link's attention to the stone. The entrance was right under the boulder, you see. Right under the thickest vines. Yeah, right there, see? Link squinted, focusing his gaze on the boulder. Finally, he could see the faint outline of a dark cave behind the thick and dense vines. This is a secluded place? Link could not resist this exclamation. Then he asked Jacker, You can see what's going on there from here. How did you know how many people are inside? Jacker explained to him, After a certain period of time, someone brings fresh fruits and spices to the bay. We didn't pay attention to fruits because they spoil too quickly. But as for spices such as garlic, onions, peppers and the like, they are brought here all the time. Considering the tastes of the people around Gervin Forest, and based on the rate of consumption of spices, we decided that there should be between 100 and 150 people there. Then our other observations confirmed this information, and we could already quite accurately determine the total number of people inside. 
Link listened to him, then nodded and said, Logical. He carefully examined the entrance to the bay, and then asked again, Are there any shelters? Jacker shook his head. These bandits are confident that no one will find their lair, so they do not have any ambushes or shelters outside the bay. However, entering the bay is a different matter. Lucy told me that she felt a strange aura around the entrance to the bay as if... as if there was some kind of detection spell there. Link was surprised. He turned to Lucy and asked, This strange aura, can you feel it? Some people are born with the innate ability to sense the aura of mana. This was not uncommon, as it was one of the natural magical talents. In other words, Lucy would have great potential if she decided to become a magician. But of course Lucy was a commoner. She was born gifted. But she had no money, and no one who would tell her that the girl had a special gift. She turned out to be just another ordinary mercenary, who could sense the presence of magical spells. Lucy was wary of claiming that she was susceptible to magical spells in front of a real magician, but still nodded in agreement. I can feel it somehow, but I'm not sure in that. Gildern added, she can really accurately determine the aura, how many times her premonition has saved us. And you can't count it. Lucy glanced at him quickly, and her face turned red. Now she was even more embarrassed. Link wasn't surprised. If Lucy thought there was a detection spell cast on the entrance to the cove, then he'd better check it out. He mulled over the idea for a while, then decided to spend one mana point to buy a level zero spell. Simple detection spell level zero spell effects. Helps roughly detect auras in the surrounding area, including auras from mana, elements, secret powers, and so on. After Link acquired the spell, he began to cast it immediately. This spell did not require the use of a wand. He blinked his eyes twice, and mana flowed into his pupils. Link's eyes began to glow with a dull white light. At the same time, there were slight changes in his field of vision. A shroud of light covered everything in his eyes. The ground was yellow, the trees were green. The stone was sprinkled with a bright white aura of metallic elements, and at the entrance to the bay, Link saw that he was shrouded a barely noticeable layer of crystal-clear aura. The aura was barely noticeable, it covered the entrance to the cave. Its light was transparent, like water in a stream, clean and clear, but its edges were clearly visible. It was really an aura filled with mana. Everything was as Lucy suspected. At the entrance, there was a detection spell lying in the bay. As the simple detection spell disappeared, Link turned to the three mercenaries and saw three pairs of eyes full of respect that were directed directly at him. He then realized that a person whose eyes emitted light must look very mysterious, and this aura of mystery naturally evoked awe and respect. At that moment, the three mercenaries completely forgot about Link's awkward appearance that they saw when they first met him. Now they fully recognized him as a real magician. What did you see? Lucy asked him. Link nodded. You are really very susceptible to magic. They really created a spell at the entrance to the bay. Gildern immediately laughed and said, What did I tell you? Lucy is always right. Lucy was happy and even a little proud of herself. She had absolutely no experience or knowledge of magic. But now that a real magician had finally recognized her abilities, the girl couldn't help but feel confident in herself. If people found out about her abilities, this could be her big advantage among the mercenaries. From that moment on, the girl could tell people that she had the ability to sense the presence of magical spells, and that the magician recognized her gift. She was sure that the other mercenaries would no longer look down on her. Victor was indeed very careful. There was nothing else to watch outside the cove, so Link told the three mercenaries that it was time to come down from the tree. Landing on the ground, Link immediately began casting a spell on Jacker. He pointed his wand at Jacker, and a watery aura enveloped the mercenary's body. She moved from her head to her feet and then rose back, and so on three times. Link then waved his wand at the ground next to Jacker, and the ground absorbed that aura. The dirt on the ground began to move as if it was a living thing, and after a while, a hill appeared from the ground. First a column of mud appeared, then arms appeared, then legs, then a head, and finally the five sense organs located on the face. Each part of the body gradually became more distinct, and when the spell was completed, standing in front of them was an avatar, that looked very similar to Jacker. This physical avatar had everything the real Jacker had, including his warhammer and shield. If you put the real Jacker and the avatar next to each other, they could not be distinguished. Excellent. The three mercenaries could not take their eyes off him. They had never seen anything like this before. Link pointed his wand at the entrance to the bay and ordered, Go there. Go into the bay in a defensive stance. The newly created Jacker turned around, 
raised a shield in front of his body. Then with a lifeless face, on which there was nothing fear, no fear entered the bay. At the same time, Link said to Jacker and the others, Come on, we will wait at the entrance to the bay, and as soon as the Avatar attracts the attention of the bandits, we will make our move. This was their carefully discussed plan, and in this regard, each of them had certain responsibilities. Link was the sharpest spear on the team, so it was his responsibility to kill opponents. Jacker and Lucy stood guard next to Link. Their job was to deflect arrows from him. As for the archer Gildern, he helped Link kill. Link saw the fake Jacker approach the boulder and then calmly enter the cove. Link waved his hand and said, Come on, we'll follow him. Then three mercenaries surrounded Link, and they all rushed into the bay together. Along the way, Link cast a spell on each of the mercenaries with his wand. A layer of clear aura immediately covered their bodies. First level spell, Cat's Agility. Effect increases the agility and speed of the one who uses this spell. Its effect lasts about 20 minutes. This was the first time that the three mercenaries directly experienced the power of magical enhancements. Their faces expressed amazement. Jacker continued to swing the shield, which felt as light as a leaf in his hand. Lucy moved forward animatedly and cheerfully as if she was floating above the ground. Gildern cried out in amazement. So this is what it's like to feel magic. How amazing, I think. It seems to me that I can run as fast as a warhorse. How funny they are. It's like they came out of the village. Link laughed quietly at them. Then he concentrated on controlling the Avatar, which at that moment was storming the bay. It was he who used the spell, so he could see the world through the eyes of the Avatar, and also control the movement of the Avatar from a distance. The physical Avatar did not even try to cover his tracks or hide. He, like a Spartan warrior, fearlessly stormed the enemy, Slayer, while shouting, Victor, you disgusting coward! Come out and fight me in a fight to the death! Victor, you son of a bitch, come out. Victor, come out and meet your creator. The Avatar spoke loudly. His voice did not just spread throughout the entire bay. Even those at the entrance to the bay could hear him clearly. In addition, this place was not called Echo Bay for nothing. All the sounds were heard throughout the bay over and over again, and this lasted for more than a few seconds. Victor, come out and meet your creator. 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 At the entrance to the bay, the three mercenaries looked at each other. If Victor could still hide in his cave after such insults, then he is not a bandit leader, but simply a saint. When the bandits heard their leader being so shamefully insulted, they were definitely seething with rage. When will these bastards come out? Lucy kept licking her red lips. She was already impatient with the desire to kill. Jacker held the shield tightly in one hand and held a war hammer in the other. Yes, come out, all of you, he said mockingly. When this mission is over, I will boast that we, just four people, were able to defeat the entire Dark Brotherhood. If everything goes according to plan today, I can live well for the rest of my life. At that very moment, chaos erupted in the bay, like a disturbed hornet's nest. A strange, crazy, ridiculous idiot who rides a horse into the bay alone and then starts insulting and making fun of their leader. Who could stand that? Kill him! Kill him! Hit him with arrows! Turn him into a porcupine! Skin him alive! Teach him a lesson that he will remember even in his next life. The bay was large. All the trees in it were cut down. The bay was oval in shape, and along its perimeter there were rows of wooden huts. There were about twenty or thirty houses. It resembled a small village. There was a clearing in the middle of the bay, and right in the middle of the clearing was a cave. Jacker's shadow avatar burst into the clearing and stood there, knocking his hammer against the metal shield in his hand. Victor, get out of the cave. If you have balls, come out and we'll fight one on one, he shouted. The Avatar continued to spew more insults, thereby infuriating the robbers even more. Members of the Dark Brotherhood slowly emerged from the wooden huts around the clearing. They stood around the Avatar, but none of them dared to make the first move. All the bandits had impressive weapons. Those who stood closer to the Avatar held one-handed swords and shields. Judging by the way they gleamed, they were probably made of steel. They also wore excellent quality black leather armor and protective metal plates that had both aesthetic and practical value. The bandits standing far from the Avatar wore the same leather armor, but they held large bows in their hands, and their arrows were aimed at the intruder. There were about seventy robbers in total, but none of them were in a hurry to take the first step. One bandit with two walked out of the crowd with swords in his hands. He grinned at the Avatar and said, Our leader does not deserve to accept anyone. It's challenge. If you want to fight him, defeat us first. The bandit was wearing leather armor of a higher quality than those around him. He also had a helmet. This guy must have been a junior commander of the bandits. 
The Avatar didn't answer. Instead, he just stood in a defensive position. Ha! Huh. You really are an idiot. The junior commander disappeared again into the crowd. There were about seventy-five people around the uninvited guest. Their arrows were ready. Even if this stranger was a sixth-level warrior and wore iron armor all over his body, he would still die as soon as the archers fired arrows at him. While the bandit's attention was focused on the Avatar, Gildern quietly asked, Well, shall we attack now? Link shook his head. No, we must wait for the moment when the Avatar makes his move. Gildern, your target is the junior commander. Kill him with one arrow. After the first wave of attacks, the bandits decided to take a break before the next attack. This break was the safest time for them to strike back. If they rushed to attack now, the risk of being hit by an arrow would be too high. The three mercenaries were experienced in combat. They only responded with a weak nod of their heads. Link sighed, his soul calming. His meek demeanor disappeared without a trace, and now he looked serious and calm. At that moment, he concentrated all his energy and preparing to cast the spell, became absolutely calm. At that moment, Link's entire surroundings merged together like a stream of water. Every emotion in him disappeared, and all he saw and thought about now was the goal in front of him. The passage of time seemed to slow. Link prepared to cast his spell. He focused his gaze on the bandits. The shadow avatar, which was surrounded by enemies, lowered its head and moved as if intending to attack. Kill him! The bandit commander ordered. There was a sound of a bowstring, and at least forty arrows flew towards the avatar, and wooden bolts quickly pierced his body. But the avatar did not fall. The magical structure inside his body remained intact, and he continued to move forward. The bandits were in shock. None of them understood what was in front of them. A moment later, one of them suddenly noticed the fallen body of their commander. The arrow went through one of his eyes, going straight into his brain. He was dead. This worried the bandits even more. Did one of them miss with an arrow and hit the commander? But they were shooting from such a short distance. How could they have made such a stupid mistake? The bandit who discovered the commander? Body thought to himself. Then suddenly explosions quickly thundered throughout the bay. Boom! 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 After each explosion, one archer fell. The faces of the shooters were distorted in horror at the sight of flesh and blood they saw. Their noses, eyes, and lips were all mixed into one indistinguishable mass. They were simply destroyed. It was unclear where this terrible attack came from, and panic began among the bandits. Each of them looked left and right with suspicion, trying to spot the invisible criminal. After about two seconds, the most perceptive of them determined the location of the attackers. They were hiding behind a wooden hut. There were four of them. A rapid series of fireballs shot out from behind a huge figure that seemed very familiar. Within one second, about twenty fireballs were released, each targeting a different shooter. In just two seconds, forty small fireballs appeared and exploded upon reaching their target. Immediately after this, all the archers fell. They were simply raised to the ground. It was clear from their appearance that neither of them had survived. After the fight at Gladstone, Link had become accustomed to seeing blood, murder, and death. He also had no pity for the bandits. They were scoundrels. All the archers were dead. Only the bandits with swords and shields remained alive. Now they couldn't carry out long-range attacks. What the hell just happened? One robber said out loud. The mercenaries. Pupils shrank in fear of what was revealed to their eyes. They were simply stunned. They saw how strong archers fell one after another, like flies, like rows of wheat, which the god of death himself cuts with a scythe. Each death was insignificant and meaningless. So what is magic really? This is what strong magicians were like. And although Link explained that if he was given two seconds to cast his spells, he could destroy all the most powerful enemies, they still were not prepared for such a terrible sight. This had a huge impact on the three mercenaries. It was just terrible. Well, let's go. Link whispered, anxiously hurrying them along. He himself thought about how tedious low-level spells were. With higher-level spells such as level 4 Lightning Storm or level 4 Flame Burst, defeating so many enemies would not be a problem. Jacker rushed forward without hesitation, Lucy and Gildern following behind him. Like the bandits, they were beside themselves with fear. However, the bandits quickly came to their senses. It, it's a magician, take cover, one of the robbers shouted. But as soon as he fell silent, a dim glass ball shot straight into his face, leaving a beautiful but deadly trail of light behind it. Boom. The explosion was so loud that it could have knocked over a large tree. He would have been wiped off the face of the earth just like the bandit's face. The bandit, without uttering a sound, fell to the ground. 
The other robbers were so shocked that they could not move. They covered their faces with their shields and cowered in horror at the sight of Link. Some of them fled to the huts, others to the caves in the further parts of the bay to avoid the terrifying attack. Everything happened as Link had planned. He decided to use spells to scare the bandits and cause them to panic. In two seconds, he created forty glass balls, each of which accurately hit the target. Link felt tired from the mental strain. His head began to hurt, so he had to reduce the speed of his spell creation. But even so, in one second, he still managed to create seven to ten fireballs. To ensure that his mental fortitude would not be damaged further, he directed the fireballs only to, to hit the bandit's body rather than using more energy to aim for the head. Even if it didn't kill them, the balls could cause serious damage, enough to immobilize the bandits. Gildern would then shoot an arrow at them, ending the life of the already wounded bandit. The intimidated robbers did not attack back. Instead, they desperately tried to hide and tried to escape. But no matter how fast they ran, their legs could not match the speed of Link's spells. They had lost forty archers, leaving only thirty-five men left. Five seconds later, the last bandit running towards the cave fell when Link's glass ball hit him right in the neck and took his head off his shoulders. Calm silence reigned in the bay again. A light breeze blew, bringing with it the heavy smell of blood. The whole bay became a common grave. Jacker swallowed nervously. Lucy silently thought, What have we become here? Gildern muttered to himself. They had been mercenaries for many years, so they had seen the magician spells before. In fact, they even got to work with an apprentice magician once. He opened locked doors, but for this magician it took at least three seconds to cast a simple spell, like candlelight. Back then, all members of the Flamingo mercenary gang believed that this is how all magicians work, but now their initial impressions were completely refuted. Link's skills in the field of magic were so powerful that the moment he cast a spell, it instantly deprived the target of his attack of life. It was incredibly fast. They were sick from fear. Would I survive if such an attack was directed at me? This was the question asked by all three mercenaries. They were sure that they would not have survived even if they had prepared for such an attack. Seeing all three standing idle at the entrance to the cave, Link furrowed his eyebrows and said sharply, What are you waiting for? Let's go to the cave before Victor runs away. Huh? Oh, okay. Jacker quickly came to his senses and was the first to rush into the cave. Link followed him, followed by Lucy and Gildern. Link sensed their fear of his magic, so he said in a low voice, I'm a little tired. I need to rest for a couple of minutes. Everyone else is on you. By showing your weakness at the right time, you can calm people down. As expected, the three mercenaries noticeably calmed down as soon as Link said those words. Their clumsy movements became more abrupt. After all, he is also a human being, all three thought. Nevertheless, this made them respect him no less, and even more. He not only managed to eliminate the biggest threat in the entire mission at the cave entrance, but also conjured a magical buff on them. Even if they couldn't deal with the bandits in the cave, then they couldn't call themselves the Flamingo Mercenary Gang. After all, they were in good shape. As soon as the Shadow Avatar burst into the bay, the crystal in Victor's room began to glow dim red light. The magic crystal that Victor had spent a fortune on was working as it should. A red light meant the presence of uninvited guests. The light was very dim. This meant that there were few intruders, probably less than ten people. Some mercenaries probably love money too much to fear for their lives, Victor thought. Victor didn't, and even moved from his chair. He just sat and continued sorting out documents. Being the leader of a large brotherhood, he was too busy to deal with such trivial things. He just had to leave the intruders to his subordinates. He was sure that in a moment they would bring the attackers to his feet. And it did not matter to him what they brought, a living body or a corpse. The bandits in the cave had long heard screams and commotion outside the bay, but they didn't expect the intruders to get inside so quickly. When three mercenaries appeared at the entrance to the cave, they took the bandits by surprise. They were incredibly fast. The screams outside stopped, and three minutes later the uninvited guests were already in the cave. It happened so quickly that they had no time to formulate a plan. Meeting two powerful guards at the entrance to the cave, the mercenaries noticed that they were wearing different armor than those inside. Their armor was of higher quality. In the dim light of the cave, they saw that the weapons in their hands also glowed with a dim light. They were enhanced by magic. This confused the three mercenaries. Their energetic pace immediately slowed down. The bandits had magical weapons, and magical weapons were very expensive. Not only this fact, but also the power of such a weapon could not be underestimated. 
They knew that Victor, the leader of the Dark Brotherhood, was very rich. The mercenaries heard that he even shit in gold. But they didn't expect that Victor would be so rich that he would arm his guards with magical equipment and magical weapons. Link was also shocked. A real magic sword cost at least 100 gold coins. But Victor was just the leader of a group of bandits. Where did he get all this money? He studied it carefully. Then a mission notice appeared in front of him. Quiet Cave Guard Tier. Two Elite Swordsman Main Weapon. Quiet Long Sword. Then Link turned his attention to the Quiet Long Sword, and a description of the weapon appeared on the interface. Silent Long Sword Quality. Medium Material. 100 Layers of Steel Effects. Small Potion of Sharpness. After reading these notifications, Link breathed a sigh of relief. Lesser Potion of Sharpness was one of the cheapest alchemical potions in the game. In fact, the original owner of Link's body also remembered something about him. This weapon potion, created using the wild steel flower, cost one gold coin per bottle, and each bottle could be used five times, and the effect lasted for an hour. As its name suggests, the potion could make weapons sharper. For such a low-level potion, even if the effect was small, it was still very effective. Link realized that the three mercenaries were reluctant to move forward. So he assured them, this is not a real magic weapon. These swords were simply dipped in an alchemical potion. There was nothing to worry about. The mercenaries trusted Link's knowledge, so upon hearing his statement, their doubts immediately evaporated. Warrior Jacker let out a battle cry, then raised his thick, heavy shield to protect his body as he charged towards the guards like a bull. Lucy followed right behind him, while Gildern stayed behind to guard Link. Yet he kept his arrows ready. Jacker was a third-level warrior. He summoned Battle Aura as he rushed forward, his shield shrouded in misty yellow earth light. He was seven feet tall. All of this together turned Jacker's attack into a wild, almost animal attack. The two warriors didn't even dare to parry the attack. They rushed to the side to evade it. These two were elite warriors, so their arms and legs were very agile. They could predict the direction of attacks and successfully avoid the blow. Try my hammer. In his other hand, Jacker held a war hammer. As soon as he saw the guards dodging the attack, the warrior struck one of them with his hammer. Click! Boom! The swordsman tried to repel the attack, but was unsuccessful. The force of Jacker's hammer was too powerful to resist. The blow from the hammer sent the sword flying out of the guard's hand, and Jacker, without hesitation, swung the hammer again at the warrior's chest. The blow instantly crushed the guard's chest and threw him about ten feet. The elite warrior died before his body hit the ground. The other bandit did not retreat, but decided to take advantage of the opportunity and was about to hit Jacker with his sword. As he swung to cut Jacker in half, suddenly his attack was blocked by another sword. It was Lucy. The bandit was stunned, and then Gildern realized that this was the perfect moment. He shot his arrow and lo and behold, the arrow went straight into the bandit's head and he fell dead. The three mercenaries worked together as one unit. With just one attack, they killed these two elite second-tier bandits. Link was counting on this. These mercenaries worked in the north, which means they were not mediocre. Those who had average skills would have been killed long ago. They would not have been able to survive. Link saw Lucy trying to rob the corpses of the bandits. So he quietly said to her, Now is not the time, let's go. Jacker added, We must kill Victor first. We can't let him escape. Okay, Lucy thought. They don't understand how difficult it is to find such expensive things. Lucy left the bodies of the bandits alone, sneaking a glance at the excellent long sword lying on the ground, and followed Jacker into the cave. Along the way, they came across more elite members of the Dark Brotherhood, but the passage of the cave was narrow, and therefore, at most, only four elite bandits could attack them at once. They, like the guards, did not expect that these intruders would be able to get inside so quickly, so everyone was taken by surprise and hurriedly came out of their hiding places without preparing at all. Mercenaries, on the other hand, were prepared for anything they had to face. They attacked ferociously, brutally, and decisively. When the opposing sides clashed, the braver side won. In a short period of time, the elite bandits died like flies. During the battle, Link did not raise a finger. The only step he took was to create his physical avatar, and that's why there were two Links in the cave. He did this to prevent Victor from sneaking a hit. In the game, Victor was a level 3 assassin, and the Quiet Cave was a dark, dimly lit place. This would undoubtedly give him an advantage, because in the darkness the assassins felt at ease. Therefore, it would be very foolish for Link not to use additional defensive tactics.
The only problem was that control of this physical avatar required his full concentration. Otherwise, the avatar could even attack the mercenaries. Soon, having defeated the attacking bandits, they achieved Great Underground Hall. A special room was hollowed out in the cave in which meetings were held. The ground was paved, leveled, and covered with wooden planks, so the floor of the room was smooth and level. It also had four walls specially carved and processed, and there were many candles on the ceiling, which, shining, illuminated the entire hall. In the middle of the hall there was a long table on which untouched dishes stood. A man who was about thirty years old was sitting at the table. He had sharp features and his brown hair was neatly combed. He appeared to be just over six feet tall and was clad in black armor. Upon closer inspection of the armor's surface, it could be seen to glow with a very dim red light. Calmly and carefully, he cut a piece of smoked deer with a steak knife, served on a silver plate. He seemed to be eating, not paying attention to what was happening around him. The man saw Jacker, who was the first to enter the hall. However, he remained unperturbed. The man even waved his hand, greeting those who entered, and his face expressed equanimity and serenity. Hey you, hello. Well you are smart. The bandits informed him about these uninvited guests. Who are you? Jacker stood at the entrance to the hall, carefully studying the enemy. Me? I am Grint, the most important, the most powerful warrior of all the servants of our leader, Victor. And having said this, Grint reached with his free hand for a white handkerchief, with which he usually carefully wiped his lips and the fat remaining on his fingers after eating. He then slowly put on the thick leather gloves that lay on the table. These manners were a hallmark of the nobility. Grint's great-great-grandfather was a knight, so he considered himself nobility and tried very hard to behave in a certain way that he considered appropriate for his class. Grint was very confident in himself. He knew that with his strength and magical equipment, no one in the western part of the Gerwent Forest could defeat him. When Grint finished preening, he picked up the heavy two-handed sword that was lying on the table. Blood-red lines radiated along the blade of this black sword. Just like his armor, the sword gave off a dull red light, and it was terrifying. Link looked out from behind Jacker, and a notification about this enemy appeared on the game interface. Grint Best Warrior of the Dark Brotherhood Alight Warrior Level. Three basic equipment. Fire Warrior Armor. Flaming Sword Show the Equipment, Link said to himself. Fire Warrior Armor High Quality Effects. Accumulates Elements Fire. When the owner of the armor is attacked, the fiery elements flow into the enemy's weapon, which becomes so hot that it is impossible to hold it. Flaming Sword High Quality Effects. Each blow provokes the appearance of a flame, which causes additional damage to the enemy. But this was already real magical equipment. Most likely these two pieces of equipment were worth at least 300 gold coins. Victor must have spent a lot of money on this warrior. He has real magical equipment, Link muttered. At the same time, he began spending Omni Points on the protective spell Small Protective Barrier. Small Protective Barrier first level spell effects. Protects against magical attacks. Particularly effective at blocking elemental spell attacks. In Gladstone, Dark Elf Mage Holmes used this spell to deflect Link's vector throw. However, the spell had the disadvantage of being useless at blocking physical attacks, so it didn't provide much benefit in this case. But that didn't mean the spell was useless. Under the right circumstances, it could be very effective. Link waved his wand at both Jacker and Lucy, and a translucent light immediately enveloped them both. Inside the haze of light were countless magical runes. They constantly appeared and disappeared like flowers blooming and falling. It was a magnificent sight. Go. Now his magical equipment cannot harm you, Link said smiling. Indeed, Grint. His magical equipment could have a strong effect on ordinary people. In fact, there was terrifying power in this equipment. Imagine your weapon gradually being engulfed in flames during battle. How can we continue the battle? When the opponent swung his greatsword heavily, the back of the blade burst into flames. Even at the mere sight of this, ordinary warriors fell into panic and all their courage disappeared somewhere. But the advantage that an ordinary warrior received by putting on magical equipment only worked when he fought with the same ordinary warriors. If his opponent suddenly turned out to be a real magician, such low-quality magic items became as useless as a homemade hammer in a fight with a seasoned warrior. The magic runes that slowly flowed over Jacker and Lucy's armor awakened their confidence. Jacker stepped forward. He protected his body with a thick iron shield. The aura that covered his entire body glowed dimly. At that moment, Jacker looked exactly like the Divine Warrior. Grint's face changed. He automatically took a step back, and the aristocratic look that he had until then disappeared without a trace. 
Is it really a magician with them? Isn't the magician should hide in a tall magic tower and research spells? Why is he walking around here in the bandit's lair? How can he defeat them now? Grint was stunned as never before. Half a minute later a clang was heard, and Grint's two-handed sword was thrown aside by the impact of Jacker, large iron shield. After that, Lucy fiercely pierced his knee with her sword. Thump! Grint couldn't get to his feet, so he fell to the floor on his knees. He planned to kill them all, but in the end, the magical equipment he was counting on was quickly destroyed, literally in an instant. Grint screamed, No, I, I can't lose. I am the strongest warrior in the Geartum Forest. Grint never finished his sentence, which was abruptly interrupted there. It was the sound of Jacker's war hammer, which he used to hit Grint right in the face. A low-class bandit who pretended to be noble. Such people are just the scum of society. Jacker turned in his hands the bloody pieces of flesh that stuck to his war hammer. He stood over Grint's corpse, whose handsome face was now one solid, eerie mass. It was quiet and calm in the cave. Victor was still checking documents in the library. He did not pay any attention to the fact of the invasion of uninvited guests into the cave. He needed to sort out so many documents, each of which related to huge amounts of money, that Victor had to concentrate all his attention on them. Oh, the tenants of Brookwell Manor haven't paid for two weeks? Then it's time to teach them a harsh lesson. Will Princess Annie's entourage be passing through River Cove next month? Then I will warn my brothers that they need to keep their swords to themselves, because we do not want to disturb Her Royal Highness. Ever since the Gladstone disaster, so many people have been moving to the south. <sighs> what a great opportunity to earn some gold coins. Victor was so immersed in this that he quickly and efficiently resolved the issues described in each document. He liked to feel the power over the destinies of other people, which he literally held in his hands. He was not bored and interested. He didn't know how much time had passed when he suddenly heard a sound outside his office. Someone was walking quickly. The steps are uneven. The man must be scared? Victor concluded after hearing the steps. The voice of his second-in-command named Collins was heard from outside. Leader, we have a problem. Victor was amazed. He could not answer. And suddenly it dawned on him. The man was able to understand what was happening. He guessed that the problem Collins had just mentioned was related to the previous invasion of the bay. How could these people become a threat to him, unless it was a level six warrior? But why did a sixth level warrior need such a small fry like Victor? Speak, Victor finally said. Victor quickly put away the documents and pulled out a drawer in the room. It was pure black, light leather armor of a very special quality. A black fog spread across its surface. Being in the dark, Victor, dressed in this armor, could completely disappear into his surroundings, and they would not be able to find him. It was the cat's skin armor, magical equipment from his lordship, who presented this gift to his subordinate. Victor quickly took off his normal clothes and began donning the powerful cat skin armor. Collins entered the room and said in one breath, Four from the bay are heading here. There was no one left in the bay who could convey any message or information about them. Even the guards standing in the cave fell one after another. Not one of them survived. Where is Grint? Grint, he is dead. There is a magician among the intruders? Collins, voice trembled. The intruders moved too fast, so fast that no one survived and could not warn the others. Even the message Collins received was a little vague. What? Wizard? Victor was surprised. For the first time in his life, he thought about escaping rather than fighting his opponents. The magicians were too mysterious. He would not dare to face such an opponent. The man did not know why the Magus would break into his hideout. He was always careful with them. He has never touched the lands that belong to the Eastern Bay High Magic Academy. Why is he here? Victor had no idea, but he knew that all he had to do now was run away and save his own skin. Putting on the helmet from the catskin armor set, Victor hastily collected the documents lying on the table. There were too many of them. He couldn't take them with him so he chose only a few of the most important ones. He put the documents in his backpack and threw it on his back. Victor then grabbed the crystal that the mysterious guest had given him. It is also worth taking with you. This important guest was also a wizard. Victor would never dare to make this magician wait. In addition to the expensive gems and most of his possessions, Victor also took with him a dagger that emanated a black aura. It was another magical item of his equipment, a special weapon, a gift from Grint, who spent a lot of money on it. He hid the dagger in a pocket on his trouser leg, then turned to Collins and said, Come on, we are getting out of here. What about ours? Brothers, Collins said several times, swallowing anxiously. I can do anything about them, it's too late. In any case, they were just scammers and bandits. 
For money he could easily hire new ones. And money was not a problem for him. Collins nodded and silently followed Victor, but they underestimated the speed of the uninvited guests. No more than ten seconds had passed since they left the office, and as the men walked down the long and narrow passage in the cave, Victor had no choice but to stop. Right in front of them, standing in the way was a huge lout whose body was covered with a luminous reflective aura. Behind the dork stood four more. One was a warrior girl, the other was an archer, and two more turned out to be identical twins, looking thin and fragile young people. One of them was Link, and the other was his avatar, although Victor hadn't figured it out yet. Damn, they couldn't be that fast. Victor frowned. The uninvited guests were standing right in front of him. Gunnar Gildern couldn't help but laugh when he saw Victor. Look how lucky we are to get here before the little rat digs another hole again. Victor and Collins both carried backpacks on their backs, so they walked heavily. Seeing them, everyone could say with confidence that they were trying to escape. Collins said, hesitatingly, Leader, what should we do now? Victor did not answer. He didn't even know how to save his own skin, let alone save other people. Victor's eyes closely followed the movements of the intruders. He took a couple of steps back until he reached a dark corner. In the darkness, the effects of the catskin armor kicked in and he completely disappeared into the darkness, as if disappearing into thin air. Realizing that his leader had just disappeared, Collins instantly realized that he had been left alone. When he saw that the opponents began to slowly approach him, he fell to his knees and began to beg, Please, Don, kill me. Please, I don't want to die. Nothing. Lucy said with disgust. Gildern pulled the string of his bow and was about to shoot at the little coward, but Link stopped his hand and said, Let him live. He will tell us all of Victor's secrets. At first, Link thought that Victor should be left alive, but now he seemed too dangerous to him alive. It's better to just kill him right there. The mercenaries. Eyes glowed. Yes, of course. At first glance, this coward could be Victor's second deputy. He probably knows all the secret places in which this cunning fox hid his treasures. Jacker walked up to Collins and hit him on the neck with one hand. The bandit immediately fainted. Victor ran away. Lucy frowned. The black leather armor he wore there. Something wrong with it. I'm sure he's hiding somewhere in the dark right now. Stay alert. This Victor is a dangerous assassin, Link said in warning. Jacker immediately ducked down and took a few steps back until he reached Link. Protect Mr. Link, he ordered quietly. Being a mercenary, he knew how dangerous a threat to the life of the mage the assassin was. Lucy and Gildern surrounded Link and his avatar. Meanwhile, in pitch darkness, Victor slowly walked around, his eyes closely watching the intruders in the dim candlelight. Especially, he carefully watched the pair of wizards, who were surrounded by their like-minded people. They do not have outstanding skills. Only the dork seems a little stronger than the rest. It was probably by using the power of two magicians that they were able to enter my lair so quickly. They don't seem to be wearing any protective gear. This is my chance. Victor was at a dead end. He had no way to escape. The only way out of this situation was to fight to the death. If I could kill the mages, these three stupid mercenaries would not be able to handle me. I'm sure I can outrun them. And when I run away, I will definitely remember them. Once he escapes, he will place a bounty on the heads of these three mercenaries. He was sure that not even five seconds would pass before they would be at his feet. Contemplating this plan, Victor quickly turned around and looked for a convenient opportunity to attack, but he underestimated the power of the magician. More precisely, he underestimated Link, who was not as weak as he seemed at first glance. Link may have looked like a thin, frail young man, but that was a disguise. Once he discovered that Victor had fled into the darkness, Link spent one Omni Point by purchasing a new spell. Illumination level zero spell effects. Creates a sphere of light, the brightness of which can be compared with the light of five candles. The spell lasted for an hour. A zero level spell cost two mana points, and each spell could illuminate a passage as brightly as five candles. There wasn't much mana left in Link's body, but he still had a bottle of mana potion, which he took with him. The mage decisively drank the potion, refilled his mana, and simultaneously learned the illumination spell. He then began to create this spell. He had the default version of the spell. The casting speed of the spell was 0.1 seconds. Link didn't hesitate to cast this spell ten times, and placed one ball of light for every six feet in the passage. In the dark corners, he placed two balls of light. In an instant, the dark passage was brightly illuminated by the illumination spell. The darkness was a safe hiding place for the assassin. Once the darkness disappeared, the assassin lost most of his power and advantage. Hiding in the dark corner, illuminated by the spell, was Victor. 
dressed in black leather armor. When the light caught up with him, he stood motionless, completely confused. How could Assassin fight if he couldn't sneak up on his opponents? At that moment, Victor looked like a girl who had her clothes ripped off in the middle of a busy market. He was in shock and had no idea what to do next. Ha ha ha, a tiny rat in the sunlight? Gildern laughed. He pulled the bowstring and shot at Victor. Jacker rushed towards Victor, but Lucy remained warily standing near Link, just in case. Tink! Click! Boom! Ah! Chaos ensued, and when faced with a combined attack from Jacker and Gildern, Victor tried his best to withstand the two strikes. Jacker swung his shield straight at Victor's body, and Lucy decided to take the opportunity and plunged her sword into Victor's heart. In his cries of agony, Victor floundered like a kite without a tail, stumbling and coughing up blood at the same time. He managed to get twenty feet away from his opponents, then hit the stone wall of the passage with a thud and fell to the ground like a bag of bones. He was no longer breathing. The assassins simply could not match the strength of the warriors. Anyway, the weapons they used were of different levels. One used light daggers, while the other used heavy and durable war hammers and iron shields. In the end, one had one item and the other had two. The fact that Victor did not immediately die after the joint attack impressed everyone. Link saw the mission completion notification on the game interface and received Omni Points as a reward. Now he had 13 Omni Points. That is it? We won? The members of the Flamingo Mercenary Group could not believe it. The mission went so smoothly and easily that compared to other missions they had completed, this one was just a vacation? No, this is not the end. At first, Link also thought that the mission was over, but then he saw a black crystal falling out of the bag, Victor. The black crystal lay in a pool of Victor's blood, a thick black aura emanated from it. When this black cloud appeared, the temperature in the cave dropped sharply. The ball of light that Link conjured became significantly dimmer, just like the flickering light from a candle. What was more terrifying was that this black cloud seemed to be alive. It flowed into Victor's nostrils, and his body began to shake slightly. What kind of bullshit is this? Gildern cried out in horror. The dead body began to move again. It seemed like things were only getting worse. Just at that moment, Link received notification of a new mission. Mission activated. Eliminate the occult. Mission details. Kill the demonic victor. Completion reward, 30 Omni Points. The more Omni Points given as mission rewards, the more difficult it was to complete it. If you kill only one target, Link will receive 30 Omni Points. Link shuddered as he thought about how strong this demonic victor was. Even Link was terrified. What was happening to Victor became more and more terrible. Smoke flowed into his body through his nostrils and his body began to tremble violently. Then, a scarlet gas burst out from the pores of his skin, completely covering his body and turning into a strong blood-red shield. Within this protection, Victor's build and figure visibly became stronger and stronger. Link felt a sense of impending danger and horror as he saw this terrifying action unfolding right in front of him. He had seen something similar once before. This happened at the Eastern Bay Academy of Magic, about six months after the official launch of the game. This action also caused the infamous events at the Academy. A sixth-level magician named Bale was caught studying dark magic without the necessary permission. Indeed, he was working on the most sinister group of dark magic spells, summoning demons. Indeed, when he was caught doing this, he was just performing a ritual to summon demons. The Dean of the Academy, Master Mage Anthony, gathered many sixth-level magic masters to prevent Bale from summoning a demon. However, due to the collision of spells, Bale's magic tower collapsed and the elements began to combine into large clumps until there were so many of them that a strong eruption occurred, which scattered these elements over half of the entire territory of the academy. But that was not all. When Bale died, a black crystal appeared on his body, which absorbed all of Bale's blood. He then resurrected as a terrifying undead monster. This monster not only knew all of Bale's spells, but also had a body with very strong resistance to magic. When he engaged in battle with the Academy's magic masters, this strange monster broke the sealed barrier holding the demon Tarvis, causing the demon to be revived and escape. When Link participated in this mission in the game, he saw with his own eyes how Master Wizard Bale was resurrected from dead, and he will never forget this sight. And now exactly the same changes were happening to Victor, his body. Quickly! We need to get out of here, Link shouted. The black crystal was called Demonic Runes. It contained countless forbidden dark magic runes, and when fresh blood fell on it, it could give demonic power to the one whose blood was spilled. 
after such a demonic transformation, a person loses his humanity and becomes ruthless and bloodthirsty. In addition, his strength and power are increased by at least two times, and his skin is given strong resistance to magical attacks, thus becoming a barrier that repels external elements. In short, transformation turns a person into a terrible killing machine. And although the process of demonic transformation could be stopped, it required a huge amount of energy, at least as powerful as that of the creator of these runes. But the creator of these magical runes was an extraordinary demon, and the power of even an ordinary demon was already irresistible. In the game, even Anthony, a seventh-level master magician, could not stop the process of occult transformation. In fact, he was not even able to destroy Bale's corpse because the power of the demonic runes protected him, just as the bloody shield now protected Victor's body. This was because the creator of the occult runes was the imprisoned Tarvis, a formidable demon who possessed legendary power. Link acted cautiously. He slowly walked away from Victor's corpse, keeping his eyes on the crystal next to him. Then a notification appeared on the interface. Demonic runes quality. Legendary effects. Destroys the life form in the realm of light and gives demonic characteristics and power. Note, if you are not a legendary mage, do not even think about stopping the process of demonic transformation. Prepare for a fierce battle. Legendary item. This means that the creator was a legendary demon. Link would never have believed that this black crystal that had now appeared in the Gerwent Forest had nothing to do with the legendary demon Tarvis. He thought that the creator of the demonic runes crystal was the same Tarvis from the game. But why were the demonic runes of Tarvis here? Link was puzzled by this question. But he knew that the demonic victor would have enormous power when he was resurrected. A power that even the combined efforts of the three mercenaries and himself could not match. Naturally, retreating was the best and only option at this point. But Link couldn't resist fighting. So while he was retreating, he waved his wand and a glass ball appeared and headed towards the demonic victor. The ball hit its target easily, but shattered with a soft pop against the blood-red shield without even damaging its surface. This ended his hopes of stopping the process of demonic transformation. The mercenaries trusted Link's judgment, so when they saw signs that he was beginning to panic, they immediately began to retreat. Each of them had the cat's dexterity spell cast on them, so they ran away quickly. But when they reached the exit from the cave passage, Link suddenly stopped. Stop, it's too late to run. He felt a rapidly occurring change in movement in the chaos of the dark aura behind him. As soon as he said this, the demonic transformation was completed. The effect of the demonic runes was as follows. The weaker the target, the faster the demonic transformation occurred. In the game, it took 15 seconds to transform Bale, a level 6 mage, and now Victor's transformation took less than 5 seconds. Jacker and Lucy immediately stopped, but Gildern gave in to his instincts and continued running. Link shouted, Come back! Our only chance is to unite against the monster and defeat it. Otherwise, even if we escape from the cave, he will still grab us. This monster wants revenge. He won. He will stop at nothing until we die. Gildern's body shook, and he immediately stopped. Just at that moment, the four heard a hoarse voice. Do you think you can kill me? Ha! You are too optimistic, fools. All four turned around and saw Victor standing on his feet again. His body had become significantly larger and taller, and the bare skin of his face appeared grayish-green, a complex web of magical runes scattered across its now metallic surface. His eyes glowed with a blinding red light. Anyone lucky enough to look into those eyes will be overcome with a sense of chaos, a premonition of murder, a mad lust for blood, and all sorts of negative emotions. The emotions evoked by this spectacle were so strong that a person with a weak will could get a mental disorder, or in other words, be scared out of his mind. This was the kind of terrible psychological impact that beings with demonic power could have. Jacker, Lucy, and Gildern had the courage, but in the face of such a heartbreaking gaze, they would also be scared to death. It will surely kill us. There is no way we can defeat this monster. He's too strong. By the ruler of light, is this a demon? A bunch of negative emotions overwhelmed the three mercenaries. They didn't have the willpower to do anything other than retreat and run for their lives. Jacker was in slightly better condition than the other two mercenaries. His face was stony, it showed no emotion. But Lucy was now deathly pale, and Gildern began to tremble. The only one who managed to maintain his composure and sane mind was Link. His soul was strengthened by the God of Light, so he was much stronger than ordinary people. But his personality came first naturally calm and collected. Even when Victor sent a furious stream of deadly aura towards them, Link remained as calm as a millpond.
not flinching in the face of the huge, raging wave. He saw that all three were standing motionless, stunned. So Link calmly assured them, demonic runes can only double the power of the owner of the body. Jacker, Victor was only a third-level assassin. Even if his strength doubled, he would not be able to defeat you. The advantage of the assassins was the dexterity of their limbs. Their physical strength was ordinary at best. Jacker, on the other hand, was a warrior. Brute strength was his greatest strength. Realizing this, Jacker was able to relax a little. He believed that something Link said was true, since Link had proven many times before that he was thinking straight. Link then turned to Lucy. There is a magic enhancement on his skin, but I will put a spell on your sword that will make him sharper. You will definitely be able to break through his defense. Link had 19 Omni points and 80 mana points left, but without hesitation, he spent 10 of his Omni points to buy a first level spell, sharpness spell, medium level. Level 1 spell effects makes the weapon very sharp. An ordinary iron sword can cut through steel like butter. The effect lasts 10 minutes. The sharpness spell was a regular spell. It couldn't be changed or improved much. It was a high-level replacement for the level 0 sharpness spell, so it was already quite powerful. After purchasing the spell, Link pointed his wand at Lucy's sword. Immediately the sword was enveloped in a bright white shell of light. As the light dimmed, a clear blue aura erupted from Lucy's sword a sign that the effect of the mid-level acuity spell had begun to work. Link then pointed his wand at Gildern's quiver and cast the same spell. As the light dimmed and dissipated, all fifteen arrows in the quiver glowed with an icy blue light. Link worked quickly. When he finished, barely a second had passed. Demonic Victor was still far away, sixty feet away. He had not yet begun to attack. Now Link's mana had been reduced to sixty-eight points and the effects of the cat's agility that affected everyone had diminished. However, without thinking, he waved his wand and cast cat's agility on everyone once again. It took 24 mana points, and he only had 44 left. 44 mana points is not a lot, but it is enough to release 44 glass balls. Demonic Victor saw that his opponents were actively preparing for battle, and he was bloody. Red eyes looked intently at Link. You, weakling mage, you destroyed everything I created. I will catch you and slowly cut your flesh. I will enjoy your slow, painful death. Victor's voice was filled with a thirst for revenge. He slowly moved towards the group of mercenaries, and as he passed Collins, he raised his foot and stepped on Collins's neck. Crunch! It was Collins's spine that broke. He died while he was still unconscious. Victor burst out with a blood-curdling laugh. Everyone in this cave must die today! Link ignored these displays of demonic Victor's cruelty and instead focused his vision to make it as sharp and piercing as ice. Now he was back in a state of concentrated spell casting. Is everyone ready? He asked. Jacker took a deep breath and firmly grabbed the shield. I, I am ready. Me too, said Lucy, pursing her dark red lips. We need to get this over with. Gildern picked up a long bow. Cold sweat rolled down from the shooter. Great. Link did not take his eyes off the approaching occult victor. Remember. If we kill him, everything in Echo Bay will become ours. This proposal revived the three mercenaries. Their eyes lit up brightly at the thought of it. During the mission, they saw a lot of valuable treasures, but due to the fact that they needed to act immediately, they did not have time to take it all. But now all they had to do was overcome the last obstacle, and everything would be theirs. It would be stupid to run away now. After all, they are mercenaries. Who could know better than the mercenaries that in life you either kill or they kill you? As soon as they thought about this, courage and determination returned to the three mercenaries. Now they were ready for battle. Passage in the cave. Nobody's. How I hate your magic. Victor held a dagger in his hand, emitting a bluish-black light. His eyes were fixed on the two thin, puny young men who were surrounded by their comrades, even now that the magic had brought him back to life. The man still had a high level of knowledge, and within a few seconds of observation he clearly understood how dangerous these magicians were. Victor was sure that as long as he didn't kill the twin magicians, the other three mercenaries had nothing to worry about. But he still thought it was strange that in a group of mercenaries there was a pair of identical twins, and both were magicians. The coincidence was too incredible. Blow everything up. The demonic Victor could not understand this, no matter how he thought about it, so he put the question aside. When Victor came closer than thirty feet, Jacker muttered something under his breath, raised his shield and rushed towards the bandit. Accurate throwing at an enemy required the expenditure of combat aura, 
as well as a special breathing technique and the simultaneous use of all muscles of the body. Such a throw released an explosive amount of energy, and the warrior became very fast. It was very difficult to dodge such a blow, of course, if the attack was not predictable. But without any effort, Demonic Victor deftly dodged the attack like a marten. At the moment when the shield was about to hit him, the man quickly stepped aside, and Jacker's attack turned out to be completely and completely unsuccessful. You are fast, but still not fast enough. Mockery was heard in Demonic Victor's voice. He turned and moving quickly like the wind, he suddenly appeared right next to Jacker. His dagger was like a poisonous snake. The blade easily circled Jacker's shield, and Victor plunged his weapon straight into the enemy's neck. The speed of his dagger was too fast. Jacker had no chance to dodge this blow. If Jacker had fought one-on-one -on -one with the demonic Victor, he would have finished him off in this one move. That's how powerful the occult Victor was. But Jacker wasn't alone. As his eyes focused on the kill, Victor noticed a flashing light out of the corner of his eye. He then saw that a sky-blue sphere of light appeared right in front of his dagger and glowed faintly. What it is? The question flashed in Victor's head, but before he could react, the ball of light exploded. Boom! There was a loud explosion. Victor felt the back of his hand become hot. At the same time, his dagger vibrated with energy. There was not much of it, but the energy was dense. The dagger shook until Victor felt a slight pain in his palm, and then everything went away. It was Link. He used the glass balls to save Jacker. In Victor's brief moment of confusion, Jacker came to his senses. With no time to celebrate his good fortune, the warrior quickly pulled himself together to prepare for a counterattack. He raised the thick, heavy iron shield with his left hand, as if it were a giant iron piece of his own arm, and charged at Victor furiously. Jacker came up with this attack due to his experience in combat. The purpose of such an attack was to retaliate when he did no damage with his first attack. If this was Jacker's attack under normal circumstances, Victor, with his increased agility after transforming with magic, would have easily dodged this move. But the cat's dexterity spell was cast on Jacker's body. His body might not be as agile as demonic Victor's, but now he was still much better than an ordinary warrior. He now moved as smooth as water and very fast. This was far beyond Victor's expectations. Boom! There was a strong blow. I hit him! Jacker was happy but felt that something was wrong. Why doesn't Victor retreat? Usually strong blows like this knock out the enemy or force him to retreat. Jacker looked out from behind his shield and saw a terrible sight. Victor stopped the attack, holding onto the metal shield with one hand. With only one hand, he was able to withstand Jacker's powerful attack almost effortlessly. The warrior also saw that three glass balls exploded right next to Victor's face. But this attack, which would have finished off several bandits, did not even scratch his skin. In fact, Victor didn't necessarily even frown. The bandit leader just closed his eyes and waited for the balls to explode. He knew that if he didn't open his eyes at the wrong time, he wouldn't take any damage. Of course, these attacks weren't completely useless. They managed to control and limit Victor's movements so that he couldn't attack Jacker again. What power, what powerful protective magic, Jacker thought, but at the same time sighed with relief. The opponent may have blocked the shield, but the shield was not strong enough to defeat the opponent. This confirmed Link's words that Victor was not invincible. I can distract him, and you attack, Jacker shouted, with his right hand, in which he was holding a warhammer. The warrior struck Victor on the head. Seeing that Jacker could hold Victor in place, Gildern's courage returned, and he shot an arrow at demonic Victor's head. Lucy also rushed to Victor. Before the girl began to attack the enemy, Link's voice convinced her. Don't try to drag out the battle. Just give him a quick strike and cut his skin. Demonic Victor's skin had magical protection. Link's magic was useless to him, but no matter how durable the skin was, it was ultimately just a protective shell outside the body, made up of elements. If all the elements could not penetrate the body, then life would not exist at all. Victor's inner body also could not contain high-level defensive magic, so as long as there were a few exposed spots on the skin, the glass balls could certainly cause real damage. Got it, answered Lucy. Because of the cat's agility spell, she actually looked like a real cat rushing towards Victor. Victor faced Jackar's war hammer, Gildern's arrow, Link's spells, and Lucy's sword at the same time. Before his death, Victor was a level three assassin. Now his strength has increased to the fourth level assassin. However, it is amazing how a level four assassin was able to withstand a joint attack from four sides. Suddenly Victor felt a huge force pressing on him. He hesitated for a second, and Lucy wounded his right hand with her sword. 
That woman's fucking sword was so sharp that his skin was left without protection. Damn you! Victor cursed, and a black cloud around his body pulsated, and then covered the wound on his hand. At the same time, quickly as a lightning, using a dagger that glowed with black light, he stabbed Lucy before she could react. Victor moved frighteningly fast. He swung the dagger frantically as if he was enraged, and his hand moved so fast that it became almost invisible like a shadow. Faced with such attacks, a simple level two archer and Lucy could not dodge or dodge them. She remembered Link's words, how as soon as she attacks the enemy she must retreat. But her speed was too slow. The girl did not have time to dodge Victor's attack. She felt the skin on her chest near her heart begin to tingle. Lucy knew that the enemy would deal her a decisive blow with a dagger. Is this the end? At the very last moment, time seemed to stop. Before Lucy's eyes, her whole life flashed frame by frame. From a peasant girl to a beautiful young girl. And then how her drunken father sold her to an old nobleman as a maid in a castle. She then gave herself up to a knight in the castle to teach her fencing. And then the girl escaped from the castle and became a traveling mercenary. As a mercenary, she met Jacker and Gildern. They formed their own small group of mercenaries and made a pact that they would earn money together and create their own mercenary group. She fought her way out of the mud in which she was born to one day fly high. High like a bird, but now it was all in vain. The girl I saw a dagger shining with a black sheen. The blade gradually approached her heart. Lucy knew that she would soon die. Will this be the end of my life? The bitter, ordinary life of a nameless girl. Will her whole life end today here in this dark cave where no one will remember about her? I'm not ready to give up my life yet, Lucy mentally exclaimed, but she no longer had the strength to resist or fight. Just at that moment, a crystal flame explosion appeared, which emitted a blue glow. The flame explosion, like a messenger from God, inexplicably moved along a curved path, bending around the other hand of the occult victor. It hit the blade of his dagger exactly. Boom! The flame explosion exploded, and a hot wave seemed to explode between Lucy and the dagger, preventing it from piercing her skin. But it was still not enough. Victor's body was protected by very strong defensive magic. He was very strong. The flame burst attack could only block his blow for a second, but that was not enough for Jacker and Gildern to save Lucy. But then Lucy felt her body being pulled back by a powerful force. She was pulled back at a speed that was at least 50% faster than normal. It was Link who used the level 1 spell Vector throw on her. With this spell, Lucy barely managed to escape the claws of death. Whoa! Lucy gasped. Victor's dagger pierced the girl's leather armor, leaving dark marks on the black skin, as if after poison. But just before the dagger pierced Lucy's skin, she was already out of Victor's sight. It was this critical moment that decided whether she would live or die. The victim escaped, and Victor's efforts were in vain. Moreover, he was now in a dangerous position, because now he could not avoid the attacks of Jacker or Gildern. At least that's what the two mercenaries thought. But Victor had an ace up his sleeve. The black cloud surrounding his body flared up with a strong impulse again, and it was as if he was instantly thrown out of the battle zone at a distance of fifteen feet. This is impossible. The three mercenaries were stunned by the strange turn of events. This is the assassin's combat skill. Instant flash, Link shouted, revealing Victor's trick. Instant flash, level three, assassin combat skill. Effects explodes the combat aura, allowing you to travel distances of up to 30 feet at unimaginably high speeds. Note, uses a large amount of combat aura. Do not overuse this spell. He can jump up to 30 feet and can't use a spell too many times. This warning was made by Link's avatar and not by Link himself in order to confuse Victor. Jacker and the others were terrified at first, but when they heard what Link shouted, all three instantly breathed a sigh of relief. The unknown was always scary. But now that they had a knowledgeable magician on their side who could reveal their opponent's tricks one by one, what else should they be afraid of? Jacker didn't hesitate now. He attacked Victor again. This attack also cost a large amount of battle aura. But Jacker didn't care, because he was not alone. There were three more allies with him. On the other hand, Victor's instant flash had just ended. The man felt a gust of wind crash into him and saw a shadow rushing towards him gradually turning into a large figure. It was still the same damn warrior. This time the attack was fast. Victor realized that he could not answer her as quickly. He had no choice but to blast his battle aura again. He then pointed his palm at the shield. Boom! Victor's hand stopped Jacker's attack, but Victor was wounded. The impact of the attack was very strong, 
and even in his enhanced demonic form, resisting this attack still proved to be an impossible task. Victor's right arm was originally bruised, but now it was damaged to such an extent that the bandit could no longer lift it. How about another arrow from me? Gildern's confidence began to grow. He and Jacker were a great team. The archer fired an arrow, which flew close to Jacker's ear, cutting off some of the warrior's hair, and headed towards Victor. Having already been hit by Lucy's sword, Victor could not afford to be killed by the arrow, which again glowed with the same blue light. He managed to dodge the arrow in critical moment, but when he dodged, he heard the sound of a rushing gust of wind. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Jacker swinging his warhammer at him again, and on the other hand, a long sword emitting blue light, trying to hit him. This time it was a joint attack from Jacker and Lucy. What was even more dangerous was that the magicians were also casting spells on him. The ball, glowing with a dull blue light, hit Victor right on the wound on his hand. There was a pop, and Victor felt pain, then numbness in his hand, and from the puncture wound he felt an extraordinary heat that penetrated his body. This joint attack ended in death, and Victor had no time to react. However, Victor was extremely cunning. The bandit saw that he had no way out, so he used his battle aura once again and activated the instant flash spell. But this time, Victor did not use flash to retreat, but rather to jump towards Link. These two mages were to blame in all his troubles. He hated them and decided to kill them both. After the previous instantaneous flash, he activated another one. Soon Victor reached Link. Die! Victor shouted angrily, piercing Link with a dagger. Demonic Victor had irresistible power. He moved too fast. No one could keep up with him. And besides, the bandit was excellent at the combat skill instant flash. In short, Victor had a decisive advantage in this battle. No one could stop him from attacking whoever he wanted. Or so it seemed. A few seconds ago, three mercenaries cornered Victor. They could practically finish him off in one move, but the next moment the situation changed. Now Link, their leader, found himself in a deadly situation. Jacker and Lucy were the first to return to Link to help him, but they could not do anything with such a short warning. It took at least half a second for Jacker's attack to reach Link, but by by that time, Victor could have killed the magician three times already. And although Lucy had very dexterous limbs, her speed was still lower than even Jacker's, so she could not quickly reach Link. Protect him! Jacker shouted to Gildern. Thanks to this battle, it had just become clear that the demonic Victor was much stronger than what the three mercenaries could fight against. If he killed Link, they would definitely die. Gunslinger Gildern understood Link's importance well. He was ready to use his bow even as a wooden stick to hit Victor with it. He knew it wouldn't kill or even hurt Victor, but he hoped it would buy him at least some time before Jacker and Lucy could get to them. I'll kill you first, Victor exclaimed. Victor did not resist the blow of the longbow at all. His dagger was aimed directly at Gildern, who was an archer, so close combat was not his strong suit at all. Victor didn't even bother to evade Gildern's futile attack, as he was too consumed with the desire to kill everyone. Gildern knew he had no chance of evading Victor's attacks. The archer thought he was about to deal the final blow, but then... Boom! These were Link's glass balls. One hit Victor in the hand and the other in the face. Victor's attack was again thwarted by the mage. Gildern instinctively retreated. Now there was no one to protect Link. Are you still trying to save others? Let's see who will save you. It's time for you to die, Victor said, grinning evilly. He rushed forward with his dagger and stabbed Link in the heart. Not Link himself, but his physical avatar. But how could it be an avatar? This happened because at the moment when Victor used his instant flash skill towards Link, his instincts flared up. Being a weak mage, he was very sensitive to sudden attacks of this kind. So he intuitively stepped back, leaving his physical avatar a little closer to Victor. In any brutal battle, it is natural to rush to attack the nearest target to you. In Victor's opinion, it was just a pair of twin magicians. They both needed to be killed, no matter which one of them will die first. Naturally, he attacked the one closest to him first. But as soon as he stabbed the dagger, Victor realized that something was wrong. He had killed many people and knew exactly what it must be like when his dagger pierced flesh and bone, but now this feeling has disappeared. It didn't look like he had struck the body. It was hard as if a bandit had stuck his dagger into the ground. What's the matter? Victor was shocked. Link then lost control of the physical avatar and the spell began to break. The avatar turned into a pile of dirt and sand. Victor immediately realized that he had made a serious mistake. Glass ball, Link said in a low, even voice. 
With a slight wave of his wand, small balls appeared in the air one after another. This time, Link really focused all his attention on creating the spell, and in less than half a second, nine blue balls appeared out of thin air. They moved in two groups. The first was heading towards Victor's face, and the rest were aimed at the wound on Victor's arm. Like Gildern, Link had no intention of seriously harming Victor. He only wanted to slow down his attacks, giving Jacker and the others time to recover. In order to increase the speed of casting spells to the limit, Link stood as still as a stone. But Gildern thought this was a bad idea. He was focused on only one thing. Link should not die. He slung his bow over his back, wrapped both arms around Link's body, and jumped away from the demonic victor as quickly as he could. None of this distracted Link's attention. He focused entirely on creating the spell. Even though the flames could not harm him, Victor did not dare to underestimate the consequences of these explosions. Every part of his body could easily withstand such an attack, but his eyes were definitely not capable of it. The bandit had to close his eyes. But in a battle against joint attacks, closing your eyes even for a moment meant certain death or defeat. The wound on his arm was also unable to withstand this attack, so when faced with explosive attacks, he could do nothing but dodge them. Yet he underestimated Link's spell. The glass balls did not look like arrows. Their trajectory could change at any second. When the distance was small enough, there was no chance to evade these attacks. Boom, 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 boom. Victor felt that the skin on his face was numb, but he did not dare open his eyes. The only thing he felt through his nose was the hot air around him. And because of this, he was even afraid to breathe, because the air could burn his lungs. The puncture wound on his right arm burned with severe pain. It seemed as if his entire arm had been fried to a crisp. Under these conditions, he no longer had the ability to use Flash Flash to run after Link. By this time, Jacker had reached Link. He used his charge. Bam! After Link's previous attack, Jacker used his shield with all his might to hit the standing motionless Victor right in the back. Ah! Victor's body trembled and he spat out dark, thick blood. His injuries were serious. And now he was truly incapacitated. Perfect timing. Lucy was next to Jacker. She plunged the sword into Victor's chest from behind him. The sword penetrated about an inch deep into the body, but she wasn't sure if that would be enough. The sword did not pierce the heart, but the attack stunned the bandit, so his reaction slowed down significantly. She knew the huge difference in skill level between her and this monster, so after stabbing him once, she pulled out the sword and hid behind Jacker's shield, waiting for another opportune moment. But Jacker had no such fears. He knew that he was a shield for his comrades. The only thing he was concentrating on was stopping or taking the attacks of this monster, even if it meant taking damage on himself, while at the same time giving his comrades the opportunity to attack the enemy. He swung his shield at Victor, then quickly moved his shield to yourself to protect yourself. Then, with his right hand, he swung his warhammer at Victor's skull. Faced with the oncoming warhammer attack, all the bandit could do was tilt his head to the side. Bam! A disgusting sound was heard as the Warhammer slammed into the left shoulder of the demonic Victor. The Warhammer weighed about 170 pounds, and Jacker hit it with all his might. A dent appeared on Victor's shoulder. The bones inside were crushed. Victor's two arms were limp and useless. However, the strength of demonic bodies was that they had an increased recovery rate. Black smoke swirled over each of Victor's wounds, and they healed right before his eyes. If only Victor could get some rest, he could fight back and resume the battle. But could Link let that happen? Definitely not. Hit with all your might, Link shouted. This was the best opportunity for them. Lucy rushed towards Victor again. Gildern jumped out from behind Link, pulled back his bowstring, and shot several arrows at the bandit. In a mad rage, Jacker continued to hit Victor with his warhammer. Link himself continued to cast spells, and a series of small balls continued to shoot directly into the wounds on Victor's body. In less than a second, their opponent was completely destroyed under the barrage of attacks. The demonic body may be strong and resilient, but under such an intense wave of attacks, he was finally beaten to the point where Victor began to resemble a tattered ragdoll. Grunting, the bandit's skull was smashed by Jacker's warhammer. When Victor fell to the ground, his body seemed to be covered with wounds from a thousand cuts. Not a single living spot remained on him. But even despite such a serious wound, this monster still did not die. He was still breathing and fighting. Black steam was still swirling around his body, trying to heal his wounds. The three mercenaries were horrified. They didn't care how badly Victor's body was broken, they simply continued to attack him in a terrifying frenzy. Ten seconds later, Jacker fell to the ground, trying to catch his breath. 
Lucy leaned against the wall of the cave, soaking wet with sweat. Gildern massaged his hand, which was cramping. In front of them lay a pile of broken flesh that used to be Victor. Is he dead now? Jacker still didn't believe and was worried, so he wanted Link to help him make sure of this. Demonic Victor was so monstrous and strange that he reminded him of demons from legends. In legends, demons did not die. The three mercenaries did not dare to take risks. If necessary, they will incinerate Victor's corpse, then seal those ashes into nine different urns and bury the urns separately, and they will make sure that each urn is at least twenty miles away from the rest. According to legends, this was the only way to make sure that demons would not come to life. Link nodded silently, then said, He is dead. He was only changed by demonic magic. His life force was still many times different from that of a real demon. Demonic Victor could not survive such a strong attack. Something was flashing on the interface. Link checked what it was and realized it was a mission completion notification. He killed Demonic Victor and completed the mission to destroy demonic magic. Then, as a reward, he was given 30 Omni Points. Now he had 39 Omni Points. Now everything that lies in the Echo Cave is ours. Time to get going, Link reminded them. Hearing this sentence, the tired and exhausted mercenaries seemed to come to life. Their eyes suddenly lit up like light bulbs, and they immediately began collecting loot. In the game, whenever players wanted to collect loot left over from battles, they would either search for the boss's body or scrutinize the map for collectibles. Typically, loot could be taken from the corpses of fallen enemies. This may seem mean, but it is generally considered noble, wise, and prudent. But in fact, the Flamingo mercenary group showed Link the other side of robbery. Savagery. They were so impatient that Link watched in horror as the mercenaries attacked the Brotherhood's treasures and belongings like a swarm of locusts. They took every item in the silent mine that could be sold for even a small amount of money. They even took the underwear of the Dark Brotherhood members. And so, half an hour after Victor's death, Jacker, Lucy, and Gildern stood on the plain of Echo Bay. Their faces were red, and next to them lay trophies, piled in a large pile. From all the members of the Dark Brotherhood, they removed the leather armor, even from ordinary members of the Brotherhood who were in the cave. They took all their weapons and collected them in a pile. In total, they collected 75 regular leather armor, 28 elite leather armor, 50 bows, 100 swords of varying quality, 30 shields, and 25 daggers. In addition, they found four sets magical equipment. Among them were Grint's fire warrior armor, the flaming sword, Victor's dagger of corruption, and the crystal ball of detection. Victor didn't have much use for the Shadow Dagger, but it was actually a top-quality weapon and could cost over 200 gold coins. Lucy's face turned purple and her almond-shaped eyes sparkled. The girl rushed back and forth, collecting prey, and her red hair shimmered like flame. She was the group's accountant, and it was Lucy who calculated the total value of their loot on a goatskin scroll, pen in hand. Regular leather armor costs one gold coin, high-grade leather armor costs two gold coins, onion one and a half gold coins. A regular steel sword costs two gold coins. All this equipment is worth at least 800 gold. Even before she finished this sentence, Jacker and Gildern could not help but be surprised. Wow, this is a fortune. It must be a dream. They used to get, if they were lucky, five gold for each mission they completed. Usually mercenaries received silver, for example, for a mission in which they obtained information. The reward was about 20 silver coins, about two gold coins, so each received seven or eight silver coins. Last year they completed about ten missions and earned fifty gold coins. They could live comfortably off this income, but they always kept their guns ready, fearing for their lives every day. So when they had no missions, they spent their money wastefully, as if there was no tomorrow. If Lucy hadn't warned them, they probably would have been penniless. But this time, after completing just one mission, they were able to get seven hundred gold coins by selling only their uniforms. This was an amount that they could not earn by working as mercenaries even for ten years. But that? It's not all, Lucy exclaimed. Lucy's heart was pounding because with this money she could get better equipment. She wanted to buy so many things but couldn't afford them. But now the girl could buy them all. The first thing they had to do was sell the uniforms before they got any money. There were a few more gold coins to be found around because each bandit was wearing money pouches. Of course they took everything. Victor also had his own personal chest which Jacker broke open with a hammer. Inside it, he found about 80 gold coins. In total, they had about 200 gold coins that could already be spent. The mercenaries' eyes were dazzled by the huge amount of gold and silver coins. Moreover, each bandit had his own savings, gems, jewelry, pocket watches, and various other valuable trinkets. 
For all this you can get money, and naturally, they did not leave a single item. One silver pocket watch can be sold for three gold coins, and for this ring with a red gem, they will give us five gold coins. And look at this silver keychain in the shape of a horse. This is the work of the master Dormick. I'm sure he's worth something too. But the most valuable thing has to be this bag of precious stones. Look how exquisite these rare gems are, said Lucy. These gems were, of course, the very reward that Victor received from the stranger in the black robe. Lucy quickly calculated the loot and came to the following conclusion. They must be worth at least seven hundred gold coins. Jacker and Gildern both swallowed. Gildern counted on his fingers. Seven hundred plus two hundred plus seven hundred? Holy God of light, that's one thousand six hundred gold coins. He must receive at least one hundred gold coins. Having so much money, he will not be calm. No. When he receives his share, he must find himself a beautiful wife and have a child with her. Thus, even if one day Gildern dies in battle, he will die calmly, knowing that his bloodline will not end with him. Gildern never wanted to lead a quiet, calm life. He loved the thrill and could not stay in one place for long. This attitude towards life was common to all three members of the Flamingo mercenary group. After they determined the value of their loot, Jacker, as the most reasonable of the three, looked at Link, expecting him to divide everything between them. The warrior understood that they were able to earn so much gold only thanks to Link's magic. Lucy and Gildern also looked at Link, but they were worried that Link would get too much of a share. And Link was a little disappointed. For a common man, this amount of money would be considered a fortune. But for a magician, it was only an insignificant amount. But he did not regret anything, because he found the most valuable object among this pile of loot, the occult runes of Tarvis. Link knew that the occult runes were dangerous, they may even have demagogic abilities, but nevertheless they contained the treasured magical knowledge that every magician dreamed of obtaining. No one in the Legion of Light would openly admit that they would like to receive such an item, but if it were sold to the Dark Elf Kingdom in Pralinka, it could definitely bring more than 10,000 gold coins, but Link would never sell it. With the level of magic he currently possessed, the youth did not have enough knowledge to study and decipher occult runes. But in the future, if he keeps the runes for himself, they might come in handy one day. The three mercenaries didn't think much about the fact that Link took the magic runes for himself. They simply wanted to be as far away from such a vicious subject as possible. Who would want to touch him again after everything they had been through? Seeing that all the members of the Flamingo mercenary group were staring at him, Link thought and said, Just give me the gold coins and take all the equipment and divide it among yourselves. Sharing equipment between them was too much of a hassle, and what Link hated most was hassle. He had already taken the occult runes, a rare legendary item, so he was more than satisfied. And after all, these mercenaries risked their lives on this mission. He couldn't help but pay them for it, right? As for the tuition fees, Link suspected he would find enough money to pay because he had seen how in the pile of loot was something called Victor's Treasure Map. The treasure map was scattered in the pile, so the three mercenaries did not notice it at all. Searching for treasure in the game was interesting and fun, but in the real world it was rather dirty, tedious, and dangerous class. Link didn't want to do this alone. He knew it would be better if someone helped him do the dirty work and then share the gold coins with the helpers. But for this, he needed those he could trust. These three mercenaries seemed to be reliable people. They were agile and strong. They may lose their temper when they see such great wealth. But their thoughts remain sound, and they do not lose their temper. That kind of fortitude wasn't a bad thing, although Link still doubted their integrity because they hadn't known each other for long. Link also used this opportunity to test their honesty. When Link spoke, the three mercenaries looked at each other. But Link, what is left is worth at least 1,400 gold coins? Jacker exclaimed in bewilderment. I know, but they're too tedious to deal with. You need to spend too much time on this. In any case, you helped me a lot, Link said. But how can we agree with this? You should receive at least 1,200 gold coins, Lucy said without hesitation. There were only three of them in the Flamingo mercenary group, but it would only be fair if the one who worked the hardest received the most money. Even the seemingly stingy Gildern did not expect to receive much. Out of 1,600 gold coins, he would be very happy to receive only 100. The young mage not only gave them the opportunity to plunder the treasures and things of the Dark Brotherhood, he also saved their lives many times, especially Lucy, whose life he snatched from the clutches of the God of Death himself. Naturally, she was very grateful to Link. Jacker nodded in agreement. 
Gildern had some doubts, but he agreed with what Lucy said, so he nodded too. Link laughed. What just happened proved that the three mercenaries were honest. Even if honesty is not the basis of all their actions, it is still a strong basis for trust and cooperation. In any case, Link will never dig for treasures. It takes too much time and effort. He would have to find someone else to do this, and now that he knew he could rely on the Flamingo mercenary group, he would naturally ask them for help. He didn't have to look for all the hidden treasures. Once he finds enough gold coins to pay for his tuition, he will stop. He pointed to a tiny notebook in the pile of loot and asked, grinning, did you see that red leather notebook? Lucy looked at where Link was pointing. Then with a slight, she said with disgust on her face, Of course, this is Victor's dirty little notebook. It's full of his lustful adventures. She found this notebook when they burst into Victor's room. It was lying right on the desktop, so Lucy opened it and found that it was filled with vulgar and obscene contents. If the notebook had not been worth several silver coins because of its fine material, it would never have appeared in this pile. Lucy was not the only one who noticed Red Leather Notebook. Jacker and Gildern saw it too. Jacker didn't appreciate it. Gildern, on the contrary, laughed and said, Well, it's not that bad. I didn't expect Victor to be such a person, but I liked the contents of the notebook. Lucy glared at him for saying those words. Link just shook his head. It was not that simple. The three didn't understand what Link meant. Mr. Link, did you notice something in the notebook? Jacker asked. Link nodded and asked Lucy, you found this notebook in Victor Cisa's office, right? Yes, it was lying open on the table. Lucy nodded, although she did not understand why Link asked this question. It was lying right on the table. Open? Maybe Victor was in such a hurry to run away that he forgot to pick it up. It was either that, or he remembered every place where he hid treasures and didn't need this notebook to remember them. And maybe he was sure that no one would be able to decipher the secret places listed inside the notebook even if someone found it. However, Link was sure that the notebook contained maps to the locations of hidden treasures, because that this is exactly what the notepad looked like in the game. This notebook was also full of salacious details, containing secret messages about Victor's hidden loot. But of course, in the game, the erotic details were rehashed, so they weren't as explicit as the actual contents of the notebook. Link asked the question again, then I'll ask you. Do you think Victor was a pervert? The three of them looked at each other and then shook their heads. From what they knew about Victor, he certainly wasn't a good person, but he certainly couldn't be called depraved. There was not a single woman to be seen in all of Echo Bay. In fact, the only rumors about Victor's crimes concerned robbery, murder, extortion, and so on. But as for women, they did not seem to interest him. Then why are there such dirty notebooks on the table in his office? Link continued. I think you've all heard rumors about Victor's hidden treasures, right? Victor hid most of his wealth, but word always spread the secrets. Anyone who knew anything about the Dark Brotherhood had heard of this too. The three mercenaries nodded, their eyes aglow with anticipation and joy. They guessed what Link was trying to say, but each of them remained silent, waiting for Link to share his discovery with them. The young man stopped hinting. He opened the first page of the notebook and began to read it out loud. To be honest, this erotic diary was written well. It was rich in detail, full of delicate and explicit descriptions and images of female curves. Every page was filled with lust and desire, and on every page images of women came to life. When Link finished reading, Jacker's gloomy face turned slightly red. Gildern continued to lick his lips. It was clear that Lucy felt awkward. She crossed her long legs. Link pretended not to notice the mercenaries? Reaction, then calmly asked, Now what do you think? Jacker felt too awkward to answer anything, Lucy. His face had turned purple by this point, and she was also silent. Gildern chuckled and said, Not bad, not bad. Now I can't wait to go to the Red Mill brothel. Link stared at Gildern and asked, None of you saw an obvious secret message here at all? Secret message? What's the secret message? Lucy couldn't resist asking. She only understood the obscene content. Okay. Link was tired of hinting, so he explained to them in detail. If I understand correctly, this notebook is a map that contains the locations of Victor says hidden treasures. See? The first entry here says that he went to the town of Springs in search of pleasure. But that was just a cover. There's a hidden meaning in this passage? Link flipped through the pages. Well, Victor said that he was looking at a small stream flowing between the woman's legs. He probably meant the small stream that flowed through the middle of the Gerwin Forest. 
He said that there were three erotic moles located near the stream. I think these moles are his marks, maybe rocks or trees. Although I think they're probably trees since they're less noticeable. They won't attract unwanted attention. The three mercenaries looked at Link carefully, and finally he said that he felt the stream between her legs and found that there was something sticking out there. He meant that in the place marked by three large trees, there would be an island in the middle of the stream, and it was there that he buried his treasure. When Link finished explaining, something clicked in Lucy's head. Wait, I think I've seen this place before? Yes, it's about a mile from here. We already passed by this place. I even noted how beautiful these three huge trees are. Jacker, Gildern, don't you remember this place? Jacker and Gildern nodded at the same time. That was just two weeks ago? Then this must be it? It's only a mile away, so why don't we go there now and check it out? Link said, laughing. Echo Cove was really well hidden, and the team didn't have to worry about their things being stolen, even if they left them here unattended. The three mercenaries agreed with Link's opinion on this. A few minutes later, the four reached a place where three huge trees stood by a stream. They dug on an island in the middle of the stream, and after a while they finally found the chest. Opening the chest, they discovered that it was full of gold coins. After counting, people realized that it contained 150 gold coins. The three mercenaries felt their hearts being torn out of their chests. This was only the first hidden treasure, and they had already found 150 gold coins. At least half of this red notebook contained stories about love affairs. The mercenaries thought about the gold coins they could get, and their faces turned red. Link, why don't taunt you tell us about the next hidden treasure location? Jacker asked. He read the notebook, but did not notice any hidden messages in it. But in the eyes of this wonderful magician, everything turned into something completely different. A notebook with erotic adventures has become a treasure map. This only proved how wise the mages were. They truly deserved awe and respect. Lucy and Gildern both nodded, waiting for an answer. They found this treasure hunt interesting and exciting. Link flipped through the notebook and counted 18 entries, which meant that there were 18 hidden treasures. This was another difference between the game and the real world. In the game, you accidentally find pages of a notebook, but here, having found just one thing, you discover all the places where Victor hid his treasures. He smiled and said, I, it'll tell you. I'll tell you, don't worry. But after this time, I won't hunt for treasures with you guys anymore. Now let's return to Echo Bay. They found the first treasure easily. It was hidden not so far away, but they were just lucky. Maybe the rest of the treasures will be harder to find. They are called hidden treasures for a reason. Victor must have hidden them somewhere in the high mountains and isolated roads, places that people usually do not dare to visit. Link had no intention of wasting so much time on such unreliable quests. So they returned to Echo Bay again, and the three mercenaries began to collect their loot. They placed the items in linen bags and then disposed of the bandits' corpses. They were unable to dig a hole deep enough to bury all the bandits, so the mercenaries simply burned the bodies, including Victor's broken and mutilated body. Demonic magic was cast on him, and the mercenaries would not rest until they burned his body. The three mercenaries completely forgot about the reward from the city council in River Cove. All the same, only complete idiots admit that they defeated the Dark Brotherhood. It is better that they do not tell anyone about this incident. If word spread about what they did, people would know that they had Victor's treasure maps, and people who wanted to get the map would cause them a lot of trouble. And so they all agreed that this treasure hunt must always remain a secret. Link had already deciphered all the hidden messages in the notebook. Some of them were really obscure and hard to decipher, but that was hardly a problem for Link. He only had to read the note a few times before the contents of Victor's hidden message became clear. Link wrote everything down and handed the notebook to Jacker. If each of these hidden treasures contains 150 gold coins, then in total there must be at least 2,700 gold coins. 2,700 gold coins. Add to this the 1,400 gold coins they had received earlier, and a total of 4,100 gold coins could be obtained? A fortune indeed. Link knew that his father, although a Viscount, would never be able to fork out such a sum. Even if he sold all his property, he would still only be able to get a thousand gold coins. The rumors about Victor's great wealth turned out to be true. The three mercenaries' eyes widened. It was an amount of money that they could not even imagine. After a long pause, Jacker was the first to break the silence. Link, how do you plan to divide this amount? Lucy and Gildern also looked at Link. 
Their eyes were full of anticipation at the same time, and anxiety. Now they had no choice but to hope that Link would give them a good share. Link already had a plan. He said, I don't have time to hunt for hidden treasures, so I'll just trust you. Once you find them, you can give me one and a half thousand gold coins. Then when my magic skills are good enough, I could provide each of you with high-quality magic equipment for free. Of course, you don't have to give me these 1,500 gold coins. In that case, I'll just take these 200 gold coins now, and we'll go our separate ways. He was the son of a nobleman, and 1,500 gold coins would be enough for his tuition fees. Link remained as calm and collected as ever when it came to concern the share. He didn't seem to understand how big a sum 1,500 gold coins actually were. It didn't seem to matter to Link whether he got the money or not. He would have been pleased either way, and that was not so far from the truth. Even if he had a treasure map, he wouldn't bother searching for those treasures. All his attention was focused on writing about magic. He didn't want to waste a single minute, much less devote so much time and energy to searching for gold coins. If it weren't for the tuition fee, he wouldn't have thought about the Dark Brotherhood at all. But now that he had completed the mission, he couldn't just give up all the loot and rewards. So he deceived the mercenaries and used high-quality magical equipment as a reason for refusal. In truth, Honesty was, of course, important, but letting the mission succeed, especially one with such a sum of money involved, depending on the honesty of people on your team, was simply stupid, and most likely, a member of your team would be very tempted to decide to betray. Honesty can be tested, but if the temptation is so tempting, it can be easily broken. A really good plan would be to rely on people who were morally upright, and then tempt them with rewards. This would guarantee a higher chance of success. Link was sure that the three mercenaries were tempted by the offer to exchange one and a half thousand gold coins for three magical items of excellent quality, crafted by the wizard himself. Custom-made, high-quality magical equipment would definitely give them an advantage in battle. This was an advantage that even money could not buy. Regarding the matter of Link's magical skills, Jacker and the others had no doubt that he would one day be able to reach a high level to create magical equipment. He was already a powerful mage even at such a young age. How much more powerful will he be in a few years? They fought side by side with Link, so they did not doubt his honesty. If Link had truly been after the money, he could have easily killed them with spells and taken it all for himself. The three mercenaries quietly conferred for a while. Then Jacker stepped forward, put three hundred gold coins and another hundred gold coins from the discovered chest into the money bag, and gave them to Link. Then he promised, Mr. Link, we promise that we will send you one and a half thousand gold coins as quickly as possible. I will be at the River Cove Inn. Link did not touch the bag of money. Instead, he used the mage's hand to lift it because the bag turned out to be quite heavy. Well, goodbye. And good luck to you. Link turned around and walked out of Echo Cove, the bag of money mysteriously floating right through the air a few feet away from him. As he walked out of Echo Cove, the three mercenaries realized that they had seen and experienced all these strange and wonderful things in just one day. Jacker, are you sure that giving him one and a half thousand gold coins is a good idea? Gildern hesitated. Lucy immediately looked at him and said, You idiot! This guy will surely become a powerful mage someday. He may not have much money right now, but this is a great opportunity for us to win him over to our side. Or do you want to be a pathetic mercenary all your life? Jack nodded. Lucy is right. We can't remain Flamingo's little band of mercenaries forever. I want us to expand and become a large mercenary group that could rival even the Thornglory mercenary squad from the north. Okay. Give him the money? Gildern shrugged. For some reason he still felt uncomfortable and was worried about the loss of one and a half thousand gold coins, which he would have to give to the magician. Meanwhile, Link, leaving Echo Bay, immediately put the bag with money in his pendant for storage. He only took out five or six gold coins to spend on his needs. He was cheerful and whistled on the way back to River Cove Town. He believed in his own belief and was sure that the three mercenaries would send him gold coins. Even if they didn't find enough gold coins in the hidden treasures, the guy was confident that they would find another way to get them for him. This was because he saw the fire that he himself lit in their eyes by mentioning the magical equipment. Link knew how hard they were trying to become the best mercenaries. So he was sure that the issue of paying for his training was finally resolved. Link returned to the River Cove Inn and threw a pile of about thirty copper coins towards the inn employee. The servant stared at him anxiously. Link laughed and said, Please bring three pieces of oatmeal bread with butter and a cup of milk to my room. 
Now the young man had 300 gold coins in his bag, and he could afford good food. Link didn't need to eat much since his body didn't require much food. A small portion of food was enough? Well, are you rich now, Link? The hotel employee joked. Link grinned, but did not explain anything. He returned to the attic. While waiting for the food to be brought, the guy took out from his pendant the goatskin parchments on which his work was written, and then purely mechanically checked it for errors. His work turned out to be not bad at all. He wrote a general article in which he did not miss anything important. The edited parts had a clear, impeccable logic and elegance. They even had an inexpressible sense of beauty that Link himself could not understand. Even when Link, the author of the work, studied the work, he had a feeling of disbelief. Did I really write this? Or did the God of Light himself do the work by inhabiting his body? Perhaps that was the case, but Link didn't take it to heart. Comparing oneself to a higher being on a higher plane of existence was simply stupid. Soon food was brought to his room. Link savored every bite and soon felt his strength returning. The guy then took out the new sheets of parchment he had bought earlier and continued working on the piece. His recent exploit in Echo Bay may have changed his brain, because when the guy started rewriting his dissertation, he discovered that he had a flood of new ideas. Soon after, Link was fully immersed in the task. This time he had enough gold coins, so thoughts of routine problems did not distract the young man from his task. He freely spent the entire day writing his dissertation and working on his spells. A week later, Link had already upgraded three level zero spells, Earth Spike, Illumination, and Mud Swamp. After improving these three spells, Link renamed them to Screw Spike, Flare, and Viscous Swamp. These three spells only used one mana point. The scale of the spells was reduced, but their energy was compressed to such an extent that it could be compared to the energy of first level spells. When combined with Link's precision, these spells can achieve amazing power. However, after upgrading these spells, Link lost all interest in level zero spells. Magic of this level was too simple for him. He did it easily, and now he longed for deeper knowledge of magic. And so his heart began to yearn for the Academy of Magic of the Eastern Bay even more strongly. All that remained was to complete his dissertation. Link had an iron grit. When he wanted to do something, he always tried to see it through to the end. Therefore, he continued to work on his document and wrote letters to Eliard in his free time. Recently, the questions he asked Eliard in letters became more and more complex. Link himself did not notice this change. He didn't know that the questions he asked had surpassed the level of knowledge of the apprentice magician. While Link was immersed in writing his dissertation, Eliard received Link's letter. He could only shake his head in alarm after reading the letter, as out of all the questions Link asked this time, he was only able to understand one. Everything else was a mystery to him. I give up. I'll just ask the teacher. Elliard copied the question written on the goatskin paper, then climbed the spiral staircase up the magic tower until he reached the great hall on the top floor where his mentor lived. At his mentor's, whose name was Moira, had a pleasant and gentle character, except when she was in class. Everyone in the magic tower knew that she didn't like to be disturbed during her free time. But this rule did not apply to Elliard. He could find Moira at any time convenient for him to ask her about everything that he did not understand or doubted. At first, Elliard felt awkward about this, but after Moira insisted on it, the guy gradually began to accept this situation. Now, whenever he had questions, he went straight to Moira. What he did now. Having reached the door, he knocked. Mentor, may I come in? Elliard said these words into the device hanging on the door. As soon as he finished his sentence, there was a soft click. The magic runes on the door glowed in the dim light, and the door opened automatically. This meant that the mentor allowed him to go inside. As he pushed the door and entered, there was another click behind him, and the door closed automatically. Elliard was already used to this. Behind the door of the room there was a wall with a colorful painting hanging on it. This wall completely blocked the view of the hall behind her. On both sides of the wall there were passages that led into a large hall. When Elliard entered, he found himself in a round room about fifty feet in diameter. In the middle stood luxurious furniture, and on the floor lay a delightful camel hair carpet. The windows were located around the hall, their glass was inlaid with precious crystals. Rays of light penetrated through the windows, which made the large hall spacious and airy. Through the inlaid crystals there were picturesque views of the eastern bay. There were bookshelves on the walls, completely filled with books. Near one bookshelf sat a female magician. She looked to be about thirty years old. She was reading a book about magic. This was Elliard. 
As mentor, Moira. Moira was a fifth-level sorceress. She was thirty-five years old. The dean of the academy was proud of her. The magus was considered the best student and the main genius of the Eastern Bay Academy of Magic. Her head was adorned with shiny blonde hair, and her body radiated a thick aura of magic, as if she was emitting light. The woman wore a dark blue mage robe with a silver lining and sat comfortably in a chair, quietly reading her book. Moira was calm and relaxed. The sunlight was scattered through the crystals, casting a shimmering light on Moira's delicate features, giving her an incredibly elegant look. But Elliard was completely oblivious to all this. There was nothing but magic in his head, and this woman in front of him was just a mentor to him whom he respected. Mentor, he said calmly. Moira nodded and put the book in her hands. Her eyes looked at the goatskin scrolls and Elliard, as hands, and then the magus asked cheerfully, What interests you this time? She paid special attention to this student because she saw in this young man a persistence that was the same as she had in the past. Elliard walked up to her and gave her the scrolls. Moira unrolled the goatskin parchment and carefully read the contents, but looking at the text, her eyes froze in place. You have already advanced so much in your knowledge? Are you at this level now? She remarked in surprise. As a fifth-level mage, she could see that these questions were very difficult. For a student to be able to ask these questions, he must have a thorough, solid understanding of the basic theory of magic. There were six questions on the scroll, and when she looked at them, she found that she could only answer two of them at once and had to work on the remaining four think again. What wonderful questions! Moira couldn't help but exclaim. Being a mage of her level, she didn't really worry about whether her students were working hard enough because if they didn't work hard, they simply wouldn't be able to become her students. Instead, the mages paid close attention to whether her students were asking great questions. Asking difficult questions can only be done after they have seriously studied the topic and then considered it carefully. Only then can you ask a high-level question. The questions in this scroll exceeded her expectations. Not only did they approach problems from a unique perspective, but they also had a certain level of spirituality that was difficult to describe. Majessa was deeply impressed that Eliard could ask such questions. Eliard blushed. This was the second time the tutor praised him. God only knew that these questions were not his. He had only studied magic for a month and could not understand the contents of the scroll. Eliard did not tell her about this last time, but this time he was afraid that he would have to, because that this misunderstanding was becoming more serious. If this continues like this, he may have problems. He formed sentences in his head and said, Mentor, these... These questions are not mine. Hmm? Moira didn't change her tone. She looked up from her scrolls at her handsome young student. Whose are they then? My friend. He is seventeen like me. He also tried to enter the academy, but his magical skills were too low. So he decided to work on them. Me. I was able to pay my tuition thanks to him. He helped me a lot. Explain everything to me in detail, Don. Miss the slightest detail. What Elliard said interested Moira. Elliard faced the piercing blue eyes of his mentor, eyes that could see through any secret. He didn't dare lie to Moira, so he told the magus every little thing that had happened since his fateful meeting with Link, including their last letters. Moira listened carefully, sometimes stopping Elliard to ask a few questions. Then she sighed and said, So he is now in River Cove, writing a dissertation that would prove his understanding of magic? It is, mentor. Do you know what he writes about? Moira asked again. Eliard nodded. Link discussed some provisions with me. He told me that he was trying to explain why the stone always lands on the ground when we throw it. To be honest, I've been thinking about this problem myself lately, but I have no idea how to solve it. Hearing this, Moira was amazed. She repeated what Eliard had said, word by word. Why does a stone always land on the ground? Why does he land on the ground? What a strange question. No one had ever asked it before, and yet why was that? She tried to use the knowledge she needed to answer this question, but after a while she gave up trying. Moira's knowledge was not enough to explain such a constantly occurring action. After a while, she sighed. This is truly a rare and excellent question. This question alone already proves his understanding of magic. She was very interested in this young man named Link. The woman took the goatskin scroll lying on the table and said, all these questions are exceptional. I am afraid I need time to think about them. Well, tomorrow then. I will give you the answers tomorrow. Thank you, Mentor. Aren't you angry at me for what I did? Elliard asked carefully. Why should I be angry with you? 
Moira smiled. You are an honest man. I should be proud of that. Elliard sighed with relief, but the question of Link joining the Academy was always on his mind. So he asked, Since the dissertation question proved my friend, his understanding of magic, can he now enter the Academy? Academy? Moira carefully considered this question. Rules are rules. He will still need to submit a dissertation. Let Link finish his work and then hand it over to me. I will discuss this matter with the Dean in due course. I think he will agree with me. Thank you? Elliard was delighted. The mentor was the Dean's best student, so by saying these words, she assured him that Link did not actually need to solve the question posed in his dissertation. When he prepares a coherent document and submits it, he will definitely be accepted into the Academy. You are welcome? Moira smiled. She had an excellent opinion of the young student Elliard, not only because of his talents in magic, but also because of his honesty. After thinking a little, Moira touched one of the bookshelves behind her, and a book appeared in the magician's hands. This friend of yours produces good impression. I think he will find this book useful. You can give it to him along with the letter. Magic textbooks are extremely valuable, and we must not lose or damage them, so you will have to go to him and deliver the book yourself. I am giving this book to him only for one day, so the next day you must return this book to me. No problem, Eliard said overjoyed. Half a month after the defeat of the Dark Brotherhood, Link was still locked up in the attic of the River Cove Inn. The conditions in the attic were simple, if not Spartan, but Link did not want to change his place of residence. He would not move to another room because his current space provided a peace and quiet that was impossible to find anywhere else in the hotel. He had progressed quite far with his dissertation, but still could not find a definitive way to develop the thoughts in it further. Yes, maybe everything he had in mind was exciting, but different thoughts mixed together, and the resulting structure became confusing. In other words, every part of Link's work had meaning, but there was no clearly defined theme that connected everything work together. Now the content of Link's work had become something so complex that it couldn't contain everything about the law of gravity. He felt like he was wandering in the dark. He had no idea whether he was walking through thorny bushes or along a smooth road. What mysterious knowledge will I reveal when I finish my work? Link stared in anticipation and excitement at the symbols that kept appearing and appearing in his work. However, today he did not feel too inspired. Link had been racking his brain for almost half a day and now his concentration was much worse. So instead of thinking about his work, he put down his pen, leaned back, and put his hands behind his head. He put both feet on the table and, with half-closed eyes, stared out of the tiny window, from which a wonderful view of the Gerwent Forest, bathed in golden sunlight, opened up. Anxiety and confusion disappeared. Peace and calm took possession of him. The guy did not know how much time had passed when he suddenly heard steps from behind the door. There were several people, one of them seemed heavy, but he tried to walk quietly and deliberately depressed, as if he was afraid to disturb Link. Link immediately recognized the owner of the steps. He waited until the people reached his door, then pointed his dark moon wand at the wooden door and cast the wizard's hand. Click spell. The door opened, and behind it stood members of the Flamingo Mercenary Squad. Come in, Link said. Jacker entered first. He was carrying a whole linen bag. The attic room was small and had a low ceiling, so Jacker had to hunch over to fit. When Gildern and Lucy entered the room, the entire space was so cramped that it seemed as if it might burst at the seams. Mr. Link, you should find yourself a better room, Gildern said. He didn't understand why such a powerful wizard would choose to live in such an abandoned, drafty attic room. After all, he had money. Laughing, Link replied, This room is enough for me. I'm used to it. In fact, it's much quieter and calmer here, and I like it. Link then turned to Jacker and said, So, I guess you found the hidden treasure. Jacker nodded and threw the linen bag on the floor. From this dull thud, it became clear that the bag was heavy. He untied the ropes, opened the bag, and immediately a golden light shone from the bag. There was a bunch of gold coins lying there. We have discovered all eighteen hidden treasures that you described, and found two thousand nine hundred gold coins. Add this to the money we received from selling the loot, and the total would be four thousand gold coins, much more than we expected. Here are your two thousand gold coins, Jacker said very quietly, afraid that someone might overhear. God knows how nervous they must have been as they carried the huge bag down the street. If anyone found out about the contents of the bag, a lot of blood would be shed for it. Despite this, Link's expression remained the same, except for a thin smile. But the agreement was to give me one and a half thousand gold coins. 
Why did you bring me an extra 500 gold coins? What Jacker admired most about Link was his manly nature. As if nothing in this world could take him by surprise. Jacker explained, You're a wizard, but you stayed in River Cove. So we assumed it must be because you're trying to get into the Eastern Cove Academy of Magic, right? Link nodded. He could guess what Jacker's intentions were, but he waited for Jacker to explain himself. We found out that the tuition fee at the Eastern Bay Magic Academy is 2,000 gold coins. I am sure that sooner or later you will be able to earn this amount, but you must agree. The sooner you can enter the Academy, the better. With such strengths, having so much money can become dangerous for us. And we still don't know where to spend so much money. So we thought, why not put that money to good use and give it to you instead? Jacker explained. For ordinary people, gold coins were incredibly valuable. If you only need to buy food, drinks, and other necessities, you can live comfortably on 30 gold coins a year. After giving Link 2,000 gold coins, the trio will have another 2,000 gold coins left, which they will divide among themselves, and then each of them will receive 650 gold coins. And even that was a huge amount of money. That amount of gold coins would be more than enough for them to buy everything they wanted to buy but could never afford. For example, Jacker finally bought a full set of steel armor. Lucy bought a smooth rapier and now it has become her new main weapon. The girl also wore new armor made of crocodile skin. Even Gildern had a brand new bow. He also replaced all his arrows with steel ones, each of which featured an eagle feather fletching. This cost him three silver coins per arrow. It was an absurdly expensive price. The three of them even bought a small hut in the city of River Cove and set up their temporary headquarters in it. They never imagined that they would be able to afford any of this before. They certainly dreamed about it. Jacker, for example, always dreamed of starting his own mercenary squad. But although their dreams were wonderful, in reality they always faced difficulties and disappointments. Unfortunately, their main obstacle has always been that they were not strong or influential enough. Jacker was a level 3 warrior, while Lucy and Gildern were level 2 warriors. For an independent mercenary group, this level of strength was not too bad. But for a mercenary unit, it was completely insufficient. For example, although they had money now, they only dared to purchase ordinary equipment and weapons. They didn't even think about buying any magical equipment for one simple reason. They were afraid that they might be killed before they had a chance to use them. It's very likely that they could get robbed the same night they bought the equipment, and then it would all be in vain. Jacker's reasoning convinced Link, so he nodded and said, I could use some extra money. Since you insist, I will take them. Training for common people did cost 2,000 gold coins, but Link was of noble blood, so he should receive a discount and will be able to pay less. However, learning magic required a lot of money, so he didn't mind saving some money. Jack smiled, but Lucy's eyes betrayed her indignation as she looked at the bag, and Gildern had to leave the room. If he had stayed there, he would not have been able to resist. He would have grabbed the bag of money and run away with it. Taking the money, Link suddenly said, I think that sooner or later people will learn about the defeat of the Dark Brotherhood. Have you noticed someone spying on you lately? Link initially considered them temporary companions and planned to completely sever ties with them after the mission ended. But now Link realized what a great character Jacker was thanks to his decision today to give him an extra 500 gold coins. Link considered himself an ambitious and visionary man who was not afraid to take risks. If given the right opportunity, Link was confident that he could soar to great heights. Although the young man was thrown into this strange new world by the God of Light, he never wasted time on self-pity. Since he was stuck here now, he thought he might as well take advantage of this. Link still doubted whether he would ever be able to achieve such an incredible mission as saving the world. Whether it was earning Omni Points so he could become stronger and more powerful, or striving for a better future where he wasn't haunted by the Dark Army. In the end, it all came down to him having to work really hard to try and change the world in which he now lived. Fighting the Dark Army was not an easy task. If he tried to do this alone, he would almost certainly fail. Link will need help. From what he saw, the Flamingo mercenary group seemed like a good choice, and they seemed worthy of his trust. What Link suspected was true. The Flamingo mercenary group had recently encountered some difficulties. Jack took a deep breath and frowned slightly. The underworld around Gerwent Forest has been on the rise lately. We had to be especially careful when selling loot from the Dark Brotherhood, he explained. However, these things cannot be hidden, and lately we have been faced with the fact that there are many bloodhounds prowling around. Fortunately, they had enough strength and power, which prevented them from being exposed to too much danger. Otherwise, 
they would already be dead. When all was said and done, their main problem was still the fact that they were not powerful enough. In the end, the responsibility for the defeat of the Dark Brotherhood was not really theirs. The Flamingo mercenaries were simply lucky to have Link on their side. Jacker believed that they had managed to survive until now mainly because those who were snooping around here had not yet realized the truth. The moment Jacker told Link about the difficult situation they found themselves in, Lucy and Gildern became gloomy and gloomy. It was obvious that they were all under a lot of pressure. Although they now had a lot of money, the mercenaries had to take every step much more carefully than before, because now they could lose their lives before they had a chance to spend this money. Being rich used to be the most desirable thing for them, but now that they had money, they could not spend it for fear that someone would find out about it. It was a cruel twist of fate. Link asked, then why don't you just take the money and leave this place? Jacker laughed bitterly and shook his head. But we haven't given you your money yet, so how could we just leave? Anyway, who cares? The minute someone finds out about our money, our lives will immediately be in danger. He didn't know why, but when he said these words, the man had a kind of premonition. It seemed to him that he was at a turning point in his life, where he could transform from a simple man into a powerful warrior. And, as he suspected, the moment he finished his sentence, Link smiled. This time it was not a polite smile as before. It was wide and sincere. Very good. In gratitude for what you did for me today, I will give you a great opportunity, Link said. He now had 39 Omni Points. With these points, he could afford to buy a secret mythical spell among the third level spells. It was considered mythical because this spell had an almost godlike power that changed the elements of a warrior's body. It helped a warrior achieve battle aura no matter what level they were at. At its core, a warrior's battle aura was the precise application of various powers. This was its difference from magic spells. For a long time, the warrior's understanding and application of their martial aura was minimal, and their martial aura was also very thin and weak. Only a few warriors were able to surpass the fourth level, and as for the sixth, seventh, eighth levels, such heights could only be achieved by inimitable geniuses who appeared once every century. But about a thousand years ago, there lived a magician named Vance who changed this situation. He conducted extensive and detailed research into the martial aura of warriors. He was also a possessed magician. To obtain data and samples for his research, he hunted and killed warriors. According to legends, he even managed to capture a genius level 8 warrior and then cut him open alive. After years of grueling work, he finally discovered the ultimate secret of combat aura and started the teaching of combat aura a branch of science in the secret spells section. The most common way to achieve the warrior's combat aura was a natural innate ability, but it could also be achieved through practice. This practice technique was classified by mages as another secret spell, but in the world of warriors, it was called martial art. Looking through the list of basic secret spells in the menu, Link found this spell, Battle Aura. Hidden power level three secret spell mana. Cost, 80 effects, changes elemental the body composition of the recipient of the spell, and greatly increases the abilities of the recipient of the spell. At the same time, the recipient of the spell will receive a detailed description of the next day's training, and through practice, the recipient of the spell can develop and increase their power exponentially. Note, let this spell be my repentance for the countless killings of gifted warriors whom I took the lives of. Opportunity? Jacker's heart began to beat faster. He hoped that Link would give him such an opportunity but he knew how powerful Link was. A brilliant mage who defeated the entire Dark Brotherhood using only level zero spells. Do such people provide ordinary opportunities? Of course not. The warrior pressed his hand to his pounding heart and waited silently. Lucy and Gildern, standing behind him, did not share their comrades' emotions. They were both not as excited as Jacker, but they felt Jacker's seriousness and remained silent. By this time, Link had already acquired the spell. He held out the new moon wand, and mana flowed into the wand. The process of casting a third level secret spell was different from the usual. As mana flowed into the wand, it began to form into complex configurations, and then the wand glowed with a green runic aura. This runic aura was a special magical structure. Link saw her in a magic book, and only read the introduction about her. According to the book, runic aura was a required high level spell structure. Each aura contained an independent magical structure and when a mage combines many different types of auras, a complex and powerful spell is formed. In Link's understanding, the spell's structure was modular in design, 
with each aura representing a unit of that module. When different modular units are combined together, it becomes possible to create an infinite variety of spells. This modular way of thinking would be helpful. It has great potential for further development. I must study it carefully. Link came up with this idea. The hidden power spell contained nine runic auras, and these auras glowed from the bottom of the wand to the very tip. Each aura emitted a green light and then fused together at the tip to form a light green ball the size of a fist. Countless tiny runes moved inside the ball, like tadpoles swimming in a pond. There were too many of these runes and they moved too densely for each of them to be distinguished. Just looking at them made my head spin. Link's body, illuminated by the green runic aura, seemed to emit a mysterious light. As the mana in his body also danced and vibrated, his entire body seemed to suddenly begin to emit light. Jacker swallowed. His eyes were filled with awe and respect. Lucy and Gildern held their breath. The first time they met Link, no matter how they looked at this young man, he was just an ordinary young man. But now this young wizard looked majestic and godlike. Before casting the spell, Link chose the words that Jacker could understand to explain what was going on. Jacker, have you ever heard of martial art? Jacker suddenly held his breath, his heart pounding like the beating of drums. He nodded softly. Of course, it is passed down in noble families from generation to generation. On the Firaman continent, martial art has always belonged only to nobles. It was never passed on to anyone outside the noble family or commoners, because the essence of martial art was only passed on to those who were related by blood. Any common man who wanted to master the martial arts had only one option, join the army and then rise through the ranks to become a knight. The noble family he served would then honor the knight by passing on the martial art. But it was a dangerous path because it was almost impossible for an ordinary person to become a knight. He would have to fight tooth and nail, and nine out of ten people who tried to achieve this would die. Even if they obtained martial art, it would only be at the most basic level. They wouldn't have gotten the most important parts. But now it seemed that this mage, Link, was going to imbue him with a precious martial art. At that moment, Jacker felt the blood boiling in his veins. He calmed his breathing. Afraid that if he breathed too hard, he would accidentally extinguish the flame of the ball of green light on Link's wand. He was practically suffocating from the exertion. Behind him, Lucy and Gildern were stunned. Lucy's face was red, and her pair of almond-shaped eyes sparkled, full of hope. Gildern completely forgot about the two thousand gold coins. Only a single thought about martial art was spinning in his head. Martial art for every warrior on the Firamin continent meant strength and glory. With its help, you can take off and sail through life at the very top of society. Without it, a man was doomed to struggle in the mud, no matter how hard he worked. Jacker, are you ready? Link asked the large man standing in front of him. The strong giant knelt in front of Link and lowered his head solemnly, as if he was being knighted. His voice trembled as the man said, Yes, I am ready. Link pointed the wand he was holding in his hand at Jacker. A green aura flowed into the warrior, his body, and the surface of Jacker. His body began to glow. The man's body glowed with a yellow, earthy hue. It was his unique martial art that created his body, obtaining the martial art. This was a testament to the unique ability of Link's hidden power spell to develop a person's potential, improve his physique, and allow him to absorb energy from the environment much better. Under the influence of this spell, Jakar's martial art quickly strengthened. But that was not all. Jakar felt that in his information appeared in my head that was not there before. The man closed his eyes to concentrate on this, and was shocked to find that he now had a way to practice to develop his martial art. The information was very clear, with key details mentioned. This was the most valuable knowledge for a warrior. Opening his eyes, Jacker pressed his hand to his heart and swore, Master Link, I, Jacker, son of Bodin, before the God of Light swear that with your consent and from this day on, I will always be faithful to you. I will always follow your every step. My strength will come to your aid when needed. Yes, martial art. He got what he had craved all his life. Moreover, Jucker received a complete martial art without any omissions. His brain contained all the detailed methods. All he had to do was practice the art daily, and it would continue to develop. With martial art, the legendary realms would no longer be just a fantasy for him. One day, he will have unmatched strength and become the strongest warrior. Jacker then began to remember his past. He was born in the countryside, in a small mountain village. His father was a blacksmith. They were both stubborn, so they argued a lot. One day, when Jacker was still little, they had a heated argument. And after that, Jacker ran away from home. 
he planned to wander around and achieve success before returning. All these years, although he was very hardworking, the man felt that his achievements were still insignificant. So although he missed his father and sister very much, he was very ashamed to return home. But now, everything was about to change. He sighed heavily. Jacker felt more than satisfied. His heart was filled with respect and gratitude for the young wizard standing in front of him. His kindness touched Jacker's heart. He was willing to give his life to serve Link. Link was puzzled by Jacker's reaction. He was only eager to gain a comrade. He never thought about getting a follower who swore to him before the God of Light. What Jacker did was essentially selling his life to Link. However, Link only cast one small spell on him. His efforts were tiny. On Earth it would not have been so easy. But then, as he thought about what had happened, Link suddenly realized that this world, a strange world, had its own separate set of rules. He understood that martial art was very important for a warrior, so he did not need to argue with him or contradict him. The young magician decided that they don't go to someone else, this monastery with their own rules. So, the guy nodded and said, I allow you to be my follower, but I don't like being interrupted, you can go your own way, and whenever I need you, I will find you. Yes, my lord. Jacker immediately began addressing Link differently. He looked back and looked into the eyes of Lucy and Gildern. The three mercenaries had fought side by side for a long time, so they understood each other well. Lucy and Gildern first noticed the strange look in Jacker's eyes, and now Jacker reminded them again. They were not stupid, and both knew that such an opportunity was rare. So without hesitation the mercenaries knelt down. My lord, please accept me as your follower, Lucy said, although there was some uncertainty in her tone. She had not known Link for long, so the girl still had some doubts. My lord, let me bask in your glory, said Gildern. It turned out that he, a man who always spoke with sarcasm, still knew how to flatter people when he wanted to. Currently, Link's maximum mana reserve was 99.1 points. When Manamaga was full, his body would emit an aura, and his eyes would shine. These were simply the effects of magic. But now Link's mana had dropped to 9 points, and therefore the magical aura around his body had sharply dimmed, and his eyes had visibly dimmed. When the three mercenaries first met Link, they saw just such an unremarkable young man. Link pondered the oath of allegiance to Lucy and Gildern and decided to accept them. All three were equally important to the Flamingo mercenary group. Both Lucy and Gildern showed promising skills and proved themselves reliable comrades in battle. So Link nodded in agreement. I will use martial art on you too, but not now, because I have exhausted all my mana. By the way, I must remind you that martial art is just an instruction on how to train properly. If you want to develop your battle aura, you will still have to work hard. After all, Hidden Power is only a third-level spell, and it was only the basic version of it, acquired by Link with Omni Points. In other words, it was only an average-level martial art, so the resulting martial aura would not be outstanding either. Link calculated that if mercenaries practiced hard enough, they could reach level 5 by age 35. But from that point on, it would become more and more difficult for them to advance further. Lucy and Gildern would probably peak at level 6, while Jacker might rise a little higher, but still not beyond level 7. But that was, of course, only temporary. If these three helped him a lot, Link might consider giving them a higher level martial art in the future. It's clear. All three mercenaries nodded. They never shied away from discipline and hard work. They were only afraid of futile and wasted effort when they were forced to wade through difficulties and give it their all, while remaining at the same level. The mercenaries noticed how tired Link looked, so they apologized, said goodbye, and left the attic. As soon as they reached the hotel hall, Jacker exclaimed, Now I feel like my dreams are in my hands. Lucy was still shocked by what happened in the attic. Lately I actually feel like I'm in a dream. Jacker, should we give Lord Link all the money we have left? I heard that learning magic is expensive. Once he pays for his tuition, he might not have much money left, she muttered. They still had 1,500 gold coins left, and this amount was too much to spend. In the end, all they could do was hide the gold somewhere safe and leave it there. Lucy is right. Jacker, what do you say? Said Gildern. Gildern no longer felt resentment towards Link. Now, having mastered the martial art, he dared to hope for a bright future. Money was nothing compared to how priceless martial arts were to warriors, and yet Link had so kindly given them such a precious item. If he was jealous of Link for money, then he could be called a selfish, stupid mouse. Jacker, of course, didn't mind. He dedicated his life to Link. Now that everyone in the Flamingo mercenary group had become Link's followers, he knew that whatever benefited Link would benefit them as well. 
the stronger Link becomes, the more promising their future will be. And so he will do everything possible to support Link's progress. We must not only give him the remaining money, but also strive to increase our power as quickly as possible and earn as much money as we can to support Lord Link's studies, Jacker said. Lucy and Gildern were both smart enough to understand the wisdom of Jacker's words. They both nodded, expressing their agreement. Jacker added in a quiet, serious voice, And also, for now we should lie low. We must not make any noise so that no one notices us, at least until this storm subsides. For now the best thing we can do is get back to training and focus on it. I will share with you the guidance I received with martial arts so that you can practice it too. Recently they have been walking on the edge of a knife, and many people from the underground world have been trying to find them. Even today, they had to be especially careful when the mercenaries went to the River Cove Hotel, fearing that Link's life might be in danger. Under the circumstances, the most sensible thing to do was to follow the turtle's example and hide in his shell for a while. When the three came to an agreement, they decided to return to their temporary headquarters to get the money. But as they left the hotel, they noticed a carriage right in front of the entrance. It was a beautiful carriage with a sky-blue top and silver-gilded edges. The horses in harness were majestic, long-legged, of noble birth. They looked stronger than the horses of some of the knights they had seen in the north. Even the coachman was dressed in luxurious livery. With just one glance, it became clear that the carriage belonged to some important person who arrived at the hotel. Must be some important bird. The hotel lobby was now buzzing with hissing voices discussing the identity of the approaching visitor. Shh! Didn't you notice the coat of arms on the carriage? She's from the East Bay Magic Academy, someone in the hall said quietly. What is this, a wizard? The other answered him. Hearing these conversations, the three hastened to step aside to give way. Ever since they met Link, they now had a new respect for all mages. To them, real mages were almost as powerful as the gods themselves, existing on a completely different plane of reality than the wandering mages they had met before. Link had not yet been able to enter the academy, but his strength was already fearsome. They couldn't imagine how much more powerful a mage from the Eastern Bay Magic Academy would be. I wonder how powerful this magician is, the three of them thought at the same time. When the carriage finally stopped, the door opened. A young man dressed in a sky-blue magical robe climbed out of the carriage. Gildern sighed sharply as soon as he saw him. By the god of light, how can a guy be so much more handsome than me? Gildern always considered himself handsome, and he conquered many women with his appearance. But looking at the magician who appeared in front of him, the archer felt ashamed of his appearance for the first time in his entire life. Just look at him. These custom-made clothes for magicians. This white jade stick in his hand. His tall and well-built body. That dreamy face with amazing features. And that magnificent aura that enveloped his entire body. It was as if the sun god had descended from heaven, so Gildern thought in amazement. To have such an attractive appearance, and at the same time be a real mage from the academy. He must have been the favorite of the god of light. This magician, as soon as he appeared in the room, became the center of attention. Everyone around him was dwarfed by his presence. Even Jacker's nearly seven-foot frame with his muscular physique now paled, in comparison to this magnificent creature. What a lucky bastard. Gildern also felt himself drawn to him as if by a magnet, and could not help but envy this magician. Lucy was the only one who did not fall under his influence. She frowned and cursed. So what, he looks like a woman. When she was younger, she was deceived by a handsome guy. Not only did this bastard cheat on her, which was unforgivable, but he also stole all her money. From that moment on, she was especially suspicious of all handsome guys. Now she thought that ordinary guys like Link were much better and, of course, much more reliable and therefore trustworthy. Jacker was the calmest of all. He raised his eyebrows slightly and said, Why do I have a feeling that this mage from the Eastern Bay Magic Academy is still not as strong as Lord Link? He was a third-level warrior who now possessed martial arts. He was much more perceptive now, and as he looked at the magician standing in front of him, he felt how weak he was. Jacker could probably defeat him with one blow. Who knows? Maybe he's just a nice boy who's good for nothing, Lucy said with a wince. By this time, the young magician entered the inn. Everyone was watching him as if under hypnosis. Then the three mercenaries turned away, left the inn, and went their own way. The magician was none other than Elliard. He was here to visit Link. Not only did he bring answers to his friend's questions, but he also brought with him a magic textbook from Moira, and some money. He knew that Link didn't have much money left after he lent him 1,300 gold pieces. He still had no way of returning all the money to him. But now that he was a student at the academy, 
he realized that in the world of magicians, 1,300 gold coins was indeed a small amount. As Moira's favorite student, he used his talents to write level zero magic scrolls, created several basic potions, and earned 15 gold coins. He believed that Link would not have much money, so he brought 10 gold coins in the hope that this could alleviate Link's current situation. Having found the innkeeper, Elliard asked him, Hello Matt, what room does my friend Mr. Link live in? Hotel Matt remembered Elliard, and Link made an even deeper impression on him. When he saw Elliard, he shrugged and said, Room? He doesn't live in a room. After you left, Mr. Link decided to stay in the attic. What? Attic. Elliard's heart beat quickly. He tried not to show his emotions and continued to ask, Why does he live in the attic? He doesn't have money, why else? Matt answered dryly. He used to eat even coarse wheat bread every day. Two rolls a day, one for lunch and one for dinner. Lately it seems like he has started making money, but not much, I would say. Most of the time he sits locked up in the attic. If you want to see him, the guy is upstairs. When he heard this, Eliard's heart began to beat quickly again. He knew that after Link gave him 1,300 gold coins, he probably had some money left. But he never would have thought that it would lead to such a terrible situation. But why didn't he mention it in his letters? In his letters, he talked about the beauty of the Gerwent Forest, asked questions about spells and the theory of magic, and yet did not say a word about the living conditions in which he found himself. Why didn't Link ever tell him? Elliard couldn't think of a single answer to this question. He thanked Matt and, under the gaze of the crowd in the hotel lobby, climbed the stairs to the attic. On the way, he heard people in the hall discussing him, but this is a real magician. Did he really come here to meet Link? Does this mean that Link is really a wizard? That's impossible. He wears tattered rags, eats and sleeps in a place that even I wouldn't want to live in. How can he be a wizard? These exclamations confirmed the owner's words. Elliard was now even more upset. His eyes began to burn until it finally became completely unbearable. The young wizard thought that perhaps the dust in the hotel had gotten into his eyes. He leaned on the wooden railing and continued to rise. When he reached the third floor, he turned the corner and walked up to the attic of the hotel. The attic was dark and dirty, the stairs were covered with a thick layer of dust, and the door to the attic was low and narrow. When Eliard stood at the door, this cramped space literally suffocated him. He had lived in a spacious magical tower with high ceilings for so long that returning to the home of ordinary people, he felt alien and out of place here. Elliard quietly knocked on the door. He tried his best to calm down and maintain composure. Come in. Openly, the voice turned out to be familiar. He was as calm and gentle as before, like a quiet pond on a starry night. Elliard opened the door and entered the room and saw Link's back, bathed in sunlight. A golden ray of sunlight poured through a small window in the attic, like a golden pillar in a dark, stuffy room. The column of light pleasantly illuminated his fragile, thin body. An emaciated figure sat on a broken chair, her hand held a quill pen, and he tirelessly wrote something on an old stained table. In the corner of the table lay several textbooks of magic and a stack of goatskin scrolls. Elliard looked to the right and saw a hard mattress on the floor. In the corner of the room hung a large cobweb, in the center of which, casually, hung a fat spider. In another corner, there was a large hole in the wall filled with rags. It didn't seem to help, because the cold draft was still blowing through the attic. The decrepit room, in a disgusting state, looked like a typical poor peasant's dwelling. Elliard had previously been an orphaned wanderer, so he knew this kind of life well. But he never thought that Link, the son of a nobleman, would also suffer this fate. But precisely because Eliard had experienced all this before, he sympathized even more that Link had to endure such a life. Torment, shame, and gratitude. A whole stream of emotions washed over Eliard. They caused a hot flash in his eyes, and the guy began to cry. But before the tears could roll down, he hurriedly raised his chin, and the tears returned. When he was eight years old, children on the street mocked him. He cried and cried. But since he was an orphan, no one came to console him. People only joked and laughed at him. Since then, he swore that he would never cry again. But this time, he could not hold back his tears. Link was a nobleman. He had 1,300 gold coins. The guy could live comfortably in the River Cove Inn. But because he wanted to help Elliard, he sacrificed his own comfort. Link had to live in such poor conditions. How could this not touch Elliard's heart? Even more painful was the fact that Link never said a word about this situation. He lived comfortably in the magic tower, studied magic, 
and Link never said a word about his difficult life. Instead, he always consoled Eliard, reminding him to focus on his studies and not get distracted. Eliard didn't even suspect that something like this could happen to Link? Link? Eliard called him carefully, trying to calm down. This seemed to shake the fragile man. The pen in his hand froze, and he turned around. Eliard, what are you doing here? Link said in bewilderment. He lost weight, became much thinner than a month ago. His eyes seemed large. They looked dull and lifeless. On his body was a rough linen robe that seemed too large as it hung on the bony figure of the young man. Eliard's heart sank at the sight of his friend. He was at his breaking point. His eyes were now red. And when a tear finally fell, the young man said, Why didn't you tell me anything? Link was perplexed when he saw the expression on Eliard's face. He wondered how this guy could be so sensitive. He was almost an adult. How could he cry over such a minor issue? But from what Link knew about the game, he knew that this was Eliard's character. There were only three times in the game when Eliard cried. The first time was him mourned his wife, who was killed by a demon. The second time, a comrade who died in battle. And the third time, when he saw countless refugees from the north. This half-man, half-boy was so sensitive. Link thought about this and guessed why Eliard was upset and laughed and said, Are you blaming me for missing such a small detail? Eliard nodded. The guy lived comfortably at the academy. In fact, if he worked a little harder, he might even earn a few gold coins. This month, he did not spend much time writing magic scrolls and still earned 15 gold coins. Some of the more hardworking students could earn more than 50 gold coins in a month. If only Link had told him, Eliard would have done anything to ensure that his friend didn't have to live in such poor conditions. Link laughed and shook his head. My friend, that's not how I live. Bad as it seems. Look, if you look out of this window, you will see the beautiful forest of Gerwent. Listen, can't you hear how quiet and calm it is in this room? Just think, I have no money. I wear old and simple clothes, so no one looks at me. No one distracts me or disturbs me so I can completely focus on working on my dissertation and magic spells. Don't you see how lucky I am? When he said these words, Eliard swayed, but he couldn't uh, help but feel that something was wrong. But, no buts. You know I only care about magic. Nothing is important to me except magic? Link kept smiling, shining brightly like the sun, driving away the gloom and darkness from Eliard. His heart. Good if he thinks so. Eliard felt better, but what he saw today was deeply imprinted in his heart and the young magician would never forget it. He knew that in this world there was only one person who would sacrifice his honor and dignity, who would be ready to be ridiculed, who wanted to live like a beggar just to help him. He considered such a person to be nothing more than a brother. If necessary, Eliard will be ready to sacrifice everything for this brother. Are you free now? Let's have a glass in the hall. What do you think? Eliard wiped away his tears and hid his emotions away. Of course. Come on, just give me a minute. I'll put the scrolls in order. Link said, laughing. When everything was neatly put away, they went downstairs into the hall. Matt, the best dish you have and the best ale? Elliard shouted. No problem, Matt said, smiling. Once their food and drinks arrived, the two friends settled down at the table, chatting and enjoying their meal. They spoke about how Link's dissertation was going and discussed some problems in magical theory. Elliard told Link about what he had seen and learned at the academy and also shared some gossip he had heard. Each of them was so involved in the conversation that they did not notice that more than ten cups of ale had been drunk. Elliard couldn't handle so much alcohol, so his words began to sound inappropriate, and he started talking nonsense. Link was able to control the effects of alcohol, so he managed to at least appear sober. While drunk, Elliard began to behave strangely. He cried, then laughed. Link didn't know what to do with him, so he asked the servant from the inn to take Elliard to his room so he could rest. No, stop it. Fuck off, I want to sleep in the attic, Elliard continued to insist. Link had no choice but to give in to his friend, and in the end, another mattress was brought into the attic, and after a while, Elliard finally fell asleep on it. Link began to sweat from trying to subdue Elliard, and soon the slight effect of the alcohol wore off. He left the inn and spoke with Elliard's coachman from the Academy of Magic. The coachman said that they planned to spend the night in the city and should return to the Academy tomorrow. Link felt relieved and headed back to the attic. Eliard brought scrolls and some kind of textbook with him to the attic. Link looked through them, and the textbook immediately fascinated him. This was a high-level magic textbook, just what you needed. This magic textbook was called Progress in Magic Spells. It contained an introduction to first-level spells and the structure of spells. It also contained a rough summary of the progress of high-level spells. 
Link flipped through the pages and discovered that the book also contained detailed descriptions of runic aura structures. What a wonderful book! She immediately captured his attention. He read and read, completely unaware of how time flies. He didn't know how much time had passed when a voice suddenly came from behind him. What time is it now? It was Elliard who woke up. Link was frightened by an unexpected voice. He groped for his pocket watch and said, It is seven in the evening? Only now Link realized that he was very hungry? I'll go get us something to eat. Elliard was also hungry, so he left the attic, and five minutes later returned with a huge tray of cheese. Both began to eat. While eating, Link continued to read the magic textbook. He went through each page very carefully and tried not to let any dust or dirt get on the pages. Elliard looked at Link's thesis. The young wizard was completely fascinated by Link's thesis. The silence between them was broken only by Elliard's occasional mutterings such as, This is amazing. Oh, I've never seen conclusions like this before. Elliard was fascinated by Link's work. A candle burned brightly all night in the attic of the River Cove Inn. Two young magicians were working diligently there. One was carried away by studying a magic textbook. The other was immersed in the thesis work of the first. Time passed quickly, and neither of them noticed how midnight had come. Link felt tired, so he put down his textbook and got ready for bed. His body was quite fragile, so he had to be careful and take care of his health. Even though he was often so immersed in a task that he forgot about the time when he remembered it, Link always tried to get a good rest. Settling under the covers, he noticed that Elliard was still thinking about his dissertation. Hey, Elliard, it's already late. Why don't you rest? He said. Wait a minute, I'm trying to understand something here? Elliard said, quickly scribbling notes with a quill pen. He was desperately trying to clarify the issue of mana conversion in Link's dissertation. He may not have known much about the application or use of this theory, but he couldn't help but admire it. As a mage, he could easily sense the sense of elegance of this simple mana formula even though he was just a student. Just as a lecherous man would be captivated by the mere sight of a beautiful girl, he was just as completely engrossed in his work. Link saw how focused Elliard was. He knew there was no way he could convince his friend to rest, so he said nothing more and fell asleep himself. The night passed quietly. Link woke up automatically, as if wound up, at three o'clock in the morning the next day. His concentration was now high, razor sharp, and he sensed that there were some quiet movements in the room. Opening his eyes, he saw that Elliard was still sitting at the table in the same way as before Link fell asleep. His eyes were as red as a rabbit's, but he didn't seem the least bit sleepy. So he is as stubborn as I am. It's not for nothing that Elliard managed to become the legendary high mage in the game. Link tried not to bother him sitting down and casting the illumination spell. He then began to read the textbook that Elliard had brought with him. The magic textbook was the property of the Eastern Bay Academy of Magic, so Lank had to return it soon. He read the book once, just to remember its contents. Then he would slowly understand the meaning of what he remembered later. He had an extraordinary memory. Plus, Link had just woken up, so his brain was now working at full capacity. It was enough for him to read the textbook only once to remember everything including graphs and illustrations. He read it a second time to review some details he might have missed, and then again to strengthen his memory. Now that he had read the book for the fourth time, he could clearly remember every detail of this first-level magic textbook called Progress in Magic Spells. Only by reviewing his memories could he remember every detail from the book as vividly as if he were watching a slideshow. Of course, it's nice to have an incredible brain, Link thought proudly. He was grateful for the exceptional memory he now possessed. By this time it was light outside. Link looked at Elliard again and saw that his friend was still immersed in his work. He noticed that Elliard's face had turned pale and thought that if he continued like this, he would soon become completely exhausted. So Link walked over to him and pushed his work away. Hey, you really need to rest? Wait, let me read it. A little more? Elliard begged. He looked with wide eyes at the goatskin paper in Link's hand. It was as if he was about to grab it, but did not dare to do so. I haven't even finished it yet. Why is there such a rush? Link was puzzled by how delighted Elliard was with his work. He thought that what he wrote still lacked organization, a clear line of thought. He thought that his work was far from presentable and complete. And why is Elliard so interested? What? You haven't even finished it yet. Elliard looked discouraged. He read it all night, but in the end he only managed to read three pages. Of what he read, he understood half of it at most but Link had actually only written 15 or 16 pages. Last night he flipped through the last few pages but realized he couldn't figure out what it said. But even so, 
he was confident that the thesis contained new and revolutionary ideas. Link, I think if you could just tidy up some points in the thesis and then come up with a suitable title, I'm sure it could be approved by the Academy. What if I copy parts of your dissertation and bring it to the Academy so my advisor can look at it? Elliard said. This idea had just come to him. He believed that even if the dissertation did not help Link get into the Academy, it would definitely improve his supervisor's opinion of Link. Maybe she'll even give Link more textbooks. Elliard would have done anything to help Link without hesitation. It's a shame that Link's innate magical talent wasn't enough. Otherwise, he would have been accepted by the Academy long ago. Elliard sighed. He noticed that Link's current magical aura was just as dim as before. It was obvious that Link was only consoling himself when he told Elliard that his magical aura was so dim because he was injured. Link didn't know what was going on in Elliard's head at that moment. He considered Elliard's idea, then nodded and said, Okay, you haven't rested yet, so you better sleep after breakfast. I'll put in order the parts of my dissertation that I have already written, and you can take it with you. He had just skimmed through the book Progress in Magical Spells and eagerly absorbed all the knowledge he could glean. He was like a wanderer in the desert who drank all the water from the first puddle he finally came across. If Link felt this way with the book, he was sure that when he finally became a student at the East Bay Academy of Magic, he would feel the same as the beggar who entered Aladdin's cave of hidden treasures. These thoughts make Link feel even worse. I wanted to go to the Academy. Elliard was really very tired. After breakfast, he went to bed while Link began cleaning up his dissertation, even though Link noted that he still had a long way to go before completing his work. A clear pattern was already beginning to emerge. Being the author, he knew the content very well, so in a very short time he managed to organize the entire work into separate parts. Of the parts into which it was divided, the very first was devoted to the formulas of Newton's universal law of gravity. Indeed, Link finally managed to develop the formulas, the universal law of gravity. But this was only a superficial conclusion that tied together many complex ideas in his dissertation. There were still places that did not contain evidence. In short, the present work did not reflect the true depth of Link's analysis. This part contained the most convincing arguments, so I will give it to Elliard with me. The rest is still too ambiguous. I'd better work on the rest before showing it. Link made the final decision to give Elliard those parts of his dissertation, where he derived the formulas for the universal law of gravity. As for the parts where he dug deeper and made more complex assumptions, the young man felt that they were still too vague and did not want to show them to anyone. After deciding which parts he would include, Link copied the edited version of the work onto new goat scrolls. Then, while Elliard was still sleeping, he took out the scrolls on which Elliard's mentor had written her answers to Link's questions and began to read them. The moment he read the answer to the first question, Link had to admit that Elliard's mentor was indeed a gifted magician with deep knowledge of magic. Her explanations are so clear and convincing. This curator Moira is definitely impressive. Why haven't I heard of this name before? Link asked himself this question. All the questions he asked Elliard were difficult, but Moira was able to give him answers that not only dispelled all of Link's doubts, but also inspired him with new ideas for further writing his dissertation. He tried hard to remember a character named Moira in the game, but he still couldn't. She was not even there during the infamous incident at the Eastern Bay Academy of Magic. But it is strange that such a wise fifth-level sorceress, who has her own personal mage tower, did not leave a mark in history. But it is not important. Link couldn't think of a reason why Moira wasn't mentioned in the game's story, but he decided to put the matter aside and continued reading the answers on the scroll. He read quickly, so he finished all six answers in a short time. Just as he was putting away the scrolls, the guy noticed the neat notes left by Moira. I am glad that my student has such a unique friend like you. You deeply understand magic. Your approaches are unique. If you have any questions regarding magic or spells, please email me directly, and I will do my best to provide you with answers and explanations. Moira Droskin These words proved that Link had received Moira's confession. He pondered for a while and realized that he had several questions. Since Moira had insisted that she would be happy to help, why not ask her a few questions now? Link picked up his pen and wrote down a few new questions. Elliard will be returning to the academy today, so he will simply give him the letter so that he can give it to Moira. Elliard woke up at noon. Before leaving, he was going to leave ten gold coins for Link. But Link, after warmly thanking him, refused. Don't worry, my friend. My father finally answered my letters and also sent me money. Oh, that's good to hear, Elliard said. He felt noticeably better. He knew that Link's father was a noble, so he didn't find it strange that he sent Link some money. 
Well, goodbye Link, Elliard said. Goodbye, take care of yourself. So, Elliard took Link's revised dissertation, textbook Moira and Link's letter with you. He climbed into the carriage and headed back to the Eastern Bay Magic Academy. When the carriage was out of sight, Link returned to the inn. Now the attitude of people in the hotel hall towards him has changed dramatically. They began to treat him with more respect and respect. Link thought it was funny. As was typical of ordinary people, they drank in the hall all day, discussing all sorts of nonsense. And then, when a bright star appeared in the sky, they all pointed at it and exclaimed in surprise and fear. But after a few minutes they returned to their gossip and rumors, wasting their lives. Link didn't feel honored or respected by receiving the respect of these people. He walked up to the counter and said to the innkeeper, Matt, send my dinner and tomorrow's breakfast to my room, please. Thank you. Matt's face bloomed as brightly as a chrysanthemum flower. Problems. Link climbed the stairs to the attic and returned to reading. I know a lot of first-level spells. If I could refine a few spells and then create a few supreme magic skills, my strength would increase many times over. But which spell should I start with? He thought about it for a while and decided to improve the vector throw spell. This spell consumed little mana, its adaptability was limitless, and even if the enemy was equipped with anti-magic equipment, this spell could still cause significant damage and pain to the enemy. At that moment, as Link fell into deep concentration, focusing on his task of modifying the spell, something sinister was unfolding in the underworld of Gerwent Forest. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk in Echo Bay. Two black shadows stood among the ruins of the bay. Did you find the runes? Asked the black shadow, who was wearing a loose cloak and holding a wand in her hand. If Victor were still alive, he would recognize the hidden figure as the same mysterious magician who gave him the occult runes. No, I couldn't find them in the bay. But I found it, said another black shadow, dressed in gray-brown leather armor. The figure's cis face was covered with a hood. The man had just left the cave and was holding a piece of burnt reddish rotten flesh and fragments of leather armor. The magician in black clothes was alarmed. They used magic spells here. I've seen this leather armor before. This is Victor. He must have been affected by occult magic, and yet he was killed. Who has such power? Could it be a mage from the Eastern Bay Magic Academy? No. Victor was careful. He would not provoke the wrath of the magicians. I heard that a group of mercenaries did it. Mercenaries? The black shadow fell silent for a moment, then opened its mouth again. Find these people. The runes must be found at all costs. Here is your reward. Got it? The black shadow took the bag from the wizard in black clothes. He opened it, saw the contents, and smiled. Then the boundaries of his body blurred. He became transparent and completely disappeared in the vicinity of the bay. Soft rustling steps echoed throughout the bay. These were the steps of a black shadow, hidden by a spell that gave it invisibility. It was a beautiful day. The sky was bright and blue, like pure tourmaline. Golden sunlight filtered through the leaves, painting a picture of light and shadow on the ground. Birds with green feathers sang the praises of Mother Nature. Squirrels scurried from tree to tree, trying to store as much food as possible before winter. In the city of River Cove, not far from the small headquarters of the Flamingo Mercenary Group, was a clearing in the middle of the forest. This clearing was about a hundred feet wide. The mercenaries carefully cleaned it, leveled the ground, and then covered it with fine sand. Wooden training dummies and arrow targets were installed on it, and there was also a hut for rest. In the area adjacent to the clearing, thorny bushes were planted and many devices were installed to prevent others from entering their territory. If any outsider decided to trespass here, the devices would make loud noises. Ever since Link used the hidden power spell on Jacker, he had honed his fighting skills in this pure area. Originally his body was very strong, but now that the warrior had received martial art, his strength was accumulating and growing. After just a few days, he advanced to the third level, and it was clear that he could even break through to the fourth level. Lucy and Gildern looked at Jacker with great envy at his progress. They could only hope that Link's mana would recover quickly, and he would use this mysterious spell on them as well. Link had rested for five days. He had probably already recovered his entire mana reserve. During these few days, Link's life was very comfortable. Since he did not want to be disturbed, he stayed in the attic of the hotel, but Lucy cleaned the room to such an extent that it simply sparkled. The girl removed the cobwebs, replaced his old mattress with a cute little bed, replaced the blanket and bedspread with fresh ones that smelled like sunshine and clean laundry, and she also washed all the dirty laundry. Even Link had to admit that it was cool to have someone who will take care of his daily needs. Today he was busy writing his dissertation, 
but his new magical experiment was successful. The weather was good, so he went to the clearing to rest a little. Link also wanted to take this opportunity to cast a hidden power spell on Lucy. When Link arrived at the clearing, Gildern was practicing archery, and Jacker was practicing his shield attack on a heavy sandbag. But Lucy was nowhere to be seen. Where is Lucy? Link asked. Previously, the mercenaries agreed among themselves that Lucy would be the second to receive the hidden power. When they saw him, Jacker and Gildern immediately stopped the training. Jacker grabbed a rag, wiped the sweat from his face, and said, Lucy went to the market to hire people. She will be back in about an hour. Oh, good. Anyway, I am in no hurry. Link nodded and then said to Jacker, Let's go. Before she returns, let's try a new spell that I just developed. Of course. Jacker took his large iron shield and covered himself with it. He took a defensive stance and then activated his battle aura with the earth element. Immediately, his body and shield were enveloped in a solid layer of yellow jewel-like light. This was the light of his battle aura. Compared to the Jacker that Link met for the first time, his light became brighter and more concentrated. He could be compared to a fourth-level warrior. Significant progress. Link gave him credit, but my spell is quite powerful, so be careful. Jacker knew very well the power of Link's spells, so he took this warning seriously. The man concentrated. When he saw that Jacker was ready, Link began to recite the spell. The guy didn't want to take Jack by surprise, so he did it slowly. Mana slowly flowed into Dark Moon's wand. A continuous stream of runic shadows flowed from its tip, and then combined to form a runic aura. Link was inspired by the runic aura of hidden power, which was an important component of high-level spells. Thus, he adapted the spell's modular structure to develop his own new spell. There were three runic auras, a clear water aura, a fiery red aura, and a pure white aura. Each of these runic auras contained a huge number of magical runes, and they were all truly a magical sight. As the runic aura formed, Link took something from the pouch that hung on his belt with his left hand. He took out a powdery substance from the bag. It was iron filings. The young man opened his palm, and the iron filings flowed to the tip of the wand, which then sparkled brightly with a white aura. This was the color of the metallic element of the aura. Except in places like mineral caves, naturally occurring metal was scarce. By bringing his supply of metal elements in the form of iron filings, Link was able to greatly increase his spellcasting speed. However, iron filings were rare and expensive in this world. He could not find them even from a blacksmith. He ended up taking them to a sawmill where they were cut with a hydraulic saw. Twenty pounds of iron filings cost him twenty gold coins. There, at the end of the stick where the metal element went, a stream of red flame accumulated, and the two elements quickly connected with each other. The metal element formed the shell, and the fire element formed the core. By combining, they created a silvery iron ball the size of a fist. Instantly, after this iron ball was formed, the third rune began to work, circling on the tip of the wand. A streak of bright light flashed towards the silvery iron ball, and it began to rotate rapidly. Not only did it begin to rotate, the ball also changed its shape. It began to become more pointed, and the rotation of the light ball became the axis of rotation of this spike. The spike was spinning very quickly so fast that a tornado began to form around it, and a high-pitched whistling sound was heard in the air. Seeing this, Jacker involuntarily swallowed. As Link cast the spell slowly, he saw the entire process of the spell materializing, and it was simply terrifying. Get ready, I'm releasing it, Link warned. Jack nodded, then grabbed the iron shield tightly. His entire body was hidden behind the shield, and then Link released a magic ball. This flaming hot metal spike containing condensed fire elements instantly shot into the air like lightning. It flew almost a hundred feet, hitting the middle of Jacker's shield. Ring. There was a deep, resonating ringing sound, and Jacker's shield scattered the yellow hue of his battle aura in all directions, like firecrackers. Jacker was struck by the enormous force. Although the warrior was still standing, he was pushed back three feet. Two footprints appeared in the sand. The man felt that his arm was numb and there were several seconds when he simply could not find the energy to resist this force. Jacker checked his shield and found a fist-sized dent about an inch deep in the thick shield. Jacker stood motionless, watching this incredible power. He knew that Link had spells for fireballs that looked like glass balls, and if Link decided to use this spell on him, Jacker could be quickly finished off and sent to the kingdom of the gods in one move. My lord, what is this spell? Gildern was horrified. They had recently tried to study and understand magic with Link, and now they had a general idea of what spells were and what they did. However, this new technique was a mystery to them. If it was a fireball, 
then its power was simply terrifying, and if it was a metal ball, then its speed and charging force were too great. What was even more terrifying was that the four metal beams that dissipated after the impact were also powerful. If they were in a crowd, the scattered shards would cause unimaginable damage. Link put away his wand and briefly explained, I used some higher level magic techniques. This spell combines the techniques of using fire elements, metal elements, and some transformative elements. When you cast this spell, it makes a high-pitched sound, so I call it Whistle. It was originally a level 1 spell, and the original version was Vector Throw, but Link improved and transformed it. Now it was nothing like its predecessor. The Whistle spell had an incredibly high speed, 650 feet per second, so its attack range was also very long. At the same time, it had special magical elements. Link can change its flight path. Of course, since the speed was very high, its magical energy was also large, so the change in trajectory might not be as fast as that of ordinary nature spells. But the spell was powerful enough to kill. Regardless of whether it was a one-on-one -on -one fight or a group fight, whistling had an advantage in both situations because the fire element inside the metal casing exploded instantly at Link's command. In other words, it looked like a grenade with shrapnel. After checking, Link was satisfied with the power of the spell. This spell can suppress even the defenses of a third-level Earth Warrior. The weakest point of the spell was the speed of its creation. Although the structure of this high-level spell was much more complex than normal first-level spells, Link was able to successfully fire it in 0.2 seconds due to the fact that he had perfected it. Of course, this could not have happened without the help of the game system. With such speed and power, the whistling became Link's new killer move. Jacker experienced the power of the spell himself, and fear lurked in him. Whistling. It should have been called Death Whistle, he thought to himself. Link laughed. He was pleased. This spell combined all the ideas he had recently gained in magic, and after creating it, the young mage received five Omni Points from the system. It was definitely a big win. By this time, Lucy had not yet returned. Link was in no hurry, so he sat down on a stool and chatted with Gildern. Gildern told him about what the mercenaries had heard and seen, and Link explained some basic knowledge about magic. Jacker listened to Link's explanation of magic as he continued to train. They chatted and chatted until two hours had passed, but Lucy had not yet appeared. The mercenaries began to worry. Jacker, are you sure she was only gone for an hour? Link frowned slightly because quite a lot of time had passed. Jacker raised his eyebrows. He could no longer study. Something is wrong. Lucy is always punctual. Even if something unexpected happened, she would send someone to inform us, especially at a time like this. Could something bad happen? Gildern, his face turned pale. It can be that someone from the Dark Brotherhood wants revenge, right? It can't be that bad. We are in River Bay. Even if chaos reigns outside the city, the police patrol the city. Moreover, it was still daytime, and Lucy was not a weak little girl. Who will dare to fight her? Link stood up and said, We won't achieve anything by just sitting and guessing. Collect all the things. We'll go to the market and ask around people. Lucy was his follower, and now that she had problems, Link had no choice but to help her. Jacker and Gilder nodded. They had trusted Link in the fight against the Dark Brotherhood, and now he was the lord to whom they were both loyal. So now that there was a problem, both subconsciously obeyed his words. Once they put all their things away, Jacker put on his new steel armor and took out his new steel round shield and hammer. This new set of equipment combined with his seven-foot frame made him look bulky and imposing, like a tank. Gildern also put on his new set of equipment. Link donned light leather armor to move more freely. They then quickly reached the market in the eastern part of River Cove City. The King's Path ran through River Cove. It was a small town of approximately one square mile due to its close location to the capital Spring City. Consequently, the city was always bustling with travelers from all walks of life. For this reason, Link and the mercenaries could easily blend into the crowd. Five minutes later, they reached the entrance to the city market. Many people sold livestock at the market. It was here that farmers from the area around Gerwent Forest came to buy or sell cows, sheep, and other livestock. These animals were very valuable, so to prevent them from escaping, a wooden fence was built around the market, and the entrance to the market was guarded by two militiamen. There were other patrolmen on duty inside, keeping an eye out for any commotion or trouble. Jacker was a mercenary, and so he was naturally on good terms with the militia. He walked up to one of the guards and thrust a silver coin into his hand. John, was there anything unusual here today? No, everything is fine. There weren't even any skirmishes, John answered shaking his head and taking the coin. 
Today he treated Jacker more politely than usual. Oh, I see. Have you seen Lucy? Jacker asked. Lucy was a beautiful woman and had an attractive figure. The girl liked to wear tight leather armor because it allowed her to move much more freely, but it also meant that everyone could see her luscious curves. Because of this, she was well known in the city, and many lonely people in the city dreamed of her. So everyone in town knew Lucy. Even if they had never seen the girl, people had at least heard of her somewhere. John knew Lucy, and in fact, he was one of the girl's most devoted admirers, although Lucy herself never spoke to him. I donned to know her. I saw that she wasn't here today, otherwise I would have noticed, John said, shaking his head. When John finished that sentence, Jacker, Gildern, and Link frowned. It seemed like something really terrible had happened. What happened? Isn't she with you guys? John asked nervously, seeing their reaction. Jack thought that this was just the expression of a man who was worried about the woman he wanted, but Link sensed something more in his words. John looked genuinely worried, but as he spoke, Link noticed that his gaze looked suspicious, as if he knew something but wasn't telling them. Link immediately walked over and secretly showed John two gold coins in his hand, sparkling with a golden sheen. At the same time, Link checked the surroundings and blocked the view of other people to make sure that only John would see the gold coins. Link asked quietly, Tell me what you know, John, and these two gold coins are yours. John still hesitated and didn't answer. Do you know why Lucy never paid attention to you? Link asked. Why? John asked without thinking. Link grinned, then said, She once told me that you were an untrustworthy type of person and that she could never feel safe in your presence. I thought it was just an excuse, but now I realized it was true. Even now, when you know that Lucy is in danger, you only think about your own safety, and yet you still dare to desire her. I'm not just thinking about my own safety. Don't you know who you've messed with? John exclaimed, his face turning red from shame and anger. With whom? I cannot tell, John said, stopping at the very last moment. Link showed five shiny gold coins that he held in his hand. John swallowed. He would have earned this amount of money only in six months. He glanced furtively to the left, then to the right, and when he was sure no one was looking, he finally said in a very quiet voice, If something happened to Lucy, it must have something to do with the syndicate. That's all I can tell you. After finishing his words, John opened his eyes wide at the gold coins in Link's hand. Yes, John loved Lucy, but Lucy never paid attention to him. She somehow provoked the wrath of the syndicate. She must already be dead, and in his eyes, a dead woman was much less attractive than these gold coins lying in front of him. Link threw the gold coins in John's face, then said to Jacker and Gildern, Let's go. We can't do anything else. Find out from him. If the Syndicate was the true culprit behind Lucy's disappearance, then they probably covered their tracks well. The market was full of people minding their own business, so any trace of their aura had already been lost in the atmosphere, and even a low-level tracking spell would be useless here. Of course, Link knew about the Syndicate. If the Dark Brotherhood was the largest underworld organization in the western region of Gerwent Forest, then the Syndicate was the unrivaled underworld organization in the entire human world. They originated from the Free Trade Confederacy in the south, and after thousands of years of development have now spread throughout the human world. In Gerwent Forest, there was a syndicate division that controlled the entire southern part of the forest. The Dark Brotherhood was like an ordinary snake, and the syndicate was like a giant underground serpent. They must have been very powerful because they were able to survive for so long, because different kingdoms in the human world launched numerous attacks on the syndicate in an attempt to destroy them. But these attacks only led to short periods of peace. The Syndicate was always able to somehow revive itself, and then, in a short period of time, grow again until it reached its former glory. They were like wild weeds. Neither fire nor blades could erase them from the face of the earth. Link also knew that the Syndicate was as difficult to get rid of as scabies, because there was an individual who led the organization under the cover of darkness, an almost invincible individual with enormous power. This individual was a dark puppet master who held in his hands the strings that no one else could see except him. He was a master of thieves, the king of the underworld on the continent of Firamon, and the first founder of the syndicate, and his name was Morpheus. Morpheus's power matched the level of legendary power, and it was said that he even caught a glimpse of the secrets of the gods. In the game, in order to ignite the divine fire, Morpheus joined the god of darkness due to which the Syndicate became a vicious organization associated with the dark side, and therefore Morpheus became the first final boss in the game. 
That year, Link was in the group that was defeated by this boss. Morpheus, are you already walking along this path of darkness? Link lamented, looking back at that terrifying battle in the game. But the Syndicate unit in the Gerwin Forest was only a small part of the entire organization, so Link was sure that he would not meet Morpheus yet. However, the boy had to admit that facing the Syndicate was a wondrous task. He must plan his next steps wisely. Apparently, Jacker and Gildern have also heard about the Syndicate. They both walked silently on their way back, lost in their thoughts. They didn't want to give up searching for Lucy. No, they would never give her up. But now they were faced with such a terrifying enemy that they were completely at a loss. How, if even it was possible, to save her? In the few minutes that they walked, Link methodically analyzed the entire case, carefully thinking through every aspect. First, what exactly did the Syndicate want? Golden coins? That might be one of their goals, although he doubted the Syndicate was that desperate for money. In any case, no one, including the Syndicate, would turn down the opportunity to earn more money. They can still look. Occult runes of Tarvis. Occult runes helped the demon Tarvis escape from the sealed barrier in which he was imprisoned. But due to Victor's defeat, the occult runes were now lost. So, the powerful figure behind the Syndicate became the next slave of the demon Tarvis. Apparently they need occult runes, Link thought. If this was the case, then it meant that Lucy would still be alive before the Syndicate figured out the location of the occult runes. But now they must have been torturing her to get the location of the occult runes from the girl. As soon as she told them, Lucy would be killed immediately, and then Link would be in for a hell of a lot of trouble. However, Link wouldn't blame Lucy if she turned him in under torture, because he knew that if he himself ended up in such a situation would immediately reveal all the secrets he had in his head. Now the most important thing was to find Lucy and bring her back in any way. Link thought about ideas, and when they reached the entrance to the River Cove Inn, he already had a big plan. Do you know where you can find a syndicate envoy? Link asked Jacker, who had been silent all this time. No organization could completely hide. Each organization will appoint an external ambassador to ensure quick and smooth communication with each department. As a mercenary, Jacker knew the underworld much better than Link. Before working in Gerwent Forest, he naturally had to learn the rules of the gang's territory and understand which lines he should not cross. The warrior learned that the Syndicate was the most prominent untouchable authority that no one could ever challenge. In the gambling house of the city of River Cove, there is someone who knows how to find them, Jacker replied. Then let's go to the gambling house. The gambling house was located in the northwestern part of the city of River Bay. It was a large two-story wooden house. This business was perhaps the most successful and brought in the most money in the area. It was rumored that the gambling house was owned by the mayor's nephew, so the house could operate even in broad daylight, and the guards would never bother them anyway. When they entered the gambling house, Jacker and Gildern stood on either side of Link standing between them, protecting him. There were a lot of people. Most of the players had bloodshot eyes from lack of sleep. In front of each card table stood a girl dealer, whose attractive figure was adorned with short clothes. In every key place of the gambling house there were strong guards who monitored everything that was happening. It was here that one could meet representatives of the lower classes of society, prostitutes, pickpockets, swindlers, and other rabble. Entering the gambling house, Jacker looked around the room and headed to the table standing in the corner. On the way he said to Link, My lord, do you see that yellow-haired boy over there? This is Jimmy, rumored to know how to get a message across to the syndicate people. This was definitely one of Jacker's strengths. He communicated with people from low strata, so he knew very well all the intricacies of this society, which is exactly what Link lacked. Link looked where Jacker pointed and saw that Jimmy was not participating in the card game, but was simply standing nearby and watching behind the game. Jimmy's hands and feet were not clean. As soon as Link looked at him, Jimmy reached out and reached into the pockets of the two players. He stole little from them, just a few coppers from each player. He was quick and careful like a dragonfly skimming the surface of the water. But he is just a pickpocket, said Link. Yes, but the syndicate is a group of thieves, said Gildern. While they were talking, the three went to Jimmy and surrounded him. Jimmy tried to escape, but Jacker and Gildern cornered him, blocking all possible escape routes. What are you doing? I am telling you I don't like being pushed. Jimmy swallowed. He extended one hand in front of his chest, and the other grabbed his pockets where the dagger was hidden. But as soon as his hand moved... Gildern raised his pocket knife and struck Jimmy's wrist with lightning speed. The cut was not just a scratch. Jimmy's wrist shook, and he gasped. With his other hand, he grabbed his cut wrist. Just like that, both of his hands were now neutralized. 
Link walked up to him, pointed the wooden Dark Moon wand at Jimmy's heart. The tip of the wand glowed dimly and said, I heard that you can convey a message to the Syndicate. Link spoke very quietly. They didn't want to make a fuss in a noisy gambling house. The guards looked in their direction, but did not see anything unusual, so they turned to another place. In the gambling house, small disagreements were common. They could not eliminate every problem that arose. So, as long as there was no big disturbance, the guards decided not to interfere. Despite this, Jimmy felt differently. The boy felt something pressing on his heart. The boy was a little cold and hurt, and he saw that there was a very dim light burning at the tip of the wand, so he was sure that this man was definitely a wizard. Jimmy was so scared that his body shook, and his voice trembled when the guy began to say, Yes, 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 I can send a message. Then tell them that I have what they want. If this girl dies, or if she even gets a scratch on her, they can forget about getting it. Remember, my name is Link and I am a wizard. If they want to meet me, I'll be at the River Cove Inn. Link spoke quietly, but his gaze remained cold as ice. He released the mana that was in his body, charging the air around him and creating a noticeable aura around him. He now had about a hundred mana points, and his supply was full. This was normal for a second-level wizard. If he now shows this to all the people, they will immediately be afraid, since they know nothing about magic. And that was enough for him. Yellow-haired Jimmy had never seen this. He nodded furiously and said, I will convey your message. Now. I'll go now. Link then removed his aura and pointed his wand at Jimmy's heart. In the darkness, he cast the magician's hand spell, then penetrated Jimmy's flesh and bones and grabbed his beating heart. Jimmy was overcome by a terrifying feeling that his heart was squeezing. He broke into a sweat. The boy? His whole body was petrified with fear. Don't even think about lying and hurry up. Otherwise the magic I placed on your heart will tear it into a thousand pieces, Link said, and removed the mage's hand. This spell was very useful for intimidating ordinary people who knew nothing about magic. If it were a strong warrior, this trick would not work because the magical power in this spell was too weak. Only the strength of the warrior's body could stop Link from penetrating his flesh and bones. Jimmy almost went crazy, and Link let him go. The moment he was freed, the guy running away from Link said, I will deliver your message immediately. Okay, now they could only wait. Link said to Jacker and Gildern, Come on. We will wait for people from the Syndicate at the River Cove Inn. He knew that the powerful people behind the scenes valued magical runes very much, and Link hid the rune in his crystal pendant. He was undetectable, so they would never be able to find him. Link threatened them with such bold words because they couldn't find him anyway. They would not dare to take any rash steps. The only option was to send someone to handle the matter. Thus, they had a chance to save Lucy's life. The next step depended on the message that the Syndicate would send. The three left the gambling house. Along the way, Link said, I know you both probably have questions. My lord, we would like to know what the Syndicate really wants? Jacker asked. Gildern was also interested. Link did not hide anything. Remember that black crystal that Victor had? It has a name. These are magic runes. I think this is exactly what they want. My lord, then shall we give it to them? Jacker asked. Link shook his head furiously and said, Of course not. It's an evil magic item, and I sealed it away. If it falls into their hands, it will bring misfortune to the entire Gerwent Forest. No, maybe even to the entire Norton Kingdom. Then something may happen that will destroy the entire Gerwent Forest. If this happens, no one will be able to escape. Technically, all of this was true because if the Academy had problems, they would have lost half the wizards of the entire kingdom and would not have been able to defend themselves against the Dark Elf Army. All this would lead to the fact that the Forest of Gerwent would be burned to the ground and all because of this magic rune. Hearing about such terrible consequences, Jacker and Gildern fell silent. They knew that Link always told them the truth. A cold smile appeared on Link's face. So, Jacker, Gildern, now do you know the downsides of having such power? As your power grows, you can do things that usually can't be done by other people. Then what you have achieved will attract the attention of people as strong as yourself, so you will have to face much stronger opponents. For example, the destruction of the Dark Brotherhood, if only the Flamingo Mercenary Group had taken over. Not only would they not have been able to defeat the Brotherhood, but they would not even have been able to kill Victor. Then they would never have touched the magic rune, and therefore would never have faced the current danger. But now everything was different. Jacker understood what Link meant, but he grinned and said, My lord, everyone will die. The only difference is, how? If I am killed by a strong opponent who used to look down on me, then my life will be wasted. Gildern squeezed the bow tightly in his hand and said, My lord. 
for a mercenary, this is the harsh reality of life. Link smiled. He realized that he had really chosen the right allies. Don't worry, it's, it's not that important. We are only dealing with a small part of the Syndicate anyway. We defeated the Dark Brotherhood, even killed the demonic victor, and these hiding thieves of the Syndicate will not be so difficult to deal with. Although, in truth, there were dangerous moments in the Syndicate. The first of them was the matter of saving Lucy's life, and the second was the power of the Syndicate, which spread throughout the human kingdom. Even if they manage to destroy the Syndicate unit in Gerwent Forest, that doesn't mean they won't have any more problems. Link will be fine. As long as he can enter the Magic Academy, he will be safe inside. But for Jacker and the others, things were different. Link felt responsible for getting them into this trouble. So he decided that he should think about how to reduce the dangers his followers would face in the future due to the Syndicate. However, Link had no idea what to do now. Forget about it. Don't think about it. When the time comes, I'll think of something. You just need to take a step and then plan the next one correctly. The most important thing now is to save Lucy's life. Link threw all his worries about the future away and focused on the most pressing problem of the present. When Jacker and Gildern heard what Link was saying, they breathed a sigh of relief. Link was their main strength, their central support. And if he was sure of something, then they only had to follow his example, and they were sure that everything would be fine. At that moment, Link heard the uniform beat of hooves behind him. He turned around and saw a beautiful carriage moving in their direction. The carriage was drawn by four beautiful horses. The carriage itself was made from a large piece of ebony and had silver runes engraved in several places. Several protective spells were also cast on the carriage. This carriage was much more luxurious than the one Eliard arrived in. There must be members of some noble family inside. Link and the others stepped aside to let the carriage pass. Coming from a noble family himself, he had some idea of such luxuries that only nobles and people of high society could afford. Such a carriage would cost at least 2,000 gold coins. Old man Hamilton Morani also had one, but it was only worth 300 gold coins. And the one standing in front of him now was definitely more expensive. River Cove City was located not far from the royal capital. There were magnificent views here. Important people from the city often came here on vacation. Needless to say, such luxurious carriages were not a rare sight here. Since Link's head was full of plans to save Lucy, he paid no attention to these nobles. He didn't notice at all how the carriage stopped right after it passed them. The knight who was following the carriage rode up to the carriage window and seemed to listen carefully to the order. He then turned his horse around and rode up to Link and the two mercenaries. Jacker and Gildern were both alarmed and grabbed their weapons. Link was also startled, but he didn't panic. He touched the shoulders of the mercenaries and assured them, Don't not worry, there won't mud be any problems. And then the wizard stepped forward. The knight quickly reached Link and then shouted condescendingly, Young man, tell me your name. Link did not answer immediately. He carefully examined the knight in front of. He was dressed in carved silver armor and a sky-blue shirt, and on his chest was an imprint of a roaring lion, the family crest. In the Norton Kingdom, the roaring lion was the symbol of the able royal family. This meant that the knight in front of him was a high-ranking person, serving directly to the king, and the man in the carriage must also be an important figure, probably a member of the royal family. Link did not know why the knight wanted to know his name, but he answered as usual, I am Link Morani, son of Viscount Hamilton Morani. I had to mention my noble surname. As he interacted with the nobles, he realized that they would treat him better if he introduced himself as one of them. As expected, the moment he mentioned his father's name, the knight's hard gaze softened. At the same time, a quiet voice came from the carriage. The voice was barely audible, but incredibly familiar. Link immediately knew who was in the carriage. It was Annie Abel, the only daughter of the Iron Duke and niece of King Leon. But shouldn't she be in Gladstone? What is she doing here in River Cove City? Ten minutes later, Link and Annie arrived at the River Cove Inn. Since Annie was a royal princess, they couldn't stay in the hall as they would draw too much attention to themselves. Therefore, they gathered on the second floor in a separate living room of the best hotel room. Besides Link and Annie, there was also a knight who asked Link his name. His name was Anderson. Meanwhile, Jacker and Gildern remained in the hall downstairs, waiting for a message from the syndicate. Why did you leave without even saying goodbye? Annie asked. She was wearing light azure leather armor. She stared at Link, waiting for his answer. There was anger in her deep blue eyes. When they met on the street, she was heading to the capital at the king's call. After the Gladstone Massacre, her father and even King Leon himself paid close attention to the Dark Elves' invasion. 
And since Annie was involved in this conflict, she was called to the capital to report the situation to the king. Link sighed. He never thought that he would meet this future legendary assassin after running so far away from Gladstone. He couldn't help but be surprised by such a remarkable coincidence. In Gladstone, due to the constant threat from the Dark Elf assassins, Link had to keep his eyes open, so he was constantly on the move, afraid to stay in one place for too long. But now he was in Rivercove City, a city in the heart of the Norton Kingdom, far from any external threats. In addition, he managed to learn more spells of a higher level. Thus, all the fears and anxieties that he experienced at Gladstone were dispelled. Link thought for a few seconds and then came up with a suitable explanation for Annie. I suppose you are wondering how a mage apprentice was able to use a spell of such a high level as Flame Burst? Link said laughing. These words caught Annie's attention. This was exactly what interested her. Anderson was also interested. He had always thought that this young man was just another noble's son, or that he was just an ordinary mage apprentice. He was surprised to find that Link had enough of his abilities to use a spell as powerful as level 4 Flame Burst. How old is he? He looks no more than 16 or 17. Shouldn't young apprentice mages of this age only know level 0 spells? The knight was surprised. So under the curious glances of Annie and Anderson, Link began an explanation, filling it with the necessary half-truths. At first, I could not create a flame explosion. In fact, the highest spells I knew were only level 2. But after defeating Wizard Holmes, I returned to Fleming's Academy and found three scrolls about the flame explosion spell. However, these scrolls turned out to be too powerful for my level, so the spell turned against me. My body was greatly weakened after using the scrolls, to the point that I could not even cast a simple spell. You know how dangerous it was at Gladstone. I would not have stayed there for a minute in such a weakened state. In the end, I had no choice but to quickly sneak away to the south before I could say goodbye to you, Link said choosing each word carefully. The guy thought that his explanation was logical. There may have been discrepancies on some points, but Fleming's academy was burned to the ground, so no one could refute his words. Annie completely believed Link's explanations because she believed that he had no reason to lie to her. However, she was disappointed by Link's actions. But you should have told me that. I would have sent people to protect you and make sure you escaped safely to the south, Annie said. <sighs> She's so frivolous, it's just terrible. Link was between two fires. Annie was not only a princess, but also a friend. Link knew she only acted like that out of concern, so he couldn't just blow her off. And so he had no choice but to continue to patiently explain everything to her. It is okay. I found the secret way to salvation. I arrived safely at Gerwin Forest by noon that day, Link said. At Selene, his flying speed, it only took three hours for Selene to cover the thousand-mile distance between Gladstone and Gerwin Forest. Annie had nothing more to argue with Link about, but she, she still couldn't come to terms with the fact that Link left Gladstone without telling her. Link didn't even seem to care about her feelings. Stop, what a strange thought. Why would Link care about her feelings? Now she was completely confused, having discovered the reason for her irritation, and the anger in her heart disappeared. The girl quickly tried to regain her composure. I saw you walking down the street sadly, and your two friends also looked confused. Did something terrible happen? Annie asked. Only heaven knows how much Link had been waiting for this question. Annie could gather significant forces behind her. Plus, Link was on fairly good terms with her, so he hoped that the girl might be willing to help him in the fight against the Syndicate. However, Link was not afraid to face the Syndicate alone. The trouble was that the influence and power of the Syndicate had spread throughout the human world, so even if he managed to destroy their unit in the Gerwin Forest, he would face a wave of retaliatory attacks. There was a saying that said, you can be a thief for a thousand days, but at the same time, it is impossible to protect yourself from thieves. Passive defense is much more likely to fail than active offense. Link wouldn't want to defend himself against the Syndicate for the rest of his life. But if he could get Princess Annie's help, even if the Syndicate discovered that Link had defeated one of their units, they would still be helpless against the power of the National Army, and would therefore be much more reluctant to take retaliatory measures. With Annie's help, Link can instead transfer the risks to the Syndicate. So, Link laid out to Annie everything he had encountered in the city of River Cove, from his meeting with the Flamingo Mercenary Gang to their fight against the Dark Brotherhood in search of gold coins. He then told Annie about Victor's hidden treasure, and then how the Syndicate found out that they had this hidden treasure, and finally about Lucy's kidnapping. The only thing Link didn't mention was the occult runes. 
he was confident that he could hide the existence of the occult runes from Annie and the Knight. The Syndicate would never mention runes because they were a forbidden item in the Realm of Light. Jacker and Gildern were both his followers, so they won't tell anyone about him either. As soon as Link finished his story, Annie turned to Anderson and said, General, the Syndicate has grown too bold. They dared to cause trouble even to a city located near Spring City. There, too, the situation that happened at Gladstone could be repeated if we don't keep them under control. Isn't it time for us to cleanse the kingdom of this dirty gang of thieves? Everyone knew that the Syndicate was a nasty and dangerous organization. In fact, every kingdom in the Realm of Light attempted to destroy the Syndicate, although none of these attempts had any permanent effect. But now that Princess Annie had spoken her order, General Anderson was naturally overcome with enthusiasm. Yes, Your Highness, Anderson said solemnly. He placed his right hand on his heart. I will immediately gather the militia in River Cove. Okay? Now you can go. The sooner we solve this problem, the better. Annie was cold and arrogant as she spoke to Anderson. Anderson bowed again and walked out of the living room with long strides. When the door closed, Annie and Link were left alone in the room. Link was still thinking about the syndicate, so he could not sit quietly in a room in which nothing was happening. Princess, he began after a few minutes of silence. Just call me Annie, as in Gladstone. Annie intervened. Okay, Annie, he said. Link, a message from the syndicate could arrive at any minute. Maybe we should sit in the hall and wait for it there? Jacker and Gildern were both in the hall, but the fact that they would meet such an enemy as the syndicate scared them. Link thought it best to be with them? Okay. Let's go, Annie replied. They both stood up and headed towards the door, but just as Link's hand was about to touch the doorknob, he heard Annie's quiet voice coming from behind him. Is Lucy beautiful? she asked. What kind of question is this? Link was surprised. He stood in confused silence for several seconds. Okay? Link finally answered. What, prettier than me? Annie asked again. Both of you? Em, no, of course. She's not as beautiful as you, Link said. Finally, he realized the strange tone in Annie's voice. Maybe Annie fell in love with him? But this is impossible. They only saw each other for two hours. How can feelings arise so quickly? To be honest, Link considered Annie a friend and nothing more. She may be a princess, and a very pretty one at that, but she's just not his type. He had to be careful with what he said, so as not to hurt her feelings. He didn't want to offend her, fearing that it might influence her decision to help him fight the syndicate. Lucy is my follower, Link said, quickly turning to Annie. We've fought battles together, so if anything happens to her, or even Jacker or Gildern, I'll do everything in my power to help and Lucy's appearance has nothing to do with it. I must do this. It is my responsibility as their lord, Link explained seriously. Both the lord and the follower had their own responsibilities and competencies. Once they swore an oath to each other, followers were required to remain loyal to their lord, and in turn, the lord was required to protect the interests of his followers. If a follower died fighting for him, then the lord must arrange a proper funeral for that follower so that his other followers do not lose their faith in him. As expected, Annie was overjoyed upon hearing Link's explanation. Her steps quickened, and the girl caught up with Link. Her attitude became noticeably more positive. If you have problems getting into the academy, I can write a letter of recommendation. My father has a friend, a powerful sixth-level wizard. He also works as a curator at the East Bay Academy of Magic. He will immediately take you under his wing as soon as my father orders. Given your talents, he will be very happy to accept you as his student. This time I forgive you. But next time if you have problems, you should let me help you, Annie said. I will remember this, Link replied. The guy opened the door and they left the room. But before they went any further, they came across Jacker on the stairs. My lord, a letter has arrived from the syndicate, he said. What was in it? Link asked, his face expressing determination. They demand that we meet them at Redleaf Cove, south of River Cove City, before three o'clock in the afternoon, and bring them. Gold coins in exchange for Lucy's safety, Jacker said. He saw Annie and thought it unwise to mention the crystal in front of a stranger, so he replaced it with gold coins instead. Annie did not notice anything suspicious in Jacker's tone. She only frowned angrily and said, Has the syndicate's power in Gerwent Forest grown that much? It seems I arrived on time. Jacker didn't quite understand what Annie meant, so he turned to Link for an explanation. Princess Annie will help us save Lucy. General Anderson went to the city to gather guards on her orders, Link said. Jacker instantly perked up. With the help of the royal family, the syndicate's threats now seemed much less dire. 
it seemed that there was a chance that Lucy could be saved. However, he was amazed to learn that his lord knew the royal princess and was even on such good terms with her. Link turned to Annie and said, Annie, the most important thing now is to save Lucy. We can think about to destroy the syndicate later. We can't make too much noise now, otherwise they will reveal our plans. I'm going to go there with Gildern and Jacker, and you and the others can safely follow them later. No, I'll go with you now. Anderson will wait here, make a further plan and go after us later. And don't even try to stop me. It's too dangerous for you to fight alone. You saved my life in Gladstone once, so now let me help you, Annie said, looking at him decisively. Okay. Link knew there was no point in arguing about this, so he just nodded. And so Annie quickly wrote a letter and told her servant to send it to Anderson. Let S go, she said. We'll ride on my horses. Redleaf Cove was about two miles north of River Cove City. There were many maples in this area, and every autumn the entire bay was covered with red leaves, which is why it was given its name. The bay was long and narrow, with a small stream in the middle. Since it was autumn, the stream had almost dried up, exposing its mouth. In a grove on the bank of the stream there stood a lone log cabin. The log cabin was shrouded in a thick blanket of darkness. It was there that all the syndicate thieves hid. They were experts in camouflage. Even the birds and small animals were unaware of their presence. The log cabin was sparsely furnished. In the middle of the room hung two iron chains, from which Lucy was chained by her arms. The girl's hair was dirty, her leather armor was torn off, and bruises and bloodstains from the lashes were visible all over her naked body. In some places, her skin was broken so badly that her bones could almost be seen. The syndicate had always been very cruel in treating their captives. Lucy was captured only two hours ago, but they were already torturing her, keeping her on the brink of death. There was a shadow in the corner. It was the executioner responsible for her torture. Well, girl, you still don't want to talk. His voice sounded extremely calm and gentle, as if he was talking to an old friend. Lucy's head dropped weakly. She let her fiery red hair fall over her face. Blood flowed down her body, forming pools of blood on the floor. As soon as she heard the voice of the dark shadow, her body began to tremble involuntarily. In the past two hours, every time the voice spoke, the sound was accompanied by the blows of the whips. As expected, a black whip burst out from the darkness, like a poisonous snake from the hand of a dark shadow. Clap! He hit Lucy's chest, and the whip immediately rolled back, bringing with it a piece of her flesh. This time the beating was especially brutal. With incredible force, the whip penetrated Lucy's chest. The girl felt a sweet taste in her throat as the blood rushed upward, but the mercenary swallowed and forced her to retreat. The girl's face distorted slightly, then a wry smile appeared on it. You have no other tricks besides whips, Lucy said weakly. Lucy dealt with pain very well. She had been a mercenary for a long time and had experienced much worse than this. One day they were catching magma spiders on the Blackstone Hill volcano in the north. The fire spider splashed its acidic saliva on Lucy, and the pain she felt then was simply terrible. The girl could remember it even now. But she didn't even squeak in such pain, so even if there was salt water on the whip, Lucy would still be able to bear it. As soon as she finished her sentence, the whip hit Lucy again. This time he touched the girl's face. But since her thick red hair covered her face, the blow didn't do much damage, but still left deep bloody streaks. Why keep it a secret? Finally the tone of the black shadow, his voice changed a little. If you want money, I can give you a thousand gold coins right now. You can take the money and go anywhere and live the rest of your life in luxury. Daydreaming? Lucy spat out blood into the corner. I will come back and kill you all. She was not a poor girl who could do nothing but cry and wait for rescue. Her nickname among the mercenaries was Fire Rose. Lucy will repay any debt, be it a debt of gratitude or revenge. The girl swore that if she ever managed to escape this place, she would return and repay those cowards lurking in the shadows for what they did to her. I don't want to disappoint you, but you won't live to see this moment. No one will save you. Perhaps I should tell you that we are members of the Syndicate. Your two mercenary friends don't stand a chance against us. They wouldn't even risk facing us, eh? Huh? The Black Shadow laughed sadly and continued. After all, I just started torturing you. If you don't open your mouth now, I'll show you what hell is on Earth. The moment Lucy heard the word Syndicate, her heart sank. Of course the girl knew the Syndicate. It was a poisonous snake that took root in the continent of Firamun. The southern part of the Gerwent Forest was their main territory. They were much stronger than the Dark Brotherhood. Ten, maybe a hundred times. This is much more than what the Flamingo mercenary group was able to withstand. Even if Jacker and Gildern came to save her, 
they would only meet their end here. If it was the Syndicate who captured her, then it seemed that Lucy had no chance of survival. She laughed bitterly, an image of a thin and frail figure flashing in her head. A brilliant young magician, the lord to whom she had recently sworn allegiance. Will he come to save her? The girl was not sure of this. In her memories the young man was always calm and indifferent. His eyes never seemed to move. They were dark and black, deep and quiet, as if nothing could awaken his feelings. When the girl was cleaning his room, the magician did not even look at her. Her sensual figure, her beautiful face, none of this attracted the young man. His eyes were always focused on spells and magic. The biggest reaction she had received during all this time was a simple thank you when she finished, and nothing more. Lucy could not understand where she occupied in the heart and mind of such an emotionless person. But as the girl guessed, she probably was not that important to him. Eh, uh, I wanted to practice my martial art in the next few days. But I think I won't have the chance to do this again. Lucy sighed mentally. A brilliant path lay right in front of her, but as soon as she approached it, at the very last moment, a poisonous snake suddenly jumped out and bit her. And now everything has collapsed. Only darkness remains. Now do you get it? The dark shadow spoke again in the corner. Lucy bit her lips and shook her head. I will never tell you. The Syndicate was a powerful organization, and even if its Lord Link was a powerful mage, perhaps even he could not defeat them. She would have understood if the young man had not come to save her, but Lucy herself would never be able to break her oath and betray him. What a stubborn girl. I admire you, haha. -ha. A figure came out of a dark corner. Its features gradually emerged. This man was dressed like a typical thief wearing a mask and brown leather armor. In his left hand was a whip soaked in blood, and in his right hand was a sharp dagger. He threw away the leather whip, then picked up the dagger and walked towards Lucy with quiet steps. He reached out and lifted Lucy's chin, then laughed and said, See this dagger? While he was talking, the man drew a circle on Lucy's chest with this dagger. His voice became even softer as he said, it's amazingly sharp. The flesh of the one who refuses to cooperate, I will cut into pieces. I will open his chest so that the man can see his own heart beating. Then I'll cut open his belly so he can see his own liver, intestines, and everything else. But don't worry, I'll be very gentle, so it won't hurt too much and you won't die right away. You're just a devil! Lucy finally felt real horror. She was never afraid of death, but the girl was afraid of this terrifying torture. Thank you for such a compliment, said the thief, smiling cruelly. His eyes exuded a terrible coldness. This is your last chance. Will you speak or remain silent? Lucy had doubts for a moment, but she quickly pushed them away. She bit her lips and said, I'd rather die. Then I will be there in the realm of the gods. Looking down on you as you head to hell? Uh... The thief sighed, the dagger slowly approaching and about to pierce Lucy's bloody chest. But at that moment, someone knocked on the door, and a voice outside said, My lord. The city mercenaries from River Cove have sent you a message. The thief immediately stopped his actions, put away the dagger, and patted Lucy on the face. Oh, so your comrades have come to die? They are as stupid as you. Saying these words, the thief opened the wooden door and walked out. Lucy's eyes suddenly flashed. Is he here to save me? She knew Jacker and Gildern well enough that they would definitely come to save her, but they couldn't find her so quickly. The only person who could figure out where she was taken and send a message in such a short time was Link. At that moment, a storm of emotions flared up inside her. Joy, worry, and gratitude. And the figure of this young magician began to emerge more and more clearly in the girl. His imagination. Outside the log cabin. When Andy heard the message from his subordinate, he frowned. Why was the magician among them? Damn it! They demanded that Lucy be safe and sound but she was beaten until the girl's entire body was covered with bloody lacerations. This may cause some problems. He thought and said, Go tell them to come to the Bay of Red Leaves. Yes, my lord. The thief turned around and left. Andy stared at the thief, his back and thought, Ordinary people don't. Know about magic runes and, of course, one even dare to touch them. Only magicians know their true value. It seems that the runes really fell into the hands of the magician. Ah. <sighs> There are only three of them, and they still want to fight me, what idiots. Andy then whistled, and soon after, a black shadow appeared from behind the bushes. My lord, what do you command? Gather all the Nightblade members and tell them to put on anti-magic armor and take anti-magic daggers. And bring me my anti-magic equipment, Andy ordered. 
Yes, my lord. Grinning, Andy said. A wizard. Let's see what you can do. Thirty minutes after receiving the message from the syndicate, Link, Annie, and two mercenaries on horseback reached the entrance to Redleaf Bay. It was late autumn, and the bay was covered in fiery red maple leaves. Weeds and bushes grew between the maples. With the exception of the river that ran through the bay, the whole place was full of secluded corners where syndicate thieves could lie in ambush. If they had rushed into the bay without prior planning or preparation, just one mistake, and they could easily have been surrounded and captured. A narrow rocky path ran through the middle of the bay. Horses could not follow such a narrow path, so the travelers had to dismount and walk. Jacker walked ahead with his shield raised, Annie was to Link's left, and Gildern walked behind him. As they entered the bay, Link saw a notification on the interface. New mission series received. Poisonous snake in Gerwent Forest. First mission. Rescue. Mission details. Rescue Lucy, who was captured and tortured by the Syndicate. Mission rewards. 20 Omni points. Link accepted mission without hesitation. He now had 14 Omni points, and his mana pool was almost full. 96 points. His glass balls only cost one mana point each, and his level one whistling spell only required four mana points. Overall, Link had more than enough resources to take on the Syndicate. Their vision in the forest was very limited, so to protect himself from sneak attacks, Link cast a Detect Aura spell on his eyes to see the innate aura of everything. A non-living beings and plants had stable and motionless auras, but animals and people were covered in auras that actively moved and vibrated. The auras that were emitted by the three people next to him were intense and energetic. Jacker's aura was yellow, and she was shining the brightest. This meant that his battle aura was the strongest. Annie's aura was gray due to the shadow energy the assassins possessed. But what surprised him the most was Gildern's glowing green aura, which was the color of the wind element. Gildern's green aura was much brighter and more intense than anything Link had seen before. It seemed that although he had not yet used the hidden power spell on Gildern, he was practicing his skills in accordance with the martial arts techniques that Jacker had shared with him. It was thanks to this that he was able to make truly impressive progress. Five minutes later, Link saw a flash of aura behind a large boulder that was about 160 feet away. He immediately knew that it was a scout sent by the Syndicate. The scout was far from them and was hiding in an inconspicuous place, so Annie and the mercenaries did not notice him. Nevertheless, nothing could hide from the eyes of the magician. Now they did not know at all what to expect in the Bay of Red Leaves, but now someone appeared on their way who could be interrogated. So Link took this opportunity and began to make the first move. The mana flowed into Link's wand and it vibrated slightly as a light blue glass ball began to form. Come on. Link pointed his wand at a large boulder, and the glass ball whistled shrilly in the air. In less than a second it flew over 160 feet. Just before it hit the rock, it suddenly changed its trajectory and wrapped itself around the boulder. Boom! They heard someone howl in pain from behind a boulder in the distance. The glass ball successfully hit its target. Jacker and Gildern were already used to seeing Link's magic in action, so this didn't really surprise them. But Annie saw this spell for the first time. Link, she exclaimed. What kind of spell is this? How was it able to travel such a huge distance? She knew magic much better than the mercenaries, so she understood that normal elemental spells could only travel a distance of no more than 100 or 130 feet. But Link had just released a spell that flew 200 feet. This fireball? But I changed it, Link explained signaling for the others to head towards the boulder. You remember the Dark Elf Wizard in Gladstone, who also used a spell that flew a long distance. I used the same technique. Is this a supreme magic skill? Annie asked. She began to understand Link's power. But the more the girl understood it, the more surprised she was. Link must now have a deep understanding of how magic works, as he can alter spells with higher magic skills. Moreover, she knew that the process of changing a spell, even a level zero spell, was difficult and time-consuming. It can take months for some sixth-level mages to create a refined and stable modified spell. Annie clearly remembered that Link didn't have this skill when they were in Gladstone. But just over a month has passed since then, and he has managed to achieve such enormous progress. What kind of talent does he have? If she had seen Link whistle, it would have shocked her even more. Link didn't have time to explain everything, so he simply nodded in response to Annie's question. The four walked up to the boulder and saw a man in grey-brown leather armor writhing behind it, on the ground in pain. The glass ball blew off his left arm. In the movies, there were characters on Earth who could still run after their arms were blown off. But in reality, the pain from amputation was incredibly intense. 
the wounded thief now had a deathly pale face and could not stop crying. Not only could he not get up and run away, the man could not even remain conscious. Jacker walked up to the thief and tore a piece of fabric from the thief's underwear, then wrapped it around the stump of his arm to prevent further blood loss. He then hit the thief twice in the face, and he immediately stopped screaming and came to his senses. Link stepped towards the thief and pointed his wand at his skull. A faint, icy aura appeared at the tip of the wand. Tell me, where are you keeping the girl? He was just a first-level thief, not much different from any other common person, so the slightest appearance of magic scared him. Naturally, Link's threat method worked well on him. She. She is in a house on the bank of the Silverfish River, the thief said heavily, enduring pain. On the bank of the Silverfish River. Link had never heard of the place? My lord, I know this place, Jacker said. Link felt relieved. This made their mission easier? Who ordered the kidnapping? Link asked the thief. This. It was Andy. He's a level three killer. A terrible person, the thief said, swallowing. He didn't want to answer Link's questions, but he was even more afraid of the magic coming from the wand. Andy? Link blinked several times, remembering where he had heard such a familiar name. It was in the game. Andy was one of the members of Morpheus's main group, and the first boss the player must face in the mission to defeat Morpheus. When he played the game, Andy was already a level 5 assassin. Link was surprised to learn that Andy was now only the leader of a small syndicate unit in Gerwent Forest. Andy had no special power or abilities that stood out in the game. He was only notorious for his ruthlessness and cruelty, as well as the fact that he was a complete pervert. If he were a man from Earth, he would be a sadistic and psychopathic serial killer, like Leatherface in the movie The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Currently, Link's main concern was how much richer and more powerful the Syndicate was compared to the Dark Brotherhood. They will be able to afford countless special equipment and potions, so even though Andy's own powers may not be as impressive, with some help he can still become a formidable opponent. What kind of schemes have they created in the Bay? Link asked. Now he feared for Lucy's life, because he knew that Andy's cruelty was not to be trifled with. I don't know. I'm just an ordinary thief. Please have mercy, the thief said, his face contorted in pain. Link realized that the thief really didn't know anything so he didn't wait for him to finish speaking and use the mage, his hand to break his neck. Having captured Lucy, the syndicate started a war between them. Should he spare the thief and let him come back and report them? Well, no. Now let's go, to the bank of the Silverfish River. Jacker knew this place, so he walked ahead. Along the way, Link used the Detect Aura spell and discovered three more scouts. He attacked everyone with his glass balls, interrogated them, and finally killed them all. By the time the bank of the Silverfish River appeared on the horizon, they had already formed a rough idea of what to expect from the enemy. Andy would not be waiting for them there. He gathered the elite members of the Syndicate, armed them with special equipment, and ordered them to wait outside the cabin, preparing to ambush them. As for the special equipment, Link had no doubt that they were wearing something that was often used in the fight against magicians, anti-magic armor. All four walked along the rough path until a house on the riverbank came into their field of vision. Through interrogation, they learned that Lucy was being kept in this house, but the moment they reached it, they were instead confronted with a terrifying sight. Lucy was not inside. She was hanging from a tree that stood outside the hut. Her arms were wrapped in chains. She had no clothes. Her body was completely covered with bleeding lacerations. Thick blood was still slowly dripping from her fingers onto the ground. From a distance it seemed that she was no longer alive, her head hung limply from her shoulders, and her face was hidden by red hair. It was completely unclear whether she was still alive. It was a disgusting sight. Jacker's face turned red, and he gripped the hammer so tightly in his hand that it creaked. Gildern clenched his teeth in silent anger. Even Annie, who didn't belong to their group, was furious. Inhumans, said Annie, we have to make them pay in full for what they did. There seemed to be no change in Link's facial expression. But his eyes became much darker, and his breathing slowed significantly. He was already in a focused state of witchcraft. Lucy was still alive. Link sensed it with Detect Aura. But now Andy, his barbaric plans have lit a flame of rage in him. And this flame could only be extinguished by Andy's blood. You will feel my magical powers on yourself. You will see, Link said as Mana gushed through his body. At least twenty elite members of the Syndicate were lying in ambush around the log cabin or more accurately, around Lucy. These elite fighters were dressed in anti-magic armor. They carried various expensive anti-magic equipment that completely masked their innate auras. 
And yet there was a minus to this. Everything in the universe has an innate aura. The disguised auras of the thieves will create a black outline against the innate aura emitted by everything else in their surroundings. The Syndicate, however, was well aware of this and took retaliatory action. In addition to wearing anti-magic armor, they also hid behind a barricade of thick wooden planks. It looked like a small, triangular wooden hut. The outside of the barricade was covered in sticks and grass, making it even more difficult to spot. In addition, the thick wooden planks were coated with anti-magic armor. Thus, mid-level spells could not penetrate this barricade. These preparations clearly demonstrated Andy's defensive tactics. I used Lucy as a provocation, and I didn't kill her, giving you time to think of ways to save her, just to add to your guilt. If Andy wanted to tease Link and the others, then he definitely succeeded. At the hideout, Link laid out his plan. Lucy is still alive. Jacker, protect me. Gildern, you must kill those who survive. And Annie, you sneak in there and save Lucy. His tone was, as usual, very even and calm. But Jacker, who had known the young man for quite a long time, sensed a certain coldness in him. Bloodlust and ruthlessness hovered around him. This wave of magical aura around Link made his hair stand on end. He immediately nodded. I see. Gildern took a deep breath, then nodded and said, Yes, my lord. Annie felt a kind of psychological oppression. She subconsciously obeyed Link's words and said, It's clear. Link put away the Dark Moon Wand and decided to use the superior Fire Crystal Staff instead. Annie knew what happened in Gladstone, so he didn't have to hide his true power. The moment the Fire Crystal Staff appeared, the fist-sized flame crystal at the tip glowed red light. He was affected by Link's seething rage, and that light burned like a flame. But although his heart was furious, Link's mind was still in its original order. He was completely focused, time slowed down in his mind, and everything around the young man became calm and silent. Let the carnage begin. With the staff in his hand, Link fired furiously from cover. Jacker immediately followed him, and raising his shield high, protected Link from the arrows flying out of the darkness. Gildern stood on the other side of Link, holding a longbow made of high-quality mulberry wood in his hand, and knocked his steel arrows to the string. He actively searched for targets in the darkness. Link's magic then began to roar. Thieves dressed in anti-magic armor hid behind the barricades and began to taunt Lucy. This ignited something inside Link, and he prepared to cast the spell. Whistle modified mixed spell level 1. Mana cost. Four effects. Using vector throw as the base of the spell, the mixture of metal and fire energies forms a high-speed spinning spear. It has an amazing level of penetrating and explosive energy. Note, when the whistle is heard, the god of death turns his attention to what is happening. Link held the iron filings in the palm of his hand and threw them into the air in front of him. Less than a second later, the first whistle materialized and headed towards the area where Link had detected the innate aura. This target was approximately 160 feet away. This distance may be too far for an ordinary mage, but for Link's modified whistling spell, such a distance was nothing. Not even half a second had passed before this high-speed spinning spike flew between the trees at a distance of a millimeter from them and then broke through a thick barricade. The barricade was about inches. This was enough to block normal level 1 fireball attacks, but she couldn't resist a spell like whistling. Boom! The whistle penetrated the barricade and reached the sealed space in the planks. The three assassins crouched to the ground behind the barricade. This tactic of three people hiding in one place was meant to prevent an ambush in the dark. This was one of Andy's cunning schemes, but in reality, it also hastened his own defeat. The Death Needle easily passed through the barricade, and upon impact, the fire core inside the metal shell immediately exploded. When first-level fire element spells explode, their explosive power is roughly equivalent strength of a hand grenade on Earth, if the grenades were covered with an iron shell. Boom. The spell exploded, the flames flaring up and dissipating. Metal shrapnel pierced the air in all four directions, leaving the Syndicate assassins inside with nowhere to hide. The anti-magic leather armor on their body had the ability to block fire damage for about a minute. This was at least enough to prevent the spell from neutralizing them. But how much can leather armor ultimately protect? Faced with shrapnel flying in all directions, these killers were as vulnerable as babies. Andy was the leader of the Syndicate unit. He never took an active part in battles and always hid from observers. The man heard an explosion of magic and immediately turned to him. This is a fire spell. Judging by its strength, it must be a fireball. The members of the Nightblade will definitely be able to survive such a blow, Andy concluded from his past experience. The fireball spell was created solely from the element of fire. 
Fire damage should have been minimal because every member of the Nightblade was wearing anti-magic leather armor. Just as he was making these conclusions, Andy heard eight explosions in just three seconds. This was exactly the amount of cover he had placed around Lucy, where the killers lay in ambush. Then everything in the bay became quiet. Andy was confident that his subordinates would be able to stand up and fight. But then he saw the magician who was causing all this unrest. He stood on the bank of the river behind the grove, with only the warrior standing next to him, who was holding a shield, and the archer, who was protecting the young magician. At this moment, if the killers were still alive, ten killers would be enough to capture them. If he could be captured, Andy was confident that his torture methods could force anyone to reveal all their secrets. But after the commotion, one second passed, two seconds, then three seconds, and the shelters were still quiet. No one was moving in them. Andy's heart began to clench. After that, a fire broke out in the barricades. Some scream was heard, but none of the killers sitting inside stood up and came out to fight. In reality, the screams lasted only a moment. The wooden planks behind which the assassins were hiding were destroyed, and Gildern fired arrows at the surviving assassins who did not die in the explosions. No one survived. In just a couple of seconds, twenty-two elite Nightblade assassins were killed. They died before they even realized what had happened to them. Andy's face turned pale. He looked at his two subordinates next to him, both sitting on the ground, silent, one of them trembling. They were scared to death. He then looked at the surviving members of the Nightblade. They had no choice but to retreat quickly. What spell did he use? What terrifying power he has? Andy could not find an explanation for what was happening. This was beyond what he knew about magic. Then he suddenly saw a black shadow next to Lucy. Andy fired two darts, cutting the cord that Lucy was suspended by, and she fell, but the shadow caught the girl before she hit the ground. The shadow then carried Lucy away on its back and they both ran away. The speed of the shadow shocked Andy. Such speed is only characteristic of a level 3 assassin. But why was there a level 3 assassin among them? Previously, he had done some research and found that their team only consisted of three people. One was a level 3 warrior, and the rest were just ordinary level 2 fighters. The mage who was with them couldn't even get into the Eastern Bay High Academy of Magic. How could a mage who wasn't even accepted by the Academy be so powerful? They defeated the Dark Brotherhood, but Andy did not understand two things. Firstly, how could the Dark Brotherhood be so weak? And secondly, what spells did the mage use? In Echo Bay, the mage in black robe said that he did not find any traces of that, that high-level spells were used there. The highest-level spell used there was only level 1. Andy planned his tactics today based on this information. But now he realized how wrong he was. My lord, what should we do now? His right hand asked quietly. Andy began to sweat with fear. He looked at the mage on the riverbank, and at that moment Link saw him too, as if he realized where he was. Andy started to panic. Get back! Back! I won't fight these people. They were just a group of thieves. They only collected money and carried out orders. Now that their lives were in danger, there was no point in doing favors for anyone. So Andy led the surviving members of the Nightblade and escaped from the banks of the Silverfish River. He was fast and knew all the turns of Redleaf Bay, so that very soon they were far from the shore of the Silverfish River. However, when he turned the corner, he came across a man who was standing right in the middle of the road. He knew this man. It was a mage in a black robe, who was a messenger from the main department of the syndicate. How long have you been here? Andy asked. The confusion in his voice was obvious. The magician in black clothes said in a hoarse voice, I am here to help you fight this magician. Are you going to fight him on your own? Andy was surprised and happy, although according to his recollections, this magician never got his hands dirty. This magician is worthy of my time? The black-robed magician carefully waved his wand in his hand. The wand was made of pure elven silver, and at the end of the wand was a dark blue magical gem, the size of a goose egg that glowed with a blue magical light. Then following his exclamation he added, But he is very strong, so we must carefully develop our plan. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. On the other side of the bay, Link said to Annie, Take her, I will run after them and kill them. He could not end the battle by allowing Andy to escape. He will not rest until he kills this cruel and twisted poisonous snake. As he spoke, a notification popped up on the interface. First step of the mission, rescue completed. Omni points received, 20, excellent. With the 14 Omni points he previously had, Link now had 34 points and 63 mana points left. This was more than enough. At the same time, the second step in the mission was activated. Mission, pursue and kill mission details. 
attack the elite members of the Syndicate unit and kill them. Mission rewards. 25 Omni points. Current progress. 22.30 seconds. This is good. Even if the game system supported this action, there was no reason for him to retreat. Annie was a little worried, but she knew that in these circumstances, as in Gladstone, nothing could stop Link from doing what he intended to do. She had no choice but to nod and agree. Okay, but be careful. Leave tracks along your path so that General Anderson can quickly catch up with you. Got it? Link nodded. He turned to look at Lucy. This stubborn girl was still conscious. She didn't make a sound and stared at Link with wide eyes. She resolutely did not give up and did not ask for mercy. She even endured the pain without a loud groan. But now that she saw her laud and his comrade standing right in front of her, she turned into a small child who was reunited with her parents. Her stony face softened and her eyes filled with tears. Link saw the lines of bruises and blood stains from the blows to Lucy's body, so he raised his staff, pointed it at her and said, Elemental healing. A cloak of light covered Lucy's body, restoring and healing the lost elements. When the spell ended, Link turned around and said to Jacker, Come on, we'll kill these thieves. The roads in Redleaf Bay were winding and narrow, and the area after crossing the Silverfish Riverbed was especially difficult to maneuver, with dense forest blocking their every step. But it was precisely because of this that Andy's tracks could be clearly seen. The trampled underbrush, the splintered wood from their hasty escape, and the unnatural position of the bushes, all these clues were eloquent and clear. A fully armored jacker cleared the way with a shield in one hand and a sword to the other. Now there was not an ounce of fear in his heart. The help of Princess Annie, Link's destructive magical power and his ever-evolving abilities combined with his intricate equipment, all strengthened the warrior's courage. Even the syndicate fled from them. To keep up with Jacker, Link cast cast the cat's dexterity spell on Gildern and on yourself. Gildern took on the role of rear scout, as his skills as a marksman were not designed for close combat. They quickly made their way through the forest. Ten minutes later, Jacker was the first to reach the top, and from a bird's eye view, he easily spotted the enemy. The team, dressed in brown leather armor similar to the syndicate bandits they had defeated, hurriedly ran away from them. My lord, the enemy is here, Jacker pointed forward. The enemy was at the foot of the mountain, and there were about fifteen of them. They traveled relatively quickly, although slower than Link due to the dangerous terrain of the mountains, which forced them to constantly negotiate the bush. However, there was something wrong with this group of bandits. Theoretically, they should have been on the run due to fear of his magical skill. Even though Andy was an impressive leader who inspired confidence in his men, they must have appeared scared and in a state of panic. And while this group of bandits did run away quickly, they did not appear to be desperate. Instead of going on the run, they seemed to be retreating. Link clearly distinguished between the two terms. How is this even possible? Link put himself in the place of the bandits. If the enemy easily overcomes his carefully planned ambush, it will have a huge impact, even for him, on morale. He himself would definitely have to flee hastily. So what, you mean these bandits are still clinging to some kind of hope? What if their people are already in ambush, waiting for us? These were several possible turns of events that slipped through Link's head. An ambush would not be a problem for him. The Detect Aura spell could easily detect the hiding places of his enemies. However, something was still wrong. Link assessed the distance between the bandits and himself. He was currently standing above them by about 600 feet. It was at this moment that Link had an epiphany. Not only did he have the advantage of occupying a higher position, but the group of bandits were also closely grouped. His whistling would definitely come as an unpleasant surprise to them. Since it could be a trap, let's launch our attack from here, Link ordered. Jacker, you continue to pursue. Gildern and I will soon catch up with you. Got it. Jacker trusted Link implicitly and rushed towards the bandits without a second thought. Cover me, Link said to Gildern. Gildern nodded and unsheathed his dagger, standing guard next to Link. Link aimed at the bandits and grabbed a handful of steel dust from his pocket. He felt a wave of magical energy surge into his fire crystal staff, and two-tenths of a second later, a metal tip of fire formed on his staff. The metal tip rotated at high speed and made a whistling sound that penetrated the quiet forest. Visible air pulsations formed around it when magical energy flowed continuously. This phenomenon was caused by the interaction of magical energy, elemental energy, and air. Gildern looked at the magic that was happening with great respect, shocked by its terrifying power. Link was completely absorbed in his sorcery, calculating the angle of attack in his mind. At that moment, Link saw several images of the position of his enemies. 
He also saw many vague images showing the positions they could take in the future. Between the people in these images, a long parabola formed, which showed the magician the line of his strike. Deep down, Link knew that this was the game interface that supported players in the spell's casting time, not its ability. The game's interface was useful not only for providing missions that rewarded Omni Points, but also for helping him cast spells, which greatly increased his attack speed. And now thanks to him, Link's attacks are even more accurate than before. I wonder what else the system is capable of, Link thought hopefully. The enemy began to disappear from sight. Link slightly adjusted the angle of his magical attack and without hesitation, he fired. Whack! The whistle made a high-pitched sound and rushed through the atmosphere, striking the bandits. Six hundred feet was indeed a long distance to cast a spell. At the three hundred foot mark, Link could barely control the attack, and at six hundred feet, Link could barely even sense the existence of magic. It was difficult to ensure that the spell did not fall apart. This was the difference between magic and weapons, such as guns, bows, and arrows. Magic was much more volatile and more difficult to control. To maintain the integrity of magic, the magician had to constantly focus and control his powers. The maximum attack distance depended on both the mage's technique and the strength of the mage's soul. Naturally, the discussion of the soul falls into the realm of mystical research, and its power is difficult to quantify. Judging by Link's current strength, maintaining a magical attack over 600 feet away was already his limit. He couldn't control the trajectory of his attack at that distance. The success of this long-range attack was entirely dependent on his calculations, not on Link's control over his magic. The young man had complete faith in the game system, and that the line of fire shown would allow him to successfully hit his targets. At the foot of the mountain, Andy had no idea of his impending demise. After the black-robed magician promised to help him, the magician who was hanging on his tail practically stopped bothering him. Link was strong, but he also had a strong mage on his side. For now, Andy just needed to follow the plan he had come up with with the black-robed mage to lead Link into the trap they had created. When Link appeared at the top of the mountain, Andy was delighted. The trap had already been set halfway down the mountains. If their enemies pursued them, they would fall prey to their carefully planned trap. Andy even slowed his pace so that he could turn back and help the black-robed mage when the trap was triggered. No one has ever managed to disgrace me in front of my people. When I catch you, you'll be sorry you were ever born. Andy remembered the thousands of torture methods he knew by heart and vowed to use them all on Link. A sudden voice broke his thoughts. Hide behind the trees now. Immediately. The voice was alarming and rough, but familiar. It was the magician in a black robe. Andy had no idea what was happening but he believed that the magician in a black robe would not harm him. He rushed behind a tree that was almost a foot and a half in diameter. At that moment, Andy heard a familiar terrifying whistling sound that deafened him. The sharp sound echoed throughout the area, and boom. Andy felt a wave of heat in the forest, wildly disturbing the calm. This was followed by cries of pain and despair. He came out of his hiding place and saw a disgusting scene. At the place where he was, the other fourteen members of the syndicate lay lifeless on the ground. Five of them died on the spot, and nine were injured. Among them, the five who were lucky enough to receive minor injuries seemed to be consumed by fear, and had already lost all fighting spirit. The syndicate bandits let down their guard and united into a small group just because they thought that the enemy was far away. But they did not know that the spell Link's whistle would destroy almost their entire squad. No, it actually destroyed the entire squad. Andy's heart was beating at an insane speed, just as he was about to remind the other members to split up and take cover. The familiar voice sounded again, Take cover. Another attack. With lightning speed, Andy retreated behind the same tree. The whistling sound was heard again, followed by a deafening explosion and debris and dirt flying everywhere. The only difference was the lack of screams. This time there was complete silence. Andy was heartbroken. The Nightblade squad he had spent so long perfecting was history. In the end, they were all useless in the face of magic. Is magic really such a terrible force? Or was this magician scary? Have I incurred the wrath of someone I should never have offended? Andy began to doubt his decisions. His thoughts were in turmoil. Link's magic exceeded Andy's expectations in every way. In a horrific attack, Andy's efforts were once again in vain. At the top of the hill, Link fired two more whistles, and the last remaining elite members of the Syndicate were killed. Link then noticed a flash on the interface, so he looked at the new notification that had just appeared. Chase and kill. Mission complete. Player receives 25 Omni Points. 
Next active mission. Kill Andy. Mission details. Kill Thief Leader Andy. Mission reward. 40 points Omni. Link accepted the mission immediately. He now had 59 Omni points and 38 mana points. Link knew that Andy might not be the last Syndicate member he would meet on his journey, but he would be pleased just by the fact that he had the opportunity to kill at least one after seeing what he did. Link was hesitant because of one thing, the high reward for completing the mission. Andy's power isn't that great, so why was the reward so high? Is he really worth 40 Omni points? Is he being helped by someone else? Or is there something more behind him? The reward was too high. The mission to rescue Gladstone only earned him 100 Omni points, so why was neutralizing just one assassin worth 40 points? Link realized that he had to be more careful in planning his next steps. Jacker, stop! Freeze! Link shouted, rushing forward. He was now more than 60 feet away from them. Jack stopped abruptly, raised his shield, and took a defensive position. Link and Gildern quickly caught up with him, after which all three regrouped. Keep pursuing him, but slowly, beware of sneak attacks, Link said. As he spoke, Link again used the Detect Aura spell to scan his surroundings in detail. He only saw normal auras around him, nothing looked suspicious or out of place, and there were no signs that anyone was lying in wait. Am I overthinking this? Link doubted. But you can't be too careful. So Link told Jacker to move as slowly as possible and be more vigilant. Link thought that he shouldn't worry too much because Andy was the only opponent left. He was just a level 3 thief, so even if he went out of his sight, Link could use a tracking spell to track him down using the aura and the marks Andy left behind. Just like Mage Holmes used the Earthhound to track down Link and Gladstone. Soon after, they reached halfway up the hill and Link still hadn't detected anything unusual with his Detect Aura spell. Oddly enough, that ominous feeling Link felt was now even more palpable. Stop. Is there something wrong? It smells suspicious here. Link's anxiety intensified, and deep wrinkles appeared between his eyebrows. Mages naturally had excellent intuition, and Link's soul received support from the God of Light, so he was even more sensitive than an ordinary magus. Even earlier, Link sensed that the behavior Andy felt strange and unnatural. The game system seemed to be giving him hints. Now, the further they walked, the stronger the foreboding became, as if an electric current was running through Link, causing his hair to stand on end. Jacker and Gildern stood silently next to Link, awaiting his orders. These two were just ordinary mercenaries, and in such a special battle, in which they faced such a powerful opponent as the Syndicate, both were blind as moles and could not see the whole situation at all. They only knew that they had to obey Link's orders. Why does Andy just hide behind a tree and do nothing? Did we scare him to death? Jacker asked. When Link attacked Andy with his spells earlier, it was as if someone warned him of the attack and told him to hide. And from then on, he remained behind the tree, not trying to run away or attack them. But Link was creating spells at the time, so he did not notice this feature. Now that Jacker pointed out this oddity, Link's intuition began to work with renewed vigor. It dawned on him how strange Andy's reaction was. He was oblivious to my attack and I was supposed to defeat him with one single blow, but he dodged it at the very last moment. If he had noticed my attack then, he should have warned his subordinates to scatter, but he did not. He suddenly turned, not even seeming to understand why or what he was avoiding. No, someone else must have warned him. After thinking, Link came to the following conclusions. But who could have warned him? Link used the Detect Aura spell and scanned the area left and right, trying to detect any hidden enemy in the forest. But as usual, he found nothing. This secret assistant Andy must have very high disguise skills. He was even able to predict my attacks and warn Andy about it. He's probably a magician. This means that now a powerful magician is hiding in this forest. Link was 100% sure of this. It was only when Link came to this conclusion that all the strange pieces of the puzzle in the current situation began to fall into place. Since Andy had an assistant who was also a powerful mage, it is not surprising that the thieves again gained confidence that they could fight back after escaping from Link. It's also not surprising that Andy was able to avoid Link's attacks. And since this assistant was a powerful mage, he easily remained invisible to Link's gaze. But where could this mage be hiding? There were still some pieces of the puzzle missing that Link couldn't find, but he remained level-headed enough to think clearly. This mage is probably of a much higher level, higher than me, or at least his disguise skills are much better than mine, but he is probably not superior to me in fighting. Otherwise, he wouldn't be hiding from me. As these thoughts swirled around in his head, he noticed that something had changed in his surroundings. Something changed behind the tree at the foot of the hill. It was Andy, 
suddenly jumping out from his hiding place. You damn flamingos, I remember all of you. You'll see. One day I'll make you regret that you were born. Andy shouted in rage. There was pure hatred and vengeance in his voice, and anger contorted his face so much that it began to look implausible. He looked exactly like a demon from hell. My lord, should we go after him? Jacker whispered, very shocked by what he saw. In all his experience as a mercenary, his most terrible opponents were such psychopathic and perverted devils as Andy. These people were generally obsessed with destruction and didn't care if they were killed in a fight, much less if it took the lives of others. Every time he faced this type of opponent, he would either run so far away from them as best he could, or simply quickly killed them and dealt with them. My lord, he is leaving, Gildern shouted. He had the same thoughts as Jacker. The two mercenaries were stunned by Andy's trick and subconsciously fell into his traps. If Link's mind wasn't strong enough, they would all fall into Andy's trap. That's why the most important qualities of a military general when leading soldiers into battle were the strength and clarity of his mind. Even though Link had never experienced real war before, the same principle applied here. There's no need to rush. He won't be able to run far, Link said, shaking his head. Fortunately, Link was always able to maintain a clear focus, and Andy's tricks failed to distract him from his thoughts. Andy must have been trying to tease us into following him. Most likely, he will lead us into traps set by the magician. Yes, we followed him the whole time, and that's exactly what he and his accomplice wanted. We must not fall into their traps. Link now began to piece together the mage's hidden schemes. Although he was puzzled by the sudden change in events, he also managed to formulate his own plan. Pursue him, but don't follow his tracks exactly. We will forge our own path, Link ordered. Yes, my lord, Jacker exclaimed. Jacker nodded and turned away from the path used by the syndicate thieves. Then, using the steel armor on his body as protection, he crushed the bushes and thickets of the forest to create a new path. Link and Gildern followed, moving a little slower than before. They moved forward without incident or attack, quickly closing the distance between them and Andy. In the middle of the hilly forest, the black-robed magician grabbed his wand in his hand and knitted his eyebrows. He was disappointed that his bait did not work on his pursuers. His carefully thought-out plan was ruined. Such an opponent will not be easy to defeat. After all, this magician killed Holmes and Gladstone. Then I guess I'll have to sweat. He took a deep breath and focused his gaze. He had now entered a calm state of spell creation. Battles between mages were not much different from battles between other classes. The main difference was the use of high-level spells, which were rarely used in a one-on-one -on -one mage duel. The reason was simple. The higher the level of the spell, the more complex its structure. Mages would have to spend more time creating magic and gathering enough energy to repel an attack, which inevitably increases the time it takes to cast spells. This was almost an ironclad rule. A magician had to be very focused while casting spells and was would be vulnerable to any attacks. In most cases, first-level spells would be more than enough to defeat an opponent, so mages rarely used high-level spells when they were not protected. The most commonly used spells in duels are zero or first-level spells. Second-level spells are also sometimes used used either for ambush attacks or when victory has already been secured. Currently, the black-robed mage was hiding in the thickets, having cast a third-level invisibility spell on himself. This invisibility spell was extremely powerful, allowing the mage to completely blend into his surroundings and even erase most of his innate aura. Naturally, Link's level zero aura detection spell could not detect him. Without a doubt, he had gained the advantage of a preemptive strike in this duel. Being able to strike first was a huge advantage. In fact, it was the deciding factor in the duel. This advantage often gave mages the opportunity to release a high-level spell that was difficult to pull off. This duel could end in one blow. To hide his tracks, the black-robed Magus chose to take cover about 240 feet away from Link. This distance had already exceeded the distance he could cast spells. He had also taken a huge risk by not casting a high-level defensive spell on himself to increase the effectiveness of the invisibility spell. A protective spell would create a concentrated magical aura around him, allowing the mage to be easily detected, rendering the use of the invisibility spell useless. The strongest defense was usually not the one that protected against a powerful attack, but the one that hid from the enemy. Knowing this, the black-robed mage chose the invisibility spell instead of the defensive spell without any hesitation. And this decision has now borne fruit, giving him the chance to strike first with a high-level spell? Should I use a defensive or offensive spell first? The magician in the black robe weighed the pros and cons. 
His strongest defensive spell was Level 3 Warding Barrier, which had a cast time of two and a half seconds. This spell could effectively protect him from a third level magic attack. Since he had the advantage of a preemptive strike, he should be able to successfully create the spell. However, the mid-level protective barrier spell could only protect against elemental attacks, but not physical attacks. From what he had seen earlier, the long-range attack released by his opponent had a strong piercing effect. His defense barrier may not be strong enough to withstand this blow. His next defensive spell was Armor of the Mage, a second-level spell. This spell works well against both physical and magical attacks. However, his opponent used a first-level spell modified with high magic skills, which could easily break through his second-level defensive spell. The black-robed mage didn't have much hope for this spell either. The speed of his opponent's spells was too fast. The mage's armor would disintegrate in an instant if he concentrated on attacking. In addition, his attacks will most likely be blocked by the loyal warrior on Link's side. The result will be that he will exchange his life for the life of his opponent's follower. This exchange was not worth it. It seems attack spells are the only way. The black-robed wizard weighed all the options and came to this conclusion. But other problems arose. His opponent was too far away to attack him with pure elemental spells. Throwing type spells will also be blocked by the warrior's shield. If only I could get closer to them, I could cast my level 3 chain lightning and cause them to paralyze. The black-robed magician was slightly discouraged. After much thought, the man decided to use the highest level summoning spell he had. Magical powers surged into his staff. The sapphire at the tip of the staff shimmered slightly, forming magic circles of runes in the atmosphere. When the fourth magic circle appeared, the black-robed mage stopped transmitting magical energy. He pointed to the ground, and each of the four magic circles released a beam of runic symbols that flowed onto the ground, casting their magic on it. In an instant, the ground began to tremble, forming a spinning, rattling lump of dirt. It grew exponentially, taking in more and more debris and dirt until it reached a height of 12 feet. Then this lump of dirt began to transform. Limbs grew from its featureless body, then clearly defined muscle groups began to form. He soon transformed into a 12-foot tall golem with crystallized rocks forming on its surface. The crystals were especially visible on the limbs, where more cobblestones had accumulated to maintain the shape. It almost looked like he was wearing crystal armor. Summoning magic, crystal golem, crystal golem level. Four spell cost, 280 mana points, effect. Summons an extremely powerful earth elemental golem. The effect lasts for 30 minutes, or until the golem is destroyed. Note, it is very strong. It was a strong fourth level spell. The black robe mage only knew one such strong spell. He let out a sigh of relief after using the spell. The magical design of this spell was very complex and also consumed a lot of mana. This spell used up more than half of his mana reserve, not to mention that it took the man four seconds to complete this spell. The appearance of this crystal golem in the quiet forest with magic unrest from a level four spell could not go unnoticed. In fact, from the moment the black-robed mage began to cast the spell, Link already felt that something was wrong. But when he finally determined the position of his enemy, the golem was already fully formed. Boom, boom, boom. A 12-foot tall crystal golem was walking towards them. It destroyed everything in its path, from trees the size of human limbs to trees with a diameter of more than one foot with one blow. Such a destructive force was simply impossible to stop. This might be possible for a level 5 warrior or higher, but not for Link and his companions. Even Jacker, the strongest of them, will not be able to stop this monster. Gildern shot at the golem, click. The metal arrow barely touched the surface of the golem. Several pieces of crystal scattered from its surface as the golem advanced further. Pale Jacker immediately jumped in front of Link, trying to protect him. My lord, I will deal with him. Please leave. He was ready to fight until his death. Link was silent and remained in place. He recognized the spell. Crystal Golem, fourth level spell. From what he had seen, it was probably just a normal version of the spell without the aid of any high magic skill enchantment effects. Of course, this spell was still difficult to deal with. If he had used his 59 Omni points earlier, the three of them would undoubtedly have been destroyed by this spell already. The young man, as brain worked, frantically searching for a solution to the situation. The best counter to magic is dispelling magic. However, the magical structure of a fourth level spell was very stable. Without a dispel spell of level four or higher, it will not be effective. On the other hand, even if Link purchased a level four dispel spell with his Omni points, he would not have enough mana to cast the spell. So Link discarded the idea almost immediately. There was only one option left then, 
Stop the summon monster and kill the summoner himself. Link came up with a plan. Buy support magic, giant's might. Giant's might third level spell cost. 60 mana points. Effect. Significantly increases the strength of the caster. Increases strength by 200%. The effect lasts for 10 minutes. Even though it was only a third level spell, its mana cost was relatively low. 60 mana points, and that was due to its sustained nature. Link's mana was now at 35 points. When purchasing a third level spell, he will spend 29 Omni points. Omni Link spent the remaining points without hesitation on increasing his maximum mana. As a result, he had 64 points of mana, which was enough for one use of Giant's Might. His staff glowed with a blood-red aura. The sticky consistency of the aura was similar to blood and gracefully flowed into Jakar's body. Under the influence of the spell, Jakar's muscles instantly increased in size, and his body began to shine with a metallic golden sheen. His muscles became even more defined, as if they were about to be torn apart. Now Jacker resembled the legendary titan from Greek mythology. The warrior felt the power permeate his body and could not hold back the warlike cry that echoed across the mountains. It took two seconds to cast the spell. Jacker's eyes glowed with a bloody tinge of magical aura, and he felt the destructive power pulsing through his body. It seemed like it could smash everything into pieces. At that moment, the crystal golem struck Link and his comrades. The blow was devastating. Before the impact hit the ground, it had already destroyed all the growth in the nearby area. Jacker raised his shield in defense. The warrior had already reached the peak of the third level battle aura, and naturally he was born with the gift of strength. This spell that Link cast on him should have effectively tripled his original power. Theoretically, he should have the strength of a level 5 warrior. Grist. There was a low rumble as the golem's shield and giant fist collided and both stopped in their tracks. Everyone held their breath. It was a hopeless situation. Jack clenched his teeth. He was almost at his limit. His body trembled slightly and his feet sank deep into the mud. This was Link's chance. Jacker gritted his teeth every time the crystal golem hit him with its explosive punch, trying his best not to fall. With each attack, his bones cracked and his internal organs squeezed, as if the warrior was overtaken by a tsunami. The heart in his chest beat wildly, and the metallic taste of blood filled his throat. He was on the verge of death. He knew he couldn't last too long. Five more minutes? Six? He didn't know. But besides the premonition of imminent death, Another strange feeling appeared in Jakar's head under the weight of these terrible attacks. It seemed to Jakar that every attack of the crystal golem was like a hammer blow, and his body was like a piece of hot iron from which this hammer is forging something. As the hammer hit him blow after blow, he felt excruciating pain. But at the same time, he felt as if the attacks were knocking the dirt out of his body, transforming him into a stronger warrior. Look at me. I hold my own against the giant that the enemy has summoned. How proud would my friends be to see me now? Another strong blow from the crystal giant, and blood rose up Jacker's throat, staining his teeth red with fresh blood. However, there was not an ounce of fear in his head, only courage that became more and more. Being able to fight an opponent worthy of legends was exactly the battle he had always dreamed of. At this time, Link managed to escape into a safe place where he was hidden from the crystal golem's attack. His gaze swept across the battlefield. After a few seconds, he noticed his two targets. One was a mage in a black robe, whose face was hidden. He was holding a mithril wand with a blue gem on the tip. And the second was Andy, who was now beaming with renewed and confidence, having the crystal golem on his side. Once Link had decided on his goals, he stopped to quickly assess the entire situation. Right now, he had four mana points, which was only enough for one whistle or four glass balls. As a level three assassin, Andy possessed dangerous speed. So if he ever got close to Link, Gildern would be unable to protect him. And in just one second, Link would be gone. At the same time, there was another opponent that he would have to face. The Mage. He had the ability to summon a level 4 Crystal Golem, so he must be at least a level 4 Mage. Link was worried that his magical aura was still more intense than Link's current aura, even after casting a level 4 spell. This meant that he could cast much more powerful spells than Link in his current state. Under such circumstances, Link seemed unable to defeat the mage. They were both dangerous enemies and the situation had now become life-threatening for Link. The way things turned out, Link found himself in a bottomless pit of defeat. Nevertheless, the guy was not going to give up. He wanted to give it his all and fight until his last breath. That's how he succeeded in the game in his previous life.
He even accomplished the miraculous feat of single-handedly defeating the demigod, Lord of the Depths Nazama, thanks to his undying determination. This was how he intended to face this battle as well. That's just the way he was. He never gave up. That's how it always was, and that's how it always will be. Link's eyes took in the entire battle scene, and he quickly saw a potential attack. Andy had nimble and fast limbs, so he could easily hide behind tree trunks to protect yourself. He gradually approached them within a hundred feet. Gildern fired several arrows at him, but the thief dodged them seemingly effortlessly. However, the black-robed mage was not so bold. He didn't make moves or attack. Instead, he continued to hide behind a tree trunk over two hundred feet away, observing the situation from time to time, clearly trying to stay out of range of Link's spells. While he would be safe from Link's spells at that distance, it also meant that his spells won't reach Link either. In fact, the mage didn't attack at all. He was clearly waiting for Andy to get close to Link before making his move. And this was the very chance Link was looking for. The mage had not yet launched his attacks, but if he could kill Andy, then he would have completed the mission of killing the leader of the thieves and would have received 40 Omni points. This would increase his chance of defeating the black-robed magician? Cover me! We'll kill Andy! Link muttered quickly. Gildern nodded and took a deep breath. He reached for the three arrows in his quiver and then placed them all on the string. Gildern knew that this was a life and death moment, so he focused all his energy and concentration on this one attack. By this time, Andy was already 60 feet away, close enough for Link to clearly see his pair of eyes, which were filled with lust blood. By chance, Andy also looked in that direction, and the two made eye contact. This was the first time Andy had seen Link at such close distance, and it made him stop for a moment. He expected to see the young magician, pale with fear and shaken to the core, but instead he saw a pair of dark eyes, unshakable and frighteningly calm. The word young did not seem to suit the owner of these eyes, although he did not seem old. The magician was no more than sixteen or seventeen years old. His body looked emaciated and weak, and his arms were no thicker than toothpicks. The only thing that stood out about him was his facial expression, or rather, the lack of any expression. His face showed no emotion. Even when Andy looked into his eyes, he could not detect any trace of feelings at all. Is this really the mage who killed all the members of the Nightblade? He looked so weak that even a single breeze could carry him away. I can easily finish him off with one blow of my dagger. But why isn't he afraid? Andy had seen a lot of people, but Link was unlike anyone else he had met so far. For a second, when Andy was thinking, Gildern took the opportunity to raise three arrows and shoot at Andy. At the same time, Link also shot a glass ball at him. A gust of wind brought Andy to his senses. Now he saw arrows flying straight at him, but with lightning speed. The man raised his dagger. Clink. Holding the dagger in his left hand, he easily deflected the arrows and redirected them to another location. And with the dagger in his right hand, he struck Link's glass ball. Bam! The ball moved forward quickly, but Andy still managed to stab it with his dagger because his reaction was incredibly fast. This was what high-level assassins were capable of. Their greatest advantage was their speed, and every move they made in battle was not in vain. They reacted to every attack without even thinking, because they had gone through so much training. It had become commonplace for them. No matter how random and unpredictable the movements of Link's glass balls were, their speed could never exceed 100 feet per second. For ordinary people, this speed was unimaginably fast, but it was too low to catch a high-level assassin like Andy by surprise. Having successfully resisted the attacks, Andy bent his body, jumped up a tree, and hid behind it, as agile as a fox. Now he was only fifty feet away from Link. At the same moment, Jacker was struggling to block the Crystal Golem's attacks, and it seemed like he couldn't stand it any longer. Link only has four mana points left. Gildern was a good shot, but he was only a second-level mercenary. His reaction speed and attack speed did not match Andy's speed. At the same time, Andy was armed with anti-magic armor and anti-magic daggers, so the glass balls could not cause him any harm. In addition, Somewhere else in the forest was a powerful master mage lurking, waiting for the right moment to attack. At this point, even Link began to think that they had a small chance of killing Andy. Andy then appeared from behind a tree and in an instant again disappeared behind another tree. Now he was only thirty feet away from them. Mage, it's time for you to die, said the killer. Link could clearly hear his manic voice echoing throughout the forest. The black-robed mage told him that the young mage had used up almost all of his mana, and that he could only cast two spells at most. 
a magician without his spells in Andy's eyes, was nothing more than a walking piece of meat. Who is a bandit? What is a murderer? There was only one thin line between these two professions. Both took pride in their agility and graceful movements. The only difference was how they made money. While the former used his abilities to rob people of their wealth, the latter specialized in killing people for a bounty on their heads. The syndicate was essentially a combination of both professions. It was an organization of bandits who took people's lives. And at the top of all these immoral acts was Andy. Andy crept up to a tree about thirty feet from Link, gently stroking the blade of his anti-magic dagger. The mage behind the tree, Link, was young but strong. There was no doubt that he was a genius. The thought of the death of such a talented mage excited him. Andy listened carefully to Link's breathing. He was breathing at a fast pace, faster than most fighters. However, the stability of his breathing set him apart from ordinary people. Even at this time, his breathing did not change. Isn't this guy shocked that I just blocked his attack? Andy was a little disappointed. He would rather fight an opponent who had lost all hope than someone who was calm and collected. It gave the man joy to see his opponent suffer. In the face of such calm, Andy began to hesitate. How can he be so unshakable? Maybe he has a trump card that I don't know about. Should I unleash all my powers now? Despite the mage's support, he still had not forgotten his previous encounter with Link's incredibly powerful magic. Andy knew that the only thing that could bring him out of the shadow of failure was to take the life of the mage opposite him right now. But will he be able to do this? Time passed. One second, two seconds, three. The voice of the magician in a black robe sounded in his head. What are you waiting for? The enemy has already called for reinforcements. No time. Andy knew nothing about Princess Annie, and the magician in a black robe was completely aware of her affairs. He also knew that River Cove City's army was rushing towards this place under the command of a powerful level 4 knight. He was not sure that he could defeat such an opponent. If the knight managed to establish contact with Link, he would have no chance of victory. The voice of the black-robed mage woke Andy from his thoughts. He listened carefully to Link's breathing and discovered his exact location. A second later, Andy began to act. Holding his dagger, he came out from behind the tree with lightning speed and threw the anti-magic dagger at the spot he had highlighted. He intended to use this attack not to cause damage, but as a bait to distract his opponent, who will cast spells. He then threw the second dagger straight at Link. Judging by its trajectory, it will pierce Link's stomach. If Link does not have time to react in time, he will be seriously injured. No, most likely, he will die. Then Andy jumped out of his hiding place and activated a combat skill. Dance Carnage. Dance Carnage Level 3. Combat Skill Effect releases a huge amount of combat aura, allowing who used to move quickly and elegantly towards the goal, like a graceful dance. The movements are so fast that the target will see multiple images. Note, be careful, this is a prelude to a kill. Using this skill will allow the user to travel 30 feet in less than half a second. This combat skill was specifically used to fight opponents who were sluggish and physical weak. More often than not, this not only ensured the safety of the assassin, but also ensured the death of the target. At the same time, Link sensed that something was wrong. He knew that the decisive factor in this battle lay in this last second. After a short recovery period, he had 3.2 mana. These mana points can be used to fire three glass balls and cast Mage's Hand once. The biggest threat to him at this moment was the anti-magic dagger. Link made a decision in a split second. He cast Mage's Hand. Despite that, that the dagger had anti-magic properties. It could only dispel spells of an elemental, but not a mystical nature. Although Mage's Hand was a weak spell, it was purely mana in nature, and therefore would have been more effective. Mage's Hand successfully blocked the dagger flying at Link and significantly reduced his speed. But after all, Mage's Hand was a weak spell. In the face of a level 3 assassin's power, the dagger would still retain some of its power. However, weakening the dagger was enough. The moment the dagger noticeably slowed down, Gildern rushed forward, using his steel arrow as a sword. Clink. The dagger was knocked off its trajectory and was unable to inflict any damage on Link. Link's attention, on the other hand, had long since been diverted from the dagger. Even if Gildern had not knocked the dagger off its trajectory, he would have been ready to take the blow. Based on the angle of the dagger and its speed after being impacted by the mage's hand, Link thought that the injury would not be fatal. However, if Andy, a professional killer, managed to get close to him, he would definitely die. Fortunately, the situation was much better. Andy had already covered 18 feet. There was almost no time left. 
Link immediately slammed his fire crystal staff on the ground, and four hundredths of a second later, he released a glass ball. It exceeded his maximum casting speed. But how? The fire crystal staff had the ability to increase the speed of casting spells, especially when using fire elemental magic. This was because the fire crystal at the tip of the staff contained a certain fire element, thereby reducing the time required to gather energy. The glass ball flew into the atmosphere, constantly changing its trajectory depending on Andy's position. Andy quickly maneuvered in different directions thanks to the effects of your activated skill. His position changed every second, and his speed was so fast that the killer could be seen in several places at the same time. Gildern couldn't determine which of them was the real Andy. If he couldn't determine the exact position of his opponent, how was he going to attack? The opponent was too strong. Gildern was unable to react quickly enough to counter his attack. He could only watch as Andy approached them at breakneck speed. However, Link was special. There was no blur in his eyes, and the guy saw everything crystal clear. His reaction time was much faster than that of an ordinary person, and no matter how much Andy tried to deceive him with his multiple images, his gaze was always focused on the real killer. The glass ball described an elegant S-shaped path in the air, completely ignoring Andy's mesmerizing movements. He hit the man right in the face. This completely unexpected attack knocked Andy off his feet. He didn't expect his plan to be foiled. By the time he came to his senses, it was already too late to block the incoming attack with an anti-magic dagger. This is how the situation developed from a third-person point of view. After Andy ran out from his hiding place, he activated his skill, and the killer was enveloped in light. He rushed towards Link, but before he could take the fourth step, he was hit in the face. Boom. The glass ball exploded with a roar. The residual flames from the explosion were extinguished by Andy's anti-magic leather armor and his own battle aura. However, the impact of the explosion penetrated the anti-magic mask and hit Andy in the face with full force. Although the impact was softened by the anti-magic mask, it was significant. The force of the explosion was comparable to the force of the blow of a fighter who attacked with all his might. This was enough to interrupt Andy's fighting skill and stop him. Success? Link breathed a sigh of relief. His opponent moved insanely fast. If he had made any mistakes, the outcome of this battle would have been completely different. This was definitely the most painful battle since he descended into the world of Fearman. Link didn't give Andy a chance to come to his senses as he launched a second glass ball at his face again. Boom! Andy was still in shock from the previous attack and was unable to dodge in time. He took the full force of the second attack. The assassin was completely stunned. Link had one mana point left and could only fire one glass ball. Link then saw a black-robed mage run in their direction, intending to save Andy. However, this mage was still 240 feet away, a distance that was beyond his spellcasting range. Link got an idea and decided to fire the final glass ball in his direction. The maximum range of the glass ball was 180 feet after it was modified by the high magic skill. This range was almost the limit of pure elemental spells below legendary rank. There was a limit to the range of pure elemental magic that could be cast. Usually 240 feet was the limit, after which the elements began to disintegrate due to weakening of focus and turbulence in the atmosphere. This was an iron rule that was not affected by the willpower of the magicians. The black-robed magician first encountered the glass ball. He didn't expect the attack to have such a long range. At first, seeing a dull, light blue ball released in his direction, the magician did not pay any attention to it. However, when the ball exceeded the normal casting range of 90 feet and showed no signs of disintegrating, the mage was puzzled and immediately released a protective spell in response. His staff was enveloped in a ball of light and a first-level spell instantly appeared from it. It was a low-level defense barrier that was good at protecting against magic. But he didn't know that this hitch had great consequences. It was at this point that Gildern came into play. A distance of less than 30 feet combined with an immovable target was just nothing for Gildern with his archery skills. It only took a split second. Andy was dead. Bam, 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 Gildern fired three arrows in quick succession. Steel arrows flew through the air, one aimed at Andy's heart another at Andy's eyes, and the third at Andy's stomach, and they all hit their target. Andy's leather armor may have had anti-magic properties, but against Gildern's carved steel arrows fired from his powerful new bow, they were completely useless. Three arrows went straight through Andy's body. He died before he could say anything. A notification then appeared on the interface, but Link didn't bother checking its details. Now only the Omni-goggles bothered him. After making sure that he now had 40 more Omni-points, 
the young mage spent twenty of them to increase his maximum mana cap without delay. Now his maximum mana had increased to 148 points, and his mana indicator was equals 21 points, enough to fire several whistles. After Andy's death, Link focused all his attention on the black-robed mage, who was 200 feet away from him. The fire crystal staff in his hand caught fire, and two-tenths of a second later, the whistle soared into air, quickly heading towards the black-robed mage. The mage had just encountered the previous attack from the glass balls. He never expected that everything would change in less than a second. He was stunned, but his reaction was still as fast. With lightning-fast steps, he turned and hid behind a tree trunk. The mage wouldn't be able to hide from Whistling Link behind a tree, but at least the tree would protect him from arrows, so he could concentrate on casting without worrying about the archer. Soon, as he took cover behind a tree, he heard a piercing sound rushing towards him. The moment it broke through his defense barrier, he waved his wand in front of him and cast a spell, Frost Shield. Instantly, a triangular shield with an area of about ten square feet appeared in front of him. It was different from the ice shield used in Gladstone. It had a larger surface area, was harder, and the casting speed of this spell was also much faster, requiring only three-tenths of a second to fully form this spell. This was an ice shield modified by the Supreme's magic skills. Clink. The moment the frost shield formed, a white spot appeared on it from the impact, and from this white point cracks arose and spread throughout the entire shield like a spider's web. It seemed as if the shield was about to break. But another whistle appeared behind the magician. The high-speed spinning spike of death circled the forest and flew behind the magician, aiming straight for his heart. The black-robed magician feared for his life. He didn't expect the young magician's spell to be as fast and merciless as a hurricane. Only now did he sense Link's true power, and the man couldn't deny the pressure it put on him. It was no surprise that he could defeat Holmes with a low-level spell like Vector Throw. Holmes must have underestimated this young magician and it cost him his life. Holmes's defeat demonstrated the fact that the magician's skill in combat and his knowledge of spells were two different things. The source of the mage's power could be their knowledge of the facts and theories of magic, but at the same time, these fixed laws and theories did not always translate well into combat skills and could in no way replace combat experience. In other words, mages were first and foremost scientists, and already then as warriors in battle. When two mages fought, what mattered was the distance and speed with which they could cast their spells. The rest of the stats, be it their spell level or their mana power, were just numbers that looked good on paper but didn't actually mean anything on the battlefield. Even if you had knowledge of higher level spells or could create more powerful spells than your opponent, if you were too late or too slow to use them, then it would all be in vain. And this is why those mages who want to be stronger in battle will tirelessly strive to use additional and more advanced higher magic skills especially those that improve their casting speed and casting distance. But now, as it turns out, the black-robed mage had not developed these aspects of his skills as much as he should have, or at least not enough to match the range and speed Link's sorcery. In fact, this level 4 mage was cornered and forced into defensive mode by Link's whistle. When whistle headed towards him, he had no time to cast an offensive spell. All he could do was cast a defensive spell. Vzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
he managed to create five basic defense barriers around his body. Right at the moment the whistling exploded. Bam! Shattered metal pieces were scattered in all directions. Most of them were deflected by the shield, but some managed to penetrate the shield and hit the mage's body. Flames from the explosion also erupted in all directions, but the mage was protected partly by the protective barrier and partly by his clothes. However, a small portion of the fire still reached the mage's body. A groan of pain escaped the mage before he could stop it. Then he had to make a hasty decision. Instantly, the ring on his finger flashed, and the magician's body was engulfed in a flash of blinding white light. After one-tenth of a second, the magician disappeared into the air and reappeared hundreds of yards away. He used a short-distance teleportation spell. Throw. Bam. Another whistle exploded exactly where it had been a few seconds ago. If the magician had not run away a few seconds ago, he would have been a new corpse. As soon as he was about three hundred feet away from them, the magic wand of the black-robed magician lit up again. And after 1.8 seconds, a monstrous creature began to materialize. Ashen Hawk. Ashen Hawk. Third level spell. Effects. A huge hawk carries the summoner with the speed of a wild swan. Gray billowing smoke flowed from the blue gem at the tip of the black-robed mage's mithril wand. The smoke then combined with dust, grass, sticks, and other light objects to form a giant hawk. Then the magician in a black robe climbed onto his back. The giant hawk flapped its wings and flew into the sky. To avoid Link's whistles, the hawk flew by changing its direction, darting up and down, and then weaving left and right. Only when he flew more than a thousand feet, which meant that they managed to get out of range of Link's spells, did he pick up speed and fly into the distance. The black-robed mage escaped. Now he could not pursue the mage, so all that Link could do is to look at the magician flying away on his giant bird. The moment the black-robed magician fled, the crystal golem stopped and abruptly stopped its attacks. His structure didn't collapse, he just stood there motionless. Jacker immediately stepped back from the giant and sighed heavily. Beads of sweat ran down his forehead as if he were standing in the rain. Only God knew how painful the battle was for Jacker and how close he was to death today. However, it wasn't all bad. He thought that the fierce battle had unleashed his potential and freed him from the self-doubts that had been holding him back. He was now confident that with a little training, he would surely be able to reach level four. Link breathed a sigh of relief. He looked at the diminishing figure in the sky, which was the mage. We were deceived by the dark elf, Link said, laughing bitterly. As the metal shot from Link's whistle pierced the mage's body after the explosion, Link noticed that the spilled blood was dark blue in color with a purple tint. This was irrefutable proof of the presence of dark elf blood. No wonder the strange incident at the academy. The magic of the Eastern Bay occurred six months after the tragedy of the Blood Moon change, when dark elves were prowling around and causing trouble for the others. Finally, Link returned to the interface and checked the latest notification. He was immediately taken aback by the contents of the newly activated mission. Mission activated. Search for evidence. Mission details. Find members of the Syndicate unit and get from them more information about the Dark Elf Mage. Mission rewards. 20 Omni Points. What is this Dark Elf Mage up to? Link had a premonition that something was wrong, because based on what he knew about the nature of the game, and in light of recent events, he knew that this dark elf mage could not be taken seriously. Doesn't matter. I'm too tired to think about anything right now. I'll just wait for General Anderson, and we'll decide what to do next. Redleaf Cove. Gildern, collect our spoils of war, and we'll be on our way, Link ordered. Link usually left the physical labor to his followers. Jacker was wounded in the previous battle but Gildern remained unharmed. Naturally, the job fell on Gildern's shoulders, and he hurriedly gathered the weapons and armor they were able to obtain from the Syndicate bandits. After using elemental healing magic on Jacker, Link leaned against a tree to get some rest and remembered the last few fights, analyzing his mistakes. It was a habit he developed while playing the game in the real world. Didn't it say that a holy knight would not be defeated by the same tactics twice? Link was not a holy knight and had not suffered any defeat. However, he was also not perfect, and often reflected on these shortcomings in order to avoid making the same mistake twice. Even if I continue to spend Omni Points on my maximum mana reserve, I will only have 148 mana points, which is too little. It would be good if I created level 0 and level 1 spells. However, one second level spell consumes 20 mana, and a third level spell consumes 60 to 120 mana. I can only cast one or two of these spells before I run out of mana. The attack from a high-level mage this time was especially dangerous. 
I would have to find a more effective and faster way to replenish my mana. Link was still in a state of magic weakness. When he fully recovers in two months, his maximum mana will be 1,480 points, which is equivalent to a level 4 mage. Thus, there was no reason for him to continue wasting Omni points on his maximum mana pool. The best option now would be to find a faster way to top it up. You can try mana restoration potions. I'll cook them when I get back. And yet, these potions have strong side effects. You need to use them together with mana restoration spells. Link vaguely remembered the secret spell of the fourth level, Mana Burst. It required 50 mana, and could restore at least 80% of your maximum mana points in a short period of time after casting this spell. It's probably time to invest some Omni points in learning this spell. Still, today's battle was another problem. Although he emerged victorious, luck played a major role in his victory. In the last few minutes, if Andy had been more patient and dragged out the battle for another five minutes, Jacker would not have been able to resist the Crystal Golem. And if Jacker had given up, Link would have had to deal with both the Crystal Golem and Andy's attack, and would have been much less likely to succeed. It was such a risky maneuver. If things continued like this, something bad would happen. For Link, this style of fighting was uncomfortable. As a magician, he preferred to control the flow of battle. Besides, in case he couldn't do it, he should always have a trump card that he could play in case of an emergency. A battle like today, where every one of their tactics was exposed, was disastrous. Link couldn't get away with it from thoughts about the magician in a black robe. That dark elf was looking for the occult runes. He is probably working in the shadows to rescue Tarvis. He must be In the last few minutes, if Andy had been more patient and dragged out the battle for another- Link didn't know the dark elf, but could gauge his personality based on the battle they faced. Like most mages, he does not like close combat, but prefers to plan ahead and control the flow of battle. I probably wouldn't be able to strike back if I fell into his trap. Speaking of traps, Link motioned for Jacker and Gildern to stay behind, and went off alone to find the failed trap set by the mage. He cast an aura of detection on himself and followed the trail of the syndicate bandits. This time he was calm and meticulous, examining every detail. Halfway through the mountains, he stopped. There was something special about the aura in this area. There was a small, but nevertheless strange distortion. In the midst of battle, one mistake could trigger a trap. Link carefully moved forward, walking around this strange aura, and finally discovered the trap. He brushed away the weeds to reveal a flat stone, slightly illuminated by the silvery green light that came from the runes carved into it. It was rune magic. Rune magic was just a term for ordinary people. In theory, this magic should have been called a high-level sorcery technique. It involved shaping a magical structure into a runic design and then carving it into a relatively flat surface. Link observed the position of the runes and the elemental energy emanating from the stone. This is a spell. It's chain lightning. Link felt a shiver run down his spine. Chain lightning third level. Lightning spell. Effect. Attacks the target with lightning. This attack will automatically rise into the air and target other enemies that hit within a 9-foot radius a maximum of 5 times. Third level. Lightning spells were known for their destructive power. If they had fallen into this trap, Gildern and he probably would not have survived the attack. Jacker would still be alive due to his battle aura. But with Syndicate bandits and a level 4 mage on his tail, the advantage would not be in his favor. Link shuddered at the sight of this magic. Opponents are becoming stronger and more cunning. I may have been lucky this time, but I won't always be lucky. I need to create defensive magic items. Until now, he relied on his instincts and wanted to go on the offensive. It was an extremely dangerous fighting style. One single mistake could cost him his life. During unforeseen situations, such as an ambush or a trap, witchcraft was out of the question. He simply didn't have enough time to go through the complex process of creating a spell. He will need to acquire magical equipment that can store spells and release them almost instantly. I think it's time to learn alchemy and enchantment spells to create my own magic items. Link was a quick learner. Moreover, he preferred to use his own magical items rather than those created by others. He didn't mind taking the time to acquire this skill. Gildern finished packing. He was dragging a bag full of loot behind him. The armor was made of high-quality material despite being damaged, and the anti-magic daggers were in good condition. They will surely be able to sell them at a good price. Let's go back and try to meet General Anderson on the road. Five minutes later, they heard footsteps and chatter. A fully armored knight emerged from the thick undergrowth. It was General Anderson. Behind him stood the River Bay Army and their captain Yaksha. 
There were about 200 soldiers in total, probably drawn from all over the city of River Cove. Anderson was clearly rushing here at full speed, his shiny armor stained with stains of dirt. After making sure that Link was unharmed, he sighed in relief. Princess Annie ordered him to immediately go help Link and make sure that he returned to the kingdom alive. If the mission failed, she would personally make sure of this and arrange his future in the kingdom. He was glad to see Link alive and unharmed. My lord, how are you feeling? Link needed the River Cove City Army to help him find syndicate hideouts, and therefore he needed to be more friendly so that they would definitely help him. The leader of the syndicate and his people have already been destroyed by us. However, the mage escaped despite his injuries, Link explained. He was a dark elf and may have fled to the syndicate's hideout. The mention of the dark elf gave Anderson chills. After the Gladstone incident, any events related to the dark elves obviously attracted attention. King Leon even gave a royal order to destroy all the dark elves in the Norton Kingdom. Believed that the syndicate would interfere with this. So silly, Anderson thought. Even though the syndicate has strong ties to Hot Spring City, this time it will be completely destroyed. Link, can you still fight? Anderson asked. To deal with the mage, you need another mage. Anderson hoped that Link would accompany him to find the syndicate's hideout. Link shook his head. My mana is completely depleted. For now, I will be resting in the city of River Bay. When you find cover, do not rush to attack. Instead, please come to me and we will discuss the plan. Even though he was on an investigation mission, Gerwin Forest was an extremely large area. The syndicate's hideout was well hidden. He couldn't be found in a short period of time, and so he had no reason to trail behind them. Seeing the tired and exhausted expression on Link's face, Anderson nodded. If there is any news, I'll let you know. Please rest. Yaksha, let's go find this bandit's hideout, he shouted to the captain. The elimination of the syndicate was a personal order of Princess Annie, and now even the Dark Elves were involved in it. If he succeeded in this mission, he could make a great contribution to the kingdom. Anderson was delighted. His attitude calmed Link. Apparently the syndicate should not pose a threat to his flamingo mercenary group. Only the Dark Elf Mage remained. As soon as we find traces of a hiding place, we will cut off all paths to salvation for him. Link stepped aside and waited for Anderson to lead his forces into the forest. Now let's return to our long-awaited rest, said Link Jacker and Gildern. Yes, my lord. Although there was a fierce battle between Link and the Syndicate in Redleaf Bay, news of this incident had not yet reached the residents of River Cove City, so life here was as peaceful as before. Earlier, Link, Jacker and Gildern were returning to the house in River Cove, which the mercenaries had bought. When they reached this place they noticed that the front door was open, and two warriors in iron armor were standing inside. Three carriages were standing on the street. Link recognized one of them. It belonged to Annie, but the guy had never seen the other two before. Just when he was thinking about who owned these two carriages, a priest in a white robe came out of the house. Link knew this priest. He was from the Temple of Ikrod, the god of the dawn, in the city of River Cove. His name was Pythor, and he was of the third level. Ikrod, the god of the dawn, was one of the gods of the Kingdom of Light, and he represented the first ray of light that shines over the world, bringing the end of darkness. According to legends, he was the son of the Lord of Light and the goddess hunting of Achillea. He had a warm and gentle nature, and the priests devoted to him possessed powerful magical healing powers. Pythor appeared exhausted, and the aura around his body was dim, apparently due to the fact that he had expended a lot of energy using strong divine healing magic. Princess Annie invited the healing priest here, so I think we don't have to worry about Lucy now, Link said to Jacker with a gentle smile that clearly expressed relief. As the trio approached the door to the house, Pythor climbed into one of the carriages and left, so only one unknown crew remained. It was simple, unadorned, and had no crest or emblem on it, which Link found rather suspicious. Mr. Link? One of the guards recognized Link as they were about to enter the lodge, so he bowed and greeted him formally. It was loud but polite. The man's voice rang through the room so that anyone inside could hear it clearly. Soon after, someone ran out into the street. It was Annie. She quickly looked Link up and down. Then the girl sighed, seeing that he was not seriously injured. How did it go? she asked. She only got to this point shortly before Link arrived. The girl originally planned to make sure Lucy's condition was stable before returning to Redleaf Bay. She didn't expect Link to return so soon? Everything is fine now, more or less. Andy and his men are dead. General Anderson is leading the guards into the forest in search of the syndicate's lair. 
Link replied, leading Jacker and Gildern into the cabin. Under the influence of Link's elemental healing, Jacker recovered significantly, and his wounds were no longer life-threatening. Now the mercenary only needed a little rest to restore his condition, so Link ordered him to get some sleep while Gildern dealt with the loot. Link and Annie then headed towards Lucy's room, and once they reached the hall on the first floor, Link could clearly sense the mysterious mana from Lucy's room. All mages could sense mana, but Link was much more sensitive than most mages, so he could sense it even if it was weak. In fact, the mana was so weak that he couldn't sense it from the outside at all. However, based on the mana this man exuded, Link was sure that the Master Mage was there. Is there anyone else in Lucy's room? Link asked Lucy, thinking about the strange carriage outside. Nothing can hide from your watchful gaze, right? Yes, there is a guest in the room whom you will be pleased to meet, I am sure of it. You'll understand everything once you step inside? Annie explained with a sweet smile on her face. Now Link was even more intrigued. He climbed the stairs to the second floor, slowly opened the door to Lucy's room, and the whole view was gradually revealed to him. Since the mercenaries had enough money after defeating the Dark Brotherhood, they could afford a decent-sized house. It was quite skillfully built from clay bricks, stone and wood. It even had two floors, and Lucy's room was on the second floor where there was more sunlight. The screen divided the room into two parts, the bedroom and the living room. When Link entered the room, he could not see the bedroom because of the screen. However, in the living room he saw a woman with delicate features and long golden locks, dressed in a blue magus robe with silver linings. There was an aura of elegance around her. The living room was very dim, so the glowing aura emitted by the woman's body made her stand out against the gloomy atmosphere of the room. She was sitting at the table when Link saw her. She was flipping through sheets of goatskin. When she heard someone open the door, she looked up. She saw Link about to say something and interrupted him. Shh! Lucy just fell asleep, said the mysterious guest. Who are you? Link asked in the quietest voice possible. By her magical aura, the guy realized that this was not an ordinary magician. In fact, he was sure that the level of this mage was much higher than his own. Now he had a vague idea of the woman's identity because the goat skins in her hands looked very familiar. The woman stood up, walked to the door and said, Lucy's life is safe now, but she still needs a lot of rest. Let's go to the hall below and talk there. Naturally, Link didn't mind, so the three of them went downstairs. As soon as they reached the hall, the woman introduced herself. Moira. I'm sure you've heard this name before. Link, of course, heard her name before. She was Elliard's mentor. They had never met before, but they communicated with each other through letters, and Moira helped explain many of the questions the young man had about magic. Thank you very much for your patient consultation, Link said, bowing. These answers from Moira were of great help to him. Thanks to them, he was able to avoid so many false turns and dead ends in his study of magic. Moira's smile widened and she extended her hand, inviting Link to sit down. She then handed the documents to Link. The guy looked at them and realized that this was his corrected work, then turned to Moira with a puzzled look. Do celestial bodies really move this way? asked Moira. Her voice became serious when discussing these academic matters. Link nodded. Now he too became serious. I analyzed the observational data of the astronomer Derek over fifty years and derived my theory from them. If each of the celestial bodies was assigned a fixed orbital path, then it should only be as I have described here, Link explained with great confidence. The stars in outer space were endlessly mysterious and fascinating, and in every world there would always be people who were attracted to their beauty. Derek was one of those people in this world. This scientist lived 300 years ago and devoted his entire life to observing the sky and stars. In the last years of his life, he recorded all his discoveries in a book called Dreams of the Stars. Although the scientist gave this work a poetic title, its content was purely scientific, and it contained Derek's own observational data on the movements of celestial bodies, which he had collected over five decades. In the world of Fearman, Derek's research was largely ignored. But because his observations were both detailed and accurate, and because he wrote beautifully, his book was passed around and widely read after his death. Link even found his book in a small bookstore in River Cove City, so he bought it for only five silver coins. She helped the young man a lot when he wrote his dissertation. But I see that your theory is far from exhaustive or complete, said Moira. There was a glint in Moira's eyes as she listened to his explanation, but she quickly hid it and kept her cool. Majessa seemed uninterested in matters of the stars and space, which was understandable because the stars were too far away. They could not have anything to do with magic or our everyday life at all. You are right. 
The theory simply describes how things happen, but as for the question of why it happens this way or where these laws come from, the theory does not answer that at all, Link said, nodding. I heard from Eliard that there are some parts of your thesis that you haven't finished yet. Can I take a look at them? asked Moira. Her eyes were focused on the thin gold chain pendant around Link's neck. The manuscripts are in mine. Okay. Link had planned to tell Moira that his manuscripts were in his room at the River Cove Inn. But now, looking into her eyes, it was obvious that he couldn't keep where he kept his things a secret from the Master Mage. So Link pulled the rest of the work out of his pendant for storage as Annie stared at him in fear. Luckily, there was no one else there. Annie was a princess, so the sight of a storage pendant would not surprise her. And he was sure that nothing could be more common for a Master Mage like Moira than a simple storage pendant. As expected, Moira was completely unperturbed. She took the goatskin papers from Link and read them for about an hour, as if there was no one else in the room. Any academy of magic in the world will open its doors wide to accept you as soon as they see this thesis, Moira said for more than an hour. Later, she put down the thesis, then took a deep breath. Does this mean I can enroll in the Eastern Bay Magic Academy now? Link asked, excited by Moira's words. Moira nodded and said, In fact, before I came here, your paper on the classical theory of gravity was sent to every teacher in the academy for review. And the dean himself, Master Anthony, agreed to it? To enroll you. Your innate talent for magic is very low. He was forced to raise your tuition fee to 2,000 gold coins, so that other students would not feel that they were treated unfairly. You won't have any problems paying for your tuition, will you? 2,000 gold coins? But it's too expensive. It's not fair. Annie chimed in. Dean Anthony ordered it. Moira said, shrugging. The look on her face meant that she couldn't do anything about it. Annie didn't say anything else when she heard that this was the order of the dean of the academy. The dean was a seventh-level master and was highly respected in the kingdom. Even her father, the Iron Duke, could not interfere with what the dean ordered. It doesn't matter, she thought. If Link couldn't afford to pay, then she would just help him with it. After all, it was only 2,000 gold coins, and she had already accumulated that amount of money anyway. Link himself had no objection to this order at all. All he wanted was to enter the academy. Now that the dean had accepted him, how could he allow a small problem regarding money to complicate this matter? I agree with the dean's order, Link said, nodding. However, there was still some doubt lurking in his mind. His maximum mana level had now reached 148 points, and although there was not much mana in his body now, how could Moira, being a fifth-level mage, not notice it? He was only 17 years old, but he had the mana level of a second-level mage level and the ability to cast second-level spells in Gladstone. He even used the fourth-level spell Flame Explosion. All this wasn't that hard to figure out, so why did Moira still think that his innate talent for magic was low? Just as he was thinking about this, he heard Moira say to Annie, Your Highness, I must ask your permission to return. To the Academy now. Link, you will come with me to the city, and along the way I will tell you the rules of the Academy. Annie did not find anything suspicious in what Moira said, so she gave them her permission to leave. Even Link didn't feel anything unusual about Moira's request, so he nodded and said, Of course. As soon as he and Moira left the cabin, Moira invited him into the carriage. Once inside the carriage, Moira snapped her fingers, and Link immediately felt the noise around him fade away. All the noise outside, the people, the horse, the turning of the wheels, everything became quiet. Link was slightly puzzled. He knew it was the effect of a soundproof barrier, meaning Moira was going to tell him something important. He kept his mouth shut, even though questions were running through his mind. He thought it best to let Moira start the conversation. After a full minute, Moira laughed and said, Young man, I'm impressed by your restraint. You must be dying to know why I think your innate talent in magic is low, aren't you? Well, you were easily able to figure out the mystery of my pendant, so I thought it would be very strange for you to make one. An obvious error in judgment, Link replied, because you will be a student of Mage Bale and he would not pay attention to you if you were a student with weak magical abilities? That way you could be close to him and watch his every move without making him suspicious of you? Moira said, blurting out the surprising revelation as if it were an ordinary fact. Link was completely stunned. He had no idea how to react to Moira's revelations. He believed that this woman was not an ordinary sorceress, but he did not expect that she could baffle him so easily. In the game, Level 6, Mage Bale was a traitor in this magic academy. He secretly studied dark magic, which ultimately led to disastrous consequences at the academy. According to Moira, he sensed that she already suspected that Bale was up to something sinister. I don't understand. 
Link couldn't think of a reason why Moira would choose him to spy on Bale. The young man did not understand why the Magus trusted him, and was even more surprised at how she could understand what Bale was up to. In fact, even Master Anthony had no idea what Bale was planning to do. In the game, when Magician Bale tried to summon demons, he was only revealed at the very last minute, and before that, no one knew anything about Bale's secrets. How could someone who had the insight to understand all this before everyone else not be famous in the game? Who was this Moira? Moira knew all the questions that were in Link's head. She smiled and explained, Because I am not human. I am the secret guardian of the realm of light, the angel of light. Link was speechless, and his eyes became like saucers. The angels of light were a legendary race that appeared in many folklore throughout the world of Firaman. In these stories, the angels of light were the protectors of the gods. They were sacred and powerful, always fighting against the dark forces on the front lines. However, not many had actually seen the Angel of Light with their own eyes. Link couldn't believe that the magic instructor from the Eastern Bay High Academy of Magic was an Angel of Light. Moreover, her motive was to inform him of some secrets that had been kept for centuries. Can I ask your name, please? Link asked after he remembered himself. While he was playing games, the Angel of Light could not often observe Firumon in the world, trying to save the world from the constantly corroding dark forces. She was named one of the Four Beauties, Herrera. After playing for half a year, the player sometimes saw Herrera. When Herrera first awoke, her powers and beauty were average at best. However, as players became stronger, more of her powers awakened and eventually revealed her true identity as the Angel of Light. Not all players were lucky enough to witness the Angel of Light's true form. The first requirement was to reach the legendary state, which only 5% of the billions of players were able to achieve. While other players could see the Angel of Light through the data of legendary players, the experience of meeting her in person was very different. However, just the sight of Herrera was enough to many. She had an elegant and fearful disposition. Seeing her, you will get rid of your evil thoughts and be able to find inner peace. Moira had no intention of keeping her real name a secret. My name is Herrera, from the Sacred Land of Light. My mission is to help people in the world of light in their fight against dark forces. However, I will not interfere directly in battles out of respect for the free will of life in this world. It really was Herrera. Link was dumbfounded. He met her one day while playing a game. However, they first met after the explosion in the Eastern Bay of High Magic, and not at the Academy itself. In fact, her whereabouts before the explosion was a mystery. He didn't think she would be at the Academy. Why did you contact me? Link was puzzled. I descended into the mortal realm thirty-five years ago. Two years ago I awakened a memory where the God of Light hinted at the coming of the Chosen One. I've been waiting since then. At first I thought that Eliard was the Chosen One, but after reading your dissertation I had the feeling that it was you who, having met you in person, confirmed my hypothesis. Link was speechless. He was truly chosen by the God of Light to descend into this world, although until now he still refused to admit it. Link's silence confirmed Herrera's hypothesis. A normal person would not have been able to remain so calm after her revelation that she was an angel of light. She continued, I have discovered that Bale appears to be experimenting with dark magic. He has gone too far into this area. There is a high probability that he will fall into deprivation. I need someone to handle the situation. It seems you are the best choice. An in-game message appeared in Link's view. Mission activated. Suspicion. Objective. Investigate the Mage Bale and find evidence of his research into black magic. Reward, 25 Omni Points. Link hesitated for a moment and then accepted the mission. After all, he really needed the Omni Glasses. Link remained silent the entire time. Thinking that he did not want this, Herrera said, I will not interfere with your free will. If you are not ready, you can still enroll in the Academy to practice magic, or even reselect your magic instructor. You can also become my student. Link felt calm as he listened to these words. Similar to his previous experiences, Herrera continues to emphasize respect for the free will of the living. Completing her mission will usually give you some pretty decent rewards. In fact, talking with Herrera was a privilege. Link knew that Herrera had misunderstood. He said, No, of course, I'm ready. I'm just a little worried. About what? asked Herrera. My true magical power is much higher than that of an ordinary academy student. The only reason I'm so weak right now is because of the side effect of the powerful potion. Level 6 Magician, how should you understand what is happening now? Indeed? Herrera nodded, but that's not a problem at all. Herrera took out a shimmering pure white feather, 
surrounded by a lot of sparkles. Look carefully. Every ball of light you see is a rune. She gave the feather to Link. If you carry it with you, it will mask your aura, making you look like any other normal student. Link examined the feather carefully, and a message appeared on the game system. Angel of Light Camouflage Feather Quality. Epic effect. Significantly reduces the magical aura you emit. The moment Link came into contact with the feather, the feather turned into a ball of light and flew around his body before disintegrating in the air. Link peered into the mirror in the carriage. He became as normal as any other student at the academy. Herrera continued, I have already made all the preparations. There is an empty slot in Bale's class. Give him 2,000 gold coins as tuition fee. He will not be able to resist such a huge amount of money. You have to be careful because Bale is a vigilant person. You must find a balance that allows you to attract his attention without raising his suspicions. Only then will you reveal the truth. It was a difficult request. Link thought for a moment and asked, Does Bale need money? Every magician needs money? Herrera winked. I understand. Link had already made a plan to get closer to Bale. The carriage was now close to the exit of River Cove City. Herrera spoke her final words. Your dissertation was intriguing. Your exposure to the orbits of the stars was accurate, and you even included a discussion of the nature of space in your assessment. However, you should never disclose this information to the public, at least until you have gained the power to protect yourself. You understand? Link shuddered and nodded his head in understanding. I swear on my heart, in the world of Firamin, knowledge can be directly translated into power. Before, when Link was ignorant, he only wanted to get the Academy's confirmation. He remembered his actions and laughed. Fortunately, he did not present the full document, but only part of it. Fine. Come back and report to the Academy in a month. Someone will lead you to Bale's magical tower. The carriage pulled up to the stop, waiting to board. Suddenly a thought flashed into his head. Lately, I have been interested in alchemy and enchantment magic. Can I borrow some books from you? Certainly. Herrera smiled. Her hands glowed with sacred light and went into space next to her. When the glow subsided, three books appeared in her hand. Enchanting Magic Theory, Fundamental Enchanting Magic, and Intermediate Enchanting Magic. The requirement to learn enchanting is much less since it does not require special tools. As for alchemy, let Sis wait until you get to the academy, she said handing the books to Jacker. Link was delighted. Thank you. Herrera smiled, her eyes reflecting the dazzling sunlight of the Gervant Forest. With a voice as clear as water, she said softly, You are the Chosen One. As a vessel of God in the mortal world, it is my duty to help you become stronger. Until you turn to the dark side, I will do everything possible to help you uncover the secrets of magic. The carriage door closed and moved, slowly moving out of Link's sight. With the weight of three books in his hand, Link thought, should he turn to the dark side? What does the dark side have to offer me? He grabbed the necklace on his chest, which contained magic runes and Selene's darkness feather, both of which emitted a strong aura of darkness. A certain amount of research into the dark side is still necessary. Know your enemy, right? Link was never alone and completely following the rules. The Syndicate covered their tracks well, even after three days of a thorough search by General Anderson and the police. Their lair has still not been located. He couldn't do anything about it, so he decided to just wait patiently. As for Princess Annie, she ordered the king to report to the cities. So on the second day, she reluctantly left the city of River Cove. With no one left to disturb him, Link could finally immerse himself peacefully in his explorations. He no longer lived in the inn's attic, but rather lived in a hut that had been purchased by the Flamingo Mercenary Group. There were people tending to his needs here, and the food prepared by the cook they hired at a high cost was delicious. The most important thing was that no one would disturb him here while he studied, so he settled into the cabin contentedly. Over the course of three days, Link finished reading three books on charms. From these books, he developed a deep understanding on the subject. The book Introduction to Enchantment Magic did a very good job of summarizing the concepts of enchantment in one sentence. Enchantment is the process of attaching spells to a specific object. In theory, as long as the correct method was used, any spell could be attached to an object, including fireball, protection armor, flying blades, hidden power, and so on. The method and skill involved in casting these spells fell under the enchantment field. Take the wand, for example. In reality, the wand was an object that could hold mana stably. According to legend, 500 years ago, magicians used spells without a wand. Thus, their spell consisted of two steps first compressing their own mana into a magical aura, 
and then using that magical aura to release the spell they intended to release. This made it much more difficult for mages at that time to advance their skills compared to the present, where mages used wands to cast their spells. After reading three books, Link turned his attention to writing letters. He had two of them to write. The first was to Moira, where he would write down all the questions he had regarding the contents of the textbooks, and the second was a letter to Eliard. Eliard shared many similar interests with him, and their intelligence was about at the same level. So Link loved to talk to him about anything. Link would write to Eliard often, regardless of whether there was something important to tell him. They often discussed their thoughts and comments on magical topics, or they only shared news and gossip that they encountered. Whatever it was, they were both very much enjoying each other's company. Link would have a lot of free time waiting for answers to his letters, and he would spend it experimenting with charms in his room, based on the theoretical and practical knowledge that he just gleaned from books. The most commonly used metal in enchantments was mithril, because it was conductive to mana. By molding mithril into various configurations through various methods, a stable and long-term mana storage device could be constructed, and through changing the structure of mithril, the mana structure could also be changed, allowing for the use of different spells. Those were the theories anyway. In practice, however, there were many other details to pay attention to that would ultimately affect the outcome, which is why Link wanted to carry out these experiments. He didn't have any mithril on hand, but that was fine because he could get some by breaking Dark Moon's wand. Although the wand was not of the highest quality, it contained a decent amount of mithril. In fact, Link managed to obtain a pound of mithril after dismantling the wand. What a waste. The price of 1,000 gold coins was spent on mithril in a stick. Should a master stickman have done this? thought Link. He wonders if the wand master's reputation was greatly exaggerated. Once he received mithril, Link spent 20 omni points to buy the transformation spell needed for the enchantment, Werewolf. Werewolf level 2 spell mana cost, 0.2 points per second. Effects. After casting a spell on a specific object, the physical form of the object will change according to the wishes of the caster. Note. This is a necessary spell for low-level enchantments. Quickly learning this spell, Link immediately used it on Mithril on the table. The spell did not require any special mana-focusing skills, so even a mage's spell-casting skills were sufficient. As the mana in Link's body was excited and organized into a specific spell structure, a special force field emerged. This force field was almost invisible. If if he hadn't slightly changed the direction of the light passing through him, where it was concentrated in Link's palm, he would not have noticed its existence at all. Link knew that the power was known in transformation spells as the Higgs force field. This force field was discovered by the magician by named Higgs over 600 years ago and he was also the one who pioneered the field of transformation spells. His discovery changed the skills of enchantment from something that only high-level magicians could do to something that any ordinary magician could easily learn. The Higgs force field had a strange property where it could transform the shape and properties of any inanimate objects. As long as your skill is sufficiently developed, you can turn metal into water or even stone into gold. But of course, the skills that were needed were very, very difficult to develop. And there was another limitation the huge mana consumption rate. The more properties of the object that had to be transformed, the higher the mana consumption. For example, the ability to turn stone into gold may at first glance seem like a tempting idea that will allow you to endlessly grow your wealth. But in reality, it would take all the mana that a sixth level mage had to turn a palm-sized cobblestone into gold of the same size and weight. Nothing can be more valuable to a wizard than his mana so no mage in his right mind will never spend all his mana on a simple palm-sized piece of gold. And so, no magician ever bothered to learn how to turn stones into gold. As the saying goes, there was no such thing as a free lunch in this world. Now back to Link. Link directed a transparent force field with his mind to wrap a bunch around his thumb Mithril is on the table. He then imagined the structure of the spell, a glass ball in his head. Link had a particularly active imagination so he could easily visualize things in his mind down to the smallest detail. This skill worked in his favor when learning the charm. The pile of mithril began to move and began to form into threads. The threads turned into magical runes and finally turned into a solid mana structure, just as Link had visualized it in his mind. After about three minutes, a shiny ball of mithril formed. At first glance, the ball seemed to be a normal metal ball with a hollow structure, but upon closer inspection, it was an exact copy of the glass ball's spell structure. Of course, the mithril threads had no mana, so currently it was only a hollow structure that could not capture the fire elements in the air. In short, 
It was just nice to look at now. Let's see if it works. Link took a small mithril ball and concentrated his mana into it. This process did not require high concentration. All you had to do was pour your mana into the ball. He didn't need to visualize the spell's structure because the mithril threads automatically channeled mana into the structure of the glass ball. In a few moments, the mana filled the entire mithril ball. Upon closer inspection, Link could see that the mithril ball began to glow, turn blue, and finally turned into a glowing blue ball. It was now a perfect copy of Link's glass spell ball. What a time-saving way to cast a spell. However, it came at a cost, Link said with a sigh. The spell cost him 1,000 gold coins. Even the ostentatious magician did not want to use such an expensive technique. It was a glass ball based on mithril, with mithril threads already in the configuration of the spell structure of Link's glass ball. Thus, any magician in the world who can control the mana in his body will be able to release the glass balls. They all had to channel their mana into the mithril ball. But of course, this technique was too expensive to be practical. Not only is its power pitifully small, it can only be used once. So it was only useful in experiments. There was a description of the basic structure of magic wands in a basic enchantment. I think I'll try to replicate that. Link got himself a wooden stick. He then cast a werewolf spell on the mithril threads to move and place it on the stick according to the spell structure shown in the textbook. After that, he put on some finishing touches. And then Link successfully created his first basic wand from scratch. Link was studying the crude wand in his hand, which was lined with mithril, when a notification appeared on his interface. Basic wand, no name. Low quality effects. Increases spell power by 5%. This isn't too bad. Link didn't mind that the wand was of poor quality because he only spent half an hour to make it. He tried spells with the new wand and thought that the feeling was very nice in his hand. Ha! Isn't this interesting? Link exclaimed, surprised at how good the wand was. He successfully cast two more spells with the new wand. Now Link's interest in enchantments deepened significantly. He remembered the chapter in Basic Enchantment about creating magic scrolls. Magic scrolls use special mana conducting ink. It involved the process of transferring the spell structure onto the two-dimensional surface of an anti-magic sheet of paper. The advantages of magic scrolls were that they were portable and economical, and if mana and activating magic runes were attached to the scrolls, even laymen could use them to cast spells. Link wanted to try to create a magic scroll, but he did not have the necessary materials. He didn't let that stop him. What to do when there was no mana conducting ink? No problem. The source of magic conducting ink was the blood of a magical creatures and mages were one of these magical creatures. So a mage's blood could be used as a replacement for mana-conducting ink. The stronger the mage, the more effective their blood will be as a mana-conducting ink. Without any reservations, Link took a few drops of blood from his body. But what about the anti-magic paper? Well, actually goat paper was the most basic and most common type of anti-magic paper. So Link took it too. Now that he had all the necessary materials, Link dipped the pen into his blood and then sketched out the structure of the fireball spells onto the goatskin paper. Link's ability to accurately imagine structure worked in his favor, recreating the structure of fireball spells in one smooth stroke on the goatskin paper. He then turned on the necessary activating magic runes and poured his mana onto the scrolls. Immediately, the blood-red ink on the goat paper emitted a magical aura, but due to the limitations of the activating runes, the scroll did not absorb the fire elements in the air, so the fireball did not form. Link wanted to check the scroll's effects immediately. He activated the magic scroll according to the method in the books, which was to erase the activating runes and then throw the scroll into the air. The scroll absorbed and attracted the fire elements in the air. Then it began to ignite and burst into a fireball. Due to the spell's very simple structure and because the scroll was made from raw materials, the fireball did not have much explosive power. But overall, Link considered it a success. How interesting. Link's interest in charms became even stronger. Soon after this letter, letters from the Academy arrived for him. He opened and read Eliard's letter before carefully studying Moira's letter, where she gave him very clear and detailed answers to his questions. Along with the letters, Moira also sent him three new textbooks, Wand Construction, Advanced Charming Skills, and Advanced Applications of the Higgs Force Field. Link rejoiced at the titles of these books. He couldn't feel happier even if they sent him gems. After going through the wand's construction, he swore that he was going to create a new wand for himself. Three days passed, and Royal Knight Anderson still had no success in finding the Syndicate's hideout. It was within Link's expectations. When he played the game, the Syndicate's hideout was well known for its secrecy. The Dark Brotherhood's hideout was well hidden, but the Syndicate's was on a completely different level. 
the syndicate built their hideout to complement the geography of the land. They also used various spells and divine powers to hide it. Even if a thorough search was made in Gerwin Forest, luck would still have to be on their side for the search to be successful. Link thus decided that he would take this time to focus on developing his wand. A mage's power depended largely on the quality of his wand, making the staff the most important piece of a mage's equipment. The powerful wand was extremely difficult to manufacture. The main wand he created earlier only managed to increase its magical power by a measly 5%. He would likely be dismissed as grossly overestimating his own abilities if he told another wizard about his foolish attempts to create a wand after only six days of practice. However, Link never followed the rules. He always valued actions over words, and was determined to accomplish what he set out to do despite the difficulties. First, he needed to fully understand and assimilate the knowledge in the three charming magical books that Herrera had kindly given him. Lucy, I plan to do meditation training these next few days. Just place any food outside my door and please don't interrupt my progress, Link warned Lucy. What if General Anderson is looking for you? Lucy was already used to Link's bizarre habits of locking himself in his room and didn't think anything of it. Anderson. Let me know if this happens. Link had no choice. He promised to help with the search earlier and could not return his word, especially after locking himself in his room. I understand. Lucy nodded. Link then began his research in the field of enchanting magic. When he woke up, his eyes were fixed on the books. He slept only three hours a day, and even when he slept, he dreamed of magic. From a third-person perspective, he seemed to have gone a little crazy. Link's brain was like a supercomputer. In three days, he finished all three magic books. Enchanting magic is so interesting, Link exclaimed. He began to compose a letter to Herrera. He had so many new questions about the wonderful world of enchanting magic. After sending the letter, he immediately began experimenting with enchanting magic. Naturally, extravaganza was a branch of magic, thanks to the work of many generations of sorcerers over the past 500 years. A complex system of spells was finally developed, many of which were unique and powerful. Link had to familiarize himself with some of the methods of enchantment before he began creating his staff. We are a little short on resources, but it does not matter. Mithril is the only resource we need. Link fell back into fanaticism. Over the next few days, sounds of explosions, laughter, and even the howling of the wind were constantly heard from Link's room. Initially, everyone was a little afraid of what was happening, but soon got used to it. Whenever the sound of an explosion was heard, they looked at each other and reached an understanding. I think. Link's experiment failed again. Three days have passed. Herrera sent the letter back from the academy. After reading her answers, Link wrote down new questions from the experiments he had been conducting for the past few days and handed the letter to the messenger. He never stopped working, and with such fanaticism, his enchanting magic level quickly rose. Time flew by. Two weeks had already passed, but this was already the fifth exchange of letters between Link and Herrera. General Anderson also tried his best not to interfere with Link's training with unnecessary things. In the last two letters, Link had improved to the point where he was able to raise some objections to Herrera's answers, rather than just passively absorbing knowledge. He made significant progress. On the last day of his two-week training, a loud explosion was heard from Link's room. With his face covered in dust, his hair disheveled, and his shirt stained, Link ran out of his room, holding a wooden stick in his hand. What caught everyone's attention was the fire crystal that appeared on the tip of the stick. I succeeded! Yes! Link swung the wooden stick ecstatically. Wooden stick? No. It was a wand. Magic wand. Match quality. Epic effect 1. Increases the casting speed of fire magic by 20%. Effect 2. Increases magical power by 50%. Effect 3. Contains third level magic. Giant's power. Released after charging. Note. Created by the mage Link. Based on the classification rule for magical equipment in the world of Firamin, equipment with three additional effects was powerful enough to be recorded in the annals of history, also known as epic quality. Link dismantled both the Fire Crystal Staff and the Dark Moon Wand before trying to combine both of their materials together. Using the knowledge he had gained over the past two weeks, he finally succeeded in creating this epic quality wand after many failures. The wood of the wand came from the Fire Crystal Staff which he thinned out to lighten the weight and increase movement speed. The tip of the wand had a huge fire crystal. At first glance, it simply looked like a giant matchstick, hence the name. It was probably the ugliest epic piece of equipment in Firamin's history. 
Link gained the reward of five Omni Points after creating the wand, and also developed his own understanding of enchanting magic. The whole process took him about twenty days. Progress was much faster than that of the average magician. This was partly due to his talent, but more than that, to his undivided attention and passion. During these few days, he skipped meals to conduct experiments, and even dreamed of magical magic while he slept. He was also confident in his control over magic, and dared to conduct all sorts of experiments, as evidenced by the successive sounds of explosions. It is not surprising that such a hard-working, fanatical genius was able to achieve such results. Lucy was the first person Link saw after he ran out of the room. Lucy had already fully recovered from her injury. The power of divine spells was mind-blowing. Even a scar remained after recovery. Lucy looked rested and at the peak of her health. She even looked like she had gained weight. Link was delighted and hugged Lucy tightly. He tried to spin around, hugging her to celebrate his achievement, but Lucy didn't even budge. Lucy was half a head taller than Link, and although she looked slender and light, she was a warrior after all, and weighed much more than the average girl. It was impossible for Link to carry her with his weak frame. Link awkwardly removed his hands as Lucy blushed. How many gold coins do we have now after paying for my tuition? Link hastily changed the subject. He was too excited and lost his cool. Previously, we received 1,300 gold coins from the sale of anti-magic equipment. On top of 1,500 gold coins you saved, we have 2,800 gold coins in total. Lucy reported the numbers after she calmed down. We will keep 500 gold coins for our daily needs. Instruct Jacker to buy more mithril with the remaining gold coins. I will enchant the rest of your armor. Link laughed. Link was still unsure about enchanting other types of high-level equipment. However, he was confident enough to enchant the basic equipment. He believed that for Jacker and the others, adding a few magical attributes would be enough to greatly increase their strength. The most important thing was that everyone now knew that the Flamingo Mercenary Group's master was a powerful magician. Jacker also became a level 4 warrior, while Lucy and Gildern gained a combat aura and became level 3. No one will look down on them anymore. Agree. Lucy's eyes sparkled at the mention of magical equipment, nodding her head enthusiastically. No shop in River Cove City would openly sell a metal as precious and expensive as mithril, which was commonly used in magical spells. But that wasn't a problem for Jacker because he had his own tricks.